Mary Barton by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell Chapter 1 A Mysterious Disappearance Oh, tears hard, tears hard to be working, the whole of the live-long day, when all the neighbours about one are off to their jaunts and play. There's Richard, he carries his baby, and Mary takes little Jane, and lovingly they'll be wandering through fields and briery lane. Manchester Song There are some fields near Manchester, well known to the inhabitants as Green Hayes Fields, through which runs a public footpath to a little village about two miles distant. In spite of these fields being flat and low, nay, in spite of the want of wood, the great unusual recommendation of level tracts of land, there is a charm about them which strikes even the inhabitant of a mountainous district, who sees and feels the effect of contrast in these commonplace but thoroughly rural fields. With the busy, bustling manufacturing town he left but half an hour ago. Here and there an old black and white farmhouse, with its rambling outbuildings, speaks of other times and other occupations than those which now absorb the population of the neighbourhood. Here in their seasons may be seen the country business of haymaking, ploughing, etc., which are such pleasant mysteries for townspeople to watch. And here the artisan, deafened with noise of tongues and engines, may come to listen a while to the delicious sounds of rural life, the lowing of cattle, the milkmaid's call, the clatter and cackle of poultry in the farmyards. You cannot wonder, then, that these fields are popular places of resort at every holiday time, and you would not wonder if you could see, or I properly describe, the charm of one particular style that it should be, on such occasions, a crowded halting place. Close by it is a deep, clear pond, reflecting in its dark green depths the shadowy trees that bend over it to exclude the sun. The only place where its banks are shelving is on the side next to a rambling farmyard, belonging to one of those old-world, gabled, black-and-white houses I named above, overlooking the field through which the public footpath leads. The porch of this farmhouse is covered by a rose tree, and the little garden surrounding it is crowded with a medley of old-fashioned herbs and flowers, planted long ago, when the garden was the only druggist shop within reach, and allowed to grow in scrambling and wild luxuriance roses, lavender, sage, balm, for tea, rosemary, pinks and wallflowers, onions and jessamine, in most republican and indiscriminate order. This farmhouse and garden are within a hundred yards of the style of which I spoke, leading from the large pasture field into a smaller one, divided by a hedge of hawthorn and blackthorn, and near this stile, on the further side, there runs a tail the primroses may often be found, and occasionally the blue sweet violet on the grassy hedge bank. I do not know whether it was on a holiday granted by the masters, or a holiday seized in right of nature, and her beautiful springtime by the workmen. But one afternoon, now ten or a dozen years ago, these fields were much thronged. It was an early May evening, the April of the poets, for heavy showers had fallen all the morning, and the round, soft, white clouds which were blown by a west wind over the dark blue sky were sometimes varied by one blacker and more threatening. The softness of the day tempted forth the young green leaves, which almost visibly fluttered into life, and the willows, 
which that morning had had only a brown reflection in the water below, were now of that tender grey green which blends so delicately with the spring harmony of colours. Groups of merry and somewhat loud talking girls, whose ages might range from twelve to twenty, came by with a buoyant step. They were most of them factory girls, and wore the usual out-of-doors dress of that particular class of maidens, namely a shawl, which at midday or in fine weather was allowed to be merely a shawl, but towards evening, if the day was chilly, became a sort of Spanish mantilla, or scotch plaid, and was brought over the head and hung loosely down, or was pinned under the chin in no unpicturesque fashion. Their faces were not remarkable for beauty. Indeed, they were below the average, with one or two exceptions. They had dark hair, neatly and classically arranged, dark eyes, but sallow complexions and irregular features. The only thing to strike a passer-by was an acuteness and intelligence of countenance, which has often been noticed in a manufacturing population. There were also numbers of boys, or rather young men, rambling among these fields, ready to bandy jokes with anyone, and particularly ready to enter into conversation with the girls, who, however, held themselves aloof, not in a shy, but rather in an independent way, assuming an indifferent manner to the noisy wit or obstreperous compliments of the lads. Here and there came a sober, quiet couple, either whispering lovers or husband and wife, as the case might be, and if the latter, they were seldom unencumbered by an infant, carried for the most part by the father, while occasionally even three or four little toddlers had been carried or dragged thus far, in order that the whole family might enjoy the delicious May afternoon together. Some time in the course of that afternoon, two working men met with friendly greeting at the style so often named. One was a thorough specimen of a Manchester man, born of factory workers, and himself bred up in youth, and living in manhood among the mills. He was below the middle size and slightly made. There was almost a stunted look about him, and his wan, colourless face gave you the idea that in his childhood he had suffered from the scanty living consequent upon bad times and improvident habits. His features were strongly marked, though not irregular, and their expression was extreme earnestness, resolute either for good or evil, a sort of latent stern enthusiasm. At the time of which I write, the good predominated over the bad in the countenance, and he was one from whom a stranger would have asked a favour with tolerable faith that it would be granted. He was accompanied by his wife, who might, without exaggeration, have been called a lovely woman, although now her face was swollen with crying, and often hidden behind her apron. She had the fresh beauty of the agricultural districts, and somewhat of the deficiency of sense in her countenance, which is likewise characteristic of the rural inhabitants in comparison with the natives of the manufacturing towns. She was far advanced in pregnancy, which perhaps occasioned the overpowering and hysterical nature of her grief. The friend whom they met was more handsome and less sensible-looking than the man I have just described. He seemed hearty and hopeful, and although his age was greater, yet there was far more of youth's buoyancy in his appearance. He was tenderly carrying a baby in arms, while his wife, 
a delicate, fragile-looking woman, limping in her gait, bore another of the same age, little feeble twins, inheriting the frail appearance of their mother. The last-mentioned man was the first to speak, while a sudden look of sympathy dimmed his gladsome face. "'Well, John, how goes it with you?' and in a lower voice he added, "'Any news of Esther yet?' Meanwhile the wives greeted each other like old friends, the soft and plaintive voice of the mother of the twins seeming to call forth only fresh sobs from Mrs. Barton. "'Come, woman,' said John Barton, "'you've both walked far enough. "'My Mary expects to have her bed in three weeks.' And as for you, Mrs. Wilson, you know you are but a cranky sort of a body at the best of times. This was said so kindly that no offence could be taken. Sit you down here, the grass is well nigh dry by this time, and you're neither of you nesh folk about taking cold. Stay, he added, with some tenderness. Here's my pocket handkerchief to spread under you to save the gowns women always think so much on. And now, Mrs. Wilson, give me the baby. I may as well carry him, while you talk and comfort my wife. Poor thing, she takes on sadly about Esther. Nesh, Anglo-Saxon, Nesk, tender. These arrangements were soon completed, the two women sat down on the blue cotton handkerchiefs of their husbands, and the latter, each carrying a baby, set off for a further walk. But as soon as Barton had turned his back upon his wife, his countenance fell back into an expression of gloom. "'Then you've heard nothing of Esther, poor lass?' asked Wilson. "'No, nor shan't, as I take it. My mind is she's gone off with somebody. My wife frets and thinks she's drowned herself, but I tell her folks don't care to put on their best clothes to drown themselves, and Mrs. Bradshaw, where she lodged, you know, says the last time she set eyes on her was last Tuesday, when she came downstairs, dressed in her Sunday gown, and with a new ribbon in her bonnet and gloves on her hands, like the lady she was so fond of thinking herself. She was as pretty a creature as ever the sun shone on. Aye, she was apparently lass. More's the pity now, added Barton, with a sigh. You see them Buckinghamshire people as comes to work here has quite a different look with them to us Manchester folk. You'll not see among the Manchester wenches such fresh rosy cheeks, or such black lashes to grey eyes, making them look like black, as my wife and Esther had. I never seed two such pretty women for sisters, never. Not but what beauty is a sad snare. Here was Esther so puffed up that there was no holding her in. Her spirit was always up. If I spoke ever so little in the way of advice to her, my wife spoiled her, it is true, for you see she was so much older than Esther. She was more like a mother to her, doing everything for her. Farrently, comely, pleasant looking. I wonder she ever left you, observed his friend. That's the worst of factory work for girls. They can earn so much when work is plenty that they can maintain themselves anyhow. My Mary shall never work in a factory, that I'm determined on. You see, Esther spent her money in dress, thinking to set off her pretty face, and got to come home so late at night that at last I told her my mind. My missus thinks I spoke crossly, but I meant right for I loved Esther, if it was only for Mary's sake. Says I, Esther, I see what you'll end up with your artificials, and your fly-away veils, and stopping out when honest women are in their beds. You'll be a street-walker, Esther, and then don't you go to think 
I'll have you darken my door, though my wife is your sister. So says she, don't trouble yourself, John. I'll pack up and be off now, for I'll never stay to hear myself called as you call me. She flushed up like a turkey cock, and I thought fire would come out of her eyes. But when she saw Mary cry, for Mary can't abide words in her house, she went and kissed her, and said she was not so bad as I thought her. So we talked more friendly, for, as I said, I liked the lass well enough, and her pretty looks, and her cheery ways. But she said, and at that time I thought there was sense in what she said, we should be much better friends if she went into lodgings, and only came to see us now and then. Then you still were friendly, folks said, you cast her off, and said you'd never speak to her again. Folks always make one a deal worse than one is, said John Barton testily. She came many a time to our house after she left off living with us. Last Sunday, Sir Knight, no, it was this very last Sunday, she came to drink a cup of tea with Mary, and that was the last time we set eyes on her. Was she any ways different in her manner? asked Wilson. Well, I don't know. I have thought several times since that she was a bit quieter, and more womanly-like, more gentle, and more blushing, and not so riotous and noisy. She comes in towards four o'clock, when afternoon church was loosing, and she goes and hangs her bonnet up on the old nail we used to call hers, while she lived with us. I remember thinking what a pretty lass she was, as she sat on a low stool by Mary, who was rocking herself, and in rather a poor way. She laughed and cried by turns, but all so softly and gently, like a child that I couldn't find in my heart to scold her, especially as Mary was fretting already. One thing I do remember I did say, and pretty sharply too. She took our little Mary by the waist, and thou must leave off calling her little Mary. She's growing up into as fine a lass as one can see on a summer's day. More of her mother's stock than thine, interrupted Wilson. Well, well, I call her little because her mother name is Mary. But, as I was saying, she takes Mary in a coaxing sort of way, and Mary, says she, what should you think if I sent for you some day and made a lady of you? So I could not stand such talk as that to my girl, and I said, Thou'd best not put that nonsense i thy girl's head, I can tell thee. I'd rather see her earning her bread by the sweat of brow, as the Bible tells her she should do. I, though she never got butter to her bread, than be like a do-nothing lady, worrying shopmen all morning, and screeching at her piney all afternoon, and going to bed without having done a good turn to any one of God's creatures but herself. Thou never could abide the gentle folk, said Wilson, half amused at his friend's vehemence. And what good have they ever done me that I should like them? asked Barton the latent fire lighting up his eye, and bursting forth, he continued, If I am sick, do they come and nurse me? If my child lies dying, as poor Tom lay, with his white wan lips, quivering, for want of better food than I could give him, does the rich man bring the wine or broth that might save his life? If I am out of work for weeks in the bad times, and winter comes, with black frost, and keen east wind, and there is no coal for the grate, and no clothes for the bed, and the thin bones are seen through the ragged clothes, does the rich man share his plenty with me, as he ought to do, if his religion wasn't a humbug? When I lie on my death bed, and Mary, bless her, stands fretting, as I know she will fret, and here his voice faltered a little. 
Will a rich lady come and take her to her own home, if need be, till she can look round and see what best to do? No, I tell you, it's the poor, and the poor only, as does such things for the poor. Don't think to come over me with the old tale that the rich know nothing of the trials of the poor. I say, if they don't know, they ought to know. We're their slaves as long as we can work. We pile up their fortunes with the sweat of our brows, and yet we are to live as separate as if we were in two worlds, aye, as separate as Dives and Lazarus, with a great gulf betwixt us. But I know who was best off then, and he wound up his speech with a low chuckle that had no mirth in it. Well, neighbour, said Wilson, all that may be very true, but what I want to know now is about Esther. When did you last hear of her? Why, she took leave of us that Sunday night in a very loving way, kissing both wife Mary and daughter Mary, if I must not call her little, and shaking hands with me, but all in a cheerful sort of manner. So we thought nothing about her kisses and shakes. But on Wednesday night comes Mrs. Bradshaw's son with Esther's box, and presently Mrs. Bradshaw follows with the key. And when we began to talk, we found Esther told her she was coming back to live with us, and would pay her week's money for not giving notice. And on Tuesday night she carried off a little bundle. Her best clothes were on her back as I said before, and told Mrs. Bradshaw not to hurry herself about the big box, but bring it when she had time. So, of course, she thought she should find Esther with us, and when she told her story, my missus set up such a screech and fell down in a dead swoon. Mary ran up with water for her mother, and I thought so much about my wife. I did not seem to care at all for Esther. But next day I asked all the neighbours, both our own and Bradshaw's, and they'd none of them heard or seen nothing of her. I even went to a policeman, a good enough sort of man, but a fellow I'd never spoken to before because of his livery, and I asked him if his cuteness could find anything out for us so I believe he asks other policemen, and one of them had seen a wench, like our Esther, walking very quickly with a bundle under her arm on Tuesday night, toward eight o'clock, and get into a hackney coach near Helm Church, and we don't know the number, and can't trace it no further. I'm sorry enough for the girl, for bad's come over her one way or another, but I'm sorrier for my wife. She loved her next to me and Mary, and she's never been the same body since poor Tom's death. However, let's go back to them. Your old woman may have done her good. As they walked homewards with a brisker pace, Wilson expressed a wish that they still were the near neighbours they once had been. Still, our Alice lives in the cellar under number 14, in Barber Street, and if you'd only speak the word, she'd be with you in five minutes to keep your wife company when she's lonesome. Though I'm Alice's brother, and perhaps ought not to say it, I will say there's none more ready to help with heart or hand than she is. Though she may have done a hard day's wash, there's not a child ill within the street, but Alice goes to offer to sit up and does sit up, too, though maybe she's to be at her work by six next morning. She's a poor woman, and can feel for the poor, Wilson, was Barton's reply, and then he added, Thank you kindly for your offer, and mayhap I may trouble her to be a bit with my wife, for while I'm at work and Mary's at school, I know she frets about a bit. See, there's Mary, and the father's eye brightened, as in the distance among a group of girls he spied his only daughter, a bonny lass of thirteen or so, 
who came bounding along to meet and to greet her father, in a manner that showed that the stern-looking man had a tender nature within. The two men had crossed the last stile, while Mary loitered behind to gather some buds of the coming hawthorn, when an overgrown lad came past her, and snatched a kiss, exclaiming, "'For old acquaintance' sake, Mary!' "'Take that for old acquaintance' sake, then,' said the girl, blushing rosy red, more with anger than shame, as she slapped his face. The tones of her voice called back her father and his friend, and the aggressor proved to be the eldest son of the latter, the senior by eighteen years of his little brothers. Here, children, instead of kissing and quarrelling, do you each take a baby, for if Wilson's arms be like mine, they are heartily tired. Mary sprung forward to take her father's charge, with a girl's fondness for infants with some little foresight of the event soon to happen at home, while young Wilson seemed to lose his rough, cubbish nature as he crowed and cooed to his little brother. "'Twins is a great trial to a poor man, bless him,' said the half-proud, half-weary father, as he bestowed a smacking kiss on the babe ere he parted with it. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two, A Manchester Tea Party「Polly put the kettle on and let's have tea. Polly put the kettle on and we'll all have tea. – Here we are, wife. Didst thou think thou lost us? – quoth hardy-voiced Wilson, as the two women rose and shook themselves in preparation for their homeward walk. Mrs. Barton was evidently soothed, if not cheered, by the unburdening of her fears and thoughts to her friend and her approving look went far to second her husband's invitation that the whole party should adjourn from Green Hayes Fields to tea at the Barton's house. The only faint opposition was raised by Mrs. Wilson, on account of the lateness of the hour at which they would probably return, which she feared on her baby's account. "'Now hold your tongue, Mrs., will you?' said her husband good-temperedly. "'Don't you know them brats never goes to sleep till long past ten? "'And haven't you a shawl under which you can tuck one lad's head "'as safe as a bird's under its wing? "'And as for to other one, I'll put it in my pocket rather than not stay "'now we are this far away from Ancoats.' "'Or I can lend you another shawl,' suggested Mrs. Barton. "'I, anything rather than not stay.' "'The matter being decided, the party proceeded home, "'through many half-finished streets, all so like one another, that you might have easily been bewildered and lost your way. Not a step, however, did our friends lose, down this entry, cutting off that corner, until they turned out of one of these innumerable streets into a little paved court, having the backs of houses at the end opposite to the opening, and a gutter running through the middle to carry off household slops, washing suds, etc. The women who lived in the court were busy taking in strings of caps, frocks, and various articles of linen, which hung from side to side, dangling so low that if our friends had been a few minutes sooner, they would have had to stoop very much, or else the half-wet clothes would have flapped in their faces. But although the evening seemed yet early, when they were in the open fields, among the pent-up houses, night, with its mists and its darkness, had already begun to fall. Many greetings were given and exchanged between the Wilsons and these women, for not long ago they had also dwelt in this court. Two rude lads, standing at a disorderly-looking house-door, exclaimed, as Mary Barton, the daughter, passed, "'Eh, hey, look! Polly Barton's getting a sweetheart!' For he had gotten him yet no benefice. Prologue to Canterbury Tales. Of course this referred to young Wilson, who stole a look to see how Mary took the idea. He saw her assume the air of a young fury, and to his next speech she answered not a word. Mrs. Barton produced the key of the door from her pocket, and on entering the house-place it seemed as if they were in total darkness, except one bright spot, which might be a cat's eye, or might be, what it was, a red-hot fire, smouldering under a large piece of coal, which John Barton immediately applied himself to break up, and the effect instantly produced was warm and glowing light in every corner of the room. 
To add to this, although the coarse yellow glare seemed lost in the ruddy glow from the fire, Mrs. Barton lighted a dip by sticking it in the fire, and having placed it satisfactorily in a tin candlestick, began to look further about her, on hospitable thoughts intent. The room was tolerably large, and possessed many conveniences. On the right of the door, as you entered, was a longish window with a broad ledge. On each side of this hung blue and white check curtains, which were now drawn, to shut in the friends met to enjoy themselves. Two geraniums, unpruned and leafy, which stood on the sill, formed a further defense from outdoor priors. In the corner, between the window and the fireside, was a cupboard, apparently full of plates and dishes, cups and saucers, and some more nondescript articles, for which one would have fancied their possessors could find no use such as triangular pieces of glass to save carving knives and forks from dirtying tablecloths. However, it was evident Mrs. Barton was proud of her crockery and glass, for she left her cupboard door open, with a glance round of satisfaction and pleasure. On the opposite side to the door and window was a staircase, and two doors, one of which, the nearest to the fire, led into a sort of little back kitchen, where dirty work, such as washing up dishes, might be done, and whose shelves served as larder and pantry and storeroom and all. The other door, which was considerably lower, opened into the coal hole, the slanting closet under the stairs, from which, to the fireplace, there was a gay-colored piece of oilcloth laid. The place seemed almost crammed with furniture, sure sign of good times among the mills. Beneath the window was a dresser with three deep drawers. Opposite the fireplace was a table, which I should call a pembroke, only that it was made of deal, and I cannot tell how far such a name may be applied to such humble material. On it, resting against the wall, was a bright green Japan tea tray, having a couple of scarlet lovers embracing in the middle. The firelight danced merrily on this, and really, setting all taste but that of a child's aside, it gave a richness of colouring to that side of the room. It was in some measure propped up by a crimson tea caddy, also of Japan ware. A round table on one branching leg, ready for use, stood in the corresponding corner to the cupboard, and if you can picture all this with a washy but clean stencil pattern on the walls, you can form some idea of John Barton's home. The tray was soon hoisted down, and before the merry clatter of cups and saucers began, the women disburdened themselves of their out-of-door things and sent Mary upstairs with them. Then came a long whispering and chinking of money, to which Mr. and Mrs. Wilson were too polite to attend, knowing, as they did full well, that it was all related to the preparations for hospitality, hospitality that, in their turn, they should have such pleasure in offering. So they tried to be busily occupied with the children, and not to hear Mrs. Barton's directions to Mary. "'Run, Mary, dear, just round the corner, and get some fresh eggs at Tipping's. You may get one apiece, that will be five pence.' and see if he has any nice ham cut that he would let us have a pound of. "'Say two pounds, missus, and don't be stingy,' chimed in the husband. "'Well, a pound and a half, Mary, and get it Cumberland ham, for Wilson comes from there away, and it will have a sort of relish of home with it he'll like. And Mary, seeing the lass he feigned to be off, you must get a pennyworth of milk and a loaf of bread. Mind you get it fresh and new, and—and and that's all, Mary.' "'No, it's not all,' said her husband. "'Thou must get six pennyworth of rum to warm the tea. "'Thou get it at the grapes. "'And thou just go to Alice Wilson. "'He says she lives just right around the corner, "'under 14 Barber Street.' "'This was addressed to his wife. "'And tell her to come and take her tea with us. "'She'll like to see her brother, I'll be bound, "'let alone Jane and the twins. "'If she comes, she must bring a teacup and saucer, "'for we have but half a dozen, "'and here's six of us,' said Mrs. Barton. Pooh, pooh, Jim and Mary can drink out of one, surely. But Mary secretly determined to take care that Alice brought her teacup and saucer, if the alternative was to be her sharing anything with Jim. Alice Wilson had but just come in. She had been out all day in the fields, gathering wild herbs for drinks and medicine, for in addition to her invaluable qualities as a sick nurse and her worldly occupations as a washerwoman, she added a considerable knowledge of hedge and field simples, and on fine days, when no more profitable occupation offered itself, she used to ramble off into the lanes and meadows as far as her legs could carry her. 
This evening she had returned loaded with nettles, and her first object was to light a candle and see to hang them up in bunches in every available place in her cellar room. It was a perfection of cleanliness. In one corner stood the modest-looking bed, with a check curtain at the head, the whitewashed wall filling up the place where the corresponding one should have been. The floor was bricked and scrupulously clean, although so damp that it seemed as if the last washing would never dry up. As the cellar window looked into an area in the street, down which boys might throw stones, it was protected by an outside shutter, and was oddly festooned with all manner of hedgerow, ditch, and field plants, which we are accustomed to call valueless, but which have a powerful effect either for good or for evil, and are consequently much used among the poor. The room was strewed, hung, and darkened with these bunches, which emitted no very fragrant odor in their process of drying. In one corner was a sort of broad-hanging shelf, made of old planks, where some old hordes of Alice's were kept. Her little bit of crockery ware was ranged on the mantelpiece, where also stood her candlestick and box of matches. A small cupboard contained at the bottom coals, and at the top her bread and basin of oatmeal, her frying pan, teapot, and a small tin saucepan, which served as a kettle, as well as for cooking the delicate little messes of broth which Alice was sometimes able to manufacture for a sick neighbor. After her walk she felt chilly and weary, and was busy trying to light her fire with the damp coals and half-green sticks, when Mary knocked. "'Come in,' said Alice, remembering, however, that she had barred the door for the night, and hastening to make it possible for anyone to come in. "'Is that you, Mary Barton?' exclaimed she, as the light from the candle streamed on the girl's face. "'How you are grown since I used to see you at my brother's. Come in, lass, come in.' Please, said Mary, almost breathless, Mother says you're to come to tea and bring your cup and saucer, for George and Jane Wilson is with us and the twins and Jim, and you're to make haste, please. I'm sure it's very neighborly and kind in your mother, and I'll come with many thanks. Stay, Mary, has your mother got any nettles for spring drink? If she hasn't, I'll take her some. No, I don't think she has. Mary ran off like a hare to fulfill what, to a girl of thirteen, fond of power, was the more interesting part of her errand, the money-spending part. And well and ably did she perform her business, returning home with a little bottle of rum and the eggs in one hand, while her other was filled with some excellent red-and-white smoke-flavored Cumberland ham wrapped up in paper. She was at home and frying ham before Alice had chosen her nettles, put out her candle, locked her door, and walked in a very foot-sore manner as far as John Barton's. What an aspect of comfort did his house-place present after her humble cellar! She did not think of comparing, but for all that she felt the delicious glow of the fire, the bright light that reveled in every corner of the room, the savory smells, the comfortable sounds of a boiling kettle, and the hissing, frizzling ham. With a little old-fashioned curtsy she shut the door, and replied with a loving heart to the boisterous and surprised greeting of her brother. And now all preparations being made, the party sat down. Mrs. Wilson in the post of honor, the rocking chair, on the right-hand side of the fire, nursing her baby, while its father, in an opposite armchair, tried vainly to quiet the other with bread soaked in milk. Mrs. Barton knew manners too well to do anything but sit at the tea-table and make tea, though in her heart she longed to be able to superintend the frying of the ham and cast many an anxious look at Mary as she broke the eggs and turned the ham, with a very comfortable portion of confidence in her own culinary powers. Jim stood awkwardly leaning against the dresser, replying rather gruffly to his aunt's speeches, which gave him, he thought, the air of being a little boy, whereas he considered himself as a young man, and not so very young neither, as in two months he would be eighteen. Barton vibrated between the fire and the tea-table, his only drawback being a fancy that every now and then his wife's face flushed and contracted as if in pain. At length the business actually began. Knives and forks, cups and saucers made a noise, but human voices were still, for human beings were hungry and had no time to speak. Alice first broke silence. Holding her teacup with the manner of one proposing a toast, she said, "'Here's to absent friends. Friends may meet, but mountains never.' It was an unlucky toast or sentiment, as she instantly felt. Everyone thought of Esther, the absent Esther, and Mrs. Barton put down her food and could not hide the fast-dropping tears. Alice could have bitten her tongue out. It was a wet blanket to the evening, for though all had been said or suggested in the fields that could be said or suggested, 
every one had a wish to say something in the way of comfort to poor Mrs. Barton, and a dislike to talk about anything else while her tears fell fast and scalding. So George Wilson, his wife and children, set off early home, not before, in spite of malapropos speeches, they had expressed a wish that such meetings might often take place, and not before John Barton had given his hearty consent, and declared that as soon as ever his wife was well again, they would have just such another evening. "'I will take care not to come and spoil it,' thought poor Alice, and going up to Mrs. Barton, she took her hand almost humbly and said, "'You don't know how sorry I am I said it.' To her surprise, a surprise that brought tears of joy into her eyes, Mary Barton put her arms round her neck and kissed the self-reproaching Alice. "'You didn't mean any harm, and it was me as was so foolish. Only this work about Esther, and not knowing where she is, lies so heavy on my heart. Good night, and never think no more about it. God bless you, Alice.' Many and many a time, as Alice reviewed that evening in her afterlife, did she bless Mary Barton for these kind and thoughtful words. But just then all she could say was, "'Good night, Mary.' And may God bless you. End of chapter two. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Chapter three. John Barton's Great Trouble. Read by Wendy in Utah. But when the morn came dim and sad, and chill with early showers, her quiet eyelids closed, she had another morn than ours. Hood. In the middle of that same night, a neighbor of the Bartons was roused from her sound, well-earned sleep by a knocking, which had at first made part of her dream, but starting up as soon as she became convinced of its reality, she opened the window and asked who was there. "'Me, John Barton,' answered he, in a voice tremulous with agitation. "'My missus is in labor, and for the love of God, step in while I run for the doctor, for she is fearful bad.' While the woman hastily dressed herself— Leaving the window still open, she heard the cries of agony which resounded in the little court in the stillness of the night. In less than five minutes she was standing by Mrs. Barton's bedside, relieving the terrified Mary, who went about where she was told like an automaton, her eyes tearless, her face calm though deadly pale, and uttering no sound except when her teeth chattered for very nervousness. The cries grew worse. The doctor was very long in hearing the repeated rings at his night bell, and still longer in understanding who it was that made this sudden call upon his services, and then he begged Barton just to wait while he dressed himself, in order that no time might be lost in finding the court and house. Barton absolutely stamped with impatience outside the doctor's door before he came down, and walked so fast homewards that the medical man several times asked him to go slower. "'Is she so very bad?' asked he. "'Worse, much worser than I ever saw her before,' replied John. "'No, she was not. She was at peace. The cries were still for ever. John had no time for listening. He opened the latch door, stayed not to light a candle for the mere ceremony of showing his companion up the stairs so well known to himself, but in two minutes was in the room where lay the dead wife, whom he had loved with all the power of his strong heart. The doctor stumbled upstairs by firelight, and met the awestruck look of the neighbor, which at once told him the state of things. The room was still, as he, with habitual tiptoe step, approached the poor frail body that nothing now could more disturb. Her daughter knelt by the bedside, her face buried in the clothes, which were almost crammed into her mouth, to keep down the choking sobs. The husband stood like one stupefied. The doctor questioned the neighbor in whispers, and then, approaching Barton, said, "'You must go downstairs. This is a great shock, but bear it like a man. Go down.' He went mechanically, and sat down on the first chair. He had no hope. The look of death was too clear upon her face. Still, when he heard one or two unusual noises, the thought burst on him, that it might only be a trance, a fit, a— he did not well know what, but not death, oh, not death, and he was starting up to go upstairs again when the doctor's heavy, cautious, creaking footstep was heard on the stairs. Then he knew what it really was in the chamber above. Nothing could have saved her. 
there has been some shock to the system and so he went on but to unheeding ears which yet retained his words to ponder on words not for immediate use in conveying sense but to be laid by in the storehouse of memory for a more convenient season the doctor seeing the state of the case grieved for the man and very sleepy thought it best to go and accordingly wished him good night but there was no answer so he let himself out and barton sat on like a stock or a stone so rigid so still he heard the sounds above too and knew what they meant he heard the stiff unseasoned drawer in which his wife kept her clothes pulled open he saw the neighbor come down and blunder about in search of soap and water he knew well what she wanted and why she wanted them but he did not speak nor offer to help at last she went with some kindly meant words a text of comfort which fell upon a deafened ear and something about mary but which mary in his bewildered state he could not tell he tried to realize it to think it possible and then his mind wandered off to other days to far different times he thought of their courtship of his first seeing her an awkward beautiful rustic far too shiftless for the delicate factory work to which she was apprenticed of his first gift to her a bead necklace which had long ago been put by in one of the deep drawers of the dresser to be kept for mary he wondered if it was there yet and with a strange curiosity he got up to feel for it for the fire by this time was well nigh out and candle he had none his groping hand fell on the piled up tea things which at his desire she had left unwashed till morning they were all so tired he was reminded of one of those daily little actions which acquire such power when they have been performed for the last time by one we love he began to think over his wife's daily round of duties and something in the remembrance that these would never more be done by her touched the source of tears and he cried aloud poor mary meanwhile had mechanically helped the neighbor in all the last attentions to the dead and when she was kissed and spoken to soothingly tears stole quietly down her cheeks but she reserved the luxury of a full burst of grief till she should be alone she shut the chamber door softly after the neighbor was gone and then shook the bed by which she knelt with her agony of sorrow she repeated over and over again the same words the same vain unanswered address to her who was no more oh mother mother are you really dead oh mother mother at last she stopped because it flashed across her mind that her violence of grief might disturb her father all was still below she looked on the face so changed and yet so strangely like she bent down to kiss it the cold unyielding flesh struck a shudder to her heart and hastily obeying her impulse she grasped the candle and opened the door then she heard the sobs of her father's grief and quickly quietly stealing down the steps she knelt by him and kissed his hand he took no notice at first for his burst of grief would not be controlled but when her shriller sobs her terrified cries which she could not repress rose upon his ear he checked himself child we must be all to one another now she is gone whispered he oh father what can i do for you do tell me i'll do anything i know thou wilt thou must not fret thyself ill that's the first thing i ask thou must leave me and go to bed now like a good girl as thou art leave you father oh don't say so ay but thou must thou must go to bed and try and sleep thou wilt have enough to do and to bear poor wench to-morrow mary got up kissed her father and sadly went upstairs to the little closet where she slept she thought it was of no use undressing for that she could never never sleep so threw herself on her bed in her clothes and before ten minutes had passed away the passionate grief of youth had subsided into sleep barton had been roused by his daughter's entrance both from his stupor and from his uncontrollable sorrow he could think on what was to be done could plan for the funeral could calculate the necessity of soon returning to his work as the extravagance of the past night would leave them short of money if he long remained away from the mill he was in a club so that money was provided for the burial 
these things settled in his own mind. He recalled the doctor's words, and bitterly thought of the shock his poor wife had so recently had in the mysterious disappearance of her cherished sister. His feelings toward Esther almost amounted to curses. It was she who had brought on all this sorrow. Her giddiness, her lightness of conduct had wrought this woe. His previous thoughts about her had been tinged with wonder and pity. But now he hardened his heart against her for ever. One of the good influences over John Barton's life had departed that night. One of the ties which bound him down to the gentle humanities of the earth was loosened, and henceforward the neighbors all remarked he was a changed man. His gloom and his sternness became habitual instead of occasional. He was more obstinate, but never to marry. Between the father and the daughter there existed in full force that mysterious bond which unites those who have been loved by one who is now dead and gone. While he was harsh and silent to others, he humored Mary with tender love. She had more of her own way than is common in any rank with girls of her age. Part of this was the necessity of the case, for of course all the money went through her hands, and the household arrangements were guided by her will and pleasure. But part was her father's indulgence, for he left her, with full trust in her unusual sense and spirit, to choose her own associates and her own times for seeing them. With all this Mary had not her father's confidence in the matters which now began to occupy him heart and soul. She was aware that he had joined clubs and become an active member of the trades union, but it was hardly likely that a girl of Mary's age, even when two or three years had elapsed since her mother's death, should care much for the differences between employers and the employed, an eternal subject for agitation in the manufacturing districts, which, however it may be lulled for a time, is sure to break forth again with fresh violence at any depression of trade, showing that in its apparent quiet the ashes had still smouldered in the breasts of a few. Among these few was John Barton. At all times it is a bewildering thing to the poor weaver to see his employer removing from house to house, each one grander than the last, till he ends in building one more magnificent than all, or withdraws his money from the concern, or sells his mill to buy an estate in the country, while all the time the weaver, who thinks he and his fellows are the real makers of this wealth, is struggling on for bread for his children, through the vicissitudes of lowered wages, short hours, fewer hands employed, etc. And when he knows trade is bad, and could understand at least partially, that there are not buyers enough in the market to purchase the goods already made, and consequently that there is no demand for more, when he would bear and endure much without complaining, could he also see that his employers were bearing their share, he is, I say, bewildered, and, to use his own word, aggravated, to see that all goes on just as usual with the mill-owners. Large houses are still occupied, while spinners and weavers' cottages stand empty because the families that once filled them are obliged to live in rooms or cellars. Carriages still roll along the streets, Concerts are still crowded by subscribers, and the shops for expensive luxuries still find daily customers while the workman loiters away his unemployed time in watching these things, and thinking of the pale, uncomplaining wife at home, and the wailing children asking in vain for enough of food, of the sinking health, of the dying life of those near and dear to him. The contrast is too great. Why should he alone suffer from bad times? I know that this is not really the case, and I know what is the truth in such matters, but what I wish to impress is what the workman feels and thinks. True that with childlike improvidence good times will often dissipate his grumbling and make him forget all prudence and foresight. But there are earnest men among these people, men who have endured wrongs without complaining, without ever forgetting or forgiving those whom they believe have caused all this woe. Among these was John Barton. His parents had suffered. His mother had died from absolute want of the necessaries of life. He himself was a good, steady workman, and as such pretty certain of steady employment. But he spent all he got with the confidence, you may also call it in providence, of one who was willing and believed himself able to supply all his wants by his own exertions. And when his master suddenly failed, and all hands in the mill were turned back one Tuesday morning, with the news that Mr. Hunter had stopped. 
Barton had only a few shillings to rely on. But he had good heart of being employed at some other mill, and accordingly, before returning home, he spent some hours in going from factory to factory asking for work. But at every mill was some sign of depression of trade. Some were working short hours, some were turning off hands, and for weeks Barton was out of work, living on credit. It was during this time that his little son, the apple of his eye, the cynosure of all his strong power of love, fell ill of the scarlet fever. They dragged him through the crisis, but his life hung on a gossamer thread. Everything, the doctor said, depended on good nourishment, on generous living, to keep up the little fellow's strength in the prostration in which the fever had left him. Mocking words! When the commonest food in the house would not furnish one little meal. Barton tried credit, but it was worn out at the little provision shops, which were now suffering in their turn. He thought it would be no sin to steal, and would have stolen, but he could not get the opportunity in the few days the child lingered. Hungry himself, almost to an animal pitch of ravenousness, but with the bodily pain swallowed up in anxiety for his little sinking lad, he stood at one of the shop windows where all edible luxuries are displayed, haunches of venison, stilton cheeses, moulds of jelly, all appetizing sights to the common passer-by and out of this shop came Mrs. Hunter. She crossed to her carriage, followed by the shopman loaded with purchases for a party. The door was quickly slammed to, and she drove away, and Barton returned home with a bitter spirit of wrath in his heart to see his only boy a corpse. You can fancy now the hordes of vengeance in his heart against the employers, for there are never wanting those who either in speech or in print find it in their interest to cherish such feelings in the working classes, who know how and when to rouse the dangerous power at their command, and who use their knowledge with unrelenting purpose to either party. So while Mary took her own way, growing more spirited every day, and growing in her beauty too, her father was chairman at many a trades union meeting, a friend of delegates, and ambitious of being a delegate himself, a chartist, and ready to do anything for his order. But now times were good, and all these feelings were theoretical, not practical. His most practical thought was getting Mary apprenticed to a dressmaker, for he had never left off disliking a factory life for a girl, on more accounts than one. Mary must do something. The factories being, as I said, out of the question, there were two things open, going out to service, and the dressmaking business and against the first of these Mary set herself with all the force of her strong will. What that will might have been able to achieve had her father been against her I cannot tell, but he disliked the idea of parting with her who was the light of his hearth, the voice of his otherwise silent home. Besides, with his ideas and feelings toward the higher classes, he considered domestic servitude as a species of slavery, a pampering of artificial wants on the one side, and giving up of every right of leisure by day, and quiet rest by night on the other. How far his strong, exaggerated feelings had any foundation in truth, it is for you to judge. I am afraid that Mary's determination not to go to service arose from far less sensible thoughts on the subject than her father's. Three years of independence of action, since her mother's death such a time had now elapsed, had little inclined her to submit to rules as to hours and associates, to regulate her dress by a mistress's ideas of propriety, to lose the dear feminine privileges of gossiping with a merry neighbor, and working night and day to help one who was sorrowful. Besides all this, the sayings of her absent, the mysterious Aunt Esther, had an unacknowledged influence over Mary. She knew she was very pretty— the factory people, as they poured from the mills, and in their freedom told the truth, whatever it might be, to every passer-by, had early let Mary into the secret of her beauty. If their remarks had fallen on an unheeding ear, there were always young men enough, in a different rank from her own, who were willing to compliment the pretty weaver's daughter as they met her in the streets. Besides, trust a girl of sixteen for knowing it well if she is pretty. Concerning her plainness, she may be ignorant." So with this consciousness, she had early determined that her beauty should make her a lady, the rank she coveted the more for her father's abuse. 
the rank to which she firmly believed her lost Aunt Esther had arrived. Now, while a servant must often drudge and be dirty, must be known as his servant by all who visited at her master's house, a dressmaker's apprentice must, or so Mary thought, be always dressed with a certain regard to appearances, must never soil her hands, need never redden or dirty her face with hard labor. Before my telling you so truly what folly Mary felt or thought injures her without redemption in your opinion, think what are the silly fancies of sixteen years of age in every class and under all circumstances. The end of all the thoughts of father and daughter was, as I said before, Mary was to be a dressmaker, and her ambition prompted her unwilling father to apply at all the first establishments, to know on what terms of painstaking and zeal his daughter might be admitted into ever so humble a workwoman's situation. But high premiums were asked at all, poor man. He might have known that without giving up a day's work to ascertain the fact. He would have been indignant indeed, had he known that if Mary had accompanied him, the case might have been rather different, as her beauty would have made her desirable as a showwoman. Then he tried second-rate places— had all the payment of a sum of money was necessary, and money he had none. Disheartened and angry, he went home at night, declaring it was time lost, that dressmaking was at all events a troublesome business and not worth learning. Mary saw that the grapes were sour, and the next day she set out herself as her father could not afford to lose another day's work, and before night, as yesterday's experience had considerably lowered her ideas, she had engaged herself as apprentice, so called, though there were no deeds or indentures to the bond, to a certain Miss Simmons, a milliner and dressmaker, in a respectable little street leading off Ardwick Green, where her business was duly announced, in gold letters on a black ground. Enclosed in a bird's-eye maple frame, and stuck in the front parlour window, where the workwomen were called her young ladies, and where Mary was to work for two years without any remuneration, on consideration of being taught the business, and where afterwards she was to dine and have tea, with a small quarterly salary, paid quarterly because so much more genteel than by the week, a very small one, divisible into a minute weekly pittance. In summer she was to be there by six, bringing her day's meals during the first two years. In winter she was not to come till after breakfast. Her time for returning home at night must always depend upon the quantity of work Miss Simmons had to do. And Mary was satisfied, and seeing this, her father was contented too, although his words were grumbling and morose. But Mary knew his ways, and coaxed and planned for the future so cheerily that both went to bed with easy, if not happy, hearts. End of chapter for more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Four, Old Alice's History. To envy note between the ample sky, to mourn no evil dee, note hour misspent, and like a living violet, silently return in sweets to heaven what goodness lent, then bend between the chastening shower content, Elliot. Another year passed on. The waves of time seem long since to have swept away all trace of poor Mary Barton. But her husband still thought of her, although with a calm and quiet grief, in the silent watches of the night. And Mary would start from her hard-earned sleep and think in her half-dreamy, half-awakened state. She saw her mother stand by her bedside, as she used to do, in the days of long ago with a shaded candle, and an expression of ineffable tenderness, while she looked on her sweeping child. But Mary rubbed her eyes, and sank back on her pillow awake, and knowing it was a dream, and still in all her troubles and perplexities. Her heart called on her mother for aid, and she thought, If mother had but lived, she would have helped me. Forgetting that the woman's sorrows are far more difficult to mitigate than a child's, even by the mighty power of a mother's love, and unconscious of the fact that she was far superior in sense and spirit to the mother she mourned. Aunt Esther was still mysteriously absent, and people had grown weary of wondering and begun to forget. Barton still attended his club and was an active member of the trades union, 
indeed more frequently than ever, since the time of Mary's return in the evening was so uncertain, and as she occasionally, in very busy times, remained all night. His chiefest friend was still George Wilson, although he had no great sympathy on the questions that agitated Barton's mind. But their hearts were bound by old ties to one another, and the remembrance of former things gave an unspoken charm to their meetings. Our old friend, the cub-like lad, Jem Wilson, had shot up into the powerful, well-made young man with a sensible face enough, nay, a face that might have been handsome, had it not been here and there marked by the smallpox. He worked with one of the great firms of engineers, who send from out their towns of workshops, engines, and machinery to the dominions of the Tsar and the Sultan. His father and mother were never weary of praising Jem, at all which commendation pretty Mary Barton would toss her head, seeing clearly enough that they wished her to understand what a good husband he would make, and to favour his love, about which he never dared to speak, whatever eyes and looks revealed. One day, in the early winter time, when people were provided with warm substantial gowns, not likely soon to wear out, and when accordingly business was rather slack at Miss Simmons, Mary met Alice Wilson, coming home from her half-day's work at some tradesman's house. Mary and Alice had always liked each other. Indeed, Alice looked with particular interest on the motherless girl, the daughter of her whose forgiving kiss had comforted her in many sleepless hours. So there was a warm greeting between the tidy old woman and the blooming young work-girl, and then Alice ventured to ask if she would come in and take her tea with her that very evening. "'You'll think it dull enough to come just to sit with an old woman like me, but there's a tidy young lass as lives in the floor above who does plain work. And now and then, a bit in your own line, Mary. She's granddaughter to old Job Lay. A spinner, and a good girl she is. Do come, Mary. I've a terrible wish to make you known to each other. She's a genteel-looking lass, too.' At the beginning of this speech, Mary had feared the intended visitor was to be no other than Alice's nephew, but Alice was too delicate-minded to plan a meeting, even for her dear Jem, when one would have been an unwilling party. And Mary, relieved from her apprehension by the conclusion, gladly agreed to come. How busy Alice felt! It was not often she had any one to tea, and now her sense of the duties of a hostess were almost too much for her. She made haste home, and lighted the unwilling fire, borrowing a pair of bellows to make it burn the faster. For herself she was always patient. She let the coals take their time. Then she put on her patents, and went to fill her kettle at the pump in the next court, and on her way she borrowed a cup, of odd saucers she had plenty, serving as plates when occasion required. Half an ounce of tea and a quarter of a pound of butter went far to absorb her morning's wages, but this was an unusual occasion. In general, she used herb-tea for herself, when at home, unless some thoughtful mistress made a present of tea-leaves from her more abundant household. The two chairs drawn out for visitors, and duly swept and dusted, an old board arranged with some skill, upon two old candle-boxes set on end. Rather rickety, to be sure, but she knew the seat of old, and when to sit lightly. Indeed, the whole affair was more for apparent dignity of position than for any real ease. A little, very little round table, put just before the fire, which by this time was blazing merrily, her unlacquered ancient third-hand tea-tray, arranged with a black teapot, two cups with a red and white pattern, and one with the old friendly willow pattern, and saucers, not to match. On one of the extra supply the lump of butter flourished away. All these preparations complete, Alice began to look about her with satisfaction, and with a sense of wonder, what more could be done to add to the comfort of the evening. She took one of the chairs away from its appropriate place by the table, and putting it close to the broad, large, hanging shelf I told you about when I first described her cellar dwelling, and mounting on it, she pulled towards her an old deal box, and thence a quantity of the oat bread of the north, the clap bread of Cumberland and Westmoreland, and descending carefully with the thin cakes, threatening to break to pieces in her hand, she placed them on the bare table, with the belief that her visitors would have an unusual treat in eating the bread of her childhood. She brought out a good piece of a four-pound loaf of common household bread as well, and that sat down to rest, really to rest, and not to pretend, on one of the rush-bottomed chairs. The candle was ready to be lighted, the kettle boiled, 
The tea was awaiting its doom in its paper parcel. All was ready. A knock at the door. It was Margaret, the young workwoman, who lived in the worm as above, who, having heard the bustle and the subsequent quiet, began to think it was time to pay her visit below. She was a sallow, unhealthy, sweet-looking young woman, with a careworn look. Her dress was humble and very simple, consisting of some kind of dark stuff gown, her neck being covered by a drab shawl or large handkerchief, pinned down behind and at the sides in front. The old woman gave her a hearty greeting, and made her sit down on the chair she had just left, while she balanced herself on the board seat, in order that Margaret might think it was quite her free and independent choice to sit there. "'I cannot think what keeps Mary Barton. She's quite grand with her late hours,' said Alice, as Mary still delayed. The truth was, Mary was dressing herself. Yes, to come to poor old Alice's. She thought it worth while to consider what gown she should put on. It was not for Alice, however. You may be pretty sure. No, they knew each other too well. But Mary liked to make an impression, and in this it must be owned she was a pretty often gratified, and there was this strange girl to consider just now. So she put on her pretty new blue merino, made tight to her throat her little linen collar and linen cuffs, and sallied forth to impress poor gentle Margaret. She certainly succeeded. Alice, who never thought much about beauty, had never told Margaret how pretty Mary was, and as she came in, half blushing at her own self-consciousness, Margaret could hardly take her eyes off her, and Mary put down her long black lashes with a sort of dislike of the very observation she had taken such pains to secure. Can you fancy the bustle of Alice to make the tea, to pour it out, and sweeten it to their liking, to help and help again to clap bread and bread and butter? Can you fancy the delight with which she watched her piled-up clap bread disappear before the hungry girls, and listened to the praises of her home-remembered dainty? My mother used to send me some clap bread by any north country person. Bless her! She knew how good such things taste when far away from home. Not but what every one likes it. When I was in service, my fellow servants were always glad to share with me. Eh, it's a long time ago, Jan. Do tell us about it, Alice," said Margaret. Why, lass, there's nothing to tell. There was more mouths at home than could be fed. Tom, that's Will's father. You don't know Will, but he's a sailor to foreign parts. Had come to Manchester and sent word what terrible lots of work was to be had, both for lads and lasses. So father sent George first. You know George well enough, Mary. And then work was scarce out toward Burton, where we lived. And father said, I mun try and get a place. And George wrote as how wages were far higher in Manchester than Milnthorpe or Lancaster. And lasses, I was young and thoughtless, and thought it was a fine thing to go so far from home. So, one day, the butcher he brings us a letter for George, to say he'd heard on a place, and I was all agog to go, and father was pleased like, but mother said little, and that little was very quiet. I've often thought she was a bit hurt to see me so ready to go. God forgive me! But she packed up my clothes, and some of the better end of her own as would fit me, in yon little paper box up there. It's good for nought now, but I would liefer live without fire, than break it up to be burnt. And yet it is going on for eighty years old. For she had it when she was a girl, and brought all her clothes in it to fathers when they were married. But as I was saying, she did not cry though the tears was often in her eyes, and I seen her looking after me down the lane as long as I were in sight, with her hand shading her eyes, and that were the last look I ever had on her. Alice knew that before long she should go to that mother, and besides, the griefs and bitter woes of youth have worn themselves out before we grow old, but she looked so sorrowful that the girls caught her sadness, and mourned for the poor woman who had been dead and gone so many years ago. "'Did you never see her again, Alice? Did you never go home while she was alive?' asked Mary. "'No, nor since. Many a time and oft have I planned to go. I plan it yet, and hope to go home again before it please God to take me. I used to try and save money enough to go for a week when I was in service, but first one thing came and then another. First Mrs. Children fell ill of the measles, 
and just when the week I'd asked for came, and then I couldn't leave them, for one and all cried for me to nurse them. Then Mrs. herself fell sick, and I could go less than ever. For, you see, they kept a little shop, and he drank, and Mrs. and me was all there was to mind children and shop and all, and cook and wash besides. Mary was glad she had not gone into service and said so. Eh, hey, lass, thou little knows the pleasure of helping others. I was as happy there as could be, almost as happy as I was at home. Well, but next year I thought I could go at a leisure time, and Mrs. told me I should have a fortnight then, and I used to sit up all that winter working hard at patchwork to have a quilt of my own making to take to my mother. But Master died, and Mrs. went away from Manchester, and I'd to look out for a place again. Well, but, interrupted Mary, I should have thought that that was the best time to go home. No, I thought not. You see, it was a different thing going home for a week on a visit, maybe with money in my pocket to give father a lift, to going home to be a burden to him. Besides, how could I hear of a place there? Anyways, I thought it best to stay, though perhaps it might have been better to a gone, for then I should have seen mother again. And the poor old woman looked puzzled. I'm sure you did what you thought right, said Margaret gently. Aye, lass, that's it, said Alice, raising her head and speaking more cheerfully. That's the thing. And then, let the Lord send what he sees fit. Not but that I grieved sore, oh, sore and sad, when towards spring next year, when my quilt were all done to the lining, George came in one evening to tell me my mother was dead. I cried many a night at after. I'd no time for crying by day, for that missus was terrible strict. She would not hearken to my going to the funeral, and indeed I would have been too late, for George set off that very night by the coach, and the letter had been kept or some it. Posts were not like the posts nowadays, and he found the burial all over, and father talking of flitting, for he couldn't abide the cottage after mother was gone. Asterisk. Come to me, Tyrell, soon at after supper. Shakespeare, Richard the Third. Was it a pretty place? asked Mary. Pretty, lass. I never seed such a bonny bit anywhere. You see, there are hills there that seem to go up into the skies. Not near, maybe, but that makes them all the bonnier. I used to think they were golden hills of heaven, about which mother sang when I was a child. Yon are the golden hills of heaven, where ye shall never win. Something about a ship and a lover, that nay have been a lover, that ballad was. Well, and near our cottage was rocks. Eh, lasses, you don't know what rocks are in Manchester. Grey pieces of stone, as large as a house, all covered over with mosses of different colours, some yellow, some brown, and the ground beneath them knee-deep in purple heather, smelling say sweet and fragrant and the low music of the humming bee forever sounding among it mother used to send sally and me out to gather ling and heather for besoms and it was such pleasant work we used to come home at an evening loaded so as you could not see us for all that it was so light to carry and then mother would make us sit down under the old hawthorn tree where we used to make our house among the great roots as stood above the ground to pick and tie up the heather it seems all like yesterday, and yet it's a long, long time agone. Poor sister Sally has been in her grave this forty year and more, but I often wonder if the hawthorn is standing yet, and if the lasses still go to gather heather, as we did, many and many a year, past and gone, I sicken at heart to see the old spot once more. Maybe next summer I may set off, if God spares me to see next summer." "'Why, have you never been in all these many years?' asked Mary. "'Why, lass, first one wanted me, and then another, and I couldn't go without money either, and I got very poor at times. Tom was a scapegrace poor fellow, and always wanted help of one kind or another, and his wife, for I think scapegraces are always married long before steady folk, was but a helpless kind of body. She were always ailing, and he were always in trouble.' 
So I had enough to do with my hands and my money, too, for that matter. They died within twelve months of each other, leaving one lad. They had had seven, but the Lord had taken six to his self. Will, as I was telling you on, and I took him myself, and left service to make a bit of a home place for him. And a fine lad he was, the very spit of his father, as to looks only steadier. For he was steady, although nought would serve him but going to sea. I tried all I could to set him against a sailor's life. Says I, Folks is as sick as dogs all the time there at sea. Your own mother told me, for she came from foreign parts, being a Manx woman, that she'd have thanked any one for throwing her into the water. Nay, I sent him all the way to Runcorn by the Duke's Canal, that he might know what the sea were. And I looked to see him come back as white as a sheet with vomiting. <laughs> But the lad went on to Liverpool and saw real ships, and came back more set than ever on being a sailor. And he said as how he had never been sick at all, and thought he could stand the sea pretty well. So I told him he mun do as he liked, and he thanked me and kissed me, for all that I was very frabbit with him. And now he's gone to South America, at t'other side of the sun, they tell me. Asterisk, frabbit, peevish. Mary stole a glance at Margaret to see what she thought of Alice's geography, but Margaret looked so quiet and demure that Mary was in doubt if she were not really ignorant. Not that Mary's knowledge was very profound, but she had seen a terrestrial globe, and knew where to find France and the continents on a map. After this long talking, Alice seemed lost for a time in reverie, and the girls respecting her thoughts, which they suspected had wandered to the home and scenes of her childhood, were silent. All at once she recalled her duties as a hostess, and by an effort brought back her mind to the present time. Margaret! You must let Mary hear thee sing. I don't know about fine music myself, but folks say Margaret is a rare singer, and I know she can make me cry at any time by singing the Odom Weaver. Do sing that, Margaret, there's a good lass. With a faint smile, as if amused at Alice's choice of a song, Margaret began. Do you know the Oldham Weaver? Not unless you are Lancashire born and bred, for it is a complete Lancashire ditty. I will copy it for you. The Oldham Weaver. One. I'm an old cotton weaver, as many a one knows. I've no t for to eat, and I've worn out my clothes. You'd hardly give tuppence for all as I've earned. My clogs are both brostin and stockings I've none. You'd think it were hard to be brought into the world to be clemmed, and to do the best as you can. o d i c k i e and Billy's can telling me long. We'd s a had better times, if I'd but hold my tongue. I've holdin my tongue till I've near stopped my breath. I think I, my heart, I soon clem to death. o d i c k i e s well crammed, he never were clemmed, and he never picked o e r in his life. We tort on six week, thinking each day were the last. We shifted and shifted. Till now we're quite fast. We lived upon nettles, while nettles were good, and Waterloo porridge, the best of our food. I'm telling you true, I can find folk a know who were living no better nor me. o l d Billy a dance at the Baileys one day, for a shop debt. I owed him, as I could not pay, but he were too lat, for o l d Billy a the bent had sowed the tit and cart. And t a i n goods for the rent. We'd nought left but the old stool that were seats for two, and on it cowered Margaret and me. Then the Baileys looked round as sly as a mouse. When they seed as all the goods were taken out of the house, says one chap to the tother, All's gone, thou may see. Says I, near fret, mon, you're welcome to me. They made no more ado but whopped up the old stool, and we both leet whack upon the flags. Then I said to a Margaret, as we lay upon the floor, We's never be lower in this world, I'm sure. If ever things a turn, well, I'm sure they mun mend, for I think in my heart we're both at the far end. For meat we have none, nor loons to weave on. Edad, they're as good lost as found. 
Our Margaret de Cares had who clothes to put on, who'd go up to London and talk to the great mon, and if things were not altered when their who had been, who's fully resolved to sue what moth an end, who's note to say again the king, but who loikes a fair thing, and who says who can tell when who's hurt. Asterisk, Clem to starve with hunger. Quote, hard is the choice when the valiant must eat their arms or Clem. Unquote, ben Johnson. Clem to pick oar means to throw the shuttle in, in hand loom weaving. The air to which this is sung is a kind of droning recitative, depending much on expression and feeling. To read it it may perhaps seem humorous, but it is that humour which is near akin to pathos, and to those who have seen the distress it describes it is a powerfully pathetic song. Margaret had both witnessed the destitution and had the heart to feel it, and withal her voice was of that rich and rare order which does not require any great compass of notes to make itself appreciated. Alice had her quiet enjoyment of tears, but Margaret, with fixed eye and earnest dreamy look, seemed to have become more and more absorbed in realizing to herself the woe she had been describing, and which she felt might at that very moment be suffering and hopeless, within a short distance of their comparative comfort. Suddenly she burst forth with all the power of her magnificent voice, as if a prayer from her very heart for all who were in distress, in the grand supplication, Lord, remember David. Mary held her breath, unwilling to lose a note. It was so clear, so perfect, so imploring. A far more correct musician than Mary might have paused with equal admiration of the really scientific knowledge with which the poor, depressed-looking young needlewoman used her superb and flexile voice. Deborah Travis herself, once an Oldham factory girl and afterwards the darling of fashionable crowds as Mrs. Knivet, might have owned a sister in her art. She stopped, and with tears of holy sympathy in her eyes, Alice thanked the songstress, who resumed her calm, demure manner, much to Mary's wonder, for she looked at her unweariedly, as if surprised that the hidden power should not be perceived in the outward appearance. Quiet enough to hear a fine, though rather quavering, male voice, going over again one or two strains of Margaret's song. "'That's Grandfather!' exclaimed she. "'I must be going, for he said he should not be at home until past nine. "'Well, I'll not say nay, for I have to be up by four, "'for a very heavy wash at Mrs. Simpson's, "'but I shall be terrible glad to see you again at any time, lasses, "'and I hope you'll take to one another.' "'As the girls ran up the cellar steps together, Margaret said, "'Just step in and see Grandfather. "'I should like him to see you.' "'And Mary consented.' End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 The Mill on Fire – Jem Wilson to the Rescue Learned he was, nor bird nor insect flew, but he its leafy home and history knew. Nor wild flower decked the rock, nor moss the well, but he its name and qualities could tell. Eliot There is a class of man in Manchester, unknown even to many of the inhabitants, whose existence will probably be doubted by many, who yet may claim kindred with all the noble names that science recognizes. I said in Manchester, but they are scattered all over the manufacturing districts of Lancashire. In the neighborhood of Oldham there are weavers, common hand-loom weavers, who throw the shuttle with unceasing sound, though Newton's Principia lies open on the loom to be snatched at in work hours, but reveled over in meal-times or at night. Mathematical problems are received with interest and studied with absorbing attention by many the broad-spoken, common-looking factory hand. 
it is perhaps less astonishing that the more popularly interesting branches of natural history have their warm and devoted followers among this class there are botanists among them equally familiar with either the lineum or the natural system who know the name and habitat of every plant within a day's walk from their dwellings who steal the holiday of a day or two when any particular plant should be in flower and tying up their simple food in their pocket handkerchiefs set off with simple purpose to fetch home the humble-looking weed there are entomologists who may be seen with a rude-looking net ready to catch any winged insect or a kind of dredge with which they rake the green and slimy pools, practical, shrewd, hard-working men who pore over every new specimen with real scientific delight. Nor is it the common and more obvious divisions of entomology and botany that alone attract these earnest seekers after knowledge. Perhaps it may be owing to the great annual town holiday of Whitsum Week, so often falling in May or June, that the two great beautiful families of Ephemeridae and Phrygenidae have been so much and so closely studied by Manchester workmen, while they have, in a great measure, escaped general observation. If you will refer to the preface to Sir J. E. Smith's Life, I have it not by me, or I would copy you the exact passage, you will find that he names a little circumstance corroborative of what i have said being on a visit to roscoe of liverpool he made some inquiries from him as to the habitat of a very rare plant said to be found in certain places in lancashire mr roscoe knew nothing of the plant but stated that if any one could give him the desired information it would be a hand-loom weaver in manchester whom he named Sir J. E. Smith proceeded by boat to Manchester, and on arriving at that town, he inquired of the porter who was carrying his luggage if he could direct him to so-and-so. "'Oh, yes,' replied the man. "'He goes a bit in my way, and on further investigation it turned out that both the porter and his friend the weaver were skilful botanists, and able to give Sir J. E. Smith the very information which he wanted.' Such are the tastes and pursuits of some of the thoughtful, little understood working men of Manchester. And Margaret's grandfather was one of these. He was a little wirily looking old man who moved with a jerky motion, as if his limbs were worked by a string like a child's toy, with the dun colored hair lying thin and soft at the back and sides of his head. His forehead was so large it seemed to overbalance the rest of his face, which had, indeed, lost its natural contour by the absence of all the teeth. The eyes absolutely gleamed with intelligence, so keen, so observant, you felt as if they were almost wizard-like. Indeed, the whole room looked not unlike a wizard's dwelling. Instead of pictures were hung rude, wooden frames of impaled insects the little table was covered with cabalistic books and beside them lay a case of mysterious instruments one of which job legg was using when his granddaughter entered on her appearance he pushed his spectacles up so as to rest midway on his forehead and gave mary a short kind welcome but Margaret he caressed as a mother caresses her firstborn, stroking her with tenderness and almost altering his voice as he spoke to her. Mary looked round on the odd, strange things she had never seen at home, and which seemed to her to have a very uncanny look. "'Is your grandfather a fortune-teller?' whispered she to her new friend. "'No,' replied Margaret in the same voice. "'But you are not the first as have taken him for such.' He is only fond of such things as most folks know nothing about. And do you know aught about them, too? I know a bit about some of the things Grandfather is fond of, just because he's fond of em. I tried to learn about em. What things are these? said Mary, struck with the weird-looking creatures that crawled around the room in their roughly made glass cases. 
but she was not prepared for the technical names which job leg pattered upon her ear on which they fell like hail on a skylight and the strange language only bewildered her more than ever margaret saw the state of the case and came to the rescue look mary at this horrid scorpion he gave such a fright i am all of a twitter yet when i think of it grandfather went to liverpool one whitsome week to go strolling about the docks and pick up what he could from the sailors who often bring some queer thing or another from the hot countries they go to and so he sees a chap with a bottle in his hand like a druggist's physic bottle and says grandfather what have you got in there so the sailor holds it up and grandfather knew it was a rare kind of scorpion not common even in the east indies where the man came from and says he how did you catch this fine fellow for he wouldn't be taken for nothin i'm thinkin and the man said as how when they were unloading the ship he'd found him lying behind a sack of rice and he thought the cold had killed him for he was not squashed nor injured a bit he did not like to part with any of the spirit out of his grog to put the scorpion in but slipped him into the bottle knowing there were folks anow who would give him something for him so grandfather gave him a shilling two shillings interrupted job leg and a good bargain it was well grandfather came home as proud as punch and pulled the bottle out of his pocket but you see the scorpion were doubled up and grandfather thought i could fairly see how big he was so he shakes him out right before the fire and a good warm one it was for i was ironing i remember i let off ironing and stooped down over to him to look at him better and grandfather got a book and began to read how this very kind were the most poisonous and vicious species how their bite were often fatal and then went on to read how people who were bitten got swelled and screamed with pain i was listening hard but as it fell out i never took my eyes off the creature though i could not a told i was watching it suddenly it seemed to give a jerk and before i could speak it gave another and in a minute it was as wild as it could be running at me just like a mad dog what did you do asked mary me while i jumped first on a chair and then all the things i'd been ironing on the dresser and i screamed for grandfather to come up by me but he did not hearken to me why if i'd come up by thee who'd a caught the creature i should like to know well i begged grandfather to crush it and i had the iron right over it once ready to drop but grandfather begged me not to hurt it in that way so i couldn't think what he'd have for he dropped round the room as if he were sore afraid for all he begged me not to injure it at last he goes to the kettle and lifts up the lid and peeps in what on earth is he doing that for thinks i he'll never drink his tea with a scorpion running free and easy about the room then he takes the tongs and he settles his spectacles on his nose and in a minute he lifted the creature up by the leg and dropped him into the boiling water and did that kill him said mary ah sure enough he boiled for longer time than grandfather liked though but i was so afeard of his coming round again i ran to the public-house for some gin and grandfather filled the bottle and then we poured off the water and picked him out of the kettle and dropped him into the bottle and he were there about twelve month what brought him to life at first asked mary why you see he were never really dead only torpid that is dead asleep with cold and our good fire brought him round i'm glad father does not care for such things said mary are you well i'm often downright glad grandfather is so fond of his books and his creatures and his plants it does my heart good to see him so happy sorting them all at home and so ready to go in search of more whenever he's a spare day look at him now he's gone back to his books and he'll be as happy as a king working away till i make him go to bed it keeps him silent to be sure but so long as i see him earnest and pleased and eager what does that matter then when he has his talking bouts you can't think how much he has to say dear grandfather you don't know how happy we are mary wondered if the dear grandfather heard all this for margaret did not speak in an undertone but no he was far too deep and eager in solving a problem he did not even notice mary's leaving 
and she went home with a feeling that she had that night made the acquaintance of two of the strangest people she had ever saw in her life. Margaret, so quiet, so commonplace, until her singing powers were called forth, so silent from home, so cheerful and agreeable at home, and her grandfather so very different from any one Mary had ever seen. Margaret had said he was not a fortune-teller, but she did not know whether to believe her. To resolve her doubts, she told the story of the evening to her father, who was interested by her account, and curious to see and judge for himself. Opportunities are not often wanting, where inclination goes before, and ere the end of the winter Mary looked upon Margaret almost as an old friend. The latter would bring her work when Mary was likely to be at home in the evenings and sit with her, and Job Legg would put a book and, and his pipe in his pocket, and just step round the corner to fetch his grandchild, ready for a talk if he found Barton in, ready to pull out pipe and book if the girls wanted him to wait and John was still at his club. In short, ready to do whatever would give pleasure to his darling Margaret. I do not know what points of resemblance or dissimilitude, for this joins people as often as that, attracted the two girls to each other. Margaret had the great charm of possessing good, strong common sense. And do you not perceive how involuntarily this is valued? It is so pleasant to have a friend who possesses the power of setting a difficult question in a clear light, whose judgment can tell what is best to be done, and who is so convinced of what is wisest, best, that in consideration of the end, all difficulties in the way diminished. People admire talent and talk about their admiration, but they value common sense without talking about it, and often without knowing it. So Mary and Margaret grew in love, one toward the other, and Mary told many of her feelings in a way she had never done before to any one. Most of her foibles were made known to Margaret, but not all. There was one cherished weakness still concealed from every one. It concerned a lover, not beloved, but favored by fancy, a gallant, handsome young man, but not beloved. Yet Mary hoped to meet him every day in her walks, blushed when she heard his name, and tried to think of him as her future husband, and above all tried to think of herself as his future wife. Alas, poor Mary, bitter woe did thy weakness work thee. She had other lovers, one or two would gladly have kept her company, but she held herself too high, they said. Jem Wilson said nothing, but loved on and on, ever more fondly. He hoped against hope he would not give up, for it seemed like giving up life to give up thought of Mary. He did not dare to look at any end of all this, the present, so that he saw her, touched the hem of her garment, was enough. Surely, in time, such deep hope would beget love. He would not relinquish hope, and yet her coldness of manner was enough to daunt any man, and it made Jem more despairing than he would acknowledge for a long time even to himself. But one evening he came round by Barton's house, a willing messenger for his father, and opening the door saw Margaret sitting asleep before the fire. She had come in to speak to Mary, and worn out by a long working, watching night, she fell asleep in the genial warmth. An old-fashioned saying about a pair of gloves came into Jem's mind, and stepping gently up, he kissed Margaret with a friendly kiss. She awoke, and perfectly understanding the thing, she said, "'For shame of yourself, Jem, what would Mary say?' Lightly said, lightly answered, she'd no but say practice makes perfect and they both laughed but the words margaret had said rankled in jem's mind would mary care would she care in the very least they seemed to call for an answer by night and by day and jem felt that his heart told him mary was quite indifferent to any action of his still he loved on and on ever more fondly Mary's father was well aware of the nature of Jem Wilson's feeling for his daughter, but he took no notice of them to any one, thinking Mary full young yet for the cares of married life, and unwilling, too, to entertain the idea of parting with her at any time, however distant. 
but he welcomed Jem at his house as he would have done his father's son, whatever were his motives for coming, and now and then admitted the thought that Mary might do worse, when her time came, than marry Jem Wilson, a steady workman at a good trade, a good son to his parents, and a fine manly-spirited chap, at least when Mary was not by, for when she was present he watched her too closely, and too anxiously, to have much of what John Barton called spunk in him. It was towards the end of February in that year, and a bitter black frost had lasted for many weeks. The keen east wind had long since swept the streets clean, though in a gusty day the dust would rise like pounded ice, and many people's faces, quite smart with the cold force with which it blew against them. Houses, sky, people, and everything looked as if a gigantic brush had washed them all over with a dark shade of Indian ink. There was some reason for this grimy appearance on human beings, whatever there might be for the dun looks of the landscape, for soft water had become an article not even to be purchased, and the poor washerwoman might be seen vainly trying to procure a little by breaking the thick grey ice that coated the ditches and ponds in the neighbourhood. People prophesied a long continuance to this already lengthened frost, said the spring would be very late, no spring fashions required, no summer clothing purchased for a short and certain summer. Indeed, there was no end to the evil prophesied during the continuance of that bleak east wind. Mary hurried home one evening, just as daylight was fading, from Mrs. Simmons, with her shawl held up to her mouth, and her head bent as if in deprecation of the meeting wind. So she did not perceive Margaret till she was close upon her at the very turning into the court. "'Bless me, Margaret, is that you? Where are you bound to? To nowhere but your own house, that is, if you'll take me in. I've a job of work to finish to-night.' morning as must be in time for the funeral to-morrow and grandfather has been out moss hunting and will not be home till late oh how charming it will be i'll help you if you're backward have you much to do yes i only got the order yesterday at noon and there's three girls besides the mother and what with trying on and matching the stuff for there was not enough in the piece they chose first i'm above a bit behindhand I've the skirts all to make. I kept that work till candlelight, and the sleeves to say nothing of little bits to the bodies, for the missus is very particular, and I could scarce keep from smiling while they were crying so, really taking on sadly, I'm sure, to hear first one and then to other clear up to notice the set of her gown. They weren't to be misfits, I promise you, though they were in such trouble." "'Well, Margaret, you're right welcome, as you know, and I'll sit down and help you with pleasure, though I was tired enough of sewing to-night at Miss Simmons.' By this time Mary had broken up the raking-coal, and lighted her candle, and Margaret settled herself to work on one side of the table, while her friend hurried over her tea at the other. The things were then lifted in mass to the dresser, and dusting her side of the table with the apron she always wore at home, Mary took up some breaths and began to run them together. "'Who's it all for? For if you've told me, I've forgotten. Why, it's Mrs. Ogden, as keeps the green grocer shop in Oxford Road. Her husband drank himself to death, and though she cried over him and his ways all the time he was alive, she's fretted sadly, for now he's dead.' "'Has he left her much to go upon?' asked Mary, examining the, the texture of the dress. "'This is beautifully fine, soft bombazine. "'No, I'm much afeard there's but little, and there's several young children besides the three Miss Ogdens. "'I should have thought girls like them would have made their own gowns,' observed Mary. "'So I dare say they do, many a one, but now they seem all so busy getting ready for the funeral, for it's to be quite a grand affair, well-nigh twenty people to breakfast, as one of the little ones told me. The little thing seemed to like the fuss, and I do believe it comforted poor Miss Ogden to make all the piece of work. Such a smell of ham boiling and fowls roasting, while I waited in the kitchen, it seemed more like a wedding nor a funeral.' 
They said she'd spend a matter of sixty pounds on the burial. I thought you said she was but badly off, said Mary. Aye, I know she's asked for credit at several places, saying her husband laid hands on every farthing he could get for drink. But the undertakers urge her on, you see, and tell her this thing's usual, and that thing's only a common mark of respect, and that everybody has to other, till the poor woman has no will of her own. I dare say, too, her heart strikes her. It always does when a person's gone, for many a word and many a slighting deed to him, who's stiff and cold and she thinks to make up matters, as it were, by a grand funeral, though she and all her children, too, may have to pinch many a year to pay the expenses, if ever they pay them at all. "'This morning, too, will cost a pretty penny,' said Mary. "'I often wonder why folks wear mourning. It's not pretty or becoming, and it costs a deal of money, just when people can spare at least. And if what the Bible tells us be true, we ought not to be sorry when a friend who's been good goes to his rest. And as for a bad man, one's glad enough to get shut on him. I cannot see what good comes a wear in mourning. I'll tell you what I think the fancy was sent for. Old Alice calls everything sent for, and I believe she's right. It does do good though not as much as it costs, that I do believe. In setting people, as is cast down by sorrow and feels themselves unable to settle to anything but crying, something to do. Why, now I told you how they were grieving, for perhaps he was a kind husband and father, in his thoughtless way, when he wasn't in liquor. But they cheered up wonderful while I was there, and I asked him for more directions than usual that they might have something to talk over and fix about, and I left him my fashion-book, though it were two months old, just a purpose. I don't think every one would grieve a that way. Old Alice wouldn't. Old Alice is one in a thousand. I doubt, too, if she would fret much, however sorry she might be. She would say it were sent, and fall to trying to find out what good it were to do. Every sorrow in her mind is sent for good. Did I ever tell you, Mary, what she said one day, when she found me taking on about something? No, do tell. What were you fretting about, first place? I can't tell you just now. Perhaps I may some time. When? Perhaps this very evening, if it rises in my heart, perhaps never. It's a fear that sometimes I can't abide to think about, and sometimes I don't like to think on anything else. Well, I was fretting about this fear, and Alice comes in for something and finds me crying. I would not tell her, no more than I would you, Mary. So she says, Well, dear, you must mind this. When you're going to fret and be low about anything, an anxious mind is never a holy mind. Oh, Mary, I have so often checked my grumbling since she said that. The weary sound of stitching was the only sound heard for a little while, till Mary inquired. Do you expect to get paid for this morning? Why, I do not much think I shall. I've thought it over once or twice, and I mean to bring myself to think I shan't, and to like to do it as my bit towards comforting them. I don't think they can pay, and yet they're just the sort of folk to have their minds easier for wearing mourning. There's only one thing I dislike making black for. It does so hurt the eyes." Margaret put down her work with a sigh, and shaded her eyes. Then she assumed a cheerful tone, and said, "'You'll not have to wait long, Mary, for my secret's on the tip of my tongue. Mary, do you know I sometimes think I'm growing a little blind? And then what would become of Grandfather and me? Oh, God help me! Lord help me!' She fell into an agony of tears, while Mary knelt by her, striving to soothe and to comfort her, but like an inexperienced person, striving rather to deny the correctness of Margaret's fear than helping her to meet and overcome the evil. No, said Margaret, quietly fixing her tearful eyes on Mary, I know I'm not mistaken. I have felt one going some time, long before I ever thought what it would lead to, and last autumn I went to a doctor, and he did not mince the matter, but said unless I sat in a darkened room with my hands before me, my sight would not last me many years longer. But how could I do that, Mary? For one thing, Grandfather would have known there was somewhat the matter, and, oh, it will grieve him sore whenever he's told, so the later the better, and besides, 
Mary, we've sometimes little enough to go upon, and what I earn is a great help, for Grandfather takes a day here and a day there for botanizing or going after insects, and he'll think little enough of four or five shillings for a specimen. Dear Grandfather, and I'm so loath to think he should be stinted of what gives him such pleasure. So I went to another doctor to try and get him to say something different, and he said, Oh, it's only weakness, and give me a bottle of lotion. But I've used three bottles, and each of them cost two shillings, and my eye is so much worse, not hurting so much, but I can't see a bit with it. There now, Mary, continued she, shutting one eye, now you only look like a great black shadow, with the edges dancing and sparkling. And can you see pretty well with the other? Yes, pretty near as well as ever. The only difference is that if I sew a long time together, a bright spot like the sun comes right where I'm looking. All the rest is quite clear, but just where I want to see. I've been to both doctors again, and now they're both of the same story, and I suppose I'm going dark as fast as may be. Plain work pays so bad, and mourning has been so plentiful this winter that I were tempted to take in any black work I could, and now I'm suffering from it. And yet, Margaret, you're going on taking it in. That's what you'd call foolish in another. It is, Mary, and yet what can I do? Folk mun live, and I think I should go blind anyway, and I daren't tell Grandfather, else I would leave it off. But he will so fret. Margaret knocked herself backward and forward to still her emotion. "'Oh, Mary,' she said, "'I try to get his face off by heart, and I stare at him so when he's not looking, and then shut my eyes to see if I can remember his dear face. There's one thing, Mary, that serves a bit to comfort me. You'll have heard of old Jacob Butterworth, the singing-weaver. Well, I knowed him a bit, so I went to him and said how I wished he'd teach me the right way of singing, and he says I've a rare fine voice, and I go once a week and take a lesson from him. He's been a grand singer in his day. He led the choruses at the festivals, and got thanked many a time by London folk, and one foreign singer, Madame Catalani, turned round and shook him by the hand before the old church, full of people. He says I may gain ever so much money by singing, but I don't know. Any rate, it's sad work being blind." She took up her sewing, saying her eyes were rested now, and for some time they sewed on in silence. Suddenly there were steps heard in the little paved court. Person after person ran past the curtained window. "'Something's up,' said Mary. She went to the door and stopped the first person she saw, inquired the cause of the commotion. "'Eh, wench, don't you see the firelight? Carson's mill is blazing away like fun, and away her informant ran.' "'Come, Margaret, on with your bonnet, and let's go to see Carson's mill. It's a fire, and they say a burning mill is such a grand sight. I never saw one.' "'Well, I think it's a fearful sight. Besides, I've all this work to do.' But Mary coaxed her in her sweet manner, and with her gentle caresses, promising to help with the gowns all night long, if necessary, nay, saying she should quite enjoy it. The truth was, Margaret's secret weighed heavily and painfully on her mind, and she felt her inability to comfort. Besides, she wanted to change the current of Margaret's thoughts, and in addition to these unselfish feelings came the desire she had honestly expressed of seeing a factory fire. So in two minutes they were ready. At the threshold of the house they met John Barton, to whom they told their errand. "'Carson's Mill?' Ay, there is a mill on fire somewhere, sure enough by the light, and it will be a rare blaze, for there's not a drop of water to be got, and much Carson will care, for they're well insured, and the machines are the old-fashioned kind. See if they don't think it a fine thing for themselves. They'll not thank them as tries to put it out. He gave way for the impatient girls to pass, guided by the ruddy light more than by any exact knowledge of the streets that led to the mill. They scampered along with bent heads, facing the terrible east wind as best they might. Carson's mill ran lengthwise from east to west. Along it went one of the oldest thoroughfares in Manchester. Indeed, all that part of town was comparatively old. It was there that the first cotton mills were built 
in the crowded alleys and back streets of the neighborhood made a fire there particularly to be dreaded. The staircase of the mill ascended from the entrance at the western end, which faced into a wide, dingy-looking street, consisting principally of public houses, pawnbrokers, shops, rag-and-bone warehouses, and dirty provision shops. The other, the east end of the factory, fronted into a very narrow back street, not twenty feet wide, and miserably lighted and paved. Right against this end of the factory were the gable ends of the last house in the principal street, a house which from its size, its handsome stone facings, and the attempt at ornament in the front, had probably once been a gentleman's house. But now the light which streamed from its enlarged front windows made clear the interior of the splendidly fitted up room, with its painted walls, its pillared recesses, its gilded and gorgeous fittings up, its miserable squalid inmates. It was a gin palace. Mary almost wished herself away, so fearful, as Margaret had said, was the sight when they had joined the crowd assembled to witness the fire. There was a murmur of many voices whenever the roaring of the flames ceased for an instant. It was easy to perceive the mass were deeply interested. "'What do they say?' asked Margaret of a neighbour in the town, as she caught a few words, clear and distinct, from the general murmur. "'There never is any one in the mill, surely!' exclaimed Mary, as the sea of upward-turned faces moved with one accord to the eastern end, looking into Dunham Street, the narrow back lane already mentioned. The western end of the mill, whither the raging flames were driven by the wind, was crowned and turreted with triumphant fire. It sent forth its infernal tongues from every window-hole, licking the black walls with amorphous fierceness. It was swayed or fell before the mighty gale, only to rise higher and yet higher, to ravage and roar yet more wildly. This part of the roof fell in with an astounding crash, while the crowd struggled more and more to press into Dunham Street for what were magnificent, terrible flames. What were falling timbers or tottering walls in comparison with human life? There, where the devouring flames had been repelled by yet more powerful wind, but where yet black smoke gushed out from every aperture, there at one of the windows on the fourth story, or rather a doorway where a crane was fixed to hoist up goods, might occasionally be seen, when the thick gusts of smoke cleared partially away for an instant, the imploring figures of two men. They had remained after the rest of the workmen for some reason or other, and owing to the wind having driven the fire in the opposite direction, had perceived no sight or sound of alarm, till long after, if anything could be called long in the throng of terrors which passed by in less than half an hour, the fire had consumed the old wooden staircase at the other end of the building. I am not sure whether it was not the first sound of the rushing crowd below that made them fully aware of their awful position. "'Where are the engines?' asked Margaret of her neighbour. "'They're coming, no doubt, but bless you. I think it's bare ten minutes since we first found out the fire. It rages so with this wind, and all so dry-like.' "'Is no one gone for a ladder?' gasped Mary, as the men were perceptibly, though not audibly, praying the great multitude below for help. "'Aye, Wilson's son and another man were off like a shot, well nigh five minutes ago, but the masons and slaters and such like have left their work and locked up the yards.' "'Wilson, then, was that man whose figure loomed out against the ever-increasing dull, hot light behind, whenever the smoke was clear. Was that George Wilson?' Mary sickened with terror. She knew he worked for Carson's, but at first she had had no idea that any lives were in danger, and since she had become aware of this, the heated air, the roaring flames, the dizzy light, and the agitated and murmuring crowd had bewildered her thoughts. "'Oh, let us go home, Margaret. I cannot stay. We cannot go. See how we are wedged in by folks? Poor Mary, you won't hanker after another fire. Hark! Listen!' for through the hushed crowd pressing round the angle of the mill and filling up dunham street might be heard the rattle of the engine the heavy quick tread of loaded horses thank god said margaret's neighbour the engines come another pause the plugs were stiff and the water could not be got 
Then there was a pressure through the crowd, the front rows bearing back on those behind, till the girls were sick with the close ramming confinement. Then a relaxation, and a breathing freely once more. "'Twas young Wilson and a fireman with a ladder," said Margaret's neighbor, a tall man who could overlook the crowd. "'Oh, tell us what you see,' begged Mary. "'They've gotten it fixed against the gin-shop wall. One of the men in the factory has fell back, dazed with smoke, I warrant. The floor's not given way there. "'God,' said he, bringing his eye lower down, "'the ladder's too short. It's a over with them, poor chaps. The fire's comin' slow and sure to that end, and afore they're given gettin' water or another ladder, they'll be dead out and out. Lord have mercy on them. A sob as if of excited women was heard in the hush of the crowd. Another pressure like the former. Mary clung to Margaret's arm with a pinching grasp, and longed to faint and be insensible, to escape from the oppressing misery of her sensations, a minute or two. "'They've taken the ladder to the temple of Apollo. Can't press back with it to the yard it came from. A mighty shout arose, a sound to wake the dead. Up on high, quivering in the air, was seen the end of the ladder, protruding out of a garret window in the gable end of the gin palace, nearly opposite to the doorway where the men had been seen. Those in the crowd nearest to the factory, and consequently best able to see up to the garret window, said that several men were holding one end and guiding by their weight its passage to the doorway. The garret window frame had been taken out before the crowd below were aware of the attempt. At length, for it seemed long, measured by beating hearts, though scarce two minutes had elapsed, the ladder was fixed, an aerial bridge at a dizzying height across the narrow street. Every eye was fixed in unwinking anxiety, and people's very breathing seemed stilled in suspense. The men were nowhere to be seen, but the wind appeared for the moment higher than ever, and drove back the invading flames to the other end. Mary and Margaret could see now. Right above them danced the ladder in the wind. The crowd pressed back from under. Firemen's helmets appeared at the window, holding the ladder firm, when one man, with quick, steady tread and unmoving head, passed from one side to the other. The multitude did not even whisper while he crossed the perilous bridge, which quivered under him, but when he was across, safe comparatively in the factory, a cheer arose for an instant. Checked, however, almost immediately by the uncertainty of the result, and the desire not in any way to shake the nerves of the brave fellow who had cast his life on such a die. "'There he is again!' sprung to the lips of many, as they saw him at the doorway, standing as if for an instant to breathe a mouthful of fresher air, before he trusted himself to cross. On his shoulders he bore an insensible body. "'It's Jem Wilson and his father,' whispered Margaret, but Mary knew it before. The people were sick with anxious terror. He could no longer balance himself with his arms. Everything must depend on nerve and eye." They saw the ladder fixed by the position of the head, which never wavered. The ladder shook under the double weight, but still he never moved his head. He dared not look below. It seemed an age before the crossing was accomplished. At last the window was gained, and the bearer relieved from his burden. Both had disappeared. Then the multitude might shout, and above the roaring flames, louder than the blowing of the mighty wind arose that tremendous burst of applause at the success of the daring enterprise. Then a shrill cry was heard, asking, "'Is the old man alive and likely to do?' "'Aye,' answered one of the firemen to the hushed crowd below. "'He's coming round finally. Now he's had a dash of cold water.' He drew back his head, and the eager inquiries, the shouts, the sea-like murmurs of the moving, rolling mass began again to be heard, but only for an instant. In far less time than even that in which ha I have endeavoured briefly to describe the pause of events, the same bold hero stepped again across the ladder, with evident purpose to rescue the man yet remaining in the burning mill. He went across in the same quick, steady manner as before, and the people below, made less acutely anxious by his previous success, were talking to each other, shouting out intelligence of the progress of the fire at the other end of the factory. 
telling of the endeavors of the firemen at that part to obtain water while the closely packed body of men heaved and rolled from side to side it was different from the former silent breathless hush i do not know if it were from this cause or from the recollection of peril past or that he looked below in the breathing moment before returning with the remaining person a slight little man slung across his shoulders but jem wilson's step was less steady his tread more uncertain he seemed to feel with his foot for the next rung the ladder to waver and finally to stop half way by this time the crowd was still enough in the awful instant that intervened no one durst speak even to encourage many turned sick with terror and shut their eyes to avoid seeing the catastrophe they dreaded it came the brave man swayed from side to side at first as slightly as if only balancing himself but he was evidently losing nerve and even sense it was only wonderful how the animal instinct of self-preservation did not overcome every generous feeling and impel him at once to drop the helpless inanimate body he carried perhaps the same instinct told him that the sudden loss of so heavy a weight would of itself be a great and imminent danger help me she's fainted cried margaret but no one heeded all eyes were directed upwards at this point of time a rope with a running nose was dexterously thrown by one of the firemen after the manner of a lasso over the head and round the bodies of the two men true it was with rude and slight adjustment but slight as it was it served as a steady guide it encouraged the sinking heart the dizzy head once more jem stepped onwards he was not hurried by any jerk or pull slowly and gradually the rope was hauled in slowly and gradually did he make the four or five paces between him and safety the window was gained and all were saved the multitude in the street absolutely danced with triumph and huzzed and yelled till you would have fancied their very throats would crack and then with all the fickleness characteristic of a large body of people pressed and stumbled and cursed and swore in the hurry to get out of dunham street and back to the immediate scene of the fire the mighty diapason of whose roaring flames formed an awful accompaniment to the screams and yells and imprecations of the struggling crowd as they pressed away margaret was left pale and almost sinking under the weight of mary's body which she had preserved in an upright position by keeping her arms tight around mary's waist dreading with reason the trampling of unheeding feet now however she gently let her down on the cold clean pavement and the change of posture and the difference in temperature now that the people had withdrawn from their close neighbourhood speedily restored her to consciousness her first glance was bewildered and uncertain she had forgotten where she was her cold hard bed felt strange the murky glare in the sky affrighted her she shut her eyes to think to recollect her next look was upwards the fearful bridge had been withdrawn the window was unoccupied they are safe said margaret all are all safe margaret asked mary ask yon fireman and he'll tell you more about it than i can but i know they're all safe the fireman hastily corroborated margaret's words why did you let jem wilson go twice asked margaret let why we could not hinder him as soon as ever he'd heard his father speak which he was not long a doin jem were off like a shot only saying he knowed better nor us where to find to other man we'd all ha gone if he had not been in such a hurry for no one can say as manchester fireman is ever backward when there's danger so saying he ran off and the two girls without remark or discussion turned homewards they were overtaken by the elder wilson pale grimy and blear-eyed but apparently as strong and well as ever he loitered a minute or two alongside of them giving an account of his detention in the mill then he hastily wished them good-night saying he must go home and tell his missus he was all safe and well but after he had gone a few steps he turned back came on mary's side of the payment and in an earnest whisper which margaret could not avoid hearing he said mary 
if my boy comes across you to-night give him a kind word or true for my sake do bless you there's a good wench mary hung her head and answered not a word and in an instant he was gone when they arrived at home he found john barton smoking his pipe unwilling to question yet very willing to hear all the details they could give him margaret went over the whole story and it was amusing to watch his gradually increasing interest and excitement first the regular puffing abated then ceased then the pipe was fairly taken out of his mouth and held suspended then he rose at every further point he came a step nearer to the narrator when it was ended he swore an unusual thing for him that if jem wilson wanted mary he should have her to-morrow if he had not a penny to keep her margaret laughed but mary who was now recovered from her agitation pouted and looked angry the work which they had left was resumed but with full hearts fingers never go very quickly and i am sorry to say that owing to the fire the two younger miss ogdens were in such grief for the loss of their excellent father that they were unable to appear before the little circle of sympathizing friends gathered together to comfort the widow and see the funeral set off End of chapter five Chapter Six Poverty and Death. How little can the rich man know of what the poor man feels when want, like some dark demon foe, nearer and nearer steals. He never tramped the weary round, a stroke of work to gain, and sickened at the dreaded sound, telling him twas in vain foot sore heart sore he never came back through the winter's wind to a dank cellar there no flame no light no food to find he never saw his darlings lie shivering the grass their bed he never heard that maddening cry daddy a bit of bread manchester song John Barton was not far wrong in his idea that the Messrs. Carson would not be overmuch grieved for the consequences of the fire in their mill. They were well insured. The machinery lacked the improvements of late years, and worked but poorly in comparison with that which might now be procured. Above all, trade was very slack. Cottons could find no market, and goods lay packed and piled in many a warehouse. The mills were merely worked to keep the machinery, human and metal, in some kind of order and readiness for better times. So this was an excellent opportunity, Messrs. Carson thought, for refitting their factory with first-rate improvements, for which the insurance money would amply pay. They were in no hurry about the business, however. The weekly drain of wages given for labor, useless in the present state of the market, was stopped. The partners had more leisure than they had known for years, and promised wives and daughters all manner of pleasant excursions, as soon as the weather should become more genial. It was a pleasant thing to be able to lounge over breakfast with a review or newspaper in hand, to have time for becoming acquainted with agreeable and accomplished daughters, on whose education no money had been spared, but whose fathers, shut up during a long day with calicoes and accounts, had so seldom had leisure to enjoy their daughters' talents. There were happy family evenings, now that the men of business had time for domestic enjoyments. There is another side of the picture. There were homes over which Carson's fire threw a deep, terrible gloom, the homes of who would fain work, and no men gave on to them, the homes of those to whom leisure was a curse. There the family music was hungry wails, when week after week passed by, and there was no work to be had, and consequently no wages to pay for the bread the children cried aloud for in their young impatience of suffering. There was no breakfast to lounge over, their lounge was taken in bed to try and keep warmth in them that bitter march weather and by being quiet to deaden the gnawing wolf within 
many a penny that would have gone little way enough in oatmeal or potatoes, bought opium to still the hungry little ones, and make them forget their uneasiness and heavy troubled sleep. It was mother's mercy. The evil and the good of her nature came out strongly then. There were desperate fathers, there were bitter-tongued mothers. Oh, God, what wonder! There were reckless children. The very closest bonds of nature were snapped in that time of trial and distress. There was faith, such as the rich can never imagine on earth. There was love, strong as death, and self-denial among rude, coarse men, akin to that of Sir Philip Sidney's most glorious deed. The vices of the poor sometimes astound us here. But when the secrets of all hearts shall be made known, their virtues will astound us in far greater degree. Of this I am certain. As the cold, bleak spring came on, spring in name alone, and consequently as trade continued dead, other mills shortened hours, turned off hands, and finally stopped work altogether. Barton worked short hours. Wilson, of course, being a hand in Carson's factory, had no work at all. But his son, working at an engineer's, and a steady man, obtained wages enough to maintain all the family in a careful way. Still it preyed on Wilson's mind to be so long indebted to his son. He was out of spirits and depressed. Barton was morose, and soured towards mankind as a body, and the rich in particular. One evening, when the clear light at six o'clock contrasted strangely with the Christmas cold, and when the bitter wind piped down every entry and through every cranny, Barton sat brooding over his stinted fire, and listening for Mary's step, in unacknowledged trust that her presence would cheer him. The door was opened, and Wilson came breathless in. "'You've not got a bit of money by you, Barton,' asked he. "'Not I. Who has now? I'd like to know. What not you want it for?' "'I do not want it for myself, though we've none to spare. But don't you know Ben Davenport has worked at Carson's? He's down with a fever, and ne'er a stick of fire, nor a cold potato in the house.' "'I had not got no money, I tell you said Barton. Wilson looked disappointed. Barton tried not to be interested, but he could not help it in spite of his gruffness. He rose and went to the cupboard, his wife's pride long ago. There lay the remains of his dinner, hastily put by ready for supper. Bread, and a slice of cold fat boiled bacon. He wrapped them in his handkerchief, put them in the crown of his hat, and said, "'Come, let us be going.' "'Going?' Art thou going to work this time o' day? No, stupid, to be sure not. Going to see the chap thou spoke on. So they put on their hats and set out. On the way, Wilson said Davenport was a good fellow, though too much of the methody, that his children were too young to work, but not too young to be cold and hungry, that they had sunk lower and lower, and pawned thing after thing, and that they now lived in a cellar in Berry Street, off Store Street. Barton growled inarticulate words of no benevolent import to a large class of mankind. So they went along till they arrived in Berry Street. It was unpaved, and down the middle a gutter forced its way, every now and then forming pools in the holes with which the street abounded. Never was the old Edinburgh cry of Gardy Low more necessary than in this street. As they passed, women from their doors tossed household slops of every description into the gutter. They ran into the next pool, which overflowed and stagnated. Heaps of ashes were the stepping-stones on which the passer-by, who cared in the least for cleanliness, took care not to put his foot. Our friends were not dainty, but even they picked their way till they got to some steps leading down to a small area, where a person standing would have his head about one foot below the level of the street, and might at the same time, without the least motion of his body, touch the window of the cellar and the damp, muddy wall right opposite. You went down one step even from the foul area into the cellar in which a family of human beings lived. 
It was very dark inside. The window panes, many of them, were broken and stuffed with rags, which was reason enough for the dusky light that pervaded the place even at midday. After the account I have given of the state of the street, no one can be surprised that on going into the cellar inhabited by Davenport, the smell was so fetid as almost to knock the two men down. Quickly recovering themselves, as those inured to such things do, they began to penetrate the thick darkness of the place, and to see three or four little children rolling on the damp, nay, wet brick floor, through which the stagnant, filthy moisture of the street oozed up. The fireplace was empty and black. The wife sat on her husband's lair, and cried in the dark loneliness. "'See, missus, I'm back again. Hold your noise, children, and don't mither your mammy for bread. Here's a chap as got some for you.' In that dim light, which was darkness to strangers, they clustered around Barton, and tore from him the food he had brought with him. It was a large hunk of bread, but it vanished in an instant. "'We mun do something for em said he to Wilson. "'You stop here, and I'll be back in half an hour.' So he strode and ran and hurried home. He emptied into the ever-useful pocket-handkerchief the little meal remaining in the mug. Mary would have her tea at Miss Simmons. Her food for the day was safe. Then he went upstairs for his better coat and his one gay red-and-yellow silk pocket-handkerchief his jewels, his plate, his valuables, these were. He went to the pawn-shop. He pawned them for five shillings. He stopped not, nor stayed, till he was once more in London Road, within five minutes' walk of Barry Street. Then he loitered in his gate, in order to discover the shops he wanted. He bought meat and a loaf of bread, candles, chips, and from a little retail yard he purchased a couple of hundredweights of coal. Some money still remained, all destined for them, but he did not yet know how best to spend it. Food, light, and warmth he had instantly seen were necessary. For luxuries he would wait. Wilson's eyes filled with tears when he saw Barton enter with his purchases. He understood it all, and longed to be once more in work that he might help in some of these material ways, without feeling that he was using his son's money. But though silver and gold he had none, he gave heart service and love works of far more value. Nor was John Barton behind in these. The fever was, as it usually is in Manchester, of a low, putrid, typhoid kind brought on by miserable living, filthy neighborhood, and great depression of mind and body. It is virulent, malignant, and highly infectious. But the poor are fatalists with regard to infection, and well for them it is so, for in their crowded dwellings no invalid can be isolated. Wilson asked Barton if he thought he should catch it, and was laughed at for his idea. The two men, rough, Tender nurses as they were, lighted the fire, which smoked and puffed into the room as if it did not know the way up the damp, unused chimney. The very smoke seemed purifying and healthy in the thick, clammy air. The children clamored again for bread, but this time Barton took a piece first to the poor, helpless, hopeless woman, who still sat by the side of her husband, listening to his anxious, miserable mutterings. She took the bread when it was put into her hand, and broke a bit, but could not eat. She was past hunger. She fell down on the floor with a heavy, unresisting bang. The men looked puzzled. "'She's well nigh clemmed,' said Barton. "'Folk do say one mustn't have give clemmed people much to eat, but bless us, she'll eat not.' "'I'll tell you what I'll do,' said Wilson. "'I'll take these two big lads, as does not but fight, home to my missus for to-night, and I'll get a jug o' tea. Them women always does best with tea, and such like slop." So Barton was now left alone with a little child, crying, when it had done eating, for Mammy. With a fainting, dead-like woman, 
and with the sick man whose mutterings were rising up to screams and shrieks of agonized anxiety he carried the woman to the fire and chafed her hands he looked around for something to raise her head there was literally nothing but some loose bricks however those he got and taking off his coat he covered them with it as well as he could he pulled her feet to the fire which now began to emit some faint heat he looked round for water but the poor woman had been too weak to drag herself out to the distant pump and water there was none he snatched the child and ran up the area steps to the room above and borrowed their only saucepan with some water in it then he began with the skilful hand of a working man to make some gruel and when it was hastily made he seized a battered iron tablespoon kept when many other little things had been sold in a lot in order to feed the baby and with it he forced one or two drops between her clenched teeth the mouth opened mechanically to receive more and gradually she revived she sat up and looked around and recollecting it all fell down again in weak and passive despair her little child crawled to her and wiped with its fingers the thick coming tears which she now had strength to weep it was now high time to attend to the man he lay on straw so damp and mouldy no dog would have chosen it in preference to flags over it was a piece of sacking coming next to his worn skeleton of a body above him was mustered every article of clothing that could be spared by mother or children this bitter weather and in addition to his own these might have given as much warmth as one blanket could they have been kept on him but as he restlessly tossed to and fro they fell off and left him shivering in spite of the burning heat of his skin every now and then he started up in his naked madness looking like the prophet of woe in the fearful plague picture but he soon fell again in exhaustion and barton found he must be closely watched lest in these falls he should injure himself against the hard brick floor he was thankful when wilson reappeared carrying in both hands a jug of steaming tea intended for the poor wife but when the delirious husband saw drink he snatched at it with an animal instinct with a selfishness he had never shown in health then the two men consulted together it seemed decided without a word being spoken on the subject that both should spend the night with the forlorn couple that was settled but could no doctor be had in all probability no the next day an infirmary order must be begged but meanwhile the only medical advice they could have must be from a druggist so barton being the moneyed man set out to find a shop in london road it is a pretty sight to walk through a street with lighted shops the gas is so brilliant the display of goods so much more vividly shown than by day and of all the shops a druggist looks the most like the tales of our childhood from aladdin's garden of enchanted fruits to the charming rosalind with her purple jar no such associations had barton yet he felt the contrast between the well-filled well-lighted shops and the dim gloomy cellar and it made him moody that such contrast should exist they are the mysterious problem of life to more than him he wondered if any in all the hurrying crowd had come from such a house of mourning he thought they all looked joyous and he was angry with them but he could not you cannot read the lot of those who daily pass you by in the streets how do you know the wild romances of their lives the trials the temptations they are even now enduring resisting sinking under you may be elbowed one instant by the girl desperate in her abandonment laughing in mad merriment with her outward gesture while her soul is longing for the rest of the dead and bringing itself to think of the cold flowing river as the only mercy of god remaining to her here you may pass the criminal meditating crimes at which you will to-morrow shudder with horror as you read them 
you may push against one humble and unnoticed the last upon earth who in heaven will ever be in the immediate light of god's countenance errands of mercy errands of sin did you ever think where all the thousands of people you daily meet are bound barton's was an errand of mercy but the thoughts of his heart were touched by sin by bitter hatred of the happy whom he for the time confounded with the selfish he reached the druggist's shop and entered the druggist whose smooth manners seemed to have been salved over with his own spirometti listened attentively to barton's description of davenport's illness concluded it was typhus fever very prevalent in that neighborhood and proceeded to make up a bottle of medicine sweet spirits of nitrate or some such innocent potion very good for slight colds but utterly powerless to stop for an instant the raging fever of the poor man it was intended to relieve he recommended the same course they had previously determined to adopt applying the next morning for an infirmary order and barton left the shop with comfortable faith in the physic given him for man of his class if they believe in physic at all believe that every description is equally efficacious meanwhile wilson had done what he could at davenport's home he had soothed and covered the man many a time he had fed and hushed the little child and spoken tenderly to the woman who lay still in her weakness and her weariness he had opened a door but only for an instant it led into a back cellar with a grating instead of a window down which dropped the moisture from pigsties and worse abominations it was not paved the floor was one mass of bad smelling mud it had never been used for there was not an article of furniture in it nor could a human being much less a pig have lived there many days yet the back apartment made a difference in the rent the davenports paid three pence more for having two rooms when he turned round again he saw the woman suckling the child from her dry withered breast surely the lad is weaned exclaimed he in surprise why how old is he going on too she faintly answered but oh it keeps him quiet when i've naught else to give him and he'll get a bit of sleep lying there if he's getting naught beside we hadn't done our best to get the childer food however we pinch ourselves hadn't she had no money for the town no my master is buckinghamshire born and he's feared the town would send him back to his parish if he went to the board so we've just borne on in hope o better times but i think they'll never come in my day and the poor woman began her weak high-pitched cry again here sup this drop o gruel and then try and get a bit o sleep john and i will watch by your master to-night god's blessing be on you she finished the gruel and fell into a deep sleep wilson covered her with his coat as well as he could and tried to move lightly for fear of disturbing her but there need have been no such dread for her sleep was profound and heavy with exhaustion once only she roused to pull the coat around her little child and now wilson's care and barton's to boot was wanted to restrain the wild mad agony of the fevered man he started up he yelled he seemed infuriated by overwhelming anxiety he cursed and swore which surprised wilson who knew his piety and health and who did not know the unbridled tongue of delirium at length he seemed exhausted and fell asleep and barton and wilson drew near the fire and talked together in whispers they sat on the floor for chairs there were none the sole table was the old tub turned upside down they put out the candle and conversed by the flickering firelight had you known this chap long asked barton better nor three year he worked with carson that long and were always a steady civil-spoken fellow though as i said afore somewhat of a methody i wish i'd gotten a letter he'd sent his missus a week or two gone when he were on tramp for work 
it did my heart good to read it, for you see, I were a bit grumblin' myself. It seemed hard to be spongin' on Jem, and takin' a his flesh meat money to buy bread for me and them as I ought to be keepin'. But you know, though I can earn not, I mun eat something. Well, as I telled ye, I were grumblin' when she, indicating the sleeping woman by a nod, brought me Ben's letter, for she could not read herself. It were as good as Bible words, ne'er a word of repining about God being our Father, and that we must bear patiently whate'er he sends. Don't you think he's the master's father, too? I'd be low to have him for brothers. Eh, hey, John, don't a talk so. Sure there's many and many a master as good or better nor us. If you think so, tell me this. How comes it they're rich and we're poor? I'd like to know that. Han they done as they'd be done by for us? But Wilson was no arguer, no speechifier, as he would have called it. So Barton, seeing he was likely to have his own way, went on. You'll say, at least many a one does, they ain't getting capital, and we ain't getting none. I say our labors are capital, and we ought to draw interest on that. They get interest on their capital, somehow, a this time, while Arn is laying idle. Else how could they all live as they do? Besides, there's many on em, has had not to begin with. There's Carsons, and Duncombs, and Mangies, and many another as comed into Manchester, with clothes to their back, and that were all, and now they're worth their tens of thousands, a getting out of our labor. Why, the very land as fetched but sixty pound twenty year agone is now worth six hundred, and that, too, is owing to our labor. But look at yo, and see me, and poor Davenport yonder, what in better are we? They and screwed us down to the lowest peg in order to make their great big fortunes and build their great big houses, and we, why, we're just clemmin', many and many of us. Can you say there's not wrong in this? Well, Barton, I'll not gainsay ye. But Mr. Carson spoke to me after the fire, and he says, I shall have to retrench and be very careful in my expenditure during these bad times, I assure ye. So you see the masters suffer, too. Han they ever seen a child of their own die a want of food? asked Barton in a low, deep voice. I do not mean continued he, to say as I am so badly off. I'd shorn to speak for myself. But when I see such men as Davenport there dying away, for very clemmin, I cannot stand it. I've but gotten Mary, and she keeps herself pretty much. I think we'll have to keep up housekeeping, but that I don't mind. And in this kind of talk the night, the long heavy night of watching, more away, as far as they could judge davenport continued in the same state although the symptoms varied occasionally the wife slept on only roused by the cry of her child now and then which seemed to have power over her when far louder noises failed to disturb her the watchers agreed that as soon as it was likely mr carson would be up and visible wilson should go to his house and beg for an infirmary order at length the grey dawn penetrated into the dark cellar. Davenport slept, and Barton was to remain there until Wilson's return, so stepping out in the fresh air, brisk and reviving, even in that street of abomination, Wilson took his way to Mr. Carson's. Wilson had about two miles to walk before he reached Mr. Carson's house, which was almost in the country. The streets were not yet bustling and busy. The shopmen were lazily taking down the shutters, although it was near eight o'clock, for the day was long enough for the purchases people made in that quarter of the town, while trade was so flat. One or two miserable-looking women were setting off on their day's begging expedition, but there were few people abroad. Mr. Carson's was a good house, and furnished with disregard to expense. But in addition to lavish expenditure, there was much taste shown, and many articles chosen for their beauty and elegance adorned his rooms. 
as Wilson passed a window, which a housemaid had thrown open, he saw pictures and gilding, at which he was tempted to stop and look, but then he thought it would not be respectful. So he hastened on to the kitchen door. The servant seemed very busy with preparations for breakfast, but good-naturedly, though hastily, told him to step in, and they could soon let Mr. Carson know he was there so he was ushered into a kitchen hung around with glittering tins where a roaring fire burnt merrily and where numbers of utensils hung round at whose nature and use wilson amused himself by guessing meanwhile the servants bustled to and fro an outdoor man-servant came in for orders and sat down near wilson the cook boiled steaks and the kitchen-maid toasted bread and boiled eggs the coffee steamed upon the fire and although the odors were so mixed and appetizing that wilson began to yearn for food to break his fast which had lasted since dinner the day before if the servants had known this they would have willingly given him meat and bread in abundance but they were like the rest of us and not feeling hunger themselves forgot it was possible another might so wilson's craving turned to sickness while they chatted on, making the kitchen's free and keen remarks upon the parlor. "'How late you were last night, Thomas!' "'Yes, I was right weary of waiting. They told me to be at the rooms by twelve, and there I was, but it was two o'clock before they called me. "'And did you wait all that time in the street?' asked the housemaid, who had done her work for the present, and come into the kitchen for a bit of gossip. "'My eye is like—' "'You don't think I'm such a fool as to catch my death of cold "'and let the horses catch their death, too, "'as we should a done if we'd stopped there. "'No, I put the horses up in the stable at the Spread Eagle "'and went myself and got a glass or two with a fire. "'They're driving a good custom, them, with coachmen. "'There were five of us, and we'd many a quart of ale and gin with it "'to keep out the cold. "'Mercy on us, Thomas, you'll get a drunkard at last.' If I do, I know whose blame it will be. It will be Mrs., and not mine. Flesh and blood can't sit to be starved to death on a coach-box, waiting for folks as don't know their own mind. A servant, semi-upper housemaid, semi-lady's maid, now came down with orders from her mistress. Thomas, you must ride to the fishmongers, and say Mrs. can't give about a half a crown a pound for salmon for Tuesday. She's grumbling because trade's so bad, and she'll want the carriage at three to go to the lecture. Thomas, at the royal execution, you know. Ay, ay, I know. And you'd better all of you mind your P's and Q's, for she's very black this morning. She's got a bad headache. It's a pity Miss Jenkins is not here to match her. Lord, how she and Mrs. did quarrel, which had got the worst headache it was that Miss Jenkins left for. She would not give up having bad headaches, and Mrs. could not abide any one to have them but herself. Mrs. will have her breakfast upstairs, cook and the cold partridge, as was left yesterday, and put plenty of cream in her coffee, and she thinks there's a roll left, and she would like it well buttered. So saying, the maid left the kitchen to be ready to attend to the young lady's bell when they chose to ring, after their late assembly the night before. In the luxurious library, at the well-spread breakfast-table, sat the two Carsons, father and son. Both were reading, the father a newspaper, the son a review, while they lazily enjoyed their nicely prepared food. The father was a prepossessing-looking, old man, perhaps self-indulgent, you might guess. The son was strikingly handsome, and knew it. His dress was neat and well-appointed, and his manners far more gentlemanly than his father's. He was the only son, and his sisters were proud of him. His father and mother were proud of him. He could not set up his judgment against theirs. He was proud of himself." The door opened, and in bounded Amy, the sweet youngest daughter of the house, a lovely girl of sixteen, fresh and glowing, and bright as a rosebud. She was too young to go to assemblies, at which her father rejoiced, for he had little Amy with her pretty jokes, and her bird-like songs, and her playful caresses all evening to amuse him in his loneliness and she was not too much tired like sophie and helen to give him her sweet company at breakfast the next morning 
he submitted willingly while she blinded him with her hands and kissed his rough red face all over she took his newspaper away after a little pretended resistance and would not allow her brother harry to go on with his review i'm the only lady this morning papa so you know you must make a great deal of me my darling i think you have your own way always whether you're the only lady or not yes papa you're pretty good and obedient i must say that but i'm sorry to say harry is very naughty and does not do what i tell him do you harry i'm sure i don't know what you mean to accuse me of amy i expected praise and not blame for i did get you that old portugal from town that you could not meet with at hughes you little ungrateful puss did you oh sweet harry you're as sweet as all de portugal yourself you're almost as good as papa but still you know you did go and forget to ask bigland for that rose that new rose they say he has got no amy i did not forget i asked him and he has got the rose sans reproach but do you know little miss extravagance a very small one is half a guinea oh i don't mind papa will give it me won't you dear father he knows his little daughter can't live without flowers and scents mr carson tried to refuse his darling but she coaxed him into acquiescence saying she must have it it was one of her necessaries life was not worth having without flowers and amy said her brother try and be content with peonies and dandelions oh you wretch i don't call them flowers besides you're every bit as extravagant who gave half a crown for a bunch of lilies of the valley at yates a month ago and then would not let his poor little sister have them though she went on her knees to beg them answer me that master hall not on compulsion replied her brother smiling with his mouth while his eyes had an irritated expression and he went first red then pale with vexed embarrassment if you please sir said a servant entering the room here's one of the mill people wanting to see you his name is wilson he says i'll come to him directly stay tell him to come in here amy danced off into the conservatory which opened out of the room before the gaunt pale unwashed unshaven weaver was ushered in there he stood at the door sleeking his hair with old country habit and every now and then stealing a glance around the splendour of the apartment well wilson what do you want to-day man please sir davenport's ill of the fever and i'm come to know if you've got an infirmary order for him davenport davenport who is the fellow i don't know the name he's worked in your factory better nor three years sir very likely i don't pretend to know the names of the men i employ that i leave to the overlooker so he's ill eh ay sir he's very bad we want to get him in at the fever wards i doubt if i've an inpatient order to spare at present but i'll give you an outpatience and welcome so saying he rose up unlocked a drawer pondered a minute and then gave wilson an outpatients order meanwhile the younger carson had ended his review and began to listen to what was going on he finished his breakfast got up and pulled five shillings out of his pocket which he gave to wilson as he passed him for the poor fellow he went past quickly and calling for his horse mounted gaily and rode away he was anxious to be in time to have a look and a smile from lovely mary barton as she went to miss simmons but to-day he was to be disappointed wilson left the house not knowing whether to be pleased or grieved they had all spoken kindly to him and who could tell if they might not inquire into davenport's case and do something for him and his family besides the cook who when she had had time to think after breakfast was sent in had noticed his paleness had had meat and bread ready to put in his hand when he came out of the parlour and a full stomach makes every one of us more hopeful when he reached berry street he had persuaded himself he bore good news and felt almost elated in his heart but it fell when he opened the cellar door and saw barton and the wife both bending over the sick man's couch with an awe-struck 
saddened look. "'Come here,' said Barton. "'There's a change come over him since you left. Is there not?' Wilson looked. The flesh was sunk, the features prominent, bony, and rigid. The fearful clay color of death was over all, but the eyes were open and sensitive, though the films of the grave were setting upon them. He wakened from his sleep, as he left him in, and began to mutter and moan, but he soon went off again, and we never knew he were awake till he called his wife, but now she's here he's got naught to say to her. Most probably, as they all felt, he could not speak, for his strength was fast ebbing. They stood round him, still and silent. Even the wife checked her sobs, though her heart was like to break. She held her child to her breast, to try to keep him quiet. Their eyes were all fixed on the yet living one, whose moments of life were passing so rapidly away. At length he brought, with jerking convulsive effort, his two hands into the attitude of prayer. They saw his lips move, and bent to catch the words which came in gasps, and not in tones. O oh Lord God, I thank Thee that the hard struggle of living is over. O oh Ben, Ben, wailed forth his wife, have you no thought for me? O oh Ben, Ben, do say one word to help me through life. He could not speak again. The trump of the archangel would set his tongue free, but not a word more would it utter till then. Yet he heard, he understood, and though sight failed, he moved his hands gropingly over the covering. They knew what he meant, and guided it to her head, bowed and hidden in her hands, when she had sunk in her woe. It rested there with a feeble pressure of endearment. The face grew beautiful, as the soul neared God. A peace beyond understanding came over it. The hand was a heavy, stiff weight on the wife's head. No more grief or sorrow for him. They reverently laid out the corpse. Wilson fetching his own spare shirt to array it in. The wife still lay hidden in the clothes in a stupor of agony. There was a knock at the door, and Barton went to open it. It was Mary, who had received a message from her father through a neighbor, telling her where he was, and she set out early to come and have a word with him before her day's work, but some errand she had to do for Miss Simmons had detained her until now. "'Come in, wench,' said her father. "'Try if thou canst comfort yon poor, poor woman, kneeling down there. God help her!' Mary did not know what to say, or how to comfort, but she knelt down by her, and put her arm around her neck, and in a little while fell to crying herself so bitterly that the source of tears was opened by sympathy in the widow, and her full heart was for a time relieved. And Mary forgot all purpose meeting with her gay lover, Harry Carson forgot Miss Simmons' errands and her anger in the anxious desire to comfort the poor lonely woman. Never had her sweet face looked more angelic, never had her gentle voice seemed so musical as when she murmured her broken sentences of comfort. "'Oh, don't cry so, dear Mrs. Davenport. Pray don't take on so. Sure, he's gone where he'll never know care again.' Yes, I know how lonesome you must feel, but think of your children. Oh, we'll all help to earn food for him. Think how sorry he'd be if he sees you fretting so. Don't cry so, please don't. And she ended by crying herself as passionately as the poor widow. It was agreed the town must bury him. He had paid to a burial club as long as he could, but by a few weeks' omission he had forfeited his claim to a sum of money now. Would Mrs. Davenport and the little child go home with Mary? The latter brightened up as she urged this plan, but no. Where the poor, fondly loved remains were, there would the mourner be, and all that they could do was to make her as comfortable as their funds would allow, and to beg a neighbor to look in and say a word at times. So she was left alone with her dead, and they went to work that had work, and he who had none took upon him the arrangements for the funeral. 
Mary had many a scolding from Miss Simmons that day for her absence of mind. To be sure, Miss Simmons was much put out by Mary's non-appearance in the morning with certain bits of muslin and shades of silk which were wanted to complete a dress to be worn that night. But it was true enough that Mary did not mind what she was about. She was too busy planning how her old black gown, her best when her mother died, might be sponged and turned and lengthened into something like decent mourning for the widow and when she went home that night though it was very late as a sort of retribution for her morning's negligence she set to work at once and was so busy and so glad over her task that she had every now and then to check herself in singing merry ditties which she felt little accorded with the sewing on which she was engaged so when the funeral day came mrs davenport was neatly arrayed in black a satisfaction to her poor heart in the midst of her sorrow barton and wilson both accompanied her as she led her two elder boys and followed the coffin it was a simple walking funeral with nothing to grate on the feelings of any far more in accordance with its purpose to my mind than the gorgeous hearses and nodding plumes which form the grotesque funeral pomp of respectable people. There was no rattling the bones over the stones of the pauper's funeral. Decently and quietly he was followed to the grave by one determined to endure her woe meekly for his sake. The only mark of pauperism attendant on the burial concerned the living and joyous, far more than the dead or the sorrowful. When they arrived in the churchyard, they halted before a raised and handsome tombstone, in reality a wooden mockery of stone respectabilities which adorned the burial ground. It was easily raised in a very few minutes, and below was the grave in which the pauper bodies were piled until within a foot or two of the surface. When the soil was shoveled over and stamped down, the wooden cover went to do temporary duty over another hole, but little recked they of this who now gave up their dead. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Jem Wilson's Repulse how infinite the wealth of love and hope garnered in these same tiny treasure-houses! And, oh, what bankrupts in the world we feel when death, like some remorseless creditor, seizes on all we fondly thought our own! THE TWINS The ghoul-like fever was not to be braved with impunity, and balked of its prey. The widow had reclaimed her children, her neighbours, in the good Samaritan sense of the word, had paid her little arrears of rent, and made her a few shillings beforehand with the world. She determined to flit from that cellar to another less full of painful associations, less haunted by mournful memories. The board, not so formidable as she had imagined, had inquired into her case, and, instead of sending her to Stoke Claypole, her husband's Buckinghamshire parish, as she had dreaded, had agreed to pay her rent. So food for four mouths was all she was now required to find. Only for three, she would have said, for herself and the unweaned child were but reckoned as one in her calculation. She had a strong heart. Now her bodily strength had been recruited by a week or two of food, and she would not despair. So she took in some little children to nurse, who brought their daily food with them, which she cooked for them without wronging their helplessness of a crumb. And when she had restored them to their mothers at night, she set to work at plain sewing, seam and gusset, and band, and sat thinking how she might best cheat the factory inspector, and persuade him that her strong, big, hungry Ben was above thirteen. Her plan of living was so far arranged, when she heard with keen sorrow, that Wilson's twin lads were ill of the fever. They had never been strong. They were like many a pair of twins, and seemed to have but one life divided between them. One life, one strength, and, in this instance, I might almost say one brain, for they were helpless, gentle, silly children, but not the less dear to their parents and to their strong, active, manly elder brother. They were late on their feet, late in talking, late in every way, 
had to be nursed and cared for when other lads of their age were tumbling about in the street and losing themselves and being taken to the police office miles away from home. Still, Want had never yet come in at the door to make love for these innocents fly out of the window, nor was this the case even now, when Jem Wilson's earnings and his mother's occasional charrings were barely sufficient to give all the family their fill of food. But when the twins, after ailing many days, and caring little for their meat, fell sick on the same afternoon with the same heavy stupor of suffering, the three hearts that loved them so each felt, though none acknowledged to the other, that they had little chance for life. It was nearly a week before the tale of their illness spread as far as the court where the Wilsons had once dwelt, and the Bartons yet lived. Alice had heard of the sickness of her little nephew several days before, and had locked her cellar door and gone off straight to her brother's house in Ancoats. But she was often absent for days, sent for, as her neighbours knew, to help in some sudden emergency of illness or distress, so that occasioned no surprise. Margaret met Jem Wilson several days after his brothers were seriously ill, and heard from him the state of things at his home. She told Mary of it as she entered the court late that evening, and Mary listened with a saddened heart to the strange contrast which such woeful tidings presented to the gay and loving words she had been hearing on her walk home. She blamed herself for being so much taken up with visions of the golden future that she had lately gone but seldom on Sunday afternoons or other leisure time to see Mrs. Wilson, her mother's friend, and with hasty purpose of amendment she only stayed to leave a message for her father with the next-door neighbour, and then went off at a brisk pace on her way to the house of mourning. She stopped with her hand on the latch of the Wilson's door to still her beating heart, and listened to the hushed quiet within. She opened the door softly. There sat Mrs. Wilson in the old rocking-chair, with one sick, death-like boy lying on her knee, crying without let or pause. But softly, gently, as fearing to disturb the troubled, gasping child, while behind her, old Alice let her fast-dropping tears fall down on the dead body of the other twin, which she was laying out on a board placed on a sort of sofa settee in the corner of the room. Over the child which yet breathed the father bent, watching anxiously for some ground of hope where hope there was none. Mary stepped slowly and lightly across to Alice. Ay, poor lad, God has taken him early, Mary. Mary could not speak. She did not know what to say. It was so much worse than she had expected. At last she ventured to whisper, Is there any chance for the other one, think you? Alice shook her head and told with a look that she believed there was none. She next endeavored to lift the little body and carry it to its old accustomed bed in the parents' room. But earnest as the father was in watching the yet living, he had eyes and ears for all that concerned the dead, and sprang gently up, and took his dead son on his hard couch in his arms with tender strength, and carried him upstairs, as if afraid of wakening him. The other child gasped louder, longer, with more effort. "'We mun get him away from his mother. He cannot die while she's wishing him.' "'Wishing him,' said Mary, in a tone of inquiry. "'I don't know ye know what wishing means. There's none can die in the arms of those who are wishing them sore to stay on earth. The soul of them, as holds them, won't let the dying soul go free, so it has a hard struggle for the quiet of death.' We mun get him away from his mother, or he'll have a hard death, poor little fellow. So without circumlocution she went and offered to take the sinking child, but the mother would not let go of him, and looking in Alice's face with brimming and imploring eyes, declared in earnest whispers that she was not wishing him, that she would fain have him released from his suffering. Alice and Mary stood by with eyes fixed on the poor child, whose struggles seemed to increase, till at last his mother said, with a choking voice, "'Mayhap, and you'd better take him, Alice. I believe my heart's wishing at this while, for I cannot, no, I cannot bring myself to let my two children go in one day. I cannot help longing to keep him, and yet he shan't suffer longer for me.' She bent down, and fondly, oh, with what passionate fondness, kissed her child, and then gave him up to Alice, who took him with tender care. Nature's struggles were soon exhausted, and he breathed his little life away in peace. 
Then the mother lifted up her voice and wept. Her cries brought her husband down to try with his aching heart to comfort hers. Again Alice laid out the dead, Mary helping with reverent fear. The father and mother carried him upstairs to the bed where his little brother lay in calm repose. Mary and Alice drew near the fire and stood in quiet sorrow for some time. Then Alice broke the silence by saying, "'It will be bad news for Jem, poor fellow, when he comes home.' "'Where is he?' asked Mary. "'Working over hours at the shop. "'They ain't getting a large order from foreign parts, and you know, Jem wouldn't work, "'though his heart's well-nigh breaking for these poor laddies.' "'Again they were silent in thought, and again Alice spoke first. "'I sometimes think the Lord is against planning.' Whene'er I plan over much, he is sure to send and mar all my plans, as if he would have me put the future into his hands. Afore Christmas time, I was as full as full could be of going home for good and all. You and heard how I've wished it this terrible long time, and a young lass from behind Burton came into place in Manchester last Martinmas. So after a while she had a Sunday out, and she comes to me and tells me some cousins of mine bid her find me out and say how glad they should be to have me bide with them and look after their children, for they ain't getting a big farm, and she's a deal to do among the cows. So many's a winter night I did lie awake and think that please God come summer I'd bid George and his wife good-bye and go home at last. Little did I think how God Almighty would balk me for not leaving my days in his hands, who had led me through the wilderness hitherto. Here's George out of work and more cast down than ever I'd seed him, wanting every chip o' comfort he can get, e'en afore his last heavy stroke, and now I'm thinking the Lord's finger points very clear to my fit abiding place. And I'm sure if George and Jane can say his will be done, that's no more than what I'm beholden to do. So saying, she fell to tidying the room, removing as much as she could every vestige of sickness, making up the fire, and setting on the kettle for a cup of tea for her sister-in-law, whose low moans and sobs were occasionally heard in the room below. Mary helped her in all these little offices. They were busy in this way when the door was softly opened and Jem came in, all grimed and dirty from his night work, his soiled apron wrapped around his middle, in guise and apparel, in which he would have been sorry at another time to have been seen by Mary. But just now he hardly saw her. He went straight up to Alice, and asked how the little chaps were. They had been a shade better at dinner-time and he had been working away through the long afternoon and far into the night, in the belief that they had taken the turn. He had stolen out during the half-hour, allowed at the works for tea, to buy them an orange or two, which now puffed out his jacket-pocket. He would make his aunt speak, he would not understand her shake of the head and fast coursing tears. "'They're both gone,' said she. "'Dead!' "'Aye, poor fellows!' They took worse about two o'clock. Joe went first, easy as a lamb, and Will died harder like. Both! Aye, lad, both. The Lord has taken them from some evil to come, or he would not have made choice of them. You may rest sure of that. Jem went to the cupboard and quietly extricated from his pocket the oranges he had bought. But he stayed long there, and at last his sturdy frame shook with his strong agony. The two women were frightened, as women always are, on witnessing a man's overpowering grief. They cried afresh in company. Mary's heart melted within her as she witnessed Jem's sorrow, and she stepped gently up to the corner where he stood, with his back turned to them, and putting her hand softly on his arm, said, "'Oh, Jem, don't give way so. I cannot bear to see you.' Jem felt a strange leap of joy in his heart, and knew the power she had of comforting him. He did not speak, as though fearing to destroy by sound or motion the happiness of that moment, when her soft hand's touch thrilled through his frame, and her silvery voice was whispering tenderness in his ear. Yes, it might be very wrong. He could almost hate himself for it, with death and woe so surrounding him. It was yet happiness, was bliss to be spoken to by Mary. "'Don't, Jem, please, don't,' whispered she again, believing that his silence was only another form of grief. He could not contain himself. He took her hand in his firm yet trembling grasp and said in tones that instantly produced a revulsion in her mood, "'Mary, I 
almost loathe myself when I feel I would not give up this minute, when my brothers lie dead and father and mother are in such trouble, for all my life that's past and gone, and Mary, as she tried to release her hand, you know what makes me feel so blessed. She did know he was right there, but as he turned to catch a look at her sweet face, he saw that it expressed unfeigned distress, almost amounting to vexation, a dread of him that he thought was almost repugnance. He let her hand go, and she quickly went away to Alice's side. Fool that I was, nay, wretch that I was, to let myself take this time of trouble to tell her how I loved her? No wonder that she turns away from such a selfish beast. Partly to relieve her from his presence, and partly from natural desire, and partly, perhaps, from a penitent wish to share to the utmost his parents' sorrow, he soon went upstairs to the chamber of death. Mary mechanically helped Alice in all the duties she performed through the remainder of that long night, but she did not see Jem again. He remained upstairs until after the early dawn showed Mary that she need have no fear of going home through the deserted and quiet streets to try and get a little sleep before work hour. So leaving kind messages to George and Jane Wilson, and hesitating whether she might dare to send a few kind words to Jem, and deciding that she had better not, she stepped out into the bright morning light, so fresh a contrast to the darkened room where death had been. They had another morn than ours. Mary lay down on her bed in her clothes, and whether it was this or the broad daylight that poured in through the sky window, or whether it was over-excitement, it was long before she could catch a wink of sleep. Her thoughts ran on Jem's manner and words, not but what she had known the tale they told for many a day, but still she wished he had not put it so plainly. "'Oh, dear,' she said to herself, "'I wish he would not mistake me so. I never dare to speak a common word of kindness, but his eye brightens and his cheek flushes. It's very hard on me, for Father and George Wilson are old friends, and Jem and I have known each other since we were quite children.' I cannot think what possesses me, that I must always be wanting to comfort him when he's downcast, and that I must go meddling with him to-night, when sure enough it was his aunt's place to speak to him. I don't care for him, and yet unless I'm always watching myself, I'm speaking to him in a loving voice. I think I cannot go right, for I either check myself, till I'm downright cross to him, or else I speak just natural, and that's too kind and tender by half and I'm as good as engaged to be married to another, and another far handsomer than Jem. Only I think I like Jem's face best for all that. Liking's liking, and there's no help for it. Well, when I'm Mrs. Harry Carson, may happen I can put some good fortune in Jem's way. But will he thank me for it? He's rather savage at times, that I can see, and perhaps kindness from me when I'm another's will only go against the grain." I'll not plague myself with thinking any more about him, that I won't. So she turned on her pillow and fell asleep, and dreamt of what was often in her waking thoughts, of the day when she should ride from church in her carriage, with wedding bells ringing, and take up her astonished father and drive away from the old dim workaday court forever, to live in a grand house, where her father should have newspapers and pamphlets and pipes and meat dinners every day and all day long, if he liked. Such thoughts mingled in her predilection for the handsome young Mr. Carson, who, unfettered by work hours, let scarcely a day pass without contriving a meeting with the beautiful little milliner he had first seen while lounging in a shop where his sisters were making some purchases, and afterwards never rested till he had freely, though respectfully, made her acquaintance in her daily walks. He was, to use his own expression to himself, quite infatuated by her, and was restless each day till the time came when he had a chance, and of late, more than a chance, of meeting her. There was something of keen, practical shrewdness about her, which contrasted very bewitchingly with the simple, foolish, unworldly ideas she had picked up from the romances which Miss Simmons' young ladies were in the habit of recommending to each other. Yes, Mary was ambitious, and did not favor Mr. Carson the less because he was rich and a gentleman. 
the old leaven infused years ago by her aunt esther fermented in her little bosom and perhaps all the more for her father's aversion to the rich and the gentle such is the contrariness of the human heart from eve downwards that we all in our old adam state fancy things forbidden sweetest so mary dwelt upon and enjoyed the idea of some day becoming a lady and doing all of the elegant nothings appertaining to ladyhood. It was a comfort to her when scolded by Miss Simmons to think of the day when she would drive up to the door in her own carriage to order her gowns from the hasty-tempered yet kind dressmaker. It was a pleasure to her to hear the general admiration of the two elder Miss Carsons, acknowledged beauties in ballroom and street, on horseback and on foot and to think of the time when she should ride and walk with them in loving sisterhood. But the best of her plans, the holiest, that which in some measure redeemed the vanity of the rest, were those relating to her father, her dear father, now oppressed with care and always a disheartened, gloomy person, how she would surround him with every comfort she could devise. Of course he was to live with them till he should acknowledge riches to be very pleasant things, and bless his lady daughter. Every one who had shown her kindness in her low estate should then be repaid a hundredfold. Such were the castles in the air, the Alnisher visions in which Mary indulged, and which she was doomed in after days to expiate with many tears. Meanwhile her words, or even more her tones, would maintain their hold on Jem Wilson's memory. A thrill would yet come over him when he remembered how her hand had rested on his arm. The thought of her mingled with all his grief, and it was profound for the loss of his brothers. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Margaret's Debut as a Public Singer Deal gently with them. They have much endured. Scoff not at their fond hopes and earnest plans, though they may seem to thee wild dreams and fancies. Perchance in the rough school of stern experience they've something learned which theory does not teach. Or if they greatly err, deal gently still, and let their error but the stronger plead, give us the light and guidance that we need. Love Thoughts One Sunday afternoon, about three weeks after that mournful night, Jem Wilson set out with the ostensible purpose of calling on John Barton. He was dressed in his best, his Sunday suit, of course, while his face glittered with the scrubbing he had bestowed on it. His dark black hair had been arranged and rearranged before the household looking-glass, and in his buttonhole he stuck a Narcissus, a sweet Nancy is its pretty Lancashire name, hoping it would attract Mary's notice so that he might have the delight of giving it her. It was a bad beginning of his visit of happiness that Mary saw him some minutes before he came into her father's house. She was sitting at the end of the dresser, with the little window blind drawn on one side, in order that she might see the passers-by in the intervals of reading her Bible, which lay open before her. So she watched all the greeting a friend gave Jem. She saw the face of condolence, the sympathetic shake of the hand, and had time to arrange her own face and manner before Jem came in, which he did as if he had eyes for no one but her father, who sat smoking his pipe by the fire, while he read an old northern star borrowed from a neighboring public house. Then he turned to Mary, who he felt, through the sure instinct of love, by which almost his body thought was present. Her hands were busy adjusting her dress, a forced and unnecessary movement Jem could not help thinking. Her accost was quiet and friendly, if grave. She felt that she reddened like a rose and wished she could prevent it, while Jem wondered if her blushes arose from fear or anger or love. She was very cunning, I am afraid. She pretended to read diligently, and not to listen to a word that was said, while, in fact, she heard all sounds, even to Jem's long, deep sighs, which wrung her heart. At last she took up her Bible, and as if their conversation disturbed her, went upstairs to her little room, and she had scarcely spoken a word to Jem, 
scarcely looked at him, never noticed his beautiful sweet Nancy, which only awaited her least word of praise to be hers. He did not know that pang was spared, that in her little dingy bedroom stood a white jug, filled with a luxuriant bunch of early spring roses, making the whole room fragrant and bright. They were the gift of her richer lover. So Jem had to go on sitting with John Barton, fairly caught in his own trap, and had to listen to his talk and answer him as best he might. "'There's the right stuff in this here star, and no mistake. Such a right-down piece for short hours.' "'At the same rate of wages as now?' asked Jem. "'Ay, ay, else where's the use? "'It's only taken out of the master's pocket what they can well afford. "'Did I ever tell you what the infirmary chap let me into many a year agone?' "'No,' said Jem listlessly. "'Well, you must know, I were in the infirmary for a fever, "'and times were rare and bad, "'and there be good chaps there to a man while he's wick.' whate'er they may be about cutting em up at after. So when I were better of the fever, but weak as water, they says to me, says they, if you can write, you may stay in a week longer, and help our surgeon with sorting his papers, and we'll take care you of your belly full of meat and drink. You'll be twice as strong in a week. So there wanted but one word to that bargain. So I were set to writing and copying. The writing I could do well enough, but they'd such queer ways of spelling that I'd ne'er been used to that I'd to look first at the copy, and then at my letters, for all the world like a cock picking up grains of corn. But one thing startled me, even then, and I thought I'd make bold to ask the surgeon the meaning of it. I've getting no head for numbers, but this I know, that by far the greater part of the accidents has come in, happened in the last two hours of work, when folk getting tired and careless. The surgeon said it were all true, and that he were going to bring that fact to light." Jem was pondering Mary's conduct, but the pause made him aware he ought to utter some civil listening noise, so he said, "'Very true.' "'Ay, it's true enough, my lad, that we're sadly overborne, and worse will come of it afore long. Block printers is going to strike. They ain't getting a bang-up union, as won't let them be put upon. But there's many a thing will happen afore long, as folk don't expect. You may take my word for that, Jem.' Jem was very willing to take it, but did not express the curiosity he should have done. So John Barton thought he'd try another hint or two. Working folk won't be ground to the dust much longer. We na had as much to bear as human nature can bear. So if the masters can't do us no good, and they say they can't, we mun try higher folk. Still Jem was not curious. He gave up hope of seeing Mary again by her own good free will and the next best thing would be to be alone, to think of her. So muttering something which he meant to serve as an excuse for his sudden departure, he hastily wished John good afternoon, and left him to resume his pipe and his politics. For three years past, trade had been getting worse and worse, and the price of provisions higher and higher. This disparity between the amount of the earnings of the working classes and the price of their food occasioned in more cases than could well be imagined disease and death. Whole families went through a gradual starvation. They only wanted a Dante to record their sufferings, and yet even his words would fall short of the awful truth. They could only present an outline of the tremendous facts of the destitution that surrounded thousands upon thousands in the terrible years 1839, 1840, and 1841. Even philanthropists, who had studied the subject, were forced to own themselves perplexed in their endeavor to ascertain the real causes of the misery. The whole matter was of so complicated a nature that it became next to impossible to understand it thoroughly. It need excite no surprise, then, to learn that a bad feeling between working men and the upper classes became very strong in this season of privation. The indigence and sufferings of the operatives induced a suspicion in the minds of many of them that their legislators, their magistrates, their employers, and even their ministers of religion were in general their oppressors and enemies, and were in league for their prostration and enthrallment. The most deplorable and enduring evil that arose out of the period of commercial depression to which I refer 
was this feeling of alienation between the different classes of society. It is so impossible to describe, or even faintly to picture, the state of distress which prevailed in the town at that time, that I will not attempt it. And yet I think again that surely, in a Christian land, it was not known, even so feebly as words could tell it, or the more happy and fortunate, would have thronged with their sympathy and their aid. In many instances the sufferers wept first, and then they cursed. Their vindictive feelings exhibited themselves in rabid politics. And when I hear, as I have heard, of the sufferings and privations of the poor, of provision shops where hapworths of tea, sugar, butter, and even flour were sold to accommodate the indigent, of parents sitting in their clothes by the fireside during the whole night, for seven weeks together, in order that their only bed and bedding might be reserved for the use of their large family, of others sleeping upon the cold hearthstone for weeks in succession without adequate means of providing themselves with food or fuel, and this in the depth of winter, of others being compelled to fast for days together, uncheered by any hope of better fortune, living moreover or rather starving in a crowded garret or damp cellar, and gradually sinking under the pressure of want and despair into a premature grave. And when this has been confirmed by the evidence of their careworn looks, their excited feelings, and their desolate homes, can I wonder that many of them, in such times of misery and destitution, spoke and acted with ferocious precipitation. An idea was now springing up among the operatives that originated with the Chartists, but which came at last to be cherished as a darling child by many and many a one. They could not believe that government knew of their misery. They rather chose to think it possible that men could voluntarily assume the office of legislators for a nation who were ignorant of its real state as who should make domestic rules, for the pretty behavior of children without caring to know that those children had been kept for days without food. Besides, the starving multitudes had heard that the very existence of their distress had been denied in Parliament, and though they felt this strange and inexplicable, yet the idea that their misery had still to be revealed in all its depths, and that then some remedy would be found soothed their aching hearts, and kept down their rising fury. So a petition was framed and signed by thousands in the bright spring days of 1839, imploring Parliament to hear witnesses who could testify to the unparalleled destitution of the manufacturing districts. Nottingham, Sheffield, Glasgow, Manchester, and many other towns were busy appointing delegates to convey this petition, who might speak not merely of what they had seen and had heard, but from what they had borne and suffered. Life-worn, gaunt, anxious, hunger-stamped men were those delegates. One of them was John Barton. He would have been ashamed to own the flutter of spirits his appointment gave him. There was the childish delight of seeing London. That went a little way and but a little way. There was the vain idea of speaking out his notions before so many grand folk. That went a little further. And last, there was the really pure gladness of heart, arising from the idea that he was one of the chosen to be instruments in making known the distresses of the people, and consequently in procuring them some grand relief, by means of which they should never suffer want or care any more. He hoped largely, but vaguely, of the results of his expedition. An argosy of the precious hopes of many otherwise despairing creatures was that petition to be heard concerning their sufferings. The night before the morning on which the Manchester delegates were to leave for London, Barton might be said to hold a levy so many neighbors came dropping in. Job Lee had early established himself and his pipe by John Barton's fire, not saying much, but puffing away, and imagining himself of use in adjusting the smoothing irons that hung before the fire, ready for Mary when she should want them. As for Mary, her employment was the same as that of Beau Tibbs' wife, just washing her father's two shirts in the pantry back kitchen, for she was anxious about his appearance in London. The coat had been redeemed, though the silk handkerchief was forfeited. The door stood open as usual between the house-place and back kitchen, 
so she gave her greeting to their friends as they entered. "'So, John, you're bound for London, are you?' said one. "'Aye, I suppose I mun go,' answered John, yielding to necessity, as it were. "'Well, there's many a thing I'd like you to speak on to the Parliament people. Thou'lt not spare him, John, I hope. Tell him our minds. How we're thinking we'd been clemmed long enough, and we do not see what in good they've been doing, if they can't give us what we are all crying for since the day we were born.' Ay, ay, I'll tell him that, and much more to it, when it gets to my turn. But thou knows there's many will have their word afore me. Well, thou'lt speak at last. Bless thee, lad, do ask him to make the masters to break the machines. There's never been good times since Spin and Jenny's came up. Machines is the ruin of poor folk, chimed in several voices. For my part, said a shivering, half-clad man, who crept near the fire as if og-stricken, I would like thee to tell him to pass the short hours, Bill. Flesh and blood gets wearied with so much work. Why should factory hands work so much longer nor other trades? Just ask him that, Barton, will ye? Barton was saved the necessity of answering by the entrance of Mrs. Davenport, the poor widow he had been so kind to. She looked half-fed and eager, but was decently clad. In her hand she brought a little newspaper parcel, which she took to Mary, who opened it, and then called out, dangling a shirt-collar from her soapy fingers. "'See, father, what a dandy you'll be in London. Mrs. Davenport has brought you this, made new cut, all after the fashion. Thank you for thinking of him.' "'Hey, Mary,' said Mrs. Davenport in a low voice, "'what's all I can do to what he's done for me and mine?' "'But, Mary, sure I can help ye, for you'll be busy with this journey.' Just help me wring these out, and then I'll take them to the mangle. So Mrs. Davenport became a listener to the conversation, and after a while joined in. I'm sure, John Barton, if you are taking messages to the Parliament folk, you'll not object to telling em what a sore trial it is, this law of theirs, keeping children for factory work, whether they be weakly or strong. There's our Ben. Why, porridge seems to go no way with him, he eats so much, and I ain't gotten no money to send him to school as I would like. And there he is, rampaging about the streets a day, getting hungrier and hungrier, and picking up a manner of bad ways. And the inspector won't let him in to work in the factory, because he's not right age. Though he's twice as strong as Sankey's little rittling of a lad, as works till he cries for his legs aching so, though he's right age and better. I've one plan I wish to tell John Barton, said a pompous, careful-speaking man and I should like him to lay it afore the honourable house. My mother comed out of Oxfordshire, and were under laundry maid in Sir Francis Dashwood's family, and when we were little ones she'd tell us stories of their grandeur, and one thing she named were that Sir Francis wore two shirts a day. Now he were all as one as a Parliament man, and many on em, I have no doubt, are like extravagant. Just tell em, John, do, that they'd be doing Lancashire weavers a great kindness, if they'd have their shirts a-made a calico. T'would make trade brisk, that would, with the power of shirts they wear. Job Lee now put in his word. Taking the pipe out of his mouth, and addressing the last speaker, he said, I'll tell ye what, Bill, and no offence, mind ye. There's but hundreds of them Parliament folk as wear so many shirts to their back, but there's thousands and thousands of poor weavers as had gotten only one shirt in the world, ay, and don't know where to get another when that rag's done. Though they're turning out miles of calico every day, and many a mile of it is lying in a warehouse, stopping up trade for want of purchasers. You take my advice, John Barton, and ask Parliament to set trade free, so as workmen can earn a decent wage, and buy their two, ay, and three shirts a year. That would make weaving brisk." He put his pipe in his mouth again, and redoubled his puffing to make up for lost time. "'I'm afeard, neighbors,' said John Barton. "'I've not much chance of telling em all you say. What I think on is just speaking out about the distress that they say is not. When they hear of children born on wet flags, without a rag to cover em or a bit of food for the mother, when they hear of folk lying down to die in the streets, or hiding their want in some hole of a cellar till death come to set em free, and when they hear of all this plague, pestilence, and famine, they'll surely do somewhat wiser for us than we can guess at now. However, I have no objection, if so be there's an opening, to speak up for what you say, 
Anyhow, I'll do my best, and you see now if better times don't come after Parliament knows all. Some shook their heads, but more looked cheery, and then one by one dropped off, leaving John and his daughter alone. Didst thou mark how poorly Jane Wilson looked? asked he, as they wound up their hard day's work, by a supper eaten over the fire, which glowed and glimmered through the room and formed their only light. No, I can't say as I did, but she's never rightly held up her head since the twins died, and all along she has never been a strong woman. Never sin her accident. Afore that I mind her looking as fresh and likely a girl as ever a one in Manchester. What accident, father? She cotched her side again a wheel. It were four wheels were boxed up. It were just when she were to have been married, and many a one thought George would have been off his bargain. But I knew he weren't the chap for that trick. Pretty near the first place she went to, when she were able to go about again, was the old church. Poor wench, all pale and limping. She went up the aisle, George holding her as tender as a mother, and walking as slow as ever he could, not to hurry her, though there were plenty enow of rude lads to cast their jests at him and her. Her face were white like a sheet when she came in the church, but afore she got to the altar she were all one flush. But, for all that, it's been a happy marriage, and George has stuck by me through life like a brother. He'll never hold his head up again if he loses Jane. I didn't like her looks tonight. And so he went to bed, the fear of forthcoming sorrow to his friend mingling with his thoughts of tomorrow and his hopes for the future. Mary watched him set off, with her hands over her eyes to shade them from the bright slanting rays of the morning sun, and then she turned into the house to arrange its disorder before going to her work. She wondered if she should like or dislike the evening and morning solitude. For several hours when the clock struck she thought of her father, and wondered where he was. She made good resolutions according to her lights, and by and by came the distractions and events of the broad full day to occupy her with the present, and to deaden the memory of the absent. One of Mary's resolutions was that she would not be persuaded or induced to see Mr. Harry Carson during her father's absence. There was something crooked in her conscience, after all, for this very resolution seemed an acknowledgment that it was wrong to meet him at any time. And yet she had brought herself to think her conduct quite innocent and proper, for although unknown to her father, and certain even did he know it, to fail of obtaining his sanction she esteemed her love-meetings with Mr. Carson as sure to end in her father's good and happiness. But now that he was away, she would do nothing— that he would disapprove of. No, not even though it was for his own good in the end. Now, among Miss Simmons' young ladies, was one who had been from the beginning a confidant in Mary's love affair, made so by Mr. Carson himself. He had felt the necessity of some third person to carry letters and messages, and to plead his cause when he was absent. In a girl named Sally Ledbitter he had found a willing advocate— she would have been willing to have embarked in a love affair herself, especially a clandestine one, for the mere excitement of the thing, but her willingness was strengthened by the sundry half-sovereigns which, from time to time, Mr. Carson bestowed upon her. Sally Ledbetter was vulgar-minded to the last degree, never easy unless her talk was of love and lovers. In her eyes it was an honour to have had a long list of wooers. So constituted it was a pity— that Sally herself was but a plain, red-haired, freckled girl, never likely, one would have thought, to become a heroine on her own account. But what she lacked in beauty, she tried to make up for, by a kind of witty boldness, which gave her what her betters would have called piquancy. Considerations of modesty or propriety never checked her utterance of a good thing. She had just talent enough to corrupt others. Her very good nature was an evil influence— they could not hate one who was so kind. They could not avoid one who was so willing to shield them from scrapes by any exertion of her own, whose ready fingers would at any time make up for their deficiencies, and whose still more convenient tongue would at any time invent for them. The Jews, or Mohammedans, I forget which, believe that there is one little bone of our body, one of the vertebrae, if I remember rightly, which will never decay and turn to dust, 
but will lie incorrupt and indestructible in the ground until the last day. This is the seed of the soul. The most depraved have also their seed of the holiness that shall one day overcome their evil, their one good quality lurking hidden but safe among all the corrupt and bad. Sally's seed of the future soul was her love for her mother, an aged bedridden woman. For her she had self-denial, for her her good nature rose into tenderness, to cheer her lonely bed. Her spirits in the evenings, when her body was often woefully tired, never flagged, but were ready to recount the events of the day, to turn them into ridicule, and to mimic, with admirable fidelity, any person gifted with an absurdity who had fallen under her keen eye. But the mother was lightly principled like Sally herself. Nor was there need to conceal from her the reason why Mr. Carson gave her so much money. She chuckled with pleasure, and only hoped that the wooing would be long a doing. Still, neither she nor her daughter nor Harry Carson liked this resolution of Mary not to see him during her father's absence. One evening, and the early summer evenings were long and bright now, Sally met Mr. Carson by appointment, to be charged with a letter from Mary imploring her to see him, which Sally was to back with all her powers of persuasion. After parting from him, she determined, as it was not so very late, to go at once to Mary's and deliver the message and letter. She found Mary in great sorrow. She had just heard of George Wilson's sudden death. Her old friend, her father's friend, Jem's father. All his claims came rushing upon her. Though not guarded from a necessary sight or sound of death, as the children of the rich are, yet it had so often been brought home to her this last three or four months. It was so terrible thus to see friend after friend depart. Her father, too, who had dreaded Jane Wilson's death the evening before he set off, and she, the weakly, was left behind while the strong man was taken. At any rate, the sorrow her father had so feared for him was spared. Such were the thoughts which came over her. She could not go to comfort the bereaved, even if comfort were in her power to give, for she had resolved to avoid Jem, and she felt that this of all others was not the occasion on which she should keep up a studiously cold manner. And in this shock of grief Sally Ledbitter was the last person she wished to see. However, she rose to welcome her, betraying her tear-swollen face. "'Well, I shall tell Mr. Carson to-morrow how you are fretting for him. "'It's no more nor he's doing for you, I can tell you.' "'For him, indeed,' said Mary, with a toss of her pretty head. "'I miss for him. "'You've been sighing as if your heart would break now for several days over your work. "'Now aren't you a little goose not to go and see one, "'who I am sure loves you as his life, and whom you love. "'How much, Mary?' "'This much, as the children say, opening her arms very wide. "'Nonsense,' said Mary, pouting. "'I often think I don't love him at all.' "'And I'm to tell him that, am I, next time I see him?' asked Sally. "'If you like,' replied Mary. "'I'm sure I don't care for that or anything else now.' "'Weeping afresh. "'But Sally did not like to be the bearer of any such news. "'She saw she had gone on the wrong tack.' and that Mary's heart was too full to value either message or letter as she ought. So she wisely paused in their delivery and said in a more sympathetic tone than she had hitherto used, "'Do tell me, Mary, what's fretting you so? You know I never could abide to see you cry.' "'George Wilson's dropped down dead this afternoon,' said Mary, fixing her eyes for one minute on Sally, and the next hiding her face in her apron as she sobbed anew. "'Dear, dear!' All flesh is grass, here to-day and gone to-morrow, as the Bible says. Still, he was an old man, and not good for much. There's better folk than him left behind. Is the canting old maid, as was his sister, alive yet? I don't know who you mean, said Mary, sharply, for she did know, and did not like to have her dear, simple Alice so spoken of. Come, Mary, don't be so innocent. "'Is Miss Alice Wilson alive, then? Will that please you? I haven't seen her hereabouts lately.' "'No. She's left living here. When the twins died, she thought she could, maybe, be of use to her sister, 
who was sadly cast down, and Alice thought she could cheer her up. At any rate she could listen to her when her heart grew overburdened, so she gave up her cellar and went to live with them. "'Well, good go with her. I'd no fancy for her, and I'd no fancy for her making my pretty Mary into a Methody. "'She wasn't a Methody. She was Church of England.' "'Well, well, Mary, you're very particular. You know what I meant. "'Look, who is this letter from?' holding up Henry Carson's letter. "'I don't know and don't care,' said Mary, turning very red. "'My eye, as if I didn't know you did know and did care.' "'Well, give it me,' said Mary impatiently, and anxious in her present mood for her visitor's departure. Sally relinquished it unwillingly. She had, however, the pleasure of seeing Mary dimple and blush as she read the letter, which seemed to say the writer was not indifferent to her. "'You must tell him I can't come,' said Mary, raising her eyes at last. "'I have said I won't meet him while father is away, and I won't.' "'But, Mary, he does so look for you. You'd be quite sorry for him. He's so put out about not seeing you. Besides, you go when your father's at home without letting on to him, and what harm would there be in going now?' "'Well, Sally, you know my answer. I won't, and I won't. "'I'll tell him to come and see you himself some evening instead of sending me. "'He'd maybe find you not so hard to deal with.' "'Mary flashed up. "'If he dares come here while father's away, "'I'll call the neighbors in to turn him out, "'so don't be putting him up to that.' "'Mercy on us! "'One would think you were the first girl that ever had a lover. "'Have you never heard what other girls do and think no shame of?' "'Hush, Sally!' "'That's Margaret Jennings at the door.' "'And in an instant Margaret was in the room. "'Mary had begged Jobly to let her come and sleep with her. "'In the uncertain firelight you could not help noticing "'that she had the groping walk of a blind person. "'Well, I must go, Mary,' said Sally. "'And that's your last word?' "'Yes, yes, good night.' "'She shut the door gladly on her unwelcome visitor. "'Unwelcome at that time, at least.' "'Oh, Margaret, have you heard the sad news about George Wilson?' "'Yes, that I have. "'Poor creatures. "'They've been so tried lately. "'Not that I think sudden death so bad a thing. "'It's easy. "'And there's no terrors for him as dies. "'For them as survives, it's very hard. "'Poor George. "'He was such a hardy-looking man.' "'Margaret,' said Mary, "'who had been closely observing her friend.' "'Thou art very blind to-night, art thou? "'Is it with crying? "'Your eyes are so swollen and red.' "'Yes, dear, but not crying for sorrow. "'Han ye heard where I was last night? "'No, where?' "'Look here!' "'She held up a bright golden sovereign. "'Mary opened her large grey eyes with astonishment. "'I'll tell you all and how about it. "'You see, there's a gentleman lecturing on music at the mechanics.' "'and he wants folk to sing his songs. "'Well, last night the counter got a sore throat "'and couldn't make a note, so they sent for me. "'Jacob Butterworth had said a good word for me, "'and they asked me what I sing. "'You may think I was frightened, "'but I thought now or never, and said I'd do my best. "'So I tried o'er the songs with the lecturer, "'and then the managers told me I were to make myself decent "'and be there by seven. "'And what did you put on?' asked Mary. "'Oh!' "'Why didn't you come in for my pretty pink gingham?' "'I did think on it, but you had not come home then. "'No, I put on my merino, as was turned last winter, and my white shawl, "'and did my hair pretty tidy. It did well enough. "'Well, but as I was saying, I went at seven. "'I couldn't see to read my music, but I took the paper in with me "'so I had something to do with my fingers.' The folks had danced, as I stood as right afore em all, as if I'd been going to play at ball with em. You may guess I felt squeamish, but mine weren't the first song, and the music sounded like a friend's voice telling me to take courage. So, to make a long story short, when it were all over, the lecturer thanked me, and the manager said as how there never was a new singer so applauded, for they clapped and stamped after I'd done, till I began to wonder how many pair of shoes they'd get through a week at that rate, let alone their hands. "'So I am to sing again on Thursday, and I got a sovereign last night, "'and am to have half a sovereign every night the lecturer is at the mechanics.' "'Well, Margaret, I'm right glad to hear it. "'And I don't think you've heard the best bit yet.' 
now that a way seemed open to me of not being a burden to any one, though it did please God to make me blind, I thought I'd tell Grandfather. I only told him about the singing and the sovereign last night, for I thought I'd not send him to bed with a heavy heart. But this morning I told him all. And how did he take it? He's not a man of many words, and it took him by surprise like. I wonder at that. I've noticed it in your ways ever since you telled me. Aye, that's it. If I'd not telled you, and you'd seen me every day, you'd not have noticed the little mite of difference from day to day. Well, but what did your grandfather say? Why, Mary, said Margaret, half smiling, I'm a bit loath to tell you, for unless you knew grandfather's ways like me, you'd think it strange. He was taken by surprise, and he said, Damn you! Then he began looking at his book, as it were, and were very quiet, while I telled him all about it, how I'd feared, and how downcast I'd been, and how I were reconciled to it, if it were the Lord's will, and how I hoped to earn money by singing, and while I were talking, I saw great big tears come dropping on the book, but in course I never let on that I saw him. Dear Grandfather, and all day long he's been quietly moving things out of my way, as he thought might trip me up and putting things in my way as he thought I might want, never knowing I saw and felt what he were doing, for you see he thinks I'm out and out blind, I guess, as I shall be soon. Margaret sighed, in spite of her cheerful and relieved tone. Though Mary caught the sigh, she felt it was better to let it pass without notice, and began with the tact which true sympathy rarely fails to supply, to ask a variety of questions respecting her friend's musical debut, which tended to bring out more distinctly how successful it had been. "'Why, Margaret!' at length she exclaimed. "'Thou wilt become as famous, maybe, as that grand lady from London, as we seed one evening driving up to the concert-room door in her carriage.' "'It looks very like it,' said Margaret, with a smile. "'And be sure, Mary, I'll not forget to give thee a lift now and then, when that comes about. "'Nay, who knows, if thou art a good girl, but may happen I may make thee my lady's maid.' Wouldn't that be nice? So I even sing to myself the beginning of one of my songs. And ye shall walk in silk attire, and siller have to spare. Nay, don't stop, or else give me something rather more new, for somehow I never quite liked that part about thinking o' Donald Mare. Well, though I'm a bit tired, I don't care if I do. Before I come, I were practicing well nigh upon two hours this one, which I'm to sing on Thursday. The lecturer said he was sure it would just suit me, and I should do justice to it, and I should be right sorry to disappoint him. He were so nice and encouraging like to me. Hey, Mary, what a pity there isn't more of that way, and less scolding and rating in the world. It would go a vast deal further. Beside, some of the singers said they were almost certain that it were a song of his own, because he was so fidgety and particular about it, and so anxious I should give it the proper expression. And that makes me care still more. The first verse, he said, were to be sung tenderly but joyously. I'm afraid I don't quite hit that, but I'll try. What a single word can do, thrilling all the heart strings through, calling forth fond memories, raining round hope's melodies, steeping all in one bright hue, what a single word can do. Now it falls into the minor key and must be very sad-like, I feel as if I could do that better than t'other. What a single word can do, making life seem all untrue, driving joy and hope away, leaving not one cheering ray, blighting every flower that grew. What a single word can do. Margaret certainly made the most of this little song. As a factory worker listening outside observed, she spun it read fine. And if she only sang it at the mechanics, with half the feeling she put into it that night, the lecturer must have been hard to please if he did not admit that his expectations were more than fulfilled. When it was ended, Mary's looks told more than words could have done what she thought of it, and partly to keep in a tear which would fain have rolled out, she brightened into a laugh and said, "'For certain the carriage is coming, so let us go and dream on it.' End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 Barton's London Experiences A life of self-indulgence is for us. A life of self-denial is for them. 
for us the streets broad-built and populous for them unhealthy corners garrets dim and cellars where the water rat may swim for us green paths refreshed by frequent rain for them dark alleys where the dust lies grim not doomed by us to this appointed pain god made us rich and poor of what do these complain mrs norton's child of the islands the next evening it was a warm pattering incessant rain just the rain to waken up the flowers but in manchester where alas there are no flowers the rain had only a disheartening and gloomy effect the streets were wet and dirty the drippings from the houses were wet and dirty and the people were wet and dirty indeed most kept within doors and there was an unusual silence of footsteps in the little paved courts mary had to change her clothes after her walk home and had hardly settled herself before she heard someone fumbling at the door the noise continued long enough to allow her to get up and go and open it there stood could it be yes it was her father drenched and wayworn there he stood he came in with no word to mary in return for her cheery and astonished greeting he sat down by the fire in his wet things unheeding but mary would not let him so rest she ran up and brought down his working day clothes and went into the pantry to rummage up their little bit of provision while he changed by the fire talking all the while as gaily as she could though her father's depression hung like a lead on her heart for mary in her seclusion at miss simmons where the chief talk was of fashions and dress and parties to be given for which such and such gowns would be wanted varied with a slight whispered interlude occasionally about love and lovers had not heard the political news of the day that parliament had refused to listen to the working men when they petitioned with all the force of their rough untutored words to be heard concerning the distress which was riding like the conqueror on his pale horse among the people which was crushing their lives out of them and stamping woe marks over the land when he had eaten and was refreshed they sat for some time in silence for mary wished him to tell her what oppressed him so yet durst not ask in this she was wise for when we are heavy laden in our hearts it falls in better with our humour to reveal our case in our own way and our own time mary sat on a stool at her father's feet in old childish guise and stole her hand into his while his sadness infected her and she caught the trick of grief and sighed she knew not why mary we mun speak to our god to hear us for man will not hearken no not now when we weep tears of blood in an instant mary understood the fact if not the details that so weighed down her father's heart she pressed his hand with silent sympathy she did not know what to say and was so afraid of speaking wrongly that she was silent but when his attitude had remained unchanged for more than half an hour his eyes gazing vacantly and fixedly at the fire no sound but now and then a deep-drawn sigh to break the weary ticking of the clock and the drip drop from the roof without mary could bear it no longer anything to rouse her father even bad news father do you know george wilson's dead her hand was suddenly and almost violently compressed he dropped down dead in oxford road yester morning that's very sad isn't it father her tears were ready to flow as she looked up in her father's face for sympathy still the same fixed look of despair not varied by grief for the dead best for him to die he said in a low voice this was unbearable mary got up under pretence of going to tell margaret that she need not come to sleep with her to-night but really to ask job lee to come and cheer her father she stopped outside the door margaret was practising her singing and through the still night air her voice rang out like that of an angel comfort ye comfort ye my people saith your god the old hebrew prophetic words fell like dew on mary's heart she could not interrupt she stood listening and comforted till the little buzz of conversation began again and then entered and told her errand both grandfather and granddaughter rose instantly to fulfil her request he's just tired out mary said old job he'll be a different man to-morrow there is no describing the looks and tones that have power over an aching heavy-laden heart but in an hour or so john barton was talking away as freely as ever 
though all his talk ran, as was natural, on the disappointment of his fond hope, of the forlorn hope of many. "'Ay, London's a fine place,' said he, "'and finer folk live in it than I ever thought on, "'or ever heard tell on except in the story-books. "'They're having their good things now, "'that afterwards they may be tormented. "'Still, at the old parable of Dives and Lazarus, "'does it haunt the minds of the rich "'as it does those of the poor?' "'Do tell us all about London, dear father,' asked Mary, "'who was sitting at her old post by her father's knee. "'How can I tell you all about it, when I never seed one-tenth of it? "'It's as big as six Manchesters, they told me. "'One-sixth may be made up of grand palaces, three sixths of middling kind, "'and the rest a holes of iniquity and filth such as Manchester knows not on, I'm glad to say. "'Well, father, but did you see the Queen?' "'I believe I didn't, though one day I'd thought I'd seen her many a time. "'You see,' said he, turning to Job Lee, "'there were a day appointed for us to go to Parliament House. "'We were most on us biding at a public house in Holborn, "'where they did very well for us. "'The morning of taking our petition, "'we had such a spread for breakfast as the Queen herself might have sitting down to. "'I suppose they thought we wanted pudding in heart. "'There were mutton kidneys and sausages and broiled ham "'and fried beef and onions, more like a dinner nor a breakfast.' Many on our chaps, though I could see, could eat but little. The food stuck in their throats when they thought of them at home. Wives and little ones as had maybe at that very time not to eat. Well, after breakfast, we were all set to walk in procession, and a time it took to put us in order, two and two, and the petition, as was yards long, carried by the foremost pairs. The men looked grave enough, you may be sure, and such a set of thin, wan, wretched-looking chaps as they were. Yourself is none to boast on. "'Ay, but I were fat and rosy to many a one. "'Well, we walked on and on through many a street, "'much the same as Deansgate. "'We had to walk slowly, slowly, "'for the carriages and cabs as thronged the streets. "'I thought by and by we should maybe get clear on them, "'But as the streets grew wider, they grew worse, "'and at last we were fairly blocked up at Oxford Street. "'We getting across it after a while, though, "'and my eyes, the grand streets we were in then. "'They're sadly puzzled how to build houses, though, in London.' "'There'd be an opening for a good steady master builder there, as note as business. "'For you see the houses are many on em built without any proper shape for a body to live in. "'Some on em they've after thought would fall down, so they've stuck great ugly pillars out before them. "'And some on em we thought they must be the tailor's sign, "'had gotten stone men and women as wanted clothes stuck on them. "'I were like a child. I forgot of my errand in looking about me.' By this time, it were dinner-time, were better, as we could tell by the sun right above our heads, and we were dusty and tired, going a step now and a step then. Well, at last, we getting into a street, grander nor all, leading to the Queen's palace, and there it were, I thought, I saw the Queen. You've seen the hearses with white plumes, Job. Job assented. Well, them undertaker folk are driving a pretty trade in London. Well, nigh every lady we saw in a carriage had hired one of them plumes for the day, and had it niddle noddling on her head. It were the Queen's drawing-room, they said, and the carriages went bowling along towards her house, some with dressed-up gentlemen like circus folk in em, and ruxa ladies in others. Carriages themselves were great shakes, too. Some of the gentlemen, as couldn't get inside, hung on behind with nosegays to smell at, and sticks to keep off folk as might splash their silk stockings. I wonder why they didn't hire a cab rather than hang on like a whip behind boy, but I suppose they wished to keep with their wives, Darby and Joan like. Coachmen were little squat men with wigs like the old-fashioned parsons. Well, we could not get on for these carriages, though we waited and waited. The horses were too fat to move quick. They never known want of food, one might tell by their sleek coats, and police pushed us back when we tried to cross. One or two of them struck with their sticks, and coachmen laughed and some officers as stood nigh put their spy-glasses in their eye and left him sticking there like mountebanks. One of the police struck me. "'What in business have you to do that?' said I. "'You're frightening them horses,' says he, in his mincing way, for Londoners are mostly all tongue-tied and can't say their A's and I's properly. "'And it's our business to keep you from molesting the ladies and gentlemen going to Her Majesty's drawing-room.' "'And why are we to be molested?' asked I, going decently about our business, which is life and death to us, and many a little one clement at home in Lancashire. "'Which business is of most consequence in the sight of God, think you? "'How are of them grand ladies and gentlemen did you think so much on?' "'But I might as well have held my peace, for he only laughed. 
John ceased. After waiting a little, to see if he would go on himself, Job said, "'Well, but that's not all your story, man. Tell us what happened when you got to the Parliament House.' After a little pause, John answered, "'If you please, neighbor, I'd rather say naught about that. It's not to be forgotten or forgiven either, by me or many another. But I cannot tell of our downcasting just as a piece of London news. As long as I live, our rejection of that day will abide in my heart, and as long as I live I shall curse them as so cruelly refused to hear us. But I'll not speak of it no more.' So daunted in their inquiries, they sat silent for a few minutes. Old Job, however, felt that someone must speak, else all the good they had done in dispelling John Barton's gloom was lost. So after a while he thought of a subject, neither sufficiently dissonant from the last to jar on a full heart, nor too much the same to cherish the continuance of the gloomy train of thought. "'Did you ever hear tell,' said he to Mary, "'that I were in London once?' "'No,' said she with surprise, and looking at Job with increased respect." "'Ay, but I were, though, and Peg there, too, though she minds not about it, poor wench. "'You must know I had but one child, and she were Margaret's mother. "'I loved her above a bit, and one day she came, standing behind me, "'for that I should not see her blushes and stroking my cheeks in her own coaxing way, "'and told me she and Frank Jennings, as was a joiner lodging near us, "'should be so happy if they were married. "'I could not find in my heart to say her nay.' though I went sick at the thought of losing her away from my home. However, she was my only child, and I never said naught of what I felt, for fear of grieving her young heart. But I tried to think of the time when I'd been young myself, and had loved her blessed mother, and how we'd left father and mother, and gone out into the world together. And I'm now right thankful I held my peace, and did not fret with telling her how sore I was at parting with her that were the light of my eyes." But, said Mary, you said the man were a neighbor. Ay, so he were, and his father afore him. But work were rather slack in Manchester, and Frank's uncle sent him word of London work and London wages. So he were to go there, and it were there Margaret was to follow him. Well, my heart aches yet at thought of those days. She's so happy, and he's so happy. Only the poor father is fretted sadly behind their backs. They were married, and stayed some days with me afore setting off, and I've often thought since. Margaret's heart failed her many a time those few days, and she would fain have spoken. But I knew from myself it were better to keep it pent up, and I never let on what I were feeling. I knew what she meant when she came kissing and holding my hand, and all her old childish ways of loving me. Well, they went at last. You know them two letters, Margaret? Yes, sure, replied his granddaughter. Well, them, too, were the only letters I ever had from her, poor lass. She said in them she were very happy, and I believe she were. And Frank's family heard he were in good work. In one of her letters, poor thing, she ends with saying, Farewell, Grandad, with a line drawn under Grandad, and from that and other hints I knew she were in the family way. And I said not, but I screwed up a little money, thinking come Whitsuntide, I'd take a holiday and go and see her and the little one. But one day towards Whitsuntide, come Jennings with a grave face, and says he, I hear our Frank and your Margaret's both get in the fever. He might have knocked me down with a straw, for it seemed as if God told me what the upshot would be. Old Jennings had gotten a letter, you see, from the landlady they lodged with, a well-penned letter, asking if they'd no friends to come and nurse them. She'd caught it first, and Frank, who was as tender over her as her own mother could have been, had nursed her till he'd caught it himself, and she, expecting her down lying every day. Well, to make a long story short, old Jennings and I went up by that night's coach. So you see, Mary, that was the way I got to London. But how was your daughter when you got there? asked Mary anxiously. She were at rest, poor wench, and so were Frank. I guessed as much when I see the landlady's face all swelled with crying when she opened the door to us. We said, where are they? And I knew they were dead from her look. But Jennings didn't, as I take it. For when she showed us into a room with a white sheet on the bed, and underneath it, plain to be seen, two still figures, he screeched out as if he'd been a woman. Yet he'd other children, and I'd none. There lay my darling, my only one. She were dead. And there were no one to love me, no, not one. 
I just remember rightly what I did, but I know I were very quiet while my heart were crushed within me. Jennings could not stand being in the room at all, so the landlady took him down, and I were glad to be alone. It grew dark while I sat there, and at last the landlady came up again and said, Come here. So I got up and walked into the light, but I had to hold by the stair rails, I were so weak and dizzy. She led me into a room where Jennings lay on a sofa fast asleep with his pocket handkerchief over his head for a nightcap. She said he'd cried himself fairly off to sleep. There were tea on the table already, for she were a kind-hearted body. But she still said, Come here, and took hold of my arm. So I went round the table, and there were a clothes-basket by the fire with a shawl put over it. Lift that up, says she, and I did. And there lay a little wee babby fast asleep. My heart gave a leap, and the tears came rushing into my eyes first time that day. Is it hers, said I, though I knew it were. Yes, said she. She were getting a bit better of the fever, and the babby were born. And then the poor young man took worse and died, and she were not many hours behind. Little mite of a thing, and yet it seemed her angel come back to comfort me. I were quite jealous of Jennings whenever he went near the babby. I thought it were more my flesh and blood than his'n, and yet I were afraid he would claim it. However, that were far enough from his thoughts. He'd plenty other children, and as I found out after, he'd all along been wishing me to take it. Well, we buried Margaret and her husband in a big, crowded, lonely churchyard in London. I were loath to leave them there, as I thought. When they rose again, they'd feel so strange at first, away from Manchester and all old friends. But it could not be helped. Well, God watches over their graves there as well as here. That funeral cost a mint of money, but Jennings and I wished to do the thing decent. Then we'd the stout little babby to bring home. We'd not over much money left, but it were fine weather, and we thought we'd take the coach to Brummagem and walk on. It were a bright May morning when I last saw London town, looking back from a big hill a mile or two off. And in that big mass of a place, I were leaving my blessed child asleep in her last sleep. Well, God's will be done. She's gotten to heaven afore me, but I shall get there at last, please God, though it's a long while first. The babby had been fed afore we set out, and the coach moving kept it asleep, bless its little heart. But when the coach stopped for dinner, it were awake and crying for its bobbies. So we asked for some bread and milk, and Jennings took it first for to feed it. But it made its mouth like a square, and let it run out at each of the four corners. Shake it, Jennings, said I. That's the way they make water run through a funnel when it's over full, and a child's mouth is broad end of the funnel, and the gullet the narrow one. So he shook it, but it only cried the more. Let me have it, says I, thinking he were an awkward old chap. But it were just as bad with me. By shaking the babby we got better nor a gill into its mouth, but more nor that came up again, wetting all the nice dry clothes landlady had put on. Well, just as we'd get into the dinner-table and helped ourselves and eaten two mouthful, came in the guard, and a fine chap with a sample of calico flourishing in his hand. "'Coach is ready,' says one. "'Half a crown your dinner,' says the other. Well, we thought it a deal for both our dinners when we'd hardly tasted them, but, bless your life, it were half a crown apiece, and a shilling for the bread and milk as were posseted all over Babby's clothes. We spoke up again it, but everybody said it were the rule, so what could two poor old chaps like us do again it? Well, poor Babby cried without stopping to take a breath from that time till we got to Brummagem for the night. My heart ached for the little thing. It caught with its wee mouth at our coat sleeves and at our mouths when we tried to comfort it by talking to it. Poor little wench! It wanted its mammy, as we're lying cold in the grave. Well, says I, it'll be clung to death if it lets out supper as it did its dinner. Let's get some woman to feed it. It comes natural to women to do for babbies. So we asked the chambermaid at the inn, and she took quite kindly to it, and we got a good supper, and grew rare and sleepy what with the warmth and with our long ride in the open air. The chambermaid said she would like to have it to sleep with her, only Mrs. would scold so, but it looked so quiet and smiling-like as it lay in her arms that we thought t'would be no trouble to have it with us. I says, See, Jennings, how women folk do quiet in babbies. It's just as I said. He looked grave. He were always thoughtful-looking, though I never heard him say anything very deep. At last, says he, Young woman, have you gotten a spare nightcap? 
"'This is always keeps nightcaps for gentlemen as does not like to unpack,' says she, rather quick. "'Aye, but, young woman, it's one of your nightcaps I want. "'The babby seems to have taken a mind to you, "'and maybe in the dark it might take me for you if I'd get in your nightcap on.' "'The chambermaid smirked and went for a cap, "'but I laughed outright at the old bearded chap, "'thinking he'd make himself like a woman just by putting on a woman's cap. "'However, he'd not be laughed out on it, "'so I held the babby till he were in bed.' Such a night as we had on it. Babby began to scream of the old-fashioned, and we took it turn and turn about to sit up and rock it. My heart were very sore for the little one as it groped about with its mouth, but for all that I could scarce keep from smiling at the thought of us two old chaps, the one with a woman's nightcap on, sitting on our hinder ends for half the night, hush a a babby as wouldn't be hush Toward morning, poor little wench, it fell asleep, fairly tired out with crying. But even in its sleep it gave such pitiful sobs, quivering up from the very bottom of its little heart, that once or twice I almost wished it lay on its mother's breast at peace for ever. Mm. Jennings fell asleep too, but I began for to reckon up our money. It were little enough we had left. Our dinner the day afore had taken so much. I didn't know what our reckoning would be for that night lodging and supper and breakfast. Doing a sum always sent me asleep ever since I were a lad, so I fell sound in a short time, and were only awakened by a chambermaid tapping at the door, to say she dressed the babby before her missus were up if we liked. But, bless you, we never thought of undressing it the night afore, and now it were sleeping so sound, and we were so glad of the peace and quietness, that we thought it were no good to waken it up to screech again. Well, there's Mary asleep for a good listener. I suppose you're getting weary of my tale, so I'll not be long over ending it. The reckoning left us very bare, and we thought we'd best walk home, for it were only sixty mile, they told us, and not stop again for naught save victuals. So we left Brummagem, which is as black a place as Manchester without looking so like home, and walked all that day, carrying Babby turn and turn about. It were well fed by chambermaid afore we left and the day were fine, and folk began to have some knowledge of the proper way of speaking, and we were more cheery at thought of home, though mine, God knows, were lonesome enough. We stopped none for dinner, but at bagging time we get in a good meal at a public house, and fed the babby as well as we could, but that were but poorly. We got a crust, too, for it to suck. Chambermaid put us up to that. That night, whether we were tired or what, and I don't know, but it were dree work, and the poor little wench had slept out her sleep, and began the cry as wore my heart out again. Says Jennings, says he, We should not have set out so like gentlefolk atop of the coach yesterday. Nay, lad, we should have had more to walk if we had not ridden, and I'm sure both you and I so weary are tramping. So he were quiet a bit, but he were one of them as were sure to find out somewhat had been done amiss when there was no going back to undo it. So presently he coughs, as if he were going to speak, and I says to myself, "'At it again, my lad,' says he. "'I ask pardon, neighbour, but it strikes me it would have been better for my son if he had never begun to keep company with your daughter.' Well, that put me up, and my heart got very full, and but that I were carrying her babby, I think I should have struck him. At last I could hold in no longer, and says I, "'Better say at once it would have been better for God never to have made the world.' for then we'd never have been in it, to have had the heavy hearts we have now. Well, he said, that were a rank blasphemy, but I thought his way of casting up again the events God had pleased to send were worse blasphemy. However, I said not more angry for the little babby's sake, as were the child of his dead son as well as of my dead daughter. The longest lane will have a turning, and that night came to an end at last, and we were footsore and tired enough, and to my mind the babby were getting weaker and weaker, and it wrung my heart to hear its little wail. I'd have given my right hand for one of yesterday's hearty cries. We were wanting our breakfasts, and so it were too, motherless babby. We could see no public houses, so about six o'clock, only we thought it were later, we stopped at a cottage, where a woman were moving about near the open door. Says I, good woman, may we rest a bit? Come in, says she wiping a chair as looked bright enough afore with her apron. It were a cheery, clean room, and we were glad to sit down again, though I thought my legs would never bend at the knees. In a minute she fell in noticing the babby, and took it in her arms, and kissed it again and again. "'Missus,' says I, "'we're not without money, and if you'd give us somewhat for breakfast, we'd pay you honest. 
and if you would wash and dress that poor baby and get some poppies down its throat, for it's well nigh clemmed, I'd pray for you till my dying day. So she said not, but give me the baby back, and afore you could say Jack Robinson, she'd a pan on the fire and bread and cheese on the table. When she turned around, her face looked red, and her lips were tight-pressed together. Well, we were right down glad on our breakfast, and God bless and reward that woman for her kindness that day. She fed the poor baby as gently and softly, and spoke to it as tenderly as its own mother could have done. It seemed as if that stranger and it had known each other afore, maybe in heaven, where folk's spirits come from, they say. The baby looked up so lovingly in her eyes, and it made little noises more like a dove than aught else. Then she undressed it, poor darling, it were time, touching it so softly, and washed it from head to foot, and as many on its clothes were dirty, and what bits of things its mother had gotten all ready for it, had been sent by the carrier from London. She put him aside, and wrapping little naked babby in her apron, she pulled out a key, as were fastened to a black ribbon, and hung down her breast, and unlocked a drawer in the dresser. I were sorry to be prying, but I could not help seeing in that drawer some little child's clothes all strewed with lavender, and lying by him a little whip and a broken rattle. I began to have an insight into that woman's heart then. She took out a thing or two, and locked the drawer, and went on dressing Babby. Just about then come her husband down, a great big fellow as didn't look half awake, though it were getting late. But he'd heard all as had been said downstairs, as were plain to be seen, but he were a gruff chap. We'd finished our breakfast, and Jennings were looking hard at the woman, as she were getting the Babby to sleep with a sort of rocking way. At length, says he, I hain't learnt the way now. It's two jiggets and a shake, two jiggets and a shake. I can get that babby asleep now myself. The man had nodded cross enough to us, and had gone to the door and stood there, whistling with his hands in his breech pockets, looking abroad. But at last he turns and says quite sharp, I say, missus, I'm to have no breakfast to-day, I suppose. So with that she kissed the child a long, soft kiss, and looking in my face to see if I could take her meaning— gave me the babby without a word. I were loath to stir, but I saw it were better to go. So giving Jennings a sharp nudge, for he'd fallen asleep, I says, "'Missus, what's to pay?' pulling out my money with a jingle, that she might not guess we were at all bare a cash. So she looks at her husband, who said ne'er a word, but were listening with all his ears nevertheless, and when she saw he would not say, she said, hesitating, as if pulled two ways, by her fear of him, should you think sixpence over much? It were so different to public house reckoning, for we'd eaten a main deal afore the chap came down. So says I, and missus, what should we give you for the babby's bread and milk? I had it once in my mind to say, and for your trouble with it, but my heart would not let me say it, for I could read in her ways how it had been a work of love. So says she, quite quick, and stealing a look at her husband's back as looked all ear if ever a back did. Oh, we could take naught for the little babby's food if it had eaten twice as much, bless it. With that he looked at her, such a scowling look. She knew what he meant, and stepped softly across the floor to him, and put her hand on his arm. He seemed as though he'd shake it off by a jerk on his elbow, but she said, quite low, For poor little Johnny's sake, Richard. He did not move or speak again, and after looking in his face for a minute she turned away, swallowing deep in her throat. She kissed the sleeping baby as she passed when I paid her. To quieten the gruff husband and stop him if he raided her, I could not help slipping another sixpence under the loaf, and then we set off again. Last look I had of that woman, she were quietly wiping her eyes with the corner of her apron as she went about her husband's breakfast. But I shall know her in heaven. He stopped to think of that long ago May morning, when he had carried his granddaughter under the distant hedgerows, and beneath the flowering sycamores— "'There's not more to say, wench,' said he to Margaret, as she begged him to go on. "'That night we reached Manchester, and I'd found out that Jennings would be glad enough to give up Babby to me. "'So I took her home at once, and a blessing she's been to me.' "'They were all silent for a few minutes, each following out the current of their thoughts. "'Then, almost simultaneously, their attention fell upon Mary, sitting on her little stool, her head resting on her father's knee, and sleeping as soundly as any infant, her breath still like an infant's, 
came and went as softly as a bird steals to her leafy nest. Her half-open mouth was as scarlet as the winter berries, and contrasted finely with the clear paleness of her complexion, where the eloquent blood flushed carnation at each motion. Her black eyelashes lay on the delicate cheek, which was still more shaded by the masses of her golden hair that seemed to form a nest-like pillar for her as she lay. Her father, in fond pride, straightened one glossy curl for an instant, as if to display its length and silkiness. The little action awoke her, and like nine out of ten people in similar circumstances, she exclaimed, opening her eyes to their fullest extent, "'I'm not asleep. I've been awake all the time.' Even her father could not keep from smiling, and Job Lee and Margaret laughed outright. "'Come, wench,' said Job, "'don't look so gloppin' because thou'st fallen asleep while an old chap like me was talking on old times. It were like enough to send thee to sleep. Try if thou canst keep thine eyes open while I read thy father a bit on a poem as is written by a weaver like ourselves. A rare chap I'll be bound as he who could weave verse like this.' So adjusting his spectacles on his nose— cocking his chin, crossing his legs, and coughing to clear his voice, he read aloud a little poem of Samuel Bramford's he had picked up somewhere. God help the poor who on this wintry morn come forth from alleys dim and courts obscure. God help yon poor pale girl who drops forlorn, and meekly her affliction doth endure. God help her outcast lamb, she trembling stands, all wan her lips and frozen red her hands. Her sunken eyes are modestly downcast. Her night-black hair streams on the fitful blast. Her bosom, passing fair, is half revealed. And, oh, so cold the snow lies there congealed. Her feet benumbed, her shoes all rent and worn. God help the outcast lamb who stands forlorn. God help the poor. God help the poor, an infant's feeble wail, comes from yon narrow gateway, and behold— a female, crouching there so deathly pale, huddling her child to screen it from the cold, her vesture scant, her bonnet crushed and torn. A thin shawl doth her baby dear enfold, and so she bides the ruthless gale of morn, which almost to her heart hath sent its cold. And now she sudden darts a ravening look, as one with new hot bread goes past the nook. And as the tempting load is onward borne, she weeps. God help thee, helpless one, forlorn. God help the poor. God help the poor. Behold yon famished lad. No shoes nor hose his wounded feet protect. With limping gait and looks so dreamy sad, he wanders onward, stopping to inspect each window stored with articles of food. He yearns but to enjoy one cheering meal. Oh, to the hungry palate vines rude would yield a zest the famished only feel. He now devours a crust of mouldy bread. With teeth and hands the precious boon is torn. Unmindful of the storm that round his head impetuous sweeps. God help thee, child forlorn. God help the poor. God help the poor. Another have I found. A bowed and venerable man is he. His slouched hat with faded crepe is bound. His coat is gray and threadbare, too, I see. The rude wind seems to mock his hoary hair. His shirtless bosom to the blast is bare, and he turns and casts a wistful eye, and with scant napkin wipes the blinding spray, and looks around as if he fain would spy. Friends he had feasted in his better day. Ah, some are dead, and some have long forborne to know the poor, and he is left forlorn. God help the poor." God help the poor who in lone valleys dwell, or by far hills where wind and heather grow. Theirs is a story sad indeed to tell, yet little cares the world and less t'would know about the toil and want men undergo. The wearying loom doth call them up at morn. They work till worn-out nature sinks to sleep. They taste, but are not fed. The snow drifts deep around the fireless cot and blocks the door. The night-storm howls a dirge across the moor. And shall they perish thus, oppressed and lorn? Shall toil and famine hopeless still be born? No. God will yet arise and help the poor. Amen, said Barton, solemnly and sorrowfully. Mary, wench, could thou copy me them lines, dost think? 
That's to say, if Job there has no objection. Not I. More they're heard and read in the better, say I. So Mary took the paper, and the next day, on a blank half-sheet of a valentine, all bordered with hearts and darts, a valentine she had once suspected to come from Jem Wilson, she copied Bamford's beautiful little poem. End of chapter 9「Ten, Return of the Prodigal My heart once soft as woman's tear is gnarled with gloating on the ills I cannot cure. Eliot Then guard and shield her innocence. Let her not fall like me. T'were better, oh, a thousand times she in her grave should be. The Outcast Despair settled down like a heavy cloud, and now and then— through the dead calm of sufferings came pipings of stormy winds, foretelling the end of these dark prognostics. In times of sorrowful or fierce endurance, we are often soothed by the mere repetition of old proverbs, which tell the experience of our forefathers. But now, it's a long lane that has no turning. The weariest day draws to an end, etc., seemed false and vain sayings. So long and so weary was the pressure of terrible times." Deeper and deeper still sank the poor. It showed how much lingering suffering it takes to kill men, that so few in comparison die during those times. But remember, we only miss those who do men's work in their humble sphere, the aged, the feeble, the children, when they die, are hardly noticed by the world. And yet, to many hearts, their deaths make a blank which long years will never fill up. Remember, too, that though it may take much suffering to kill the able-bodied and effective members of society, it does not take much to reduce them to worn, listless, diseased creatures, who thenceforward crawl through life with moody hearts and pain-stricken bodies. The people had thought the poverty of the preceding years hard to bear, and found its yoke heavy, but this year added sorely to its weight. Former times had chastised them with whips, but this chastised them with scorpions. Of course Barton had his share of mere bodily sufferings. Before he had gone up to London on his vain errand, he had been working short time. But in the hopes of speedy redress by means of the interference of Parliament, he had thrown up his place, and now, when he asked leave to resume his work, he was told they were diminishing their number of hands every week and he was made aware by the remarks of fellow workmen that a Chartist delegate and a leading member of a trades union was not likely to be favoured in his search after employment. Still he tried to keep up a brave heart concerning himself. He knew he could bear hunger, for that power of endurance had been called forth when he was a little child, and had seen his mother hide her daily morsel, to share it among her children, and when he, being the eldest, had told the noble lie that he was not hungry— could not eat a bit more, in order to imitate his mother's bravery, and still the sharp wail of the younger infants. Mary, too, was secure of two meals a day at Miss Simmons, though, by the way, the dressmaker, too, feeling the effect of bad times, had left off giving tea to her apprentices, setting them the example of long abstinence by putting off her own meal till work was done for the night, however late that might be. But the rent— it was half a crown a week, nearly all Mary's earnings, and much less room might do for them, only two. Now came the time to be thankful that the early dead were saved from the evil to come. The agricultural laborer generally has strong local attachments, but they are far less common, almost obliterated among the inhabitants of a town. Still there are exceptions, and Barton formed one. He had removed to his present house, just after the last bad times, when little Tom had sickened and died. He had then thought the bustle of a removal would give his poor, stunned wife something to do, and he had taken more interest in the details of the proceeding than he otherwise would have done, in the hope of calling her forth to action again. So he seemed to know every brass-headed nail driven up for her convenience. Only one had been displaced. It was Esther's bonnet-nail, which, in his deep, revengeful anger against her, after his wife's death, he had torn out of the wall and cast into the street. It would be hard work to leave the house, which yet seemed hallowed by his wife's presence in the happy days of old. 
but he was a law unto himself, though sometimes a bad, fierce law, and he resolved to give the rent-collector notice, and look out for a cheaper abode, and tell Mary they must flit. Poor Mary! She loved the house, too. It was wrenching up her natural feelings of home, for it would be long before the fibres of her heart would gather themselves about another place. This trial was spared. The collector, of himself, on the very Monday when Barton planned to give him notice of his intention to leave, lowered the rent three pence a week, just enough to make Barton compromise, and agree to stay on a little longer. But by degrees the house was stripped of all its little ornaments. Some were broken, and the odd two-pences and three-pences wanted to pay for their repairs were required for the far sterner necessity of food. And by and by Mary began to part with the other superfluities at the pawn-shop. The smart tea-tray and tea-caddy, long and carefully kept, went for bread for her father. He did not ask for it or complain, but she saw hunger in his shrunk, fierce, animal look. Then the blankets went, for it was summer-time and they could spare them, and their sale made a fund which Mary fancied would last till better times came. But it was soon all gone, and then she looked around the room to crib it of its few remaining ornaments. To all these proceedings her father never said a word. If he fasted or feasted after the sale of some article, on an unusual meal of bread and cheese, he took all with a sullen indifference, which depressed Mary's heart. She often wished he would apply for relief from the guardian's relieving office, often wondered the trades union did nothing for him. Once when she asked him as he sat, grimed, unshaven, and gaunt, after a day's fasting, over the fire, why he did not get relief from the town, he turned around, with grim wrath, and said, "'I don't want money, child. Damn their charity and their money. I want work, and it is my right. I want work.' He would bear it all, he said to himself, and he did bear it, but not meekly. That was too much to expect. Real meekness of character is called out by experience of kindness, and few had been kind to him. Yet through it all, with stern determination, he refused the assistance his trades union would have given him. It had not much to give, but with worldly wisdom thought it better to propitiate an active, useful member than to help those who were more unenergetic, though they had large families to provide for. Not so, thought John Barton. With him need was right. Give it to Tom Darbyshire, he said. He's more claim on it than me, for he's more need of it, with his seven children. Now Tom Darbyshire was, in his listless, grumbling way, a backbiting enemy of John Barton's, and he knew it, but he was not to be influenced by that in a matter like this. Mary went early to her work, but her cheery laugh over it was now missed by the other girls. Her mind wandered over the present distress, and then settled, as she stitched, on the visions of the future, where yet her thoughts dwelt more on the circumstances of ease and the pomps and vanities awaiting her than on the lover with whom she was to share them. Still she was not insensible to the pride of having attracted one so far above herself in station, not insensible to the secret pleasure of knowing that he, whom so many admired, had often said he would give anything for one of her sweet smiles. Her love for him was a bubble, blown out of vanity, but it looked very real and very bright. Sally Ledbetter, meanwhile, keenly observed the signs of the times. She found out that Mary had begun to affix a stern value to money as the purchaser of life, and many girls had been dazzled and lured by gold, even without the betraying love which she believed to exist in Mary's heart. So she urged young Mr. Carson, by representations of the want she was sure surrounded Mary, to bring matters more to a point. But he had a kind of instinctive dread of hurting Mary's pride of spirit, and durst not hint his knowledge in any way of the distress that many must be enduring. He felt that, for the present, he must still be content with stolen meetings and summer evening strolls, and the delight of pouring sweet, honeyed words into her ears while she listened, with a blush and a smile that made her look radiant with beauty. No, he would be cautious, in order to be certain, for Mary— one way or another, he must make his. He had no doubt of the effect of his own personal charms in the long run, for he knew he was handsome, and believed himself fascinating. If he had known what Mary's home was, he would not have been so much convinced of his increasing influence over her by her being more and more ready to linger with him in the sweet summer air, 
for when she returned for the night her father was often out, and the house wanted the cheerful look it had had in the days when money was never wanted to purchase soap and brushes, black lead and pipe clay. It was dingy and comfortless, for of course there was not even the dumb familiar home friend, a fire. And Margaret, too, was now very often from home, singing at some of those grand places. And Alice, oh, Mary wished she had never left her cellar to go and live at Ancoats with her sister-in-law. For in that matter Mary felt very guilty. She had put off and put off going to see the widow after George Wilson's death, from dread of meeting Jem, or giving him reason to think she wished to be as intimate with him as formerly. And now she was so much ashamed of her delay that she was likely never to go at all. If her father was at home it was no better, indeed it was worse. He seldom spoke, less than ever, and often when he did speak they were sharp, angry words, such as he had never given her formerly. Her temper was high too, and her answers not over-mild, and once in his passion he had even beaten her. If Sally Ledbitter or Mr. Carson had been at hand at that moment, Mary would have been ready to leave her home for ever. She sat alone after her father had flung out of the house, bitterly thinking on the days that were gone, angry with her own hastiness, and believing that her father did not love her, striving to heap up one painful thought on another. Who cared for her? Mr. Carson might. But in this grief that seemed no comfort. Mother dead, father so often angry, so lately cruel, for it was a hard blow, and blistered and reddened Mary's soft white skin with pain. And then her heart turned round, and she remembered with self-reproach how provokingly she had looked and spoken, and how much her father had to bear, and, oh, what a kind and loving parent he had been till these days of trial. The remembrance of one little instance of his fatherly love thronged after another into her mind, and she began to wonder how she could have behaved to him as she had done. Then he came home, and but for very shame she would have confessed her penitence in words— but she looked sullen, from her effort to keep down emotion, and for some time her father did not know how to begin to speak. At length he gulped down his pride and said, "'Mary, I'm not above saying I'm very sorry I beat thee. Thou wert a bit aggravating, and I'm not the man I was. But it were wrong, and I'll try never to lay hands on thee again.' So he held out his arms, and in many tears she told him her repentance for her fault. He never struck her again." Still he often was angry, but that was almost better than being silent. Then he sat near the fireplace, from habit smoking or chewing opium. Oh, how Mary loathed that smell! And in the dusk, just before it merged into the short summer night, she had learned to look with dread towards the window, which now her father would have kept uncurtained, for there were not seldom seen sights which haunted her in her dreams— Strange faces of pale men with dark, glaring eyes peered into the inner darkness, and seemed desirous to ascertain if her father was home. Or a hand and arm, the body hidden, was put within the door and beckoned him away. He always went, and once or twice, when Mary was in bed, she heard men's voices below, in earnest, whispered talk. They were all desperate members of trades unions, ready for anything, made ready by want. While all this change for gloom yet struck fresh and heavy on Mary's heart, her father startled her out of a reverie one evening by asking her when she had been to see Jane Wilson. From his manner of speaking she was made aware that he had been, but at the time of his visit he had never mentioned anything about it. Now, however, he gruffly told her to go next day without fail, and added some abuse of her for not having been before. The little outward impulse of her father's speech gave Mary the push, which she in this instance required, and accordingly, timing her visit so as to avoid Jem's hours at home, she went the following afternoon to Ancoats. The outside of the well-known house struck her as different, for the door was closed instead of open as it once had always stood. The window-plants, George Wilson's pride and especial care, looked withering and drooping, they had been without water for a long time, and now, when the widow had reproached herself severely for neglect, in her ignorant anxiety she gave them too much. On opening the door Alice was seen, not stirring about in her habitual way, but knitting by the fireside. The room felt hot, although the fire burnt grey and dim under the bright rays of the afternoon sun. 
Mrs. Wilson was siding the dinner things, and talking all the time in a kind of whining, shouting voice which Mary did not at first understand. She understood at once, however, that her absence had been noted and talked over. She saw a constrained look on Mrs. Wilson's sorrow-stricken face, which told her a scolding was to come. "'Dear Mary, is that you?' she began. "'Why, who would have dreamt of seeing you? We thought you'd clean forgotten us, and Jem has often wondered if he should know you if he met you in the street. Now poor Jane Wilson had been sorely tried, and at present her trials had had no outward effect but that of increased acerbity of temper. She wished to show Mary how much she was offended, and meant to strengthen her cause by putting some of her own sharp speeches into Jem's mouth.' Mary felt guilty and had no good reason to give as an apology, so for a minute she stood silent, looking very much ashamed, and then turned to speak to Aunt Alice, who in her surprised hearty greeting to Mary had dropped her ball of worsted, and was busy trying to set the thread to rights before the kitten had entangled it past redemption, once round every chair and twice round the table. "'You must speak louder than that if you mean her to hear.' She's become deaf as a post this last few weeks. I'd a told you, if I'd remember how long it were since you'd seen her. Yes, my dear, I'm getting very hard of hearing of late, said Alice, catching the state of the case with her quick glancing eyes. I suppose it's the beginning of the end. Don't talk of that way, screamed her sister-in-law. We've had enough of ends and deaths without forecasting more. She covered her face with her apron and sat down to cry. He was such a good husband, said she in a less excited tone to Mary, as she looked up with tear-streaming eyes from behind her apron. "'No one can tell what I've lost in him, for no one knew his worth like me.' Mary's listening sympathy softened her, and she went on to unburden her heavy-laden heart. "'Ah, oh, dear, dear, no one knows what I've lost. When my poor boys went, I thought the Almighty had crushed me to the ground, but I never thought of losing George. I did not think I could have borne to have lived without him, and yet I'm here.' and he's—' A fresh burst of crying interrupted her speech. Mary, beginning to speak again, did you ever hear what a poor creature I were when he married me? And he's such a handsome fellow. Jem's nothing to what his father were at his age. Yes, Mary had heard, and so she said. But the poor woman's thoughts had gone back to those days, and her little recollections came out, with many interruptions of sighs and tears and shakes of the head. There were not about me for him to choose me. I were just well enough afore the accident. But at after I were downright plain. And there was Bessie Witter, as would have given her eyes for him. She is as Mrs. Carson now, for she were a handsome lass, although I never could see her beauty then, and Carson weren't so much above her, as they're both above us all now. Mary went very red and wished she could help doing so, and wished also that Mrs. Wilson would tell her more about the father and mother of her lover, but she durst not ask, and Mrs. Wilson's thoughts soon returned to her husband and their early married days. "'If you'll believe me, Mary, there never was such a born goose at housekeeping as I were, and yet he married me. I had been in factories since five years old, almost, and I knew not about cleaning or cooking, let alone washing and such like work.' The day after we were married, he went to his work at after breakfast, and says he, "'Jenny, we'll have the cold beef and potatoes, and that's a dinner for a prince.' I were anxious to make him comfortable. God knows how anxious. And yet I'd no notion how to cook a potato. I knowed they were boiled, and knowed their skins were taken off, and that were all. So I tidied my house in a rough kind of way. Then I looked at the very clock up yonder, pointing at one that hung against the wall, and I seed it were nine o'clock, so thinks I— the potatoes shall be well boiled at any rate, and I gets em on the fire in a jiffy. That's to say, as soon as I could peel em, which were a tough job at first. And then I fell to unpacking my boxes. And at twenty minutes past twelve he comes home, and I had the beef ready on the table, and I went to take the potatoes out of the pot. But, oh, Mary, the water had boiled away, and they were all in nasty brown messes smelt through all the house. He said not, and were very gentle. But, oh, Mary, I cried so that afternoon. I shall never forget it. No, never. I made many a blunder at after, but none that fretted me like that. Father does not like girls to work in factories, said Mary. No, I know he does not, and reason good. They oughtn't to go it after they're married. That I'm very clear about. I could reckon up, counting on her fingers. Aye, 
Nine men I know has been driven to the public house by having wives as worked in factories. Good folk, too, as thought there was no harm in putting their little ones out to nurse, and letting their house go all dirty and their fires all out. And that was a place as was tempting for a husband to stay in, was it? He soon finds out gin shops, where all is clean and bright, and where the fires blaze cheerily and gives a man a welcome, as it were. Alice, who was standing near for the convenience of hearing, had caught much of this speech, and it was evident the subject had previously been discussed by the women, for she chimed in. "'I wish our Jem could speak a word to the Queen about factory work for married women. Eh, but he comes it strong when once you get him to speak about it. Wife of his'n will never work away from home. I say it's Prince Albert as ought to be asked how he'd like his missus to be from home when he comes in, tired and worn, wanting someone to cheer him, and maybe her to come in by and by, just as tired and down in the mouth, and how he'd like for her never to be at home, to see to the cleaning of his house, or to keep a bright fire in his grate, let alone his meals being all hugger-mugger and comfortless. I'd be bound, Prince as he is, if his missus served him so, he'd be off to a gin palace or summat of that kind. So why can't he make a law against poor folks' wives working in factories? Mary ventured to say that she thought the Queen and Prince Albert could not make laws. But the answer was, Pooh! Don't tell me it's not the Queen as makes laws, and isn't she bound to obey Prince Albert? And if he said they mustn't, why, she'd say they mustn't. And then all folk would say, Oh, no, we never shall do any such thing no more. Jem's getting on rarely, said Alice who had not heard her sister's last burst of eloquence, and whose thoughts were still running on her nephew and his various talents. "'He's found out somewhat about crank or tank. I forget rightly which it is. But the master's made him foreman, and he all the while turning off hands. But he said he could not part with Jim no how. He's good wage now. I tell him he'll be thinking of marrying soon, and he deserves a right-down good wife, that he does.' Mary went very red, and looked annoyed, although there was a secret spring of joy deep down in her heart at hearing Jem so spoken of. But his mother only saw the annoyed look, and was piqued accordingly. She was not over and above desirous that her son should marry. His presence in the house seemed a relic of happier times, and she had some little jealousy of his future wife, whoever she might be. Still, she could not bear any one not to feel gratified and flattered by Jem's preference, and full well she knew— how above all others he preferred Mary. Now she had never thought Mary good enough for Jem, and her late neglect in coming to see her still rankled a little in her breast. So she determined to invent a little, in order to do away with any idea Mary might have, that Jem would choose her for his right-down good wife, as Aunt Alice called it. Ay, he'll be for taking a wife soon, and then, in a lower voice, as if confidentially, but really to prevent any contradiction or explanation from her simple sister-in-law, she added, "'It'll not be long afore Molly Gibson, that's her at the provision shop around the corner, will hear a secret as will not displease her, I'm thinking. She's been casting sheep's eyes at our gem this many a day, but he thought her father would not give her to a common working man. But now he's good as her every bit. I thought once he'd a fancy for thee, Mary, but I do not think you'd ever suit it, so it's best as it is.' By an effort Mary managed to keep down her vexation, and to say, she hoped he'd be happy with Molly Gibson. She was very handsome, for certain. I in a notable body, too. I'll just step upstairs and show you the patchwork quilt she gave me but last Saturday. Mary was glad she was going out of the room. Her words irritated her. Perhaps not the less because she did not fully believe them. Besides, she wanted to speak to Alice, and Mrs. Wilson seemed to think that she, as the widow, ought to absorb all the attention. "'Dear Alice,' began Mary, "'I'm so grieved to find you so deaf. It must have come on very rapid.' "'Yes, dear, it's a trial. I'll not deny it. Pray God give me strength to find out its teaching. I felt it sore one fine day when I thought I'd go gather some meadow-sweet to make tea for Jane's cough, and the field seemed so dree and still, and at first could not make out what was wanting, and then it struck me, it were the song of the birds, and that I never should hear their sweet music no more, and I could not help crying a bit. But I have much to be thankful for. I think I'm a comfort to Jane, if I'm only someone to scold now and then, poor body. It takes off her thoughts from her sore losses when she can scold a bit. If my eyes are left, I can do well enough. I can guess at what folks are saying." The splendid red and yellow patch quilt now made its appearance, 
and Jane Wilson would not be satisfied unless Mary praised it all over, border, centre, and groundwork, right side and wrong, and Mary did her duty, saying all the more, because she could not work herself up at the very hearty admiration of her rival's present. She made haste, however, with her commendations, in order to avoid encountering Jem. As soon as she was fairly away from the house and street, she slackened her pace and began to think. Did Jem really care for Molly Gibson? Well, if he did, let him. People seemed all to think he was much too good for her, Mary's own self. Perhaps someone else, far more handsome and far more grand, would show him one day that she was good enough to be Mrs. Henry Carson. So temper, or what Mary called spirit, led her to encourage Mr. Carson more than ever she had done before. Some weeks after this there was a meeting of the trades union to which John Barton belonged. The morning of the day on which it was to take place he had lain late in bed, for what was the use of getting up? He had hesitated between the purchase of meal or opium, and had chosen the latter for its use had become a necessity with him. He wanted it to relieve him from the terrible depression its absence occasioned. A large lump seemed only to bring him into a natural state, or what had been his natural state formerly. Eight o'clock was the hour fixed for the meeting, and at it were read letters, filled with details of woe from all parts of the country. Fierce, heavy gloom brooded over the assembly, and fiercely and heavily did the men separate towards eleven o'clock some irritated by the opposition of others to their desperate plans. It was not a night to cheer them, as they quitted the glare of the gas-lighted room and came out into the street. Unceasing, soaking rain was falling, the very lamps seemed obscured by the damp upon the glass, and their light reached but to a little distance from the posts. The streets were cleared of passers-by, not a creature seemed stirring except here and there a drenched policeman in his oilskin cape. Barton wished the others good night, and set off home. He had gone through a street or two when he heard a step behind him, but he did not care to stop and see who it was. A little further the person quickened step, and touched his arm very lightly. He turned and saw, even by the darkness visible of that badly lighted street, that the woman who stood by him was of no doubtful profession. It was told by her faded finery, all unfit to meet the pelting of that pitiless storm, the gauze bonnet once pink, now dirty white, the muslin gown, all draggled and soaking wet up to the very knees, the gay-coloured barege shawl, closely wrapped round the form, which yet shivered and shook as the woman whispered, "'I want to speak with you.' He swore an oath and bade her be gone. "'I really do. Don't send me away. I'm so out of breath I cannot say all I would at once.' She put her hand to her side and caught her breath with evident pain. "'I tell thee I'm not the man for thee.' adding an opprobrious name. "'Stay,' said he, as the thought suggested by her voice flashed across him. He gripped her arm, the arm he had just before shaken off, and dragged her, faintly resisting, to the nearest lamp-post. He pushed the bonnet back and roughly held the face she would fain have averted to the light, and in her large, unnaturally bright grey eyes, her lovely mouth half open, as if imploring the forbearance she could not ask for in words, he saw at once the long-lost Esther, she who had caused his wife's death. Much was like the gay creature of former years, but the glaring paint, the sharp features, the changed expression of the whole. But most of all he loathed the dress, and yet the poor thing, out of her little choice of attire, had put on the plainest she had to come on that night's errand. "'So it's thee, is it? It's thee!' exclaimed John, as he ground his teeth and shook her with passion. I've looked for thee long at corners of streets and such like places. I knew I should find thee at last. Thee will maybe bethink thee of some words I spoke, which put thee up at the time of somewhat about street-walkers. But, oh, no, thou art none of them knots. No one thinks thou art who sees thy fine draggle-tailed dress and thy pretty pink cheeks, stopping for very want of breath. Oh, mercy, John, mercy, listen to me, for Mary's sake. She meant his daughter but the name only fell on his ear as belonging to his wife, and it was adding fuel to the fire. In vain did her face grow deadly pale around the vivid circle of paint. In vain did she gasp for mercy. He burst forth again. "'And thou names that name to me? And thou thinkst the thought of her will bring thee mercy? Dost thou know it was thee who killed her, as sure as ever Cain killed Abel? She'd loved thee as her own, and she'd trusted thee as her own.' And when thou wert gone, she never held head up again, but died in less than a three-week. 
and at her judgment day she'll rise and point to thee as her murderer, or if she don't, I will. He flung her, trembling, sinking, fainting from him, and strode away. She fell with a feeble scream against the lamp-post, and lay there in her weakness, unable to rise. A policeman came up in time to see the close of these occurrences, and concluding from Esther's unsteady, reeling fall that she was tipsy, he took her in half-unconscious state to the lock-ups for the night. The superintendent of that abode of vice and misery was roused from his dozing watch through the dark hours by half-delirious wails and moanings, which he reported as arising from intoxication. If he had listened, he would have heard these words repeated in various forms, but always in the same anxious, muttering way. He would not listen to me, what can I do? He would not listen to me, and I wanted to warn him. Oh, what shall I do to save Mary's child? What shall I do? How can I keep her from being such a one as I am, such a wretched, loathsome creature? She was listening just as I listened, and loving just as I loved, and the end will be just like my end. How shall I save her? She won't hearken to warning, or heed it more than I did, and who loves her well enough to watch over her as she should be watched? God keep her from harm, and yet I won't pray for her sinner that I am. Can my prayers be heard? No, they'll only do harm. How shall I save her? He would not listen to me. So the night wore away. The next morning she was taken up to the new bailey. It was a clear case of disorderly vagrancy, and she was committed to prison for a month. How much might happen in that time? End of chapter 10, Return of the Prodigal This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11. Mr. Carson's Intentions Revealed O oh Mary, canst thou wreck his peace, what for thy sake would gladly die? Or canst thou break that heart of his, whose only fault is loving thee? Burns I can like of the wealth, I must confess. Yet more I prize the man, though moneyless. I am not of their humour yet, that can for title or estate affect a man or of myself one body deign to make with him i loathe for his possession's sake withers fidelia barton returned home after his encounter with esther uneasy and dissatisfied he had said no more than he had been planning to say for years in case she was ever thrown in his way in the character in which he felt certain he should meet her he believed she deserved it all and yet he now wished he had not said it her look, as she asked for mercy, haunted him through his broken and disordered sleep. Her form, as he last saw her, lying prostrate in helplessness, would not be banished from his dreams. He sat up in bed to try and dispel the vision. Now, too late, his conscience smote him with harshness. It would have been all very well, he thought, to have said what he did if he had added some kind words at last. He wondered if his dead wife was conscious of that night's occurrence, and he hoped not— for with her love of Esther he believed it would embitter heaven to have seen her so degraded and repulsed. For he now recalled her humility, her tacit acknowledgment of her lost character, and he began to marvel if there was power in the religion he had often heard of to turn her from her ways. He felt that no earthly power that he knew of could do it, but there glimmered on his darkness the idea that religion might save her. Still, where to find her again? in the wilderness of a large town, where to meet with an individual of so little value or note to any. And evening after evening he paced the same streets in which he had heard those footsteps following him, peering under every fantastic, discreditable bonnet, in the hopes of once more meeting Esther, and addressing her in a far different manner from what he had done before. But he returned, night after night, disappointed in his search, and at last gave it up in despair, and tried to recall his angry feelings toward her, in order to find relief from his present self-reproach. He often looked at Mary, and wished she were not so like her aunt, for the very bodily likeness seemed to suggest the possibility of a similar likeness in their fate. And then this idea enraged his irritable mind, and he became suspicious and anxious about Mary's conduct. Now hitherto she had been so remarkably free from all control, and almost from all inquiry concerning her actions, 
that she did not brook this change in her father's behavior very well. Just when she was yielding more than ever to Mr. Carson's desire of frequent meetings, it was hard to be so questioned concerning her hours of leaving off work, whether she had come straight home, etc. She could not tell lies, though she could conceal much if she were not questioned. So she took refuge in obstinate silence, alleging as a reason for it her indignation at being so cross-examined. This did not add to the good feeling between father and daughter, and yet they dearly loved each other, and in the minds of each one principal reason for maintaining such behavior as displeased the other was believing that this conduct would ensure that person's happiness. Her father now began to wish Mary was married. Then this terrible superstitious fear suggested by her likeness to Esther would be done away with. He felt that he could not resume the reins he had once slackened, but with a husband it would be different. If Jem Wilson would marry her, with his character for steadiness and talent? But he was afraid Mary had slighted him. He came so seldom now to the house. He would ask her, "'Mary, what's come over thee and Jem Wilson? You were great friends at one time.' Oh, folks say he's going to be married to Molly Gibson. Of course, courting takes up a deal of time, answered Mary, as indifferently as she could. Thou's played thy cards badly, then, replied her father in a surly tone. At one time he were desperate fond of thee, or I'm much mistaken. Much fonder of thee than thou deservest. That's as people think, said Mary pertly, for she remembered that the very morning before she had met Mr. Carson, who had sighed, and swore, and protested all manner of tender vows that she was the loveliest, sweetest, best, etc. And when she had seen him afterwards riding with one of his beautiful sisters, had he not evidently pointed her out, as in some way or other an object worthy of attention and interest, and then lingered behind his sister's horse for a moment to kiss his hand repeatedly? So as for Jem Wilson, she could whistle him down the wind." But her father was not in the mood to put up with pertness, and he upbraided her with the loss of Jem Wilson till she had to bite her lips till the blood came, in order to keep down the angry words that would rise in her heart. At last her father left the house, and then she might give way to her passionate tears. It so happened that Jem, after much anxious thought, had determined that day to put his fortune to the touch to win or lose all. He was in a condition to maintain a wife in comfort. It was true his mother and aunt must form part of the household, but such is not an uncommon case among the poor, and if there were the advantages of previous friendship between the parties, it was not, he thought, an obstacle to matrimony. Both mother and aunt, he believed, would welcome Mary, and, oh, what a certainty of happiness the idea that welcome implied! He had been absent and abstracted all day long with the thought of the coming event of the evening. He almost smiled at himself for his care in washing and dressing in preparation for his visit to Mary, as if one waistcoat or another could decide his fate in so passionately a momentous thing. He believed he only delayed before his little looking-glass for cowardice, for absolute fear of a girl. He would try not to think so much about the affair, and he thought the more. "'Poor Jem, it is not an auspicious moment for thee.' "'Come in,' said Mary, as someone knocked at the door while she sat sadly at her sewing, trying to earn a few pence by working over hours at some morning. Jem entered, looking more awkward and abashed than he had ever done before. Yet here was Mary all alone, just as he had hoped to find her. She did not ask him to take a chair, but after standing a minute or two he sat down near her. "'Is your father home, Mary?' said he, by way of making an opening— for she seemed determined to keep silence, and went on stitching away. "'No, he's gone to his union, I suppose.' Another silence. It was no use waiting, thought Jem. The subject would never be led to by any talk he could think of in his anxious, fluttered state. He had better begin at once. "'Mary,' said he, and the unusual tone of his voice made her look up for an instant. But in that same time she understood from his countenance what was coming— and her heart beat so suddenly and violently that she could hardly sit still. Yet one thing she was sure of, nothing he could say should make her have him. She would show them all who would be glad to have her. She was not yet calm after her father's irritating speeches, yet her eyes fell veiled before that passionate look fixed upon her. Dear Mary, for how dear you are I cannot rightly tell you in words. It's no new story I'm going to speak about. You must have seen and known it long, 
for since we were boy and girl I have loved you above father and mother and all, and all I've thought on by day and dreamt on by night has been something in which you've had a share. I'd no way of keeping you for long, and I scorned to try and tie you down, and I lived in terror lest someone else should take you to himself. But now, Mary, I'm foreman in the works, and— Dear Mary, listen, as she in her unbearable agitation stood up and turned away from him. He rose, too, and came nearer, trying to take hold of her hand, but this she would not allow. She was bracing herself up to refuse him for once and for all. And now, Mary, I've a home to offer you, and a heart as true as ever a man had to love you and cherish you. We shall never be rich folk, I dare say. But if a loving heart and a strong right arm can shield you from sorrow or from want, mine shall do it. I cannot speak as I would like. My love won't let itself be put into words, but, oh, darling, say you'll believe me and that you'll be mine. She could not speak at once. Her words would not come. Mary, they say silence gives consent. Is it so? he whispered. Now or never the effort must be made. No? It does not with me. Her voice was calm, although she trembled from head to foot. I will always be your friend, Jem, but I can never be your wife. Not my wife, said he mournfully. Oh, Mary, think a while. You cannot be my friend if you will not be my wife. At least I can never be content to be only your friend. Do think a while. If you say no, you will make me a hopeless desperate. It's no love of yesterday. It has made the very groundwork of all that people call good in me. I don't know what I shall be if you won't have me. And Mary, think how glad your father would be. It may sound vain, but he's told me more than once how much he should like to see us two married. Jem intended this for a powerful argument, but in Mary's present mood it told against him more than anything, for it suggested the false and foolish idea that her father, in his evident anxiety to promote her marriage with Jem, had been speaking to him on the subject with some degree of solicitation. I tell you, Jem, it cannot be. Once and for all I will never marry you. And is this the end of all my hopes and fears? The end of my life, I may say, for it is the end of all worth living for. His agitation rose and carried him into passion. Mary, you'll hear, maybe, of me as a drunkard, maybe as a thief, maybe as a murderer. Remember, when all are speaking ill of me, you will have no right to blame me, for it's your cruelty that will have made me what I feel I shall become. You won't even say you'll try and like me, will you, Mary? said he suddenly changing his tone from threatening despair to fond, passionate entreaty, as he took her hand and held it forcibly between both of his while he tried to catch a glimpse of her averted face. She was silent, but it was from deep and violent emotion. He could not bear to wait. He would not hope to be dashed away again. He rather, in his bitterness of heart, chose the certainty of despair, and before she could resolve what to answer, he flung away her hand and rushed out of the house. Jem, Jem, cried she, with faint and choking voice. It was too late. He left street after street behind him with his almost winged speed, as he sought the fields where he might give way unobserved to all the deep despair he felt. It was scarcely ten minutes since he had entered the house, and found Mary at comparative peace. And now she lay half across the dresser, her head hidden in her hands, and every part of her body shaking with the violence of her sobs. She could not have told at first, if you had asked her, and she could have commanded voice enough to answer, why she was in such agonized grief. It was too sudden for her to analyze or think upon it. She only felt that by her own doing her life would be hereafter blank and dreary. By and by her sorrow exhausted her body by its power, and she seemed to have no strength left for crying. She sat down, and now thoughts crowded on her mind. One little hour ago, and all was still unsaid, and she had her fate in her own power. And yet how long ago had she determined to say pretty much what she did if the occasion ever offered? It was as if two people were arguing the matter, that mournful, desponding communion between her former self and her present self herself a day, an hour ago, and herself now. For we have every one of us felt how a very few minutes of the months and years called life 
will sometimes suffice to place all time past and future in an entirely new light, will make us see the vanity or the criminality of the bygone, and so change the aspect of the coming time that we look with loathing on the very thing we have most desired. A few moments may change our character for life by giving a totally different direction to our aims and energies. To return to Mary, her plan had been, as we all know, to marry Mr. Carson, and the occurrence an hour ago was only a preliminary step. True. But it had unveiled her heart to her. It had convinced her that she loved Jem above all persons or things. But Jem was a poor mechanic, with a mother and an aunt to keep, a mother, too, who had shown her pretty clearly that she did not desire her for a daughter-in-law, while Mr. Carson was rich and prosperous and gay, and she believed would place her in all circumstances of ease and luxury where want would never come. What were these hollow vanities to her now she had discovered the passionate secret of her soul? She felt as if she almost hated Mr. Carson, who had decoyed her with his baubles. She now saw how vain, how nothing to her, would be all the gaieties and pomps, all joys and pleasures, unless she might share them with Jem. Yes, with him she had harshly rejected so short a time ago. If he were poor, she loved him all the better. If his mother did think her unworthy of him, what was it but the truth, as she now owned, with bitter penitence? She had hitherto been walking in grope light towards a precipice, but in the clear revelation of that past hour she saw her danger, and turned away resolutely and forever. That was some comfort. I mean her clear perception of what she ought not to do, of what no luring temptation should ever again induce her to hearken to. How she could best undo the wrong she had done to Jem and herself by refusing his love was another anxious question. She wearied herself by proposing plans and rejecting them. She was roused to a consciousness of the time by hearing the neighboring church clock strike twelve. Her father, she knew, might be expected home any minute, and she was in no mood for a meeting with him. So she hastily gathered up her work and went to her own little bedroom, leaving him to let himself in. She put out her candle, that her father might not see its light under the door, and sat down on her bed to think. But again, turning things over in her mind again and again, she could only determine at once to put an end to all further communication with Mr. Carson in the most decided way she could. Maidenly modesty, and true love is ever modest, seemed to oppose every plan she could think of for showing Jem how much she repented her decision against him, and how dearly she had discovered that she loved him. She came to the unusual wisdom of resolving to do nothing, but strive to be patient, and to improve circumstances as they might turn up. Surely if Jem knew of her remaining unmarried, he would try his fortune again. He would never be content with one rejection. She believed she could not in his place. She had been very wrong. But now she would endeavor to do right, and have womanly patience, until he saw her changed and repentant mind in her natural actions. Even if she had to wait for years, it was no more than now it was easy to look forward to, as a penance for her giddy flirting on the one hand, and her cruel mistake concerning her feelings on the other. So anticipating a happy ending in the course of her love, however distant it might be, she fell asleep just as the earliest factory bells were ringing. She had sunk down in her clothes, and her sleep was unrefreshing. She wakened up shivery and chill in body, and sorrow-stricken in mind, though she could not at first rightly tell the cause of her depression. She recalled the events of the night before, and still resolved to adhere to the determinations she had then formed. But patience seemed a far more difficult virtue this morning. She hastened downstairs in her earnest, sad desire to do right, now took much pains to secure a comfortable though scanty breakfast for her father, and when he dawdled into the room in an evidently irritable temper, she bore all with the gentleness of penitence, till at last her mild answers turned away wrath. She loathed the idea of meeting Sally Ledbitter at her daily work, yet it must be done, and she tried to nerve herself for the encounter, and to make it at once understood that having determined to give up having anything further to do with Mr. Carson, she considered the bond of intimacy broken between them. But Sally was not the person to let these resolutions be carried into effect too easily. 
she soon became aware of the present state of mary's feelings but she thought they merely arose from the changeableness of girlhood and that the time would come when mary would thank her for almost forcing her to keep up her meetings and communications with her rich lover so when two days had passed over in rather too marked avoidance of sally on mary's part and when the former was made aware by mr carson's complaints that mary was not keeping her appointments with him and that unless he detained her by force he had no chance of obtaining a word as she passed him in the street on her rapid walk home she resolved to compel mary to what she called her own good she took no notice during the third day of mary's avoidance as they sat at work she rather seemed to acquiesce in the coolness of their intercourse she put away her sewing early and went home to her mother who she said was more ailing than usual the other girls soon followed her example and mary casting a rapid glance up and down the street as she stood last on miss simmons doorstep darted homewards in hopes of avoiding the person whom she was fast learning to dread that night she was safe from any encounter on her road and she arrived at home which she found as she expected empty for she knew it was a club night which her father would not miss she sat down to recover breath and to still her heart which panted more from nervousness than from over-exertion although she had walked so quickly then she arose and taking off her bonnet her eye caught the form of sally ledbitter passing the window with a lingering step and looking into the darkness with all her might as if to ascertain if mary were returned in an instant she repassed and knocked at the house door but without awaiting an answer she entered well mary dear knowing well how little dear mary considered her just then it's so difficult to get any comfortable talk at miss simmons i thought i'd just step up and see you at home i understood from what you said your mother was ailing and that you wanted to be with her replied mary in no welcoming tone ay but mother's better now said the unabashed sally your father's out i suppose looking round as well as she could for mary made no haste to perform the hospitable offices of striking a match and lighting a candle yes he's out said mary shortly and busying herself at last about the candle without ever asking her visitor to sit down so much the better answered sally for to tell you the truth mary i've a friend at the end of the road as is anxious to come and see you at home since you're grown so particular as not to like to speak to him in the street he'll be here directly oh sally don't let him in said mary speaking at last heartily and running to the door she would have fastened it but sally held her hands laughing meanwhile at her distress oh please sally struggling dear sally don't let him come here the neighbors will so talk and father'll go mad if he hears he'll kill me sally he will besides i don't love him i never did oh let me go as footsteps approached and then as they passed the house and seemed to give her a respite she continued do sally dear sally go and tell him i don't love him and that i don't want to have anything more to do with him it was very wrong i dare say keeping company with him at all but i'm very sorry if i've led him to think too much of me and i don't want him to think any more will you tell him this sally and i'll do anything for you if you will i'll tell you what i'll do said sally in a more relenting mood i'll go back with you to where he's waiting for us or rather i should say where i told him to wait for a quarter of an hour till i seed if your father was at home and if i didn't come back in that time he said he'd come here and break the door open but he'd see you oh let us go let us go said mary feeling that the interview must be and had better be anywhere than at home where her father might return at any minute she snatched up her bonnet and was at the end of the court in an instant but then not knowing whether to turn to the right or to the left she was obliged to wait for sally who came leisurely up and put her arm through mary's with a kind of decided hold intended to prevent the possibility of her changing her mind and turning back but this under the circumstances was quite different to mary's plan she had wondered more than once if she must not have another interview with mr carson and had then determined while she expressed her resolution that it should be the final one to tell him how sorry she was if she had thoughtlessly given him false hopes for be it remembered she had the innocence and the ignorance to believe his intentions honourable and he feeling that at any price he must have her only that he would obtain her as cheaply as he could had never undeceived her while sally ledbitter laughed in her sleeve at them both and wondered how it would all end 
whether Mary would gain her point of marriage, with her sly affection of believing such to be Mr. Carson's intention in courting her. Not very far from the end of the street, into which the court where Mary lived opened, they met Mr. Carson, his hat a good deal slouched over his face, as if afraid of being recognized. He turned when he saw them coming, and led the way without uttering a word, although they were close behind, to a street of half-finished houses. The length of the walk gave Mary time to recoil from the interview which was to follow, but even if her own resolve to go through with it had failed, there was the steady grasp of Sally Ledbitter, which she could not evade without an absolute struggle. At last he stopped in the shelter and concealment of a wooden fence, put up to keep the building rubbish from intruding on the foot-pavement. Inside this fence, a minute afterwards, the girls were standing by him, Mary now returning Sally's detaining grasp with interest, for she had determined on the way to make her a witness, willing or unwilling, to the ensuing conversation. But Sally's curiosity led her to be a very passive prisoner in Mary's hold. With more freedom than he had ever used before, Mr. Carson put his arm firmly round Mary's waist, in spite of her indignant resistance. "'Nay, nay, you little witch! Now I've caught you, I shall keep you prisoner.' "'Tell me now what has made you run away from me so fast these few days. "'Tell me, you sweet little coquette.' "'Mary ceased struggling, but turned, so as to be almost opposite to him, "'while she spoke out calmly and boldly. "'Mr. Carson, I want to speak to you once and for all. "'Since I met you last Monday evening, I have made up my mind to have nothing more to do with you. "'I know I have been wrong in leading you to think I liked you.' but I believe I didn't rightly know my own mind, and I humbly beg your pardon, sir, if I've led you to think too much of me. For an instant he was surprised. The next, vanity came to his aid, and convinced him that she could only be joking. He, young, agreeable, rich, handsome. No, she was only showing a little womanly fondness for coquetting. You're a darling little rascal to go on in this way. "'Humbly begging my pardon if you've made me think too much of you. "'As if you didn't know, I think of you from morning till night. "'But you want to be told it again and again, do you? "'No, indeed, sir, I don't. "'I would far lifer that you should say you would never think of me again "'than that you should speak of me in this way. "'For indeed, sir, I never was more in earnest than I am "'when I say to-night is the last night I will ever speak to you. "'Last night, you sweet little equivocator, but not last day.' "'Ha, Mary, I've caught you, have I?' "'As she, puzzled by his perseverance in thinking her joking, "'hesitated in what form she could now put her meaning. "'I mean, sir,' she said sharply, "'that I will never speak to you again at any time after to-night.' "'And what's made this change, Mary?' he said seriously enough now. "'Have I done anything to offend you?' added he earnestly. "'No, sir,' she answered gently, but yet firmly. I cannot tell you exactly why I have changed my mind, but I shall not alter it again, and as I said before, I beg your pardon if I have done wrong by you. And now, sir, if you please, good night. But I do not please. You shall not go. What have I done, Mary? Tell me. You must not go without telling me how I have vexed you. What would you have me do? Nothing, sir, but— in an agitated tone, "'Oh, let me go! You cannot change my mind. It's quite made up. Oh, sir, why do you hold me so tight? If you will know why I won't have anything more to do with you, it is that I cannot love you. I have tried, and I really cannot.' This naive and candid avowal served her but little. He could not understand how it could be true. Some reason lurked behind. He was passionately in love. What should he do to tempt her? A thought struck him. "'Listen, Mary, nay, I cannot let you go till you have heard me. I do love you dearly, and I won't believe but what you love me a very little, just a very little. Well, if you don't like to own it, never mind. I only want now to tell you how much I love you, by what I am ready to give up for you. You know, or perhaps you are not fully aware, how little my father and mother would like me to marry you. So angry would they be, and so much ridicule should I have to brave, that of course I have never thought of it till now. I thought we could be happy enough without marriage. Deep sank those words into Mary's heart. 
But now, if you like, I'll get a license to-morrow morning, nay, to-night, and I'll marry you in defiance of all the world rather than give you up. In a year or two my father will forgive me, and meanwhile you shall have every luxury money can purchase, and every charm that love can devise to make your life happy. After all, my mother was but a factory girl. This was said to himself as if to reconcile himself to this bold step. Now, Mary, you see how willing I am to sacrifice a good deal for you. I even offer you marriage to satisfy your little ambitious heart. So now, won't you say you can love me a little, little bit? He pulled her towards him. To his surprise, she still resisted. Yes, though all she had pictured to herself for so many months in being the wife of Mr. Carson was now within her grasp, she resisted. His speech had given her but one feeling, that of exceeding great relief, for she had dreaded, now she knew what true love was, to think of the attachment she might have created, the deep feeling her flirting conduct might have called out. She had loaded herself with reproaches for the misery she might have caused. It was a relief to gather that the attachment was of that low, despicable kind, which can plan to seduce the object of its affection, that the feeling she had caused was shallow enough for it only pretended to embrace self, at the expense of the misery, the ruin of one falsely termed beloved. She need not be penitent to such a plotter. That was the relief. I am obliged to you, sir, for telling me what you have. You may think I am a fool, but I did think you meant to marry me all along, and yet thinking so I felt I could not love you. Still I felt sorry I had gone so far in keeping company with you. Now, sir— I tell you, if I had loved you before, I don't think I should have loved you, now you have told me you meant to ruin me, for that's the plain English of not meaning to marry me till just this minute. I said I was sorry, and humbly begged your pardon. That was before I knew what you were. Now I scorn you, sir, for plotting to ruin a poor girl. Good night. And with a wrench, for which she had reserved all her strength, she flew off like a bolt. They heard her flying footsteps echo down the quiet street. The next sound was Sally's laugh, which grated on Mr. Carson's ears and keenly irritated him. "'And what do you find so amusing, Sally?' asked he. "'Oh, sir, I beg your pardon. I humbly beg your pardon, as Mary says. But I can't help laughing to think how she's outwitted us. She was going to have said outwitted you, but changed the pronoun. "'Why, Sally, had you any idea she was going to fly out in this style?' "'No, I hadn't, to be sure. "'But if you did think of marrying her, why, if I may be so bold as to ask, "'did you go and tell her you had no thought of doing otherwise by her? "'That was what put her up at last. "'Why, I had repeatedly before led her to infer that marriage was not my object. "'I never dreamed she could have been so foolish as to have mistaken me, "'little provoking romancer though she be. "'So I naturally wished her to know what a sacrifice of prejudice, of—' Of myself, in short, I was willing to make for her sake. Yet I don't think she was aware of it, after all. I believe I might have any lady in Manchester if I liked, and yet I was willing and ready to marry a poor dressmaker. Don't you understand me now? And don't you see what a sacrifice I was making to humour her, and all to no avail? Sally was silent, and so he went on. My father would have forgiven any temporary connection far sooner than my marrying one so far beneath me in rank. "'I thought you said, sir, your mother was a factory girl,' remarked Sally rather maliciously. "'Yes, yes, but then my father was not in much such a station. At any rate, there was not the disparity there is between Mary and me.' Another pause. "'Then you mean to give her up, sir?' She made no bones of saying she gave you up. "'No, I do not mean to give her up, whatever you and she may please to think. I am more in love with her than ever, even for this charming, capricious ebullition of hers.' She'll come round, you may depend upon it. Women always do. They always have second thoughts and find out that they are best in casting off a lover. Mind, I don't say I shall offer her the same terms again. With a few more words of no importance, the Allies parted. End of chapter 11, Mr. Carson's Intentions Revealed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Chapter Twelve, Old Alice's Bairn. I loved him not, and yet now he is gone. I feel I am alone. I checked him while he spoke. Yet could he speak? Alas, I would not check. For reasons not to love him, once I sought and wearied all my thought. W. S. Landor. And now Mary had, as she thought, dismissed both her lovers. But they looked on their dismissals with very different eyes. He who loved her with all his heart and with all his soul considered his rejection final. He did not comfort himself with the idea, which would have proved so well founded in his case, that women have second thoughts about casting off their lovers. He had too much respect for his own heartiness of love to believe himself unworthy of Mary. That mock humble conceit did not enter his head. He thought he did not hit Mary's fancy, and though that may sound a trivial everyday expression, yet the reality of it cut him to the heart. Wild visions of enlistment, of drinking himself into forgetfulness, of becoming desperate in some way or another, entered his mind. But then the thought of his mother stood like an angel with a drawn sword in the way to sin. For you know, he was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, dependent on him for daily bread. So he could not squander away health and time, which were to him money wherewith to support her failing years. He went to his work accordingly, to all outward semblance just as usual, but with a heavy, heavy heart within. Mr. Carson, as we have seen, persevered in considering Mary's rejection of him as merely a charming caprice. If she were at work, Sally Ledbetter was sure to slip a passionately loving note into her hand, and then so skillfully move away from her side, that Mary could not all at once return it, without making some sensation among the workwomen. She was even forced to take several home with her. But after reading one, she determined on her plan. She made no great resistance to receiving them from Sally, but kept them unopened, and occasionally returned them in a blank half-sheet of paper. But far worse than this, was the being so constantly waylaid as she went home by her persevering lover, who had been so long acquainted with all her habits that she found it difficult to evade him. Late or early, she was never certain of being free from him. Go this way or that, he might come up some cross street when she had just congratulated herself on evading him for that day. He could not have taken a surer mode of making himself odious to her. And all this time Jim Wilson never came, not to see her, that she did not expect, but to see her father. Too, she did not know what, but she had hoped he would have come on some excuse just to see if she hadn't changed her mind. He never came. Then she grew weary and impatient, and her spirits sank. The persecution of the one lover, and the neglect of the other, oppressed her sorely. She could not now sit quietly through the evening at her work, or if she kept, by a strong effort, from pacing up and down the room. She felt as if she must sing to keep off thought while she sewed, and her songs were the maddest, merriest she could think of. Barbara Allen and such sorrowful ditties did well enough for happy times, but now she required all the aid that could be derived from external excitement to keep down the impulse of grief. And her father, too, he was a great anxiety to her, he looked so changed and so ill. Yet he would not acknowledge to any ailment. She knew that, be it as late as it would, she never left off work until, if the poor servants paid her pretty regularly for the odd jobs of mending she did for them, she had earned a few pence, enough for one good meal for her father on the next day. But very frequently all she could do in the morning, after her late sitting up at night, was to run with the work home and receive the money from the person for whom it was done. She could not stay often to make purchases of food, but gave up the money at once to her father's eager clutch sometimes prompted by a savage hunger, it is true, but more frequently by a craving for opium. On the whole, he was not so hungry as his daughter, for it was a long fast from the one o'clock dinner hour at Miss Simmons to the close of Mary's vigil, which was often extended to midnight. She was young, and had not yet learned to bear climbing. One evening, as she sang a merry song over her work, stopping occasionally to sigh, the blind Margaret came groping in, it had been one of Mary's additional sorrows that her friend had been absent from home, accompanying the lecturer on music in his round among the manufacturing towns of Yorkshire and Lancashire. Her grandfather, too, had seen this a good time for going his expeditions in search of specimens. 
so that the house had been shut up for several weeks. "'Oh, Margaret, Margaret, how glad I am to see you. Take care. There now, you're all right. That's Father's chair. Sit down.' She kissed her over and over again. "'It seems like the beginning of brighter times to see you again, Margaret. Bless you. And how well you look.' Doctors always send ailing folk for change of air, and you know I've had plenty of that same lately. You've been quite a traveller, for sure. Tell us all about it, do, Margaret. Where have you been to, first place? Eh, lass, that would take a long time to tell. Half o'er the world, I sometimes think. Bolton and Bury, and Outham and Halifax, and— But, Mary, guess who I saw there? Maybe you know, though, so it's not fair guessing. No, I do not. Tell me, Margaret, for I cannot abide waiting and guessing. Well, one night as I were going from my lodgings with the help on a lad as belonged to the landlady to find the room where I were to sing, I heard a cough before me, walking along. Thinks I, that's Jim Wilson's cough, or I'm much mistaken. Next time came a sneeze and cough, and then I were certain. First I hesitated whether I should speak, thinking if it were a stranger he'd maybe think me forward but I knew blind folks must not be nesh about using their tongues, so says I. Jim Wilson is at you, and sure enough it was, and nobody else. Did you know he were in Halifax, Mary? Footnote. Forward. Forward. End of footnote. No, she answered, faintly and sadly, for Halifax was all the same to her heart as the Antipodes, equally inaccessible by humble penitent looks and maidenly tokens of love. Well, he's there, however. He's putting up an engine for some folks there for his master. He's doing well, for he's getting four or five men under him. We two or three meetings, and he telled me all about his invention for doing away with the crank or summit. His master's bought it from him, and taken out a patent, and Jim's a gentleman for life with the money his master get him. But you'll have heard all this, Mary. No, she had not. Well, I thought it all happened afore he left Manchester, and then, in course, you'd a known. But maybe it were all settled after he got to Halifax. However, he's gotten two or three hundred pounds for his invention. But what's up with you, Mary? You're sadly out of sorts. You've never been quarreling with Jim, surely. Now Mary cried outright. She was weak in body and unhappy in mind, and the time was come when she might have the relief of telling her grief. She could not bring herself to confess how much of her sorrow was caused by her having been vain and foolish. She hoped that need never be known, and she could not bear to think of it. Oh, Margaret, do you know Jim came here one night when I were put out and cross? Oh, dear, dear, I could bite my tongue out when I think on it. And he told me how he loved me, and I thought I did not love him, and I told him I didn't. And, Margaret, he believed me and went away so sad and so angry, and now— I'd do anything. I would indeed. Her sobs choked the end of her sentence. Margaret looked at her with sorrow, but with hope, for she had no doubt in her own mind that it was only a temporary estrangement. "'Tell me, Margaret,' said Mary, taking her apron down from her eyes and looking at Margaret with eager anxiety. "'What can I do to bring him back to me? Should I write to him?' "'No,' replied her friend. "'That would not do.' Men are so queer, they like to have a the courtin' to themselves. But I did not mean to write him a courting letter, said Mary, somewhat indignantly. If you wrote at all, it would be to give him a hint you'd taken the rue, and would be very glad to have him now. I believe now he'd rather find that out himself. But he won't try, said Mary, sighing. How can he find it out when he's at Halifax? If he's a will, he's a way, depend upon it. And you would not have him if he's not a will to you, Mary. "'No, dear,' changing her tone from the somewhat hard way in which sensible people too often speak, to the soft accents of tenderness which come with such peculiar grace from them. "'You must just wait and be patient. You may depend upon it. All will end well, and better than if you meddled in it now.' "'But it's so hard to be patient,' pleaded Mary. "'Aye, dear, being patient is the hardest work we, any of us, have to do through life, I take it. Waiting is far more difficult than doing. I've known that about my sight, and many a one has known it in watching the sick. But it's one of God's lessons we all must learn, one way or another. After a pause. Have you been to see his mother of late? No, not for some weeks. 
When last I went she was so frabbit with me that I really thought she'd wished I'd keep away. Footnote. Frabbit. Ill-tempered. End of footnote. Well, if I were you I'd go. Jim will hear on it, and it will do you far more good in his mind than writing a letter, which, after all, you would find a tough piece of work when you came to settle to it. It would be hard to say neither too much nor too little, but I must be going. Grandfather is at home, and it's our first night together, and he must not be sitting wanting me any longer. She rose up from her seat, but still delayed going. Mary, I've somewhat else I want to say to you, and I don't rightly know how to begin. You see, Grandfather and I know what bad times is, and we know your father is out of work, and I'm getting more money than I can well manage. And, dear, would you just take this bit of gold and pay me back in good times? The tears stood in Margaret's eyes as she spoke. Dear Margaret, we're not so bad-pressed as that. The thought of her father and his ill looks and his one meal a day rushed upon Mary. And yet, dear, if it would not put you out of your way, I would rather work hard to make it up to you. But would not your grandfather be vexed? Not he, wench. It were more his thought than mine, and we have gotten ever so many more at home, so don't hurry yourself about paying. It's hard to be blind, to be sure, else money comes in so easily now to what it used to do, and it's downright pleasure to earn it, for I do so like singing. I wish I could sing, said Mary, looking at the sovereign. Some has one kind of gifts and some another. Many's the time when I could see that I longed for your beauty, Mary. We're like childer, ever wanting what we hanna got. But now I must say just one more word. Remember, if you're sore pressed for money, we shall take it very unkind if you do not let us know. Good-bye to ye. In spite of her blindness she hurried away, anxious to rejoin her grandfather, and desirous also to escape from Mary's expressions of gratitude. Her visit had done Mary good in many ways. It had strengthened her patience and her hope. It had given her confidence in Margaret's sympathy, and last, and really least in comforting power, of so little value are silver and gold in comparison to love, that gift in every one's power to bestow, came the consciousness of the money value of the sovereign she held in her hand, the many things it might purchase. First of all came the thought of the comfortable supper for her father that very night, and acting instantly upon the idea, she set off in hopes that all the provision shops might not yet be closed, although it was so late. That night the cottage shone with unusual light and fire gleam, and the father and daughter sat down to a meal they thought almost extravagant. It was so long since they had had enough to eat. Food gives heart, say the Lancashire people, and the next day Mary made time to go and call on Mrs. Wilson, according to Margaret's advice. She found her quite alone, and more gracious than she had been the last time Mary had visited her. Alice was gone out, she said. She would just step up to the post office, all for no earthly use, for it were to ask if they hadn't a letter lying there for her from her foster son, Will Wilson, the sailor lad. What made her think there were a letter? asked Mary. Why, you see, a neighbor has as been in Liverpool, told us Will's ship were come in. Now, he said last time he were in Liverpool he'd a come to a seen Alice, but his ship had but a week holiday, and hard work for the men in that time, too. So Alice makes sure he'll come this, and has had her hand behind her ear at every noise in the street, thinking it were him. And today she were neither to have nor to hold, but off she would go to the post and see if he hadn't sent her a line to the old house near you. I tried to get her to give up going, for let alone her deafness she's getting so dark, she cannot see five yards afore her. But no, she would go, poor old body. I did not know her sight failed her. She used to have good eyes enough when she lived near us. Ay, but it's gone lately a good deal. But you never ask after Jim. Anxious to get in a word on the subject nearest her heart. No, replied Mary, blushing scarlet. How is he? I cannot justly say how he is, seeing he's at Halifax. But he were very well when he wrote last Tuesday. Han you heard of his good luck? Rather to her disappointment, Mary owned she had heard of the sum his master had paid him for his invention. Well, and did not Margaret tell you what he'd done with it? It's just like him, though, ne'er to say a word about it. Why, when he were paid, what does he do but get his master to help him to buy an income for me and Alice? He had her name put down for her life, but poor thing, 
She'll not be long to the fore, I'm thinking. She's sadly failed of late. And so, Mary, you see, we're two ladies of property. It's a matter of twenty pound a year, they tell me. I wish the twins had lived, bless em, said she, dropping a few tears. They should have had the best of schooling and their bellyfuls of food. I suppose they're better off in heaven, only I should so like to see em. Mary's heart filled with love at this new proof of Jim's goodness, but she could not talk about it. She took Jane Wilson's hand, and pressed it with affection, and then turned the subject to Will, her sailor nephew. Jane was a little bit sorry, but her prosperity had made her gentler, and she did not resent what she felt at Mary's indifference to Jim and his merits. "'He's been in Africa and that neighborhood, I believe. He's a fine chap, but he's not getting Jim's hair. His has too much of the red in it. He sent Alice, but maybe she told you, a matter of five pound when he were over before.' but that were not to an income, you know. "'It's not every one that can get a hundred or two at a time,' said Mary. "'No, no, that's true enough. There's not many a one like Jim. That's Alice's step,' said she, hastening to open the door to her sister-in-law. Alice looked weary and sad and dusty. The weariness and the dust would not have been noticed either by her or the others if it had not been for the sadness. "'No letters,' said Mrs. Wilson. "'No, none. I must just wait another day to hear from my lad. "'It's very dree work waiting,' said Alice. "'Margaret's words came into Mary's mind. "'Every one has their time and kind of waiting. "'If I but knew he were safe and not drowned,' spoke Alice, "'if I but knew he were drowned, I would ask Grace to say, "'Thy will be done. It's the waiting.' "'It's hard work to be patient to all of us,' said Mary.' I know I find it so, but I did not know one so good as you did, Alice. I shall not think so badly of myself for being a bit impatient, now I've heard you say you find it difficult. The idea of reproach to Alice was the last in Mary's mind, and Alice knew it was. Nevertheless, she said, Then, my dear, I beg your pardon, and God's pardon, too, if I've weakened your faith by showing you how feeble mine was. Half our life's spent in waiting, and it ill becomes one like me, with so many mercies to grumble. I'll try and put a bridle o'er my tongue, and my thoughts, too. She spoke in a humble and gentle voice, like one asking forgiveness. Come, Alice, interposed Mrs. Wilson. Don't fret yourself for e'er a trifle wrong, said here or there. See, I put the kettle on, and you and Mary shall have a dish of tea in no time. So she bustled about, and brought out a comfortable-looking substantial loaf, and set Mary to cut bread and butter, while she rattled out the teacups, always a cheerful sound. Just as they were sitting down, there was a knock heard at the door, and without waiting for it to be opened from the inside, someone lifted the latch, and in a man's voice asked if one George Wilson lived there. Mrs. Wilson was entering on a long and sorrowful explanation of his having once lived there, but of his having dropped down dead, when Alice, with the instinct of love, for in all usual and common instances, sight and hearing failed to convey impressions to her until long after other people had received them, arose and tottered to the door. "'My bairn, my own dear bairn,' she exclaimed, falling on Will Wilson's neck. You may fancy the hospitable and welcoming commotion that ensued, how Mrs. Wilson laughed and talked and cried, all together if such a thing can be done, and how Mary gazed with wondering pleasure at her old playmate, now a dashing, bronze-looking, ringleted sailor, frank and hearty and affectionate. But it was something different from common to see Alice's joy at once more having her foster-child with her. She did not speak, for she really could not, but the tears came coursing down her old withered cheeks and dimmed the horn spectacles she had put on in order to pry lovingly into his face. So what with her failing sight and her tear-blinded eyes, she gave up the attempt of learning his face by heart through the medium of that sense and tried another. She passed her sodden, shriveled hands, all trembling with eagerness, over his manly face, bent meekly down in order that she might more easily make her strange inspection. At last her soul was satisfied. After tea, Mary, feeling sure there was much to be said on both sides, at which it would be better none should be present, not even an intimate friend like herself, got up to go away. This seemed to arouse Alice from her dreamy consciousness of exceeding happiness, and she hastily followed Mary to the door. There, standing outside with the latch in her hand, she took hold of Mary's arm, and spoke nearly the first words she had uttered since her nephew's return. 
My dear, I shall never forgive myself if my wicked words tonight are any stumbling block in your path. See how the Lord has put coals of fire on my head. O oh, Mary, don't let my being an unbelieving Thomas weaken your faith. Wait patiently on the Lord, whatever your trouble may be. End of chapter 12 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter 13 A Traveler's Tales The mermaid sat upon the rocks all day long, admiring her beauty and combing her locks, and singing a mermaid song. And hear the mermaid song you may, as sure as sure can be, if you will but follow the sun all day, and souse with him into the sea. W. S. Landor it was perhaps four or five days after the events mentioned in the last chapter that one evening, as Mary stood lost in reverie at the window, she saw Will Wilson enter the court, and came quickly up to her door. She was glad to see him, for he had always been a friend of hers, perhaps too much like her in character ever to become anything nearer or dearer. She opened the door in readiness to receive his frank greeting, which she as frankly returned. "'Come, Mary, on with bonnet and shawl, or whatever rigging you women require before leaving the house. I'm sent to fetch you, and I can't lose time when I'm under orders.' "'Where am I to go to?' asked Mary, as her heart leaped up at the thought of who might be waiting for her. "'Not very far,' replied he, "'only to old Joe Blaze round the corner there.' Aunt would have me come and see these new friends of hers, and then we meant to have come on here to see you and your father, but the old gentleman seems inclined to make a night of it, and have you all there. Where is your father? I want to see him. He must come, too. He's out, but I'll leave word next door for him to follow me. That's to say, if he comes home afore long, she added hesitatingly. Is anyone else at Job's? "'No, my Aunt Jane would not come, for some maggot or other. "'And as for Jim, I don't know what you've all been doing to him, "'but he's as downhearted a chap as I'd wish to see. "'He's had his sorrow, sure enough, poor lad, "'but it's time for him to be shaking off his dull looks "'and not go moping like a girl.' "'Then he's come for Halifax, is he?' asked Mary. "'Yes, his body's come, but I think he's left his heart behind him.' His tongue I'm sure he has, as we used to say to children, when they would not speak. I try to rouse him up a bit, and I think he likes having me with him, but still he's as gloomy and as dull as can be. T'was only yesterday he took me to the works, and you'd have thought us two Quakers as the spirit hadn't moved. All the way down we were so mum. It's a place to craze a man, certainly. Such a noisy black hole." There were one or two things worth looking at, the bellows, for instance, or the gale they called a bellows. I could have stood near it a whole day, and if I had a berth in that place, I should like to be bellows man, if there is such a one. But Jem weren't diverted even with that. He stood as grave as a judge while it blew my hat out of my hand. He's lost all relish for his food, too, which frets my aunt sadly. "'Come, Mary, aren't you ready?' She had not been able to gather if she were to see Jim at Joe Blaze. But when the door was opened, she at once saw and felt he was not there. The evening, then, would be a blank, at least so she thought for the first five minutes. But she soon forgot her disappointment in the cheerful meeting of old friends, all except herself with some cause for rejoicing at that very time. Margaret, who would not be idle, was knitting away, with her face looking full into the room, away from her work. Alice sat meek and patient, with her dimmed eyes and gentle look, trying to see and to hear, but never complaining. Indeed, in her inner self she was blessing God for her happiness, for the joy of having her nephew, her child, near her, was far more present to her mind than her deprivations of sight and hearing. Job was in the full glory of host and hostess, too, for by a tacit agreement he had roused himself from his habitual abstraction 
and had assumed many of Margaret's little household duties. While he moved about, he was deep in conversation with the young sailor, trying to extract from him any circumstances connected with the natural history of the different countries he had visited. "'Oh, if you are fond of grubs and flies and beetles, there's no place for em like Sierra Leone. I wish you'd have some of ours. We had rather too much of a good thing. We drank them with our drink and could scarcely keep from eating them with our food.' I never thought any folk could care for such fat green beasts as those, or I would have brought you them by the thousand. A plate full of pea soup would have been full enough for you, I dare say. It were often too full for us. I would have given a good deal for some of them, said Job. Well, I knew folk at home liked some of the queer things one meets with abroad, but I never thought they'd care for them nasty, slimy things. I were always on the lookout for a mermaid, for that, I knew, were a curiosity. "'You might have looked long enough,' said Job, in an undertone of contempt, which, however, the quick ears of the sailor caught. "'Not so long, master, in some latitudes, as you think. It stands to reason the sea hereabouts is too cold for mermaids, for women here don't go half-naked on account of climate.' but I've been in lands where muslin were too hot to wear on land, and where the sea were more than milk warm, and though I'd never the good luck to see a mermaid in that latitude, I know them that has. Do tell us about it, cried Mary. Pooh, pooh, said Job, the naturalist. Both speeches determined Will to go on with his story. What could a fellow who had never been many miles from home know about the wonders of the deep, that he should put him down in that way? Well, it were Jack Harris, our third mate last voyage, as many and many a time told us all about it. You see, he were becalmed off Chatham Island, that is in the Great Pacific, and a warm enough latitude for mermaids and sharks and such like perils. So some of the men took the long boat and pulled for the island to see what it were like, and when they got near they heard a puffing like a creature come up to take breath. You've never heard a diver? No? Well, you've heard folks in the asthma, and it were for all the world like that. So they looked around, and what should they see but a mermaid sitting on a rock and sunning herself? The water is always warmer when it's rough, you know, so I suppose in the calm she felt it rather chilly, and had come up to warm herself. "'What was she like?' asked Mary breathlessly. Job took his pipe off the chimney-piece, and began to smoke with very audible puffs, as if the story were not worth listening to. "'Oh, Jack used to say she was all the world as beautiful as any of the wax ladies in the barber's shops. Only, Mary—' There were one little difference. Her hair was bright grass green. I should not think that was pretty, said Mary hesitatingly, as if not liking to doubt the perfection of anything belonging to such an acknowledged beauty. Oh, but it is when you're used to it. I always think when first we get sight of land, there's no color so lovely as grass green. However, she had green hair sure enough, and were proud enough of it, too, for she were combing it out full length when first they saw her. They all thought she were a fair prize, and maybe as good as a whale in ready money. They were whale-fishers, you know. For some folk think a deal of mermaids, whatever other folk do. This was a hit at Job, who retaliated in a series of sonorous spittings and puffs. So, as I were saying, they pulled towards her, thinking to catch her. She were all the while combing her beautiful hair and beckoning to them, while with the other hand she held a looking-glass. "'How many hands had she?' asked Job. Two, to be sure, just like any other woman,' answered Will indignantly. "'Oh, I thought you said she beckoned with one hand and combed her hair with another,' and held a looking-glass with her third, said Job, with provoking quietness. 
No, I didn't. At least, if I did, I meant she did one thing after another, as anyone but— here he mumbled a word or two— could understand. Well, Mary, turning very decidedly towards her, when she saw them coming near, whether it were she grew frightened at their fowling pieces, as they had on board for a bit of shooting on the island, or whether it were she were just a fickle jade as did not rightly know her own mind, which, seeing one half of her was woman, I think myself most probably. But when they were only about two oars lengths from the rock where she sat, down she plopped into the water, leaving nothing but her hinder end of a fish-tail sticking up for a minute, and then that disappeared too. "'And did they never see her again?' asked Mary. "'Never so plain. The man who had the second watch one night declared he saw her swimming round the ship, and holding up her glass for him to look in. And then he saw the little cottage near Aber in Wales, where his wife lived, as plain as ever he saw it in life, and his wife standing outside, shading her eyes as if she were looking for him. But Jack Harris gave him no credit, for he said he were always a bit of a romancer, and besides that were a homesick, downhearted chap. "'I wish they had caught her,' said Mary, musing. "'They got one thing as belonged to her,' replied Will, "'and that I've often seen with my own eyes, "'and I reckon it's a sure proof of the truth of their story "'for them that wants proof.' "'What was it?' asked Margaret, "'almost anxious her grandfather should be convinced. "'Why, in her hurry she left her comb on the rock, "'and one of the men spied it. "'So they thought that were better than nothing, "'and they rode there and took it, "'and Jack Harris had it on board the John Cropper, "'and I saw him comb his hair with it every Sunday morning.' "'What was it like?' asked Mary eagerly, her imagination running on coral combs studded with pearls. "'Why, if it had not had such a strange yarn belonging to it, you'd never had noticed it from any other small-tooth comb.' "'I should rather think not,' sneered Joe Blay. The sailor bit his lips to keep down his anger against an old man. Margaret felt very uneasy, knowing her grandfather so well, and not daring to guess what caustic remark might come next to irritate the young sailor guest. Mary, however, was too much interested by the wonders of the deep to perceive the incredulity with which Job Lay received Wilson's account of the mermaid, and when he left off, half offended, and very much inclined not to open his lips again through the evening, she eagerly said, "'Oh, do tell us something more of what you hear and see on board ship. Do, Will.' "'What's the use, Mary, if folk won't believe one? There are things I saw with my own eyes that some people would pish and try at as if I were a baby to be put down by cross noises. But I'll tell you, Mary, with an emphasis on you, some more of the wonders of the sea, seeing you're not too wise to believe me.' I have seen a fish fly. This did stagger Mary. She had heard of mermaids, as signs of inns and as sea wonders, but never of flying fish. Not so Job. He put down his pipe, and nodding his head as a token of approbation, he said, Ay, ay, young man, now you're speaking truth. Well, now, you'll swallow that, old gentleman. You'll credit me when I say I've seen a critter half fish, half bird, and you don't credit me when I say there be such beasts as mermaids, half fish, half woman? To me, one's just as strange as the other. You never saw the mermaid yourself, interposed Margaret gently. But love me, love my dog, was Will Wilson's motto, only his version was, believe me, believe Jack Harris and the remark was not so soothing to him as it was intended to have been. "'It's the Exocetus, one of the Malacopterigi abdominalis,' said Job, much interested. "'Ay, there you go. You're one of them folks as never knows beasts unless they're called out of their names. Put em in Sunday clothes, and you know em, but in their work-a-day English you never know naught about em.' 
I've met with many of your kidney, and if I'd a known it, I'd a christened poor Jack's mermaid with some green gibberish of a name. Mermaidicus Jack Harrisensis. That's just like their new-fangled words. Do you believe there's such a thing as the Mermaidicus, master? asked Will, enjoying his own joke uncommonly, as most people do. Not I. Tell me about the— Well, said Will, pleased at having excited the old gentleman's faith and credit at last. It were on this last voyage, about a day's sail from Madeira, that one of our men— "'Not Jack Harris, I hope,' murmured Job. "'Called me,' continued Will, not noticing the interruption, "'to see the what you call it flying fish, I say it is. "'It were twenty feet out of water, and it flew near on to a hundred yards. "'But I say, old gentleman, I have gotten one dried, "'and if you'll take it, why, I'll give it to you. "'Only,' he added in a lower tone, I wish you'd just give me credit for the Mermaidicus. I really believe, if the assuming faith in the story of the mermaid had been made the condition of receiving the flying fish, Job Lay, sincere man as he was, would have pretended belief he was so much delighted at the idea of possessing the specimen. He won the sailor's heart by getting up to shake both hands in his vehement gratitude puzzling poor old Alice, who yet smiled through her wonder, for she understood the action to indicate some kindly feeling towards her nephew. Job wanted to prove his gratitude, and was puzzled how to do it. He feared the young man would not appreciate any of his duplicate aronades, not even the great American Miguel, one of his most precious treasures or else he would gladly have bestowed any duplicate on the donor of a real dried exocetus. What would he do for him? He could ask Margaret to sing. Other folks, besides her old doting grandfather, thought a deal of her songs. So Margaret began some of her noble old-fashioned songs. She knew no modern music, for which her auditors might have been thankful but she poured her rich voice out in some of the old canzonets she had lately learned while accompanying the musical lecturer on his tour. Mary was amused to see how the young sailor sat entranced, mouth, eyes, all open in order to catch every breath of sound. His very lids refused to wink, as if afraid in that brief proverbial interval to lose a particle of the rich music that floated through the room. For the first time the idea crossed Mary's mind that it was possible the plain little sensible Margaret, so prim and demure, might have power over the heart of the handsome, dashing, spirited Will Wilson. Job, too, was rapidly changing his opinion of his new guest. The flying fish went a great way, and his undisguised admiration for Margaret's singing carried him still further. It was amusing enough to see these two, within the hour so barely civil to each other, endeavoring now to be ultra-agreeable. Will, as soon as he had taken breath, a long, deep gasping of admiration after Margaret's song, sidled up to Job and asked him in a sort of doubting tone, "'You wouldn't like a live Manx cat, would you, master?' "'A what?' exclaimed Job. "'I don't know its best name,' said Will humbly, "'but we call them just Manx cats. "'They're cats without tails.' "'Now Job, in all his natural history, "'had never heard of such animals. "'So Will continued, "'Because I'm going, afore my joining my ship, "'to see my mother's friends in the island.' and would gladly bring you one, if so be you'd like to have it. They look as queer and out of nature as flying fish, or he gulped the words down that should have followed. Especially when you see him walking a rooftop, right again the sky, when a cat, as is a proper cat, is sure to stick her tail stiff out behind, like a slack rope dancer a-balancing. But these cats have no tail, cannot stick it out, which captivate some people uncommonly. If you'll allow me, I'll bring one for Miss there, jerking his head at Margaret. 
Job assented with grateful curiosity, wishing much to see the tailless phenomenon. "'When are you going to sail?' asked Mary. "'I cannot justly say. Our ship's bound for America next voyage, they tell me. A messmate will let me know when her sailing day is fixed. But I've got to go to the Isle of Man first. I promised Uncle last time I were in England to go this next time. I may have to hoist the Blue Peter any day, so make much of me while you have me, Mary.' Job asked him if he had been in America. "'Haven't I? North and South, both. This time we're bound to North. Yankee land, as we call it, where Uncle Sam lives.' "'Uncle who?' said Mary. "'Oh, it's a way sailors have of speaking. I only mean I'm going to Boston, U.S. That's Uncle Sam.' Mary did not understand. So she left him and went to sit by Alice, who could not hear conversation unless expressly addressed to her. She had sat patiently silent the greater part of the night, and now greeted Mary with a quiet smile. "'Where's your father?' asked she. "'I guess he's at his union. He's there most evenings.' Alice shook her head. But whether it were that she did not hear— or that she did not quite approve of what she heard, Mary could not make out. She sat silently watching Alice, and regretted over her dimmed and veiled eyes, formerly so bright and speaking. As if Alice understood by some other sense what was passing in Mary's mind, she turned suddenly round and answered Mary's thought. "'You're mourning for me, my dear, and there's no need, Mary,' I'm as happy as a child. I sometimes think I am a child, whom the Lord is hush abying to my long sleep. For when I were a nurse girl, my missus always told me to speak very soft and low, and to darken the room that her little one might go to sleep. And now all the noises are hushed and still to me, and the bonny earth seems dim and dark, and I know it's my father lulling me away to my long sleep. I'm very well content, and you mustn't fret for me. I've had well nigh every blessing in life I could desire. Mary thought of Alice's long-cherished, fond wish to revisit the home of her childhood, so often and often deferred, and now probably never to take place, or if it did, how changed from the fond anticipation of what it was to have been. It would be a mockery to the blind and deaf Alice. The evening came quickly to an end. There was the humble, cheerful meal, and then the bustling merry farewell, and Mary was once more in the quietness and solitude of her own dingy, dreary-looking home, her father still out, the fire extinguished, and her evening's task of work lying all undone upon the dresser. But it had been a pleasant little interlude to think upon. It had distracted her attention for a few hours from the pressure of many uneasy thoughts of the dark, heavy, oppressive times when sorrow and want seemed to surround her on every side, of her father, his changed and altered looks, telling her so plainly of broken health and an embittered heart, of the morrow and the morrow beyond that, to be spent in that close, monotonous workroom with Sally Ledbitter's odious whispers hissing in her ear, and of the hunted look so full of dread from Miss Simmons' doorstep up and down the street, lest her persecuting lover should be near. For he lay in wait for her with wonderful perseverance, and of late had made himself almost hateful by the unmanly force which he had used to detain her to listen to him, and the indifference with which he exposed her to the remarks of the passers-by, any of whom might circulate reports which it would be terrible for her father to hear, and worse than death should they reach Jem Wilson. And all this she had drawn upon herself by her giddy flirting, Oh, how she loathed the recollection of the hot summer evening, when, worn out by stitching and sewing, she had loitered homewards with weary languor, and first listened to the voice of the tempter. And Jem Wilson, oh, Jem, Jem, 
why did you not come to receive some of the modest looks and words of love which mary longed to give you to try and make up for the hasty rejection which you as hastily took to be final though both mourned over it with many tears but day after day passed away and patience seemed of no avail and mary's cry was ever the old moan of the moated grange why comes he not she said i am a weary a weary i would that i were dead End of chapter 13「Jem's Interview with Poor Esther Know the temptation, ere you judge the crime. Look on this tree, t'was green and fair and graceful. Yet now, save these few shoots, how dry and rotten! Thou canst not tell the cause. Not long ago, a neighbour oak, with which its roots were twined, in falling wrenched them with such cruel force, that though we covered them again with care, its beauty withered, and it pined away. So could we look into the human breast, how oft the fatal blight that meets our view, should we trace down to the torn bleeding fibres of a too trusting heart, where it were shame, for pitying tears, to give contempt or blame. Street walks. The month was over, the honeymoon to the newly married, the exquisite convalescence to the living mother of a living child, the first dark days of nothingness to the widow and the child bereaved, the term of penance, of hard labour, and of solitary confinement to the shrinking, shivering, hopeless prisoner. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me. Shall you, or I, receive such blessing? I know one who will. An overseer of a foundry, an aged man, with hoary hair, has spent his Sabbaths for many years in visiting the prisoners and the afflicted in Manchester New Bailey, not merely advising and comforting, but putting means into their power of regaining the virtue and the peace they had lost, becoming himself their guarantee in obtaining employment, and never deserting those who have once asked help from him. Esther's term of imprisonment was ended. She received a good character in the governor's books. She had picked her daily quantity of oakum, had never deserved the extra punishment of the treadmill, and had been civil and decorous in her language. And once more she was out of prison. The door closed behind her with a ponderous clang, and in her desolation she felt as if shut out of home, from the only shelter she could meet with, houseless and penniless as she was, on that dreary day. But it was but for an instant that she stood there doubting. One thought had haunted her both by night and by day, with monomaniacal incessancy, and that thought was how to save Mary, her dead sister's only child, her own little pet in the days of her innocence, from following in the same downward path to vice. To whom could she speak and ask for aid? She shrank from the idea of addressing John Barton again, her heart sank within her at the remembrance of his fierce repulsing action and far fiercer words. It seemed worse than death to reveal her condition to Mary, else she sometimes thought that this course would be the most terrible, the most efficient warning. She must speak. To that she was soul compelled. But to whom? She dreaded addressing any of her former female acquaintance even supposing they had sense, or spirit, or interest enough to undertake her mission. To whom shall the outcast prostitute tell her tale? Who will give her help in the day of need? Hers is the leper sin, and all stand aloof dreading to be counted unclean. In her wild night wanderings she had noted the haunts and habits of many a one who little thought of a watcher in the poor forsaken woman. You may easily imagine that a double interest was attached by her to the ways and companionships of those with whom she had been acquainted in the days which, when present, she had considered hardly worked and monotonous, but which now, in retrospection, seemed so happy and unclouded. Accordingly, she had, as we have seen, known where to meet with John Barton on that unfortunate night, 
which had only produced irritation in him, and a month's imprisonment to her. She had also observed that he was still intimate with the Wilsons. She had seen him walking and talking with both father and son, her old friends too, and she had shed unregarded, unvalued tears, when some one had casually told her of George Wilson's sudden death. It now flashed across her mind that to the son, to Mary's playfellow, her elder brother in the days of childhood, her tale might be told, and listened to with interest by him, and some mode of action suggested by which Mary might be guarded and saved. All these thoughts had passed through her mind while yet she was in prison, so when she was turned out her purpose was clear, and she did not feel her desolation of freedom as she would otherwise have done. That night she stationed herself early near the foundry where she knew Jem worked. He stayed later than usual, being detained by some arrangements for the morrow. She grew tired and impatient. Many workmen had come out of the door in the long, dead brick wall, and eagerly had she peered into their faces, deaf to all insult or curse. He must have gone home early. One more turn in the street, and she would go. During that turn he came out, and in the quiet of that street of workshops and warehouses she directly heard his steps. How her heart failed her for an instant! But still she was not daunted from her purpose, painful as its fulfilment was sure to be. She laid her hand on his arm. As she expected, after a momentary glance at the person who thus endeavoured to detain him, he made an effort to shake it off and pass on. But, trembling as she was, she had provided against this by a firm and unusual grasp. "'You must listen to me, Jem Wilson,' she said, with almost an accent of command. "'Go away, missis. I've nought to do with you, either in heartening or talking.' He made another struggle. "'You must listen,' she said again, authoritatively, "'for Mary Barton's sake.' The spell of her name was as potent as that of the mariner's glittering eye. He listened like a three-year child. "'I know you care enough for her to wish to save her from harm.' He interrupted his earnest gaze into her face, with the exclamation, "'And who can you be to know Mary Barton, or to know that she's out to me?' There was a little strife in Esther's mind for an instant, between the shame of acknowledging herself and the additional weight to her revelation which such acknowledgment would give. Then she spoke. "'Do you remember Esther, the sister of John Barton's wife, the aunt to Mary, and the valentine I sent you last February ten years?' "'Yes, I mind her well. But you're not Esther, are you?' He looked again into her face, and seeing that indeed it was his boyhood's friend, he took her hand, and shook it with a cordiality that forgot the present in the past. "'Why, Esther, where in you been this many a year? Where in you been wondering that we none of us could find you out?' The question was asked thoughtlessly, but answered with fierce earnestness. "'Where have I been? What have I been doing? Why do you torment me with questions like these? Can you not guess?' But the story of my life is wanted to give forth to my speech. Afterwards I will tell it you. Nay, don't change your fickle mind now and say you don't want to hear it. You must hear it, and I must tell it, and then see after Mary, and take care she doesn't become like me. As she's loving now, so did I love once, one above me far. She remarked not, in her own absorption, the change in Jem's breathing the sudden clutch at the wall which told the fearfully vivid interest he took in what she said. He was so handsome, so kind. Well, the regiment was ordered to Chester. Did I tell you he was an officer? And he could not bear to part from me, nor I from him. So he took me with him. I never thought poor Mary would have taken it so to heart. I always meant to send for her to pay me a visit when I were married, for, mark you, he promised me marriage they all do. Then came three years of happiness. I suppose I ought not to have been happy, but I was. I had a little girl, too. Oh, the sweetest darling that ever was seen. But I must not think of her, putting her hand wildly up to her forehead, or I shall go mad, I shall. 
don't tell me any more about yourself said jem soothingly what you're tired already are you but i will tell you as you've asked for it you shall hear it i won't recall the agony of the past for nothing i will have the relief of telling it oh how happy i was sinking her voice into a plaintive childlike manner it went like a shot through me when one day he came to me and told me he was ordered to ireland and must leave me behind at bristol with enwer jem muttered some words she caught their meaning and in a pleading voice continued oh don't abuse him don't speak a word against him you don't know how i love him yet when i'm sunk so low you don't guess how kind he was he gave me fifty pounds before we parted and i knew he could ill spare it don't jem please as his muttered indignation rose again for her sake he ceased i might have done better with the money i see now but i didn't know the value of it then formerly i'd earned it easily enough at the factory and as i had no more sensible ones i spent it on dress and on eating while i lived with him i had it for asking and fifty pounds would i thought go a long way so i went back to chester where i'd been so happy and set up a small ware shop and i had a room near we should have done well but alas alas my little girl fell ill and i couldn't mind my shop and her too and things grew worse and worse i sold my goods anyhow to get money to buy her food and medicine i wrote over and over again to her father for help but he must have changed his quarters for i never got an answer the landlord seized the few bobbins and tapes i had left for shop rent and the person to whom the mean little room to which we had been forced to remove belonged threatened to turn us out unless his rent was paid it had run on so many weeks and it was winter cold bleak winter and my child was so ill so ill and i was starving and i couldn't bear to see her suffer and forgot how much better it would be for us to die together oh her moans and moans which money could give the means of relieving so i went out into the street one january night do you think god will punish me for that she asked with wild vehemence, almost amounting to insanity and shaking jem's arm in order to force an answer from him but before he could shape his heart's sympathy into words her voice had lost its wildness and she spoke with the quiet of despair but it's no matter i've done that since which separates us as far asunder as heaven and hell can be her voice rose again to the sharp pitch of agony my darling my darling even after death i may not see thee my own sweet one she was so good like a little angel what is that text i don't remember the text mother used to teach me when i sat on her knee long ago it begins blessed are the pure blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god ay that's it it would break mother's heart if she knew where i am now it did break mary's heart you see and now i recollect it was about her child i wanted to see you jem you know mary barton don't you said she trying to collect her thoughts yes jem knew her how well his beating heart could testify well there's something to do for her i forget what wait a minute oh, she's so like my little girl said she raising her eyes glistening with unshed tears in search of the sympathy of jem's countenance he deeply pitied her but oh how he longed to recall her mind to the subject of mary and the lover above her in rank and the service to be done for her sake but he controlled himself to silence after a while she spoke again and in a calmer voice when i came to manchester for i couldn't stay in chester after her death i found you all out very soon and yet i never thought my poor sister was dead i suppose i wouldn't think so i used to watch about the court where john lived for many and many a night and gather all i could about them from the neighbours talk for i never asked a question i put this and that together and followed one and listened to another many's the time i've watched the policeman off his beat and peeped through the chink of the window shutter to see the old room and sometimes mary or her father sitting up late for some reason or another i found out mary went to learn dressmaking 
and I began to be frightened for her, for it's a bad life for a girl to be out late at night in the streets, and after many an hour of weary work they're ready to follow after any novelty that makes a little change. But I made up my mind that bad as I was I could watch over Mary, and perhaps keep her from harm. So I used to wait for her at nights, and follow her home, often when she little knew any one was near her. There was one of her companions I never could abide, and I'm sure that girl is at the bottom of some mischief. By and by Mary's walks homewards were not alone. She was joined soon after she came out by a man, a gentleman. I began to fear for her, for I saw she was light-hearted, and pleased with his attentions, and I thought worse of him for having such long talks with that bold girl I told you of. But I was laid up for a long time with spitting of blood, and could do nothing. I'm sure it made me worse, thinking about what might be happening to Mary. And when I came out, all was going on as before, only she seemed fonder of him than ever. And, oh, Gemma, father won't listen to me. And it's you that must save Mary. You're like a brother to her, and maybe could give her advice and watch over her. And at any rate, John will hearken to you. Only he's so stern and so cruel. She began to cry a little at the remembrance of his harsh words, but Jem cut her short by his hoarse, stern inquiry. "'Who is this spark that Mary loves? Tell me his name.' "'It's young Carson, old Carson's son, that your father worked for.' There was a pause. She broke the silence. "'Oh, Jem, I charge you with the care of her. I suppose it would be murder to kill her. "'But it would be better for her to die than to live to lead such a life as I do. "'Do you hear me, Jem?' "'Yes, I hear you. It would be better. Better we were all dead.' "'This was said as if thinking aloud, but he immediately changed his tone and continued. "'Esther, you may trust to my doing all I can for Mary. "'That I have determined on. And now listen to me. You love the life you lead.' else you wouldn't speak of it as you do. Come home with me. Come to my mother. She and my Aunt Alice live together. I'll see that they give you a welcome. And tomorrow I'll see if some honest way of living can't be found for you. Come home with me. She was silent for a minute, and he hoped he had gained his point. Then she said, God bless you, Jem, for the words you've just spoken. Some years ago you might have saved me. "'as I hope and trust you will yet save Mary. "'But it's too late now, too late,' she added, "'with accents of deep despair. "'Still he did not relax his hold. "'Come home,' he said. "'I tell you, I cannot. "'I could not lead a virtuous life if I would. "'I should only disgrace you. "'If you will know all,' said she, "'as he still seemed inclined to urge her, "'I must have drink.' Such as live like me could not bear life if they did not drink. It's the only thing to keep us from suicide. If we did not drink, we could not stand the memory of what we have been, and the thought of what we are for a day. If I go without food, and without shelter, I must have my dram. Oh, you don't know the awful nights I've had in prison for want of it, said she, shuddering, and glaring round with terrified eyes, as if dreading to see some spiritual creature with dim form nearer. It's so frightful to see them, whispering in tones of wildness, although so low-spoken. There they go, round and round my bed the whole night through, my mother carrying little Annie. I wonder how they got together, and Mary, and all looking at me with their sad, stony eyes. Oh, Jem, it's so terrible! They don't turn back either, but pass behind the head of the bed, and I feel their eyes on me everywhere. If I creep under the clothes, I still see them, and what's worse, she's hissing out her word with fright, they see me. Don't speak to me of leading a better life. I must have a drink. I cannot pass tonight without a dram. I dare not. Jem was silent from deep sympathy. Oh, could he then do nothing for her? She spoke again, but in a less excited tone, although it was thrillingly earnest. You are grieved for me. I know it better than if you told me in words. 
but you can do nothing for me. I am past hope. You can yet save Mary. You must. She is innocent, except for the great error of loving one above her in station. Jem, you will save her. With heart and soul, though in few words, Jem promised that if aught earthly could keep her from falling, he would do it. Then she blessed him, and bade him good night. "'Stay a minute,' said he, as she was on the point of departure. "'I may want to speak to you again. I must know where to find you. Where do you live?' She laughed strangely. <laughs> "'And do you think one sunk so low as I am has a home? Decent, good people have homes. We have none. No. If you want me, come at night and look at the corners of the streets about here.' The colder, the bleaker, the more stormy the night, the more certain you will be to find me. For then, she added, with a plaintive fall in her voice, it's so cold sleeping in entries and on doorsteps, and I want to dram more than ever. Again she rapidly turned off, and Jem also went on his way. But before he reached the end of the street, even in the midst of the jealous anguish that filled his heart, his conscience smote him. He had not done enough to save her. One more effort, and she might have come. Nay, twenty efforts would have been well rewarded by her yielding. He turned back, but she was gone. And the tumult of his other feeling, his self-reproach, was deadened for the time. But many and many a day afterwards he bitterly regretted his omission of duty, his weariness of well-doing. Now the great thing was to reach home and solitude. Mary loved another. Oh, how should he bear it? He had thought her rejection of him a hard trial, but that was nothing now. He only remembered it to be thankful that he had not yielded to the temptation of trying his fate again. Not in actual words, but in a meeting where her manner should tell far more than words. That her sweet smiles, her dainty movements, her pretty household ways were all to be reserved to gladden another's eyes and heart. And he must live on. That seemed the strangest. But a long life, and he knew men did live long, even with deep biting sorrow corroding at their hearts, must be spent without Mary. Nay, with the consciousness she was another's. That hell of thought he would reserve for the quiet of his own room, the dead stillness of night. He was on the threshold of home now. He entered. There were the usual faces the usual sights. He loathed them, and then he cursed himself because he loathed them. His mother's love had taken a cross turn because he had kept the tempting supper she had prepared for him waiting until it was nearly spoilt. Alice, her dulled senses deadening day by day, sat mutely near the fire, her happiness bounded by the consciousness of the presence of her foster-child, knowing that his voice repeated what was passing to her deafened ear that his arm removed each little obstacle to her tottering step. And Will, out of the very kindness of his heart, talked more and more merrily than ever. He saw Jem was downcast, and fancied his rattling might cheer him. At any rate, it drowned his aunt's muttered grumblings, and in some measure concealed the blank of the evening. At last bedtime came, and Will withdrew to his neighbouring lodging, and Jane and Alice Wilson had raked the fire, and fastened doors and shutters, and pattered upstairs with their tottering footsteps and shrill voices. Jem, too, went to the closet termed his bedroom. There was no bolt to the door, but by one strong effort of his right arm a heavy chest was moved against it, and he could sit down on the side of his bed and think. Mary loved another. That idea would rise uppermost in his mind, and had to be combated in all its forms of pain. It was, perhaps, no great wonder that she should prefer one so much above Jem in the external things of life. But the gentleman, why did he, with his range of choice among the ladies of the land, why did he stoop down to carry off the poor man's darling? With all the glories of the garden at his hand, why did he prefer to cull the wild rose? Jem's own fragrant wild rose. His own! Oh, never now his own! Gone for evermore! Then uprose the guilty longing for blood, 
the frenzy of jealousy. Someone should die. Who'd rather Mary were dead, cold in her grave, than that she were another's? A vision of her pale, sweet face, with her bright hair all bedabbled with gore, seemed to float constantly before his aching eyes. But hers were ever open, and contained, in their soft, deathly look, such mute reproach. What had she done to deserve such cruel treatment from him? She had been wooed by one who Jem knew to be handsome, gay, and bright, and she had given him her love. That was all. It was the wooer who should die. Yes, die, knowing the cause of his death. Jem pictured him, and gloated on the picture, lying smitten, yet conscious, and listening to the upbraiding accusation of his murderer. How he had left his own rank, and dared to love a maiden of low degree, and, oh, stinging agony of all, how she, in return, had loved him. Then the other nature spoke up, and bade him remember the anguish he should so prepare for Mary. At first he refused to listen to that better voice, or listened only to pervert. He would glory in her wailing grief, he would take pleasure in her desolation of heart. No, he could not, said the still, small voice. It would be worse, far worse, to have caused such woe, than it was now to bear his present heavy burden. But it was too heavy, too grievous to be born and live. He would slay himself, and the lovers should love on, and the sun shine bright, and he with his burning woeful heart would be at rest, rest that is reserved for the people of God. Had he not promised, with such earnest purpose of soul as makes words more solemn than oaths, to save Mary from becoming such as Esther? Should he shrink from the duties of life into the cowardliness of death? Who would then guard Mary with her love and her innocence? Would it not be a goodly thing to serve her, although she loved him not, to be her preserving angel through the perils of life, and she unconscious all the while? He braced up his soul, and said to himself that with God's help he would be that earthly keeper. And now the mists and the storms seemed clearing away from his path, though it still was full of stinging thorns. Having done the duty nearest to him, of reducing the tumult of his own heart to something like order, the second became more plain before him. Poor Esther's experience had led her, perhaps too hastily, to the conclusion that Mr. Carson's intentions were evil towards Mary. At least she had given no just ground for the fears she entertained that such was the case. It was possible, nay, to Jem's heart very probable, that he might only be too happy to marry her. She was a lady by right of nature, Jem thought, in movement, grace, and spirit. What was birth to a Manchester manufacturer, many of whom glory, and justly too, in being the architects of their own fortunes? And as far as wealth was concerned, judging another by himself, Jem could only imagine it a great privilege to lay it at the feet of the loved one. Harry Carson's mother had been a factory girl, so, after all, what was the great reason for doubting his intentions towards Mary? There might probably be some little awkwardness about the affair at first, Mary's father having such strong prejudices on the one hand, and something of the same kind being likely to exist on the part of Mr. Carson's family. But Jem knew he had power over John Barton's mind, and it would be something to exert that power in promoting Mary's happiness, and to relinquish all thought of self in so doing. Oh, why had Esther chosen him for this office? It was beyond his strength to act rightly. Why had she singled him out? The answer came when he was calm enough to listen for it. Because Mary had no other friend capable of the duty required of him, the duty of his brother, as Esther imagined him to be in feeling, from his long friendship, he would be unto her as a brother. As such... He ought to ascertain Harry Carson's intentions towards her in winning her affections. He would ask him straightforwardly, as became man speaking to man, not concealing, if need were, the interest he felt in Mary. Then, with the resolve to do his duty to the best of his power, peace came into his soul. He had left the windy storm and tempest behind. 
two hours before day dawn, he fell asleep. End of chapter 14 of Mary Barton by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell Chapter 15 A Violent Meeting Between the Rivals What thoughtful heart can look into this gulf that darkly yawns, twixt, rich and poor, and not find food for saddest meditation, can see without a pang of keenest grief, them fiercely battling like some natural foes whom God had made, with help and sympathy, to stand as brothers, side by side, united. Where is the wisdom that shall bridge this gulf and bind them once again in trust and love. Love Truths We must return to John Barton, poor John. He never got over his disappointing journey to London. The deep mortification he then experienced, with, perhaps, as little selfishness for its cause as mortification ever had, was of no temporary nature, indeed, few of his feelings were. Then came a long period of bodily privation, of daily hunger after food, and though he tried to persuade himself he could bear want himself with social indifference, and did care about it as little as most men, yet the body took its revenge for its uneasy feelings. The mind became soured and morose, and lost much of its equipped poise. It was no longer elastic as in the days of youth, or in times of comparative happiness it ceased to hope, and it is hard to live on when one can no longer hope. The same state of feeling which John Barton entertained, if belonging to one who had leisure to think of such things, and physicians to give names to them, would have been called monomania. So haunting, so incessant, were the thoughts that pressed upon him. I have somewhere read a forcibly described punishment among the Italians, worthy of a Borgia. The supposed or real criminal was shut up in a room, supplied with every convenience and luxury, and at first mourned little over his imprisonment but day by day he became aware that the space between the walls of his apartment was narrowing, and then he understood the end. Those painted walls would come into hideous nearness, and at last crush the light out of him. And so day by day, nearer and nearer, came the diseased thoughts of John Barton. They excluded the light of heaven, the cheering sounds of earth, they were preparing his death. It is true much of their morbid power might be ascribed to the use of opium. But before you blame too harshly this use, or rather abuse, try a hopeless life, with daily cravings of the body for food. Try not alone being without hope yourself, but seeing all around you reduced to the same despair, arising from the same circumstances, all around you telling, though they use no words or language, by their looks and feeble actions, that they are suffering and sinking under the pressure of want. Would you not be glad to forget life and its burdens? And opium gives forgetfulness for a time. It is true they who thus purchased it pay dearly for their oblivion, but can you expect the uneducated to count the cost of their whistle? Poor wretches, they pay a heavy price. Days of oppressive weariness and languor, whose realities have the feeble sickliness of dreams. Nights, whose dreams are fierce realities of agony. Sinking health tottering frames, incipient madness, and worse, the consciousness of incipient madness. This is the price of their whistle, 
but have you taught them the science of consequences? John Barton's overpowering thought, which was to work out his fate on earth, was rich and poor. Why are they so separate, so distinct, when God has made them all? It is not his will that their interests are so far apart. Whose doing is it? And so on into the problems and mysteries of life, until, bewildered and lost, unhappy and suffering, the only feeling that remained clear and undisturbed in the tumult of his heart was hatred to the one class, and keen sympathy with the other. But what availed his sympathy? No education had given him wisdom, and without wisdom even love, with all its effects, too often works but harm. He acted to the best of his judgment, but it was a widely erring judgment. The actions of the uneducated seem to me typified in those of Frankenstein, that monster of many human qualities, ungifted with a soul, a knowledge of the difference between good and evil. The people rise up to life, they irritate us, they terrify us, and we become their enemies. Then, in the sorrowful moment of our triumphant power, their eyes gaze on us with mute reproach. Why have we made them what they are, a powerful monster, yet without the inner means for peace and happiness? John Barton became a Chartist, a Communist, all that is commonly called wild and visionary. Ay, but being visionary is something. It shows a soul, a being not altogether sensual, a creature who looks forward for others, if not for himself, and with all his weakness he had a sort of practical power, which made him useful to the bodies of men to whom he belonged. He had a ready kind of rough Lancashire eloquence, arising out of the fullness of his heart, which was very stirring to men similarly circumstanced, who liked to hear their feelings put into words. He had a pretty clear head at times, for method and arrangement, a necessary talent to large combinations of men, and what perhaps more than all made him relied upon and valued, was the consciousness which every one who came in contact with him felt, that he was actuated by no selfish motives, that his class, his order, was what he stood by, not the rights of his own paltry self. For even in great and noble men, as soon as self comes into prominent existence, it becomes a mean and paltry thing. A little time before this, there had come one of those occasions for deliberation among the employed, which deeply interested John Barton, and the discussions concerning which had caused his frequent absence from home of late. I am not sure if I can express myself in the technical terms of either masters or workmen, but I will try simply to state the case on which the latter deliberated. An order for coarse goods came in from a new foreign market. It was a large order, giving employment to all the mills engaged in that species of manufacture, but it was necessary to execute it speedily, and at as low prices as possible, as the masters had reason to believe that a duplicate order had been sent to one of the continental manufacturing towns where there were no restrictions on food, no taxes on building or machinery, and where consequently they dreaded that the goods could be made at a much lower price than they could afford them for, and that, by so acting and charging, the rival manufacturers would obtain undivided possession of the market. It was clearly their interest to buy cotton as cheaply, and to beat down wages as low as possible, and in the long run the interests of the workmen would have been thereby benefited. 
distrust each other as they may, the employers and the employed must rise or fall together. There may be some difference as to chronology, none as to fact, but the masters did not choose to make all these circumstances known. They stood upon being the masters, and that they had a right to order work at their own prices and they believed that in the present depression of trade and unemployment of hands, there would be no great difficulty in getting it done. Now let us turn to the workmen's view of the question. The masters of the tottering foundation, of whose prosperity they were ignorant, seemed doing well, and, like gentlemen, lived at home in ease, while they were starving gasping on from day to day, and there was a foreign order to be executed, the extent of which, large as it was, was greatly exaggerated, and it was to be done speedily. Why were the masters offering such low wages under these circumstances? Shame upon them! It was taking advantage of their work people being almost starved, but they would starve entirely, rather than come into such terms. It was bad enough to be poor, while by the labour of their thin hands, the sweat of their brows, the masters were made rich, but they would not be utterly ground down to dust. No, they would fold their hands and sit idle, and smile at the masters, whom even in death they could baffle. With Spartan endurance they determined to let the employers know their power, by refusing to work. So class distrusted class, and their want of mutual confidence wrought sorrow to both. The masters would not be bullied, and compelled to reveal why they felt it wisest and best to offer only such low wages. They would not be made to tell that they were even sacrificing capital to obtain a decisive victory over the continental manufacturers. And the workmen sat silent and stern, with folded hands, refusing to work for such pay. There was a strike in Manchester. Of course it was succeeded by the usual consequences. Many other trades unions connected with different branches of business, supported with money, countenance, and encouragement of every kind. The stand which the Manchester power loom weavers were making against their masters. Delegates from Glasgow, from Nottingham, and other towns were sent to Manchester to keep up the spirit of resistance. A committee was formed and all the requisite officers elected, chairman, treasurer, honorary secretary, among them was John Barton. The masters, meanwhile, took their measure. They placarded the walls with advertisements for power loom weavers. The workmen replied by a placard in still larger letters, stating their grievances. The masters met daily in town to mourn over the time, so far slipping away, for the fulfilment of the foreign orders, and to strengthen each other in their resolution not to yield. If they gave up now, they might give up always. It would never do. And amongst the most energetic of the masters, the Carsons, father and son, took their places. It is well known that there is no religionist so zealous as a convert, no masters so stern, and regardless of the interests of their work people, as those who have risen from such a station themselves. This would account for the elder Mr. Carson's determination not to be bullied into yielding, not even to be bullied into giving reasons for acting as the masters did, it was the employer's will, and that should be enough for the employed. Harry Carson did not trouble himself much about the grounds for his conduct. 
He liked the excitement of the affair. He liked the attitude of resistance. He was brave, and he liked the idea of personal danger, with which some of the more cautious tried to intimidate the violent among the masters. Meanwhile, the power loom weavers living in the more remote parts of Lancashire and the neighbouring counties heard of the master's advertisements for workmen, and in their solitary dwellings grew weary of starvation, and resolved to come to Manchester. Footsore, way-worn, half-starved looking men they were, as they tried to steal into town in the early dawn, before people were astir, or in the dusk of the evening. And now began the real wrongdoing of the trades' unions. As to their decision to work, or not, at such a particular rate of wages, that was either wise or unwise, all error of judgment at the worst. But they had no right to tyrannise over others, and tie them down to their own procrustean bed. A boring, what they considered oppression in the masters. Why did they oppress others? Because, when men get excited, they know not what they do. Judge, then, with something of the mercy of the Holy One, whom we all love. In spite of policemen set to watch over the safety of the poor country weavers, in spite of magistrates, and prisons, and severe punishments, the poor depressed men tramping in from Burnley, Paddingham, and other places, to work at the condemned starvation prices, were waylaid and beaten, and left by the roadside almost for dead. The police broke up every lounging knot of men. They separated quietly, to reunite half a mile out of town. Of course, the feeling between the masters and the workmen did not improve under these circumstances. Combination is an awful power. It is like the equally mighty agency of steam, capable of almost unlimited good or evil. But to obtain a blessing on its labours, it must work under the direction of a high and intelligent will incapable of being misled by passion or excitement. The will of the operatives had not been guided to the calmness of wisdom. So much for generalities. Let us now return to individuals. A note, respectfully worded, although its tone of determination was strong, had been sent by the power loom weavers, requesting that a deputation of them might have a meeting with the masters, to state the conditions they must have fulfilled before they would end the turnout. They thought they had attained a sufficiently commanding position to dictate. John Barton was appointed one of the deputation. The masters agreed to this meeting, being anxious to end the strife although undetermined among themselves how far they should yield, or whether they should yield at all. Some of the old, whose experience had taught them sympathy, were for concession. Others, white-headed men too, had only learnt hardness and obstinacy from the days of the years of their lives, and sneered at the more gentle and yielding. The younger men were one and all for an unflinching resistance to claims urged with so much violence. Of this party, Harry Carson was the leader. But like all energetic people, the more he had to do, the more time he seemed to find. With all his letter-writing, his calling, his being present at the new bailey, when investigations of any case of violence against knobsticks were going on, he beset Mary more than ever. She was weary of her life for him. From blandishments he had even gone to threats, 
threats that whether she would or not she should be his. He showed an indifference that was most insulting to everything which might attract attention and injure her character. Knobsticks, those who consent to work at lower wages. And still she never saw Jem. She knew he had returned home. She heard of him occasionally through his cousin, who roved gaily from house to house, finding and making friends everywhere. But she never saw him. What was she to think? Had he given her up? Were a few hasty words, spoken in a moment of irritation, to stamp her lot through life? At times she thought, that she could bear this meekly, happy in her own constant power of loving, for of change or of forgetfulness she did not dream. Then at other times her state of impatience was such that it required all her self-restraint to prevent her from going and seeking him out, and, as man would do to man or woman to woman, begging him to forgive her hasty words, and allow her to retract them, and bidding him accept of the love that was filling her whole heart. She wished Margaret had not advised her against such a manner of proceeding. She believed it was her friend's words that seemed to make such a simple action impossible, in spite of all the internal urgings but a friend's advice is only thus powerful when it puts into language the secret oracle of our souls. It was the whisperings of her womanly nature that caused her to shrink from any unmaidenly action, not Margaret's counsel. All this time, this ten days or so, of Will's visit to Manchester, there was something going on which interested Mary even now, and which, in former times, would have exceedingly amused and excited her. She saw as clearly as if told in words that the merry, random, boisterous sailor had fallen deeply in love with the quiet, prim, somewhat plain Margaret. She doubted if Margaret was aware of it, and yet, as she watched more closely, she began to think some instinct made the blind girl feel whose eyes were so often fixed upon her pale face, that some inner feeling made the delicate and becoming rose flush steal over her countenance. She did not speak so decidedly as before. There was a hesitation in her manner that seemed to make her very attractive as if something softer, more lovable than excellent sense, were coming in as a motive for speech. Her eyes had always been soft, and were in no ways disfigured by her blindness, and now seemed to have a new charm, as they quivered under their white downcast lids. She must be conscious, thought Mary, heart answering to heart. Will's love had no blushings, no downcast eyes, no weighing of words. It was as open and undisguised as his nature, yet he seemed afraid of the answer its acknowledgment might meet with. It was Margaret's angelic voice that had entranced him, and which made him think of her as a being of some other sphere that he feared to woo so he tried to propitiate Job in all manner of ways. He went over to Liverpool to rummage in his great sea chest for the flying fish. No very odorous present, by the way. He hesitated over a child's call for some time, which was, in his eyes, a far greater treasure than any ex exotest. What use could it be of to a landsman? Then Margaret's voice rung in his ears, and he determined to sacrifice it, his most precious possession, to one whom she loved as she did her grandfather. It was rather a relief to him, 
when, having put it and the flying fish together in a brown paper parcel, and sat upon them for security all the way in the railroad, he found that Job was so indifferent to the precious call that he might easily claim it again. He hung about Margaret till he had received many warnings and reproaches from his conscience in behalf of his dear Aunt Alice's claims upon his time. He went away, then he bethought him of some other little word with Job, and he turned back and stood talking once more in Margaret's presence, door in hand, only waiting for some little speech of encouragement to come in and sit down again. But as the invitation was not given, he was forced to leave at last and go and do his duty. Four days had Jem Wilson watched for Mr. Harry Carson without success. His hours of going and returning to his home were so irregular, owing to the meetings and consultations among the masters, which were rendered necessary by the turn-out. On the fifth, without any purpose on Jem's part, they met. It was the workman's dinner hour, the interval between twelve and one, when the streets of Manchester are comparatively quiet. For a few shopping ladies and lounging gentlemen count for nothing in that busy, bustling living place. Jem had been on an errand for his master, instead of returning to his dinner and in passing along a lane, a road, called, in compliment to the intentions of some future builder and street. He encountered Harry Carson the only person, as far as he saw, beside himself, treading the unfrequented path. Along one side ran a high broad fence, blackened over by coal tar, and spiked and stuck with pointed nails at the top, to prevent any one from climbing over into the garden beyond. By this fence was the footpath. The carriage road was such as no carriage, no, not even a cart, could possibly have passed along without Hercules to assist in lifting it out of the deep clay ruts. On the other side of the way was a dead brick wall, and a field after that, where there was a saw pit and joiner's shed. Jem's heart beat violently when he saw the gay, handsome young man approaching, with a light buoyant step. This, then, was he whom Mary loved. It was, perhaps, no wonder, for he seemed to the poor smith so elegant, so well appointed, that he felt the superiority in externals, strangely and painfully, for an instant. Then something uprose within him, and told him, that a man's a man for a that, for a that, and twice as much as a that and he no longer felt troubled by the outward appearance of his rival. Harry Carson came on, lightly bounding over the dirty places with almost a lad's buoyancy. To his surprise the dark, sturdy-looking artisan stopped him by saying respectfully, "'May I speak a word with you, sir?' "'Certainly, my good man,' looking his astonishment, then finding that the promised speech did not come very quickly, he added, But make haste, for I'm in a hurry. Jem had cast about for some less abrupt way of broaching the subject uppermost in his mind than he now found himself obliged to use. With a husky voice that trembled as he spoke, he said, I think, sir, you're keeping company with a young woman called Mary Barton. A light broke in upon Henry Carson's mind, and he paused before he gave the answer for which the other waited. Could this man be a lover of Mary's? And, strange, stinging thought, could he be beloved by her, and so have caused her obstinate rejection of himself? He looked at Jem from head to foot, a black, grimy mechanic, 
in dirty fustian clothes, strongly built and awkward, according to the dancing master. Then he glanced at himself, and recalled the reflection he had so lately quitted in his bedroom. It was impossible. No woman with eyes could choose the one when the other wooed. It was Hyperion to a satyr. That quotation came aptly. He forgot that a man's a man for a that. And yet there was a clue, which he had often wanted, to her changed conduct towards him. If she loved this man, if he hated the fellow, and longed to strike him, he would know all. Mary Barton, let me see. Aye, that is the name of the girl. An arrant flirt the little hussy is, but very pretty. Aye, Mary Barton is her name. Jem bit his lips. Was it then so that Mary was a flirt? the giddy creature of whom he spoke. He would not believe it, and yet how he wished the suggestive words unspoken. That thought must keep now, though. Even if she were, the more reason for there being someone to protect her, poor faulty darling. She's a good girl, sir, though maybe a bit set up with her beauty, but she's her father's only child, sir, and he stopped. He did not like to express suspicion, and yet he was determined he would be certain there was ground for none. What should he say? Well, my fine fellow, and what have I to do with that? It's but loss of my time and yours too. If you've only stopped me to tell me Mary Barton is very pretty, I know that well enough. He seemed as though he would have gone on, but Jem put his black, working right hand upon his arm to detain him. The haughty young man shook it off, and with his glove pretended to brush away the sooty contamination that might be left upon his light great coat sleeve. The little action aroused Jem. I will tell you in plain words what I have got to say to you, young man. It's been told me by one as knows and has seen that you walk with this same Mary Barton, and are known to be courting her, and her as spoke to me about it, thinks as how Mary loves you. That may be, or may not, but I'm an old friend of hers and her father's, and I just wish to know if you mean to marry the girl. Spite of what you said of her lightness, I had known her long enough to be sure she'll make a noble wife for any one. Let him be what he may, and I mean to stand by her like a brother, and if you mean rightly, you'll not think the worst on me for what I've now said. And if, but no, I'll not say what I'll do to the man who wrongs a hair of her head. He shall rue it to the longest day he lives, that's all. Now, sir, what I ask of you is this, if you mean fair and honourable by her, well and good, but if not, for your own sake as well as hers, leave her alone, and never speak to her more. Jem's voice quivered with the earnestness with which he spoke, and he eagerly waited for some answer. Harry Carson, meanwhile, instead of attending very particularly to the purpose the man had in addressing him, was trying to gather from his speech what was the real state of the case. He succeeded so far as to comprehend that Jem inclined to believe that Mary loved his rival, and consequently that if the speaker were attached to her himself, he was not a favoured admirer. The idea came into Mr. Carson's mind that perhaps, after all, Mary loved him in spite of her frequent and obstinate rejections, and that she had employed this person, whoever he was, to bully him into marrying her. He resolved to try and ascertain more correctly the man's relation to her. Either he was a lover, and if so, not a favoured one. 
in which case Mr. Carson could not at all understand the man's motives for interesting himself in securing her marriage, or he was a friend, and an accomplice, whom she had employed to bully him. So little faith in goodness have the mean and selfish. Before I make you into my confidant, my good man, said Mr. Carson, in a contemptuous tone, I think it might be as well to inquire your right to meddle with our affairs. Neither Mary nor I, as I conceive, called you in as a mediator. He paused. He wanted a distinct answer to the last supposition. None came. So he began to imagine he was to be threatened into some engagement, and his angry spirit rose. And so, my fine fellow, you will have the kindness to leave us to ourselves, and not to meddle with what does not concern you. If you were a brother or a father of hers, the case might have been different. As it is, I can only consider you an impertinent meddler. Again he would have passed on, but Jem stood in a determined way before him, saying, you say, if I had been her brother or her father, you'd have answered me what I ask. Now, neither father nor brother could love her as I have loved her, I, and as I love her still. If love gives a right to satisfaction, it's next to impossible any one breathing can come up to my right. Now, sir, tell me, do you mean fair by Mary or not? I've proved my claim to know, and, by G, I will know. Come, come, no impudence, replied Mr. Carson, who, having discovered what he wanted to know, namely, that Jem was the lover of Mary's, and that she was not encouraging his suit, wished to pass on, father, brother, or rejected lover, with an emphasis on the word rejected. No one has a right to interfere between my little girl and me. Not one shall. Confound you, man. Get out of my way, or I'll make you. As Jem still obstructed his path with dog determination. I won't, then, till you give me your word about Mary, replied the mechanic, grinding his words out between his teeth, and the livid paleness of the anger he could no longer keep down, covering his face, till he looked ghastly. Won't you? With a taunting laugh. Then I'll make you. The young man raised his slight cane, and smote the artisan across the face with a stinging stroke. An instant afterwards he lay stretched in the muddy road, Jem standing over him, panting with rage. What he would have done next in his moment of ungovernable passion no one knows, but a policeman from the main street into which this road led had been sauntering about for some time, unobserved by the either of the parties, and expecting some kind of conclusion like the present to the violent discussion going on between the two young men. In a minute he had pinioned Jem, who sullenly yielded to the surprise. Mr. Carson was on his feet directly, his face glowing with rage or shame. "'Shall I take him to the lock-up for assault, sir?' said the policeman. "'No, no,' exclaimed Mr. Carson. "'I struck him first. It was no assault on his side, though,' he continued, hissing out his words to Jem who even hated freedom procured for him, however justly, at the intervention of his rival. I will never forgive or forget insult. Trust me, he gasped the words in excess of passion. Mary shall fare no better for your insolent interference, he laughed, as if with the consciousness of power. Jem replied with equal excitement, and if you dare to injure her in the least, I will wait you where no policeman can step in between. 
and God shall judge between us two. The policeman now interfered with persuasions and warnings. He locked his arm in Jem's to lead him away, in an opposite direction to that in which he saw Mr. Carson was going. Jem submitted gloomily for a few steps, then wrenched himself free. The policeman shouted after him, "'Take care, my man. There's no girl on earth worth what you'll be bringing on yourself if you don't mind.' But Jem was out of hearing. End of Chapter 15「Chapter 16 Meeting Between Masters and Workmen」Not for a moment take the scorner's chair, while seated there thou know'st not a word, a tone, a look, may gall thy brother's heart, and make him turn in bitterness against thee. Love Truths The day arrived on which the masters were to have an interview with the deputation of the work people. The meeting was to take place in a public room at an hotel, and there, about eleven o'clock, the mill owners, who had received the foreign orders, began to collect. Of course, the first subject, however full their minds might be of another, was the weather. Having done their duty by all the showers and sunshine which had occurred during the past week, they fell to talking about the business which had brought them together. There might be about twenty gentlemen in the room, including some by courtesy who were not immediately concerned in the settlement of the present question, but who, nevertheless, were sufficiently interested to attend. These were divided into little groups, who did not seem by any means unanimous. Some were for a slight concession, just a sugar plum to quieten the, na the naughty children, a sacrifice to peace and quietness. Some were steadily and vehemently opposed to the dangerous precedent of yielding one jot or one tittle to the outward force of a turnout. It was teaching the work people how to become masters, said they. Did they want the wildest thing hereafter? They would know that the way to obtain their wishes would be to strike work? Besides, one or two of those present had only just returned from the new bailey, where one of the turnouts had been tried for a cruel assault on a poor north country weaver who had attempted to work at the low price. They were indignant, and justly so, at the merciless manner in which the poor fellow had been treated, and their indignation at wrong took, as it often does, the extreme form of revenge. They felt as if, rather than yield to the body of men who were resorting to such cruel measures towards their fellow workmen, they, the masters, would sooner relinquish all the benefits to be derived from the fulfillment of the commission, in order that the workmen might suffer keenly. They forgot that the strike was, in this instance, the consequence of want and need, suffered unjustly, as the endurers believed. For, however insane, and without ground of reason, such was their belief, and such was the cause of their violence. It is a great truth that you cannot extinguish violence by violence. You may put it down for a time, but while you are crowing over your imaginary success, see if it does not return with seven devils worse than its former self. No one thought of treating the workmen as brethren and friends, and openly, clearly, as appealing to reasonable men, stating exactly and fully the circumstances which led the masters to think it was the wise policy of the time to make sacrifices themselves and to hope for them from the operatives. In going from group to group in the room, you caught such a medley of sentences as the following. Poor devils, they're near enough to starving, I'm afraid. Mrs. Aldred makes two cow's heads into soup every week, and people come many miles to fetch it, and if these times last, we must try and do more. But we must not be bullied into anything. A rise of a shilling or so won't make much difference, and they will go away thinking they've gained their point. And that's the very thing I object to. They'll think so, and whenever they've got a point to gain, no matter how unreasonable, they'll strike work really injures them more than us. I don't see how our interests can be separated. The damned brute had thrown vitriol on the poor fellow's ankles, and you know what a bad part that is to heal. He had to stand still with the pain, and that left him at the mercy of the cruel wretch, who beat him about the head till you'd hardly have known he was a man. They doubt if he'll live. If it were only for that, I'll stand out against them, even if it is the cause of my ruin. Aye, I for one won't yield one farthing to the cruel brutes. They're more like wild beasts than human beings. Well, who might have made them different? I say, Carson, just go and tell Duncombe of this fresh instance of their abominable conduct. He's wavering, but I think this will decide him. The door was now opened, and the waiter announced that the men were below, and asked if it were the pleasure of the gentlemen that they should be shown up. They assented, 
and rapidly took their places round the official table, looking as like they could to the Roman senators who awaited the eruption of Brennus and his Gauls. Tramp, tramp, came the heavy clogged feet up the stairs, and in a minute five wild, earnest-looking men stood in the room. John Barton, from some mistake as to time, was not among them. Had they been larger-boned men, you would have called them gaunt. As it was, they were a little of stature, and their fustian clothes hung loosely about their shrunk limbs. In choosing their delegates, too, the operatives had had more regard to their brains and power of speech than to their wardrobes. They might have read the opinions of that worthy Professor Truffelstreck in Sartor Resartus, to judge from the dilapidated coats and trousers which yet clothed men of parts and of power. It was long since many of them had known the luxury of a new article of dress, and air gaps were to be seen in their garments. Some of the masters were rather affronted at such a ragged detachment coming between the wind and their nobility, but what cared they? At the request of a gentleman hastily chosen to officiate as chairman, the leader of the delegates read, in a high-pitched, psalm-singing voice, a paper containing the operative statement of the case at issue, their complaints and their demands, which last were not remarkable for moderation. He was then desired to withdraw for a few minutes with his fellow delegates to another room, while the masters considered what should be their definite answer. When the men had left the room, a whispered earnest consultation took place, everyone re-urging his former arguments. The conceders carried the day, but only by a majority of one. The minority haughtily and audibly expressed their dissent from the measures to be adopted. Even after the delegates re-entered the room, their words and looks did not pass unheeded by the quick-eyed operatives. Their names were registered in bitter hearts. The masters would not consent to the advance demanded by the workmen. They would agree to give one shilling per week more than they had previously offered. Were the delegates empowered to accept such an offer? They were empowered to accept or decline any offer made that day by the masters. Then it might be as well for them to consult among themselves as to what should be their decision. They again withdrew. It was not for long. They came back, and positively declined any compromise of their demands. Then up sprang Mr. Henry Carson, the head and voice of the violent party among the masters, and addressing the chairman even before the scowling operatives, he proposed some resolutions which he and those who agreed with him had been concocting during this last absence of the deputation. They were, firstly, withdrawing the proposal just made and declaring all communication between the masters and that particular trades union at an end. Secondly, declaring that no master would employ any workman in future unless he signed a declaration that he did not belong to any trades union, and pledged himself not to assist or subscribe to any society, having for its object interference with the master's powers, and thirdly, that the masters should pledge themselves to protect and encourage all workmen willing to accept employment on those conditions, and at the rate of wages first offered. Considering that the men who now stood listening with lowered brows of defiance were all of them leading members of the Union, which resolutions were in themselves sufficiently provocative of animosity, but not content with simply stating them, Harry Carson went on to characterize the conduct of the workmen in no measured terms, every word he spoke rendering their looks more livid, their glaring eyes more fierce. One among them would have spoken but checked himself, in obedience to the stern glance and pressure on his arm received from the leader. Mr. Carson sat down and a friend instantly got up to second the motion. It was carried, but far from unanimously. The chairman announced it to the delegates, who had been once more turned out of the room for a division. They received it with deep, brooding silence, but spake never a word, and left the room without even a bow. Now, there had been some by-play at this meeting, not recorded in the Manchester newspapers, which gave an account of the more regular part of the transaction. While the men had stood grouped near the door on their first entrance, Mr. Harry Carson had taken out his silver pencil and had drawn an admirable caricature of them, lank, ragged, dispirited, and famine-stricken. Underneath he wrote a hasty quotation from the fat knight's well-known speech in Henry IV. He passed it to one of his neighbors, who acknowledged the likeness instantly, and by him it was sent round to others, who all smiled and nodded their heads, and when it came back to its owner, he tore the back of the letter on which it was drawn in two, twisted them up, and flung them into the fireplace. But, careless whether they reached their aim or not, he did not look to see that they fell just short of any consuming cinders. This proceeding was closely observed by one of the men. He watched the masters as they left the hotel, laughing, some of them were, at passing jokes. And when all had gone, he re-entered. He went to the waiter who recognized him, 
there's a bit on my picture up yonder, as one of the gentlemen threw away. I've a little lad as home as dearly loves a picture. By your leave, I'll go up for it. The waiter, good-natured and sympathetic, accompanied him upstairs, saw the paper, picked it up, and untwisted. And then, being convinced, by a hasty glance at its contents, that it was only what the man had called it, a bit of a picture, he allowed him to bear away his prize. Towards seven o'clock that evening, many operatives began to assemble in a room in the Weaver's Arms public house, a room appropriated for festive occasions, as the landlord in his circular on opening the premises had described it, but, alas, it was on no festive occasion that they met there this night. Starved, irritated, despairing men, they were assembled to hear the answer that morning given by the masters to their delegates, after which, as was stated in the notice, a gentleman from London would have the honor of addressing the meeting on the present state of affairs between the employers and the employed, or, as he chose to term them, the idle and the industrious classes. The room was not large, but its bareness of furniture made it appear so. The unshaded gas flared down on the lean and unwashed artisans as they entered, their eyes blinking in the excess of light. They took their seats on benches and awaited the deputation. The latter gloomily and ferociously delivered the master's ultimatum, adding thereto not one word of their own. And it sank all the deeper into the sore hearts of the listeners for their forbearance. Then the gentleman from London, who had been previously informed of the master's decision, entered. You would have been puzzled to define his exact position, or what was the state of his mind as regarded education. He looked so self-conscious, so far from earnest, among the group of eager, fierce, absorbed men whom he now stood. He might have been a disgraced medical student in the Bob Sawyer class, or an unsuccessful actor, or a flashy shopman. The impression he would have given you would have been unfavorable, and yet there was much about him that could only be characterized as doubtful. He smirked in acknowledgment of their uncouth greetings, and sat down. Then, glancing around, he inquired whether it would not be agreeable to the gentlemen present to have pipes and liquor handed round, adding that he would stand treat. As the man, who has had his taste educated to love reading, falls devouringly upon books after a long absence. So these poor fellows, whose tastes had been left to educate themselves into a liking for tobacco, beer, and similar gratifications, gleamed up at the proposal of the London delegate and tobacco and drink deaden the pangs of hunger, and make one forget the miserable home, the desolate future. They were now ready to listen to him with approbation. He felt it, and rising like a great orator with his right arm outstretched, his left in the breast of his waistcoat, he began to declaim with a forced theatrical voice. After a burst of eloquence, in which he blended the deeds of the elder and the younger Brutus, and magnified the resistless might of the millions of Manchester, the Londoner descended to matter-of-fact business, and in his capacity this way he did not belie the good judgment of those who had sent him as a delegate. Masses of people, when left to their own free choice, seem to have discretion in distinguishing men of natural talent. It is a pity that so little regard, temper, and principles. He rapidly dictated resolutions and suggested measures. He wrote out a stirring placard for the walls. He proposed sending delegates to entreat the assistance of other trades unions in other towns. He headed the list of subscribing unions by a liberal donation from that with which he was especially connected in London. And what was more and more uncommon, he pained down the money in real, clinking, blinking golden sovereigns. The money, alas, was cravingly required, but before alleviating any private necessities on the morrow, small sums were handed to each of the delegates who were in a day or two to set out on their expeditions to Glasgow, Newcastle, Nottingham, etc. These men were most of them members of the deputation who had that morning waited upon the masters. After he had drawn up some letters, and spoken a few more stirring words, the gentleman from London withdrew, previously shaking hands all around, and many speedily following him out of the room and out of the house. The newly appointed delegates and one or two others remained behind to talk over their respective missions and to give and exchange opinions in more homely and natural language than they dared to use before the London orator. He's a rare chap, young, began one, indicating the departed delegate by a jerk of his thumb towards the door. He's getting the gift of the gab, anyhow. Aye, aye, he knows what he's about. See how he poured it into us about that there Brutus. He were pretty hard, too, to kill his own son. I could kill mine if he took part with the masters, to be sure. He's but a stepson, but that makes no odds, said another. But now tongues were hushed, and all eyes were directed toward the member of the deputation who had that morning returned to the hotel to obtain possession of Harry Carson's clever caricature of the operatives. 
the heads clustered together to gaze at it and detect the likenesses. That's John Slater. I'd have known him anywhere by his big nose. Lord, how like! That's me! It's the very way I'm obligated to pin my waistcoat up to hide that I've got no shirt. That is a shame, and I'll not stand it. Well, said John Slater, after having acknowledged his nose and his likeness, I could laugh at a jest as well as air the best on him, though I did tell again myself if I were not all clemming. His eyes filled with tears. He was a poor, pinched, sharp-featured man, with a gentle and melancholy expression of countenance. And if I could keep from thinking of them at home, as is Clemen, but with their cries for food ringing in my ears and making me afear to go home, and wonder if I should hear them wailing out, if I lay cold and drowned at the bottom of the canal, why, there, why, man, I cannot laugh it out. It seems to make me sad that there is any as can make game on what they have never knowed, as can make such laughable pictures on men whose very hearts within them are so raw and sore as ours were and are. God help us. John Barton began to speak. They turned to him with great attention. It makes me more sad. It makes my heart burn within me to see that folk can make a jest of striving men, of chaps who come to ask for a bit of fire for the old granny, as shivers in the cold for a bit of bedding and some warm clothing to the poor wife who lies in labor on the damp flags, and for victuals for the children whose little voices are getting too faint and weak to cry aloud with hunger. For brothers, is it not them, the things we ask for when we ask for more wages? We do not want dainties. We want bellyfuls. We do not want gym crack coats and waistcoats. We want warm clothes, and so that we get them, we not quarrel with what they're made on. We do not want their grand houses. We want a roof to cover us from the rain and the snow and the storm. I am not alone to cover us, but the helpless ones that cling to us in the keen wind and ask us with their eyes why we brought them into the world to suffer. He lowered his deep voice to almost a whisper. I've seen a father who had killed his child rather than let it clem before his eyes, and he were a tender-hearted man. He began again in his usual tone. We come to the masters with full hearts to ask for them things I named afore. We know that they've gotten money, as we've earned for them. We know trade is mending, and they've large orders for which they'll be well paid. We ask for our share of the payment, for, say we, if the masters get our share of payment, it will only go to keep servants and horses to more dress and pomp, well and good. If you choose to be fools, will not hinder you, so long as you're just. But our share we must and will have. We'll not be cheated. We want it for our daily bread, for life itself, and not for our own lives neither, for there's many a one here I know by myself, as would be glad and thankful to lie down and die out of this weary world, but for the lives of them little ones who don't yet know what life is and are afeard of death. Well, we come before the masters to state what we want and what we must have before we'll set shoulder to their work, and they say no. One would think that would be enough of hard-heartedness, but it isn't. They go and make jesting pictures on us. I could laugh at myself as well as poor John Slater there, but then I must be easy in my mind to laugh. Now I only know that I would give the last drop of my blood to avenge us on yon chap who had so little feeling in him as to make game on earnest, suffering men. A low, angry murmur was heard among the men, but it did not yet take form or words. John continued, You'll wonder, chaps, how I come to miss the time this morning. I'll just tell you what I was doing. The chaplain at the new bailey sent and give me an order to see Jonas Higginbotham. His was as taken up last week for throwing vitriol in an obstick's face. Well, I couldn't help but go, and I didn't reckon it would have kept me so late. Jonas were like one crazy when I got to him. He said he couldn't get rest night or day for the face of the poor fellow he damaged. Then he thought on his weak, clemmed look as he tramped footsore into town, and Jonas thought maybe he'd left them at home as would look for news and hope and get none but haply tidings of his death. Well, Jonas had thought on these things till he could not rest, but walked up and down continually, like a wild beast in his cage. At last he bethought him on a way to help a bit, and he got the chaplain to send for me, and he tells me this, and that the man were lying in the infirmary, and who bade me go, today's the day as folk may be admitted to the infirmary, and get a silver watch, as was his mother's, and sell it as well as I could, and take the money, and bid the poor knobstick send it to his friends beyond Burnley, and I were to take him Jonas' kind regards and he humbly asked him to forgive him. So I did what Jonas wished, but bless your life, none of us would ever throw vitriol again, at least at a knobstick. If they could see the sight I saw today, the man lay, his face all wrapped in cloths, so I didn't see that. 
not a limb nor a bit of a limb could keep from quivering with pain he would have bitten his hand to keep down his moans but couldn't his face hurt him so if he moved it air so little he could scarce mind me when i telled him about jonas he did squeeze my hand when i jingled the money but when i axed his wife's name he shrieked out mary mary shall i never see you again mary my darling they've made me blind because i wanted to work for you and our own baby oh mary mary then the nurse came and said he were raving and that i had made him worse and i feared it was true yet i were loth to go without knowing where to send the money so that kept me beyond my time chaps did you hear where the wife lived at last asked many anxious voices no he went on talking to her till his words cut my heart like a knife i axed the nurse to find out who she was and where she lived but what i'm more special naming it now for is this for one thing i wanted you all to know why i weren't at my post this morning for another i wish to say that i for one have seen enough of what comes of attacking knobsticks and i'll have naught to do with it no more there were some expressions of disapprobation but john did not mind them nay i'm no coward he replied and i'm true to the backbone what i would like and what i would do would be to fight the masters there's one among you called me a coward well every man has a right to his opinion but since i've thought on the matter to-day i've thought we can all of us been more like cowards in attacking the poor like ourselves them as none to help but must choose between vitriol and starvation i say we're more cowardly in doing that than in leaving them alone no what i would do is this have it the masters again he shouted have it the masters he spoke lower all listened with hushed breath it's all the masters as has wrought this woe it's the masters i should pay for it him has called me coward just now he try if i am one or not set me to serve out the masters and see if there's out i'll stick it it would give the masters a bit on a fry if one of them were beaten within an inch of his life said one ay were beaten till no life were left in it growled another and so with words or looks that told more than words they built up a deadly plan deeper and darker grew the import of their speeches as they stood hoarsely muttering their meaning out and glaring with eyes that told the terror in their own thoughts were to them upon their neighbours their clenched fists their set teeth their livid looks all told the suffering which their minds were voluntarily undergoing in the contemplation of crime and in familiarising themselves with its details then came one of those fierce terrible oaths which bind members of trades unions to any given purpose then under the flaring gaslight they met together to consult further with the distrust of guilt each was suspicious of his neighbour each dreaded the treachery of another a number of pieces of paper the identical letter on which the caricature had been drawn that very morning were torn up and one was marked and all were folded up again looking exactly alike they were shuffled together in a hat the gas was extinguished each drew out a paper the gas was relighted then each went as far as he could from his fellows and examined the paper he had drawn without saying a word and with a countenance as stony and immovable as he could make it then still rigidly silent they each took up their hats and went every one his own way he who had drawn the marked paper had drawn the lot of the assassin and he had sworn to act according to his drawing but no one save god in his own countenance knew who was the appointed murderer end of chapter 16 Recording by Anna Daly, Washington, D.C. Chapter 17 Barton's Night Errand Mournful is to say farewell, though for few brief hours we part. In that absence, who can tell what may come to wring the heart? Anonymous the events recorded in the last chapter took place on a tuesday on thursday afternoon mary was surprised in the midst of some little bustle in which she was engaged by the entrance of will wilson he looked strange at least it was strange to see any different expression on his face to his usual joyous beaming appearance he had a paper parcel in his hand he came in and sat down more quietly than usual why, Will, what's the matter with you? You seem quite cut up about something. And I am, Mary. I'm come to say good-bye, and few folk like to say good-bye to them they love. Good-bye? Bless me, Will, that's sudden, isn't it? Mary left off ironing, and came and stood near the fireplace. She had always liked Will, but now it seemed as if a sudden spring of sisterly love had gushed up in her heart. So sorry did she feel to hear of his approaching departure. "'It's very sudden, isn't it?' said she, repeating the question. 
"'Yes, it's very sudden,' said he dreamily. "'No, no, it isn't,' rousing himself to think of what he was saying. "'The captain told me in a fortnight he would be ready to sail again, "'but it comes very sudden on me. "'I had got so fond of you all.' "'Mary understood the particular fondness that was thus generalized. "'She spoke again. "'But it's not a fortnight since you came. "'Not a fortnight since you knocked at Jane Wilson's door. "'And I was there, you remember. "'Nothing like a fortnight.' "'No, I know it's not. "'But you see, I got a letter this afternoon from Jack Harris "'to tell me our ship sails on Tuesday next, "'and it's long since I promised my uncle, my mother's brother, "'him that lives at Kirk Christ beyond Ramsey, in the Isle of Man, "'that I'd go and see him and his this time of coming ashore. "'I must go. I'm sorry enough, but I mustn't slight poor mother's friends. "'I must go.' "'Don't try to keep me,' said he, evidently fearing the strength of his own resolution, if hard-pressed by entreaty. "'I'm not a-going, Will. I dare say you're right. Only I can't help feeling sorry you're going away. It seems so flat to be left behind. When do you go?' "'Tonight. I shan't see you again.' "'Tonight? And you go to Liverpool? Maybe you and father will go together. He's going to Glasgow.' "'By way of Liverpool?' "'No, I'm walking, and I don't think your father will be up to walking.' "'Well, and why on earth are you walking? "'You can get by railway for three and sixpence.' "'Aye, but Mary, thou mustn't let out what I'm going to tell thee. "'I haven't got three shillings. "'No, nor even a sixpence left, at least not here. Before I came, I gave my landlady enough to carry me to the island and back, and maybe a trifle for presents, and I brought the rest here. And it's all gone but this, jingling a few coppers in his hand. Nay, never fret over my walking a matter of thirty mile, added he, as he saw she looked grave and sorry. It's a fine clear night, and I shall set off betimes, and get in afore the Manx packet sails. Where's your father going? "'To Glasgow, did you say? "'Perhaps he and I may have a bit of a trip together then, "'for if the Manx boat has sailed when I get into Liverpool, "'I shall go by a Scotch packet. "'What's he going to do in Glasgow? "'Seek for work? "'Trade is as bad there as here, folks say.' "'No, he knows that,' answered Mary sadly. "'I sometimes think he'll never get work again, "'and that trade will never mend. "'It's very hard to keep up one's heart.' "'I wish I were a boy. I'd go to sea with you. "'It would be getting away from bad news at any rate. "'And now there's hardly a creature that crosses the doorstep, "'but has something sad and unhappy to tell one. "'Father is going as a delegate from his union "'to ask help from the Glasgow folk. "'He's starting this evening.' "'Mary sighed, for the feeling again came over her "'that it was very flat to be left alone.' "'You say no one crosses the threshold, but has something sad to say. "'You don't mean that Margaret Jennings has any trouble?' asked the young sailor anxiously. "'No,' replied Mary, smiling a little. "'She's the only one I know, I believe, who seems free from care. "'Her blindness almost appears a blessing sometimes. "'She was so downhearted when she dreaded it, "'and now she seems so calm and happy when it's downright come. "'No, Margaret's happy, I do think.' "'I could almost wish it had been otherwise,' said Will thoughtfully. "'I could have been so glad to comfort her and cherish her, if she had been in trouble.' "'And why can't you cherish her, even though she is happy?' asked Mary. "'Oh, I don't know. She seems so much better than I am. "'And her voice, when I hear it, and think of the wishes that are in my heart— it seems as much out of place to ask her to be my wife as it would be to ask an angel from heaven. Mary could not help laughing outright, in spite of her depression, at the idea of Margaret as an angel. It was so difficult, even to her dressmaking imagination, to fancy where and how the wings would be fastened to the brown stuffed gown, or the blue and yellow print. Will laughed, too, a little— out of sympathy with Mary's pretty merry laugh. Then he said, "'Aye, you may laugh, Mary. 
"'It only shows you've never been in love.' "'In an instant Mary was carnation color, "'and the tears sprang to her soft gray eyes. "'She that was suffering so much from the doubts arising from love. "'It was unkind of him. "'He did not notice her change of look and of complexion. "'He only noticed that she was silent. "'So he continued. "'I thought, I think, that when I come back from this voyage I will speak.' It's my fourth voyage in the same ship, and with the same captain, and he's promised he'll make me a second mate after this trip. Then I shall have something to offer Margaret, and her grandfather, and Aunt Alice shall live with her, and keep her from being lonesome while I'm at sea. I'm speaking as if she cared for me and would marry me. Do you think she does care at all for me, Mary? asked he anxiously. Mary had a very decided opinion of her own on the subject, but she did not feel as if she had any right to give it. So she said, "'You must ask Margaret, not me, Will. She's never named your name to me.' His countenance fell. "'But I should say that was a good sign from a girl like her. I've no right to say what I think. But, if I was you, I would not leave her now without speaking.' "'No, I cannot speak. I have tried.' I've been in to wish them good-bye, and my voice stuck in my throat. I could say naught of what I'd planned to say, and I never thought of being so bold as to offer her marriage till I'd been my next trip and been made mate. I could not even offer her this box, said he, undoing his paper parcel, and displaying a gaudily ornamented accordion. I longed to buy her something, and I thought, if it were something in the music line, she would maybe fancy it more. So... "'Will you give it to her, Mary, when I'm gone? "'And if you can slip in something tender, "'something, you know, of what I feel, "'maybe she would listen to you, Mary.' "'Mary promised that she would do all that he asked. "'I shall be thinking on her many and many a night "'when I'm keeping my watch in mid-sea. "'I wonder if she will ever think on me "'when the wind is whistling and the gale rising.' "'You'll often speak of me to her, Mary, "'and if I should meet with any mischance, "'tell her how dear, how very dear she was to me, "'and bid her, for the sake of one who loved her well, "'try and comfort my poor Aunt Alice. "'Dear old Aunt, "'you and Margaret will often go and see her, won't you? "'She's sadly failed since I was last ashore. "'And so good as she has been. "'When I lived with her, a little wee chap, I used to be wakened by the neighbours knocking her up. This one was ill, and that body's child was restless, and for as tired as ever she might be, she would be up and dressed in a twinkling, never thinking of the hard day's wash afore her next morning. Them were happy times. How pleased I used to be when she would take me into the field with her to gather herbs. I've tasted tea in China since then. "'but it wasn't half so good as the herb tea she used to make for me a Sunday nights. "'And she knew such a deal about plants and birds and their ways. "'She used to tell me long stories about her childhood. "'And we used to plan how we would go sometime, please God, that was always her word, "'and live near her old home beyond Lancaster, "'in the very cottage where she was born, if we could get it. "'Dear, and how different it is!' Here is she still in a back street of Manchester, never likely to see her own home again, and I, a sailor, off for America next week. I wish she had been able to go to Burton once afore she died. She would maybe have found all sadly changed, said Mary, though her heart echoed Will's feeling. Ay, ay, I dare say it's best. One thing I do wish, though, and I have often wished it when out alone on the deep sea, when even the most thoughtless can't choose but think on the past and the future, and that is, that I'd never grieved her. Oh, Mary, many a hasty word comes sorely back on the heart when one thinks when she'll never see the person whom one has grieved again. They both stood thinking. Suddenly Mary started. That's father's step, and his shirt's not ready. She hurried to her irons, and tried to make up for lost time. John Barton came in, such a haggard and wildly anxious-looking man Will thought he had never seen. 
He looked at Will, but spoke no word of greeting or welcome. "'I'm come to bid you good-bye,' said the sailor, and would, in his sociable, friendly humour, have gone on speaking. But John answered abruptly, "'Good-bye to you, then.' There was that in his manner which left no doubt of his desire to get rid of the visitor, and Will accordingly shook hands with Mary, and looked at John, as if doubting how far to offer to shake hands with him. But he met with no answering glance or gesture, so he went his way, stopping for an instant at the door to say, "'You'll think on me on Tuesday, Mary. That's the day we shall hoist our blue Peter,' Jack Harris says." Mary was heartily sorry when the door closed. It seemed like shutting out a friendly sunbeam. And her father! What could be the matter with him? He was so restless, not speaking. She wished he would, but starting up and then sitting down and meddling with her irons, he seemed so fierce, too, to judge from his face. She wondered if he disliked Will being there, or if he were vexed to find that she had not got further on with her work. At last she could bear his nervous way no longer. It made her equally nervous and fidgety. She would speak. "'When are you going, father? I don't know the time of the trains.' "'And why shouldst thou know?' replied he gruffly. "'Meddle with thy ironing, but don't be asking questions about what doesn't concern thee.' "'I wanted to get you something to eat first, answered she gently. "'Thou dost not know that I'm learning to do without food,' said he. "'Mary looked at him to see if he spoke jestingly. "'No, he looked savagely grave.' "'She finished her bit of ironing, and began preparing the food she was sure her father needed.' for by this time her experience in the degrees of hunger had taught her that his present irritability was increased, if not caused, by want of food. He had had a sovereign given to him to pay his expenses as delegate to Glasgow, and out of this he had given Mary a few shillings in the morning, so she had been able to buy a sufficient meal, and now her care was to cook it so as to tempt him. If thou art doing that for me, Mary, thou mayst spare thy labour. I tell thee I were not for eating. Just a little bit, father, before starting, coaxed Mary perseveringly. At that instant, who should come in but Job Lee? It was not often he came, but when he did pay visits, Mary knew from past experience they were anything but short. Her father's countenance fell back into the deep gloom from which it was but just emerging at the sound of Mary's sweet voice and pretty pleading. He became again restless and fidgety, scarcely giving Job Lee the greeting necessary for a host in his own house. Job, however, did not stand upon ceremony. He had come to pay a visit, and was not to be daunted from his purpose. He was interested in John Barton's mission to Glasgow, and wanted to hear all about it. So he sat down, and made himself comfortable, in a manner that Mary saw was meant to be stationary. "'So thou art off to Glasgow, art thou?' he began his catechism. "'Aye. When art starting?' "'Tonight. That I know, but by what train?' That was just what Mary wanted to know, but what apparently her father was in no mood to tell. He got up without speaking, and went upstairs. Mary knew from his step, and his way, how much he was put out, and feared Job would see it too. But no, Job seemed imperturbable. So much the better, and perhaps she could cover her father's rudeness by her own civility to so kind a friend. So, half listening to her father's movements upstairs, passionate, violent, restless motions they were, and half attending to Job Lee, she tried to pay him all due regard. "'When does thy father start, Mary?' "'That plaguing question again. "'Oh, very soon. "'I'm just getting him a bit of supper. "'Is Margaret very well?' "'Yes, she's well enough. "'She's meaning to go and keep Alice Wilson company "'for an hour or so this evening, "'as soon as she thinks her nephew will have started for Liverpool, "'for she fancies the old woman will feel a bit lonesome. "'The union is paying for your father, I suppose.' "'Yes, they've given him a sovereign. "'You're one of the Union, Job? "'Aye, I'm one sure enough, "'but I'm a sleeping partner in the concern. "'I were obliged to become a member for peace, "'else I don't go along with them. "'You see, they think themselves wise "'and me silly for differing with them. "'Well, 
There's no harm in that. But then they won't let me be silly in peace and quietness, but will force me to be as wise as they are. Now that's not British liberty, I say. I'm forced to be wise according to their notions, else they persecute me and sarve me out. What could her father be doing upstairs, tramping and banging about? Why did he not come down? Or why did not Job go? The supper would be spoilt. But Job had no notion of going. You see, my folly is this, Mary. I would take what I could get. I think half a loaf is better than no bread. I would work for low wages rather than sit idle and starve. But comes the trades union and says, Well, if you take the half loaf, we'll worry you out of your life. Will you be clemmed or will you be worried? Now clemming is a quiet death, and worrying isn't, so I choose clemming and come into the union. But I'd wish they'd leave me free if I am a fool. Creak, creak went the stairs. Her father was coming down at last. Yes, he came down, but more doggedly fierce than before, and made up for his journey, too, with his little bundle on his arm. He went up to Job, and more civilly than Mary expected, wished him good-bye. He then turned to her, and in a short, cold manner, bade her farewell. "'Oh, father, don't go yet. Your supper is all ready. Stay one moment.' But he pushed her away and was gone. She followed him to the door, her eyes blinded by sudden tears. She stood there looking after him. He was so strange, so cold, so hard. Suddenly, at the end of the court, he turned and saw her standing there. He came back quickly and took her in his arms. "'God bless thee, Mary. God in heaven bless thee, poor child.' She threw her arms round his neck. "'Don't go yet, father. I can't bear you to go yet. Come in and eat some supper. You look so ghastly. Dear father, do.' "'No,' he said, faintly and mournfully. "'It's best as it is. I couldn't eat, and it's best to be off.' I cannot be still at home. I must be moving. So saying, he unlaced her soft, twining arms, and kissing her once more, set off on his fierce errand. And he was out of sight. She did not know why, but she had never before felt so depressed, so desolate. She turned in to Job, who sat there still. Her father, as soon as he was out of sight, slackened his pace, and fell into that heavy, listless step which told, as well as words could do, of hopelessness and weakness. It was getting dark, but he loitered on, returning no greeting to any one. A child's cry caught his ear. His thoughts were running on little Tom, on the dead and buried child of happier years. He followed the sound of the wail that might have been his, and found a poor little mortal who had lost his way, and whose grief had choked up his thoughts to the single want. "'Mammy! Mammy!' With tender address John Barton soothed the little laddie, and with beautiful patience he gathered fragments of meaning from the half-spoken words which came mingled with sobs from the terrified little heart. So, aided by inquiries here and there from a passer-by, he led and carried the little fellow home, where his mother had been too busy to miss him, but now received him with thankfulness and with an eloquent Irish blessing. When John heard the words of blessing, he shook his head mournfully, and turned away to retrace his steps. Let us leave him. Mary took her sewing after he had gone, and sat on, and sat on, trying to listen to Job, who was more inclined to talk than usual. She had conquered her feeling of impatience towards him so far as to be able to offer him her father's rejected supper, and she even tried to eat herself, but her heart failed her. A leaden weight seemed to hang over her, a sort of presentiment of evil, or perhaps only an excess of low-spirited feeling in consequence of the two departures which had taken place that afternoon. She wondered how long Job Lee would sit. She did not like putting down her work and crying before him, and yet she had never in her life longed so much to be alone in order to indulge in a good hearty burst of tears. "'Well, Mary,' 
she suddenly caught him saying. I thought you'd be a bit lonely tonight, and as Margaret were going to cheer the old woman, I said I'd go and keep the young in company, and a very pleasant chatty evening we've had. Very. Only I wonder as Margaret is not come back. But perhaps she is, suggested Mary. No, no, I took care of that. Look ye here, and he pulled out the great house key. She'll have to stand waiting at the street, and that I'm sure she wouldn't do when she knew where to find me. "'Will she come back by herself?' asked Mary. "'Ay. At first I were afraid of trusting her, and I used to follow her a bit behind, never letting on, of course. But, bless you, she goes along as steadily as can be, rather slow, to be sure, and her head a bit on one side, as if she were listening. And it's real beautiful to see her cross the road. She'll wait above a bit to hear that all is still.' Not that she's so dark as not to see a coach or a cart like a big black thing, but she can't rightly judge how far off it is by sight. So she listens. Hark! That's her! Yes, in she came, with her usually calm face all tear-stained and sorrow-marked. What's the matter, my wench? said Job hastily. Oh, Grandfather, Alice Wilson's so bad! She could say no more for her breathless agitation. The afternoon, and the parting with Will, had weakened her nerves for any aftershock. "'What is it? Do tell us, Margaret,' said Mary, placing her in a chair and loosening her bonnet-strings. "'I think it's a stroke, or the palsy. At any rate, she has lost the use of one side.' "'Was it a four, Will set off?' asked Mary. "'No. He were gone before I got there,' said Margaret, and she were much about as well as she had been for many a day. She spoke a bit. But not much, but that were only natural, for Mrs. Wilson likes to have the talk to her cell, you know. She got up to go across the room, and then I heard a drag wi' her leg, and presently a fall, and Mrs. Wilson came running, and set up such a cry, I stopped wi' Alice while she fetched a doctor, but she could not speak to answer me, though she tried, I think. Where was Jem? Why didn't he go for the doctor? He were out when I got there, and he never came home while I stopped. Thou'st never left Mrs. Wilson alone with poor Alice, asked Job hastily. No, no, said Margaret, but, oh, Grandfather, it's now I feel how hard it is to have lost my sight. I should have so loved to nurse her, and I did try, until I found I did more harm than good. Oh, Grandfather, if I could but see! She sobbed a little, and they let her give that ease to her heart. Then she went on. No, I went round by Mrs. Davenport's, and she were hard at work, but the minute I told my errand she were ready and willing to go to Jane Wilson and stop up all night with Alice. And what does the doctor say? asked Mary. Oh, much what all doctors say. He puts a fence on this side and a fence on that for fear he should be caught tripping in his judgment. One moment he does not think there's much hope. But while there is life, there is hope. The next, he says he should think she might recover partial. But her age is a gainer. He's ordered her leeches to her head. Margaret, having told her tale, leant back with weariness, both of body and mind. Mary hastened to make her a cup of tea, while Job, lately so talkative, sat quiet and mournfully silent. I'll go first thing tomorrow morning and learn how she is, and I'll bring word back before I go to work, said Mary. It's a bad job Will's gone, said Job. Jane does not think she knows any one, replied Margaret. It's perhaps as well he shouldn't see her now, for they say her face is sadly drawn. He'll remember her with her own face better if he does not see her again. With a few more sorrowful remarks they separated for the night, and Mary was left alone in her house, to meditate on the heavy day that had passed over her head. Everything seemed going wrong. Will gone, her father gone, and so strangely too, and to a place so mysteriously distant as Glasgow seemed to be to her. She had felt his presence as a protection against Harry Carson and his threats, and now she dreaded lest he should learn she was alone. Her heart began to despair, too, about Jem. She feared he had ceased to love her, and she, she only loved him more and more for his seeming neglect. And, 
as if all this aggregate of sorrowful thoughts was not enough. Here was this new woe of poor Alice's paralytic stroke. End of chapter 17 Recording by Glenda Kindred Chapter 18 Murder But in his pulse there was no throb, nor on his lips one dying sob, Sigh, nor word, nor struggling breath, heralded his way to death. Siege of Corinth. My brain runs this way and that way. Twill not fix on aught but vengeance. Duke of Guise. I must go back now to an hour or two before Mary and her friends parted for the night. It might be about eight o'clock that evening, and the three Miss Carsons were sitting in their father's drawing-room. He was asleep in the dining-room, in his own comfortable chair. Mrs. Carson was, as was usual with her, when no particular excitement was going on, very poorly, and sitting upstairs in her dressing-room, indulging in the luxury of a headache. She was not well, certainly. Wind in the head, the servants called it. But it was but the natural consequence of the state of mental and bodily idleness in which she was placed. Without education enough to value the resources of wealth and leisure, she was so circumstanced as to command both. It would have done her more good than all the ether and sal volatile she was daily in the habit of swallowing, if she might have taken the work of one of her own housemaids for a week, made beds, rubbed tables, shaken carpets, and gone out into the fresh morning air, without all the paraphernalia of shawl, cloak, boa, fur boots, bonnet, and veil, in which she was equipped before setting out for an airing, in the closely shut-up carriage. So the three girls were by themselves in the comfortable, elegant, well-lighted drawing-room, and like many similarly situated young ladies, they did not exactly know what to do to while away the time until the tea-hour. The elder two had been at a dancing-party the night before, and were listless and sleepy in consequence. One tried to read Emerson's essays, and fell asleep in the attempt. The other was turning over a parcel of new songs, in order to select what she liked. Amy, the youngest, was copying some manuscript music. The air was heavy with the fragrance of strongly scented flowers, which sent out their night odours from an adjoining conservatory. The clock on the chimney-piece chimed eight. Sophie, the sleeping sister, started up at the sound. "'What o'clock is that?' she asked. Eight, said Amy. "'Oh, dear, how tired I am! Is Harry come in? Tea will rouse one up a little. Are you not worn out, Helen?' "'Yes, I am tired enough. One is good for nothing, the day after a dance. Yet I don't feel weary at the time. I suppose it is the lateness of the hours.' And yet, how could it be managed otherwise? So many don't dine till five or six, that one cannot begin before eight or nine, and then it takes a long time to get into the spirit of the evening. It is always more pleasant after supper than before. Well, I'm too tired to-night to reform the world in the manner of dances or balls. What are you copying, Amy? Only that little Spanish air you sing, Quen Quiera. What are you copying it for? asked Helen. Harry asked me to do it for him this morning at breakfast-time, for Miss Richardson, he said. "'For Jane Richardson,' said Sophie, as if a new idea were receiving strength in her mind. "'Do you think Harry means anything by his attentions to her?' asked Helen. "'Nay, I do not know anything more than you do. I can only observe and conjecture. What do you think, Helen?' "'Harry always likes to be of consequence to the bell of the room. If one girl is more admired than another, he likes to flutter about her, and seem to be on intimate terms with her. That is his way, and I have not noticed anything beyond that in his manner to Jane Richardson.' "'But I don't think she knows it's only his way. "'Just watch her the next time we meet her when Harry is there, "'and see how she crimsons and looks another way "'when she feels he is coming up to her. "'I think he sees it, too, and I think he is pleased with it. "'I dare say Harry would like well enough "'to turn the head of such a lovely girl as Jane Richardson, "'but I'm not convinced that he's in love, whatever she may be. "'Well, then,' said Sophie indignantly, "'though it is our own brother, "'I do not think he is behaving very wrongly.' The more I think of it, the more I am sure she thinks he means something, and that he intends her to think so. And then when he leaves off paying her attention— "'Which will be as soon as a prettier girl makes her appearance,' interrupted Helen. "'As soon as he leaves off paying her attention,' resumed Sophie, "'she will have many and many a heartache, and then she will harden herself into being a flirt, a feminine flirt, as he is a masculine flirt. Poor girl!' "'I don't like to hear you speak so of Harry,' said Amy, looking up at Sophie." "'And I don't like to have to speak so, Amy, for I love him dearly. "'He is a good, kind brother, but I do think him vain, "'and I think he hardly knows the misery, the crime, "'to which indulged vanity may lead him.' "'Helen yawned. 
"'Oh, do you think we may ring for tea? Sleeping after dinner makes me so feverish.' "'Yes, surely. Why should not we?' said the more energetic Sophie, pulling the bell with some determination. "'Tea directly, Parker,' she said authoritatively, as the man entered the room. She was too little in the habit of reading the expressions on the faces of others to notice Parker's countenance. Yet it was striking. It was blanched to a dead whiteness, the lips compressed as if to keep within some tale of horror, the eyes distended and unnatural. It was a terror-stricken face. The girls began to put away their music and books, in preparation for tea. The door slowly opened again, and this time it was the nurse who entered. I call her nurse, for such had been her office in bygone days, though now she held rather an anomalous situation in the family. Seamstress, attendant on the young ladies, keeper of the stores, only nurse was still her name. She had lived longer with them than any other servant, and to her their manner was far less haughty than to the other domestics. She occasionally came into the drawing-room to look for things belonging to their father or mother, so it did not excite any surprise when she advanced into the room. They went on arranging their various articles of employment. She wanted them to look up. She wanted them to read something in her face, her face so full of woe, of horror. But they went on without taking any notice. She coughed, not a natural cough, but one of those coughs which ask so plainly for a remark. "'Dear nurse, what is the matter?' asked Amy. "'Are you not well?' "'Is Mamma ill?' asked Sophie quickly. "'Speak, speak, nurse,' said they all, as they saw her efforts to articulate choked by the convulsive rising in her throat. They clustered around her with eager faces, catching a glimpse of some terrible truth to be revealed. "'My dear young ladies, my dear girls!' she gasped out at length, and then she burst into tears. "'Oh, do tell us what it is,' said one. "'Anything is better than this. Speak!' "'My children, I don't know how to break it to you. My dears—' poor Mr. Harry's brought home. Brought home! Brought home! How? Instinctively they sank their voices to a whisper, but a fearful whisper it was, in the same low tone, as if afraid lest the walls, the furniture, the inanimate things which told of preparation for life and comfort should hear, she answered, Dead. Amy clutched her nurse's arm, and fixed her eyes on her as if to know if such a tale could be true, and when she read its confirmation in those sad, mournful, unflinching eyes, she sank, without word or sound, down in a faint upon the floor. One sister sat down on an ottoman and covered her face, to try and realize it. That was Sophie. Helen threw herself on the sofa, and burying her head in the pillows, tried to stifle the screams and moans which shook her frame. The nurse stood silent. She had not told all. "'Tell me,' said Sophie, looking up and speaking in a hoarse voice, which told of the inward pain, "'Tell me, nurse, is he dead, did you say? Have you sent for a doctor?' "'Oh, send for one, send for one,' continued she, her voice rising to shrillness, and starting to her feet. Helen lifted herself up, and looked, with breathless waiting, toward the nurse. "'My dears, he is dead. But I have sent for a doctor. I have done all I could.' "'When did he—when did they bring him home?' asked Sophie. "'Perhaps ten minutes ago, before you rang for Parker.' "'How did he die? Where did they find him? He looked so well. He always seemed so strong. Oh, are you sure he is dead?' She went towards the door. Nurse laid her hand on her arm. "'Miss Sophie, I have not told you all. Can you bear to hear it? Remember, Master is in the next room, and he knows nothing yet. Come, you must help me to tell him. Now be quiet, dear. It was no common death he died.' She looked in her face as if trying to convey her meaning by her eyes. Sophie's lips moved, but Nurse could hear no sound. "'He has been shot as he was coming home along Turner Street to-night.' Sophie went on with the motion of her lips, twitching them almost convulsively. "'My dear, you must rouse yourself, and remember your father and mother have yet to be told. Speak, Miss Sophie!' But she could not. Her whole face worked involuntarily. The nurse left the room, and almost immediately brought back some sal volatile and water. Sophie drank it eagerly, and gave one or two deep gasps. Then she spoke in a calm, unnatural voice. "'What do you want me to do, nurse? Go to Helen and poor Amy. See?' they want help. Poor creatures! We must let them alone for a bit. You must go to Master, that's what I want you to do, Miss Sophie. You must break it to him. Poor gentleman! Come, he's asleep in the dining-room, and the men are waiting to speak to him. Sophie went mechanically to the dining-room door. Oh, I cannot go in. I cannot tell him. What must I say? I'll come with you, Miss Sophie. Break it to him by degrees. I can't, nurse. My head throbs so. I shall be sure to say the wrong thing. However, she opened the door. 
There sat her father, the shaded light of the candle-lamp falling upon, and softening his marked features, while his snowy hair contrasted well with the deep crimson morocco of the chair. The newspaper he had been reading had dropped on the carpet by his side. He breathed regularly and deeply. At that instant the words of Mrs. Heeman's song came full in Sophie's mind, Ye know not what ye do, that call the slumberer back from the realms unseen by you, to life's dim, weary track. But this life's track would be to the bereaved father something more than dim and weary hereafter. Papa, she said softly, he did not stir. Papa, she exclaimed, somewhat louder. He started up, half awake. Tea is ready, is it? And he yawned. No, papa, but something very dreadful, very sad has happened. He was gaping so loud that he did not catch the words she uttered, and did not see the expression of her face. "'Master Henry has not come back,' said Nurse. Her voice, heard in unusual speech to him, arrested his attention, and rubbing his eyes, he looked at the servant. "'Harry, oh, no, he had to attend a meeting of the masters about those cursed turnouts. I don't expect him yet. What are you looking at me so strangely for, Sophie?' "'Oh, papa, Harry is come back,' said she, bursting into tears. "'What do you mean?' said he, startled into an impatient consciousness that something was wrong. "'One of you says he has not come home, and the other says he is. Now, that's nonsense. Tell me at once what's the matter. Did he go on horseback to town? Is he thrown? Speak, child, can't you?' "'No, he's not been thrown, papa,' said Sophie, sadly. "'But he's badly hurt,' put in the nurse, desirous to be drawing his anxiety to a point. "'Hurt!' "'Where? How? Have you sent for a doctor?' said he, hastily rising, as if to leave the room. "'Yes, papa, we've sent for a doctor, but I'm afraid—I believe it's of no use.' He looked at her for a moment, and in her face he read the truth. His son, his only son, was dead. He sank back in his chair, and hid his face in his hands, and bowed his head upon the table. The strong mahogany dining-table shook and rattled under his agony. Sophie went and put her hands around his bowed neck. "'Go! You are not Harry,' said he, but the action roused him. "'Where is he? Where is he?' said he, with his strong face set into the lines of anguish by two minutes of such intense woe. "'In the servants' hall,' said Nurse. Two policemen and another man brought him home. They would be glad to speak to you when you are able, sir.' "'I am now able,' replied he. At first when he stood up he tottered, but steadying himself he walked, as firmly as a soldier on drill, to the door." Then he turned back and poured out a glass of wine from the decanter, which yet remained on the table. His eye caught the wine-glass which Harry had used but two or three hours before. He sighed a long, quivering sigh, and then, mastering himself again, left the room. "'You had better go back to your sister's, Miss Sophie,' said Nurse. Miss Carson went. She could not face death yet. The nurse followed Mr. Carson to the servants' hall. There, on their dinner-table, lay the poor dead body. The men who had brought it were sitting near the fire, while several of the servants stood around the table, gazing at the remains. The remains! One or two were crying, one or two were whispering, awed into a strange stillness of voice and action by the presence of the dead. When Mr. Carson came in they all drew back and looked at him with the reverence due to sorrow. He went forward and gazed long and fondly on the calm, dead face. Then he bent down and kissed the lips yet crimson with life. The policeman had advanced, and stood ready to be questioned. But at first the old man's mind could only take in the idea of death. Slowly, slowly came the conception of violence, of murder. "'How did he die?' he groaned forth. The policemen looked at each other. Then one began, and stated that, having heard the report of a gun in Turner Street, he had turned down that way, a lonely, unfrequented way Mr. Carson knew, but a shortcut to his garden door, of which Harry had a key, that as he, the policeman, came nearer, he had heard footsteps as of a man running away, but the evening was so dark, the moon not having yet risen, that he could see no one twenty yards off. That he had even been startled, when close to the body, by seeing it lying across the path at his feet. That he had sprung his rattle, and when another policeman came up, by the light of the lantern, they had discovered who it was that had been killed. That they believed him to be dead when they first took him up, as he had never moved, spoken, or breathed. That intelligence of the murder had been sent to the superintendent, who would probably soon be here. That two or three policemen were still about the place where the murder was committed, seeking out for some trace of the murderer. Having said this, they stopped speaking. Mr. Carson had listened attentively, never taking his eyes off the dead body. When they had ended, he said, "'Where was he shot?' 
they lifted up some of the thick chestnut curls and showed a blue spot you could hardly call it a hole the flesh had closed so much over it in the left temple a deadly aim and yet it was so dark a night he must have been close upon him said one policeman and have had him between him and the sky added the other there was a little commotion at the door of the room and there stood poor mrs carson the mother she had heard unusual noises in the house and had sent down her maid much more a companion to her than her highly educated daughters to discover what was going on but the maid either forgot or dreaded to return and with nervous impatience mrs carson came down herself and had traced the hum and buzz of voices to the servants hall mr carson turned round but he could not leave the dead for any one leaving take her away nurse it is no sight for her tell miss sophy to go to her mother his eyes were again fixed on the dead face of his son presently mrs carson's hysterical cries were heard all over the house her husband shuddered at the outward expression of the agony which was rending his heart then the police superintendent came and after him the doctor the latter went through all the forms of ascertaining death without uttering a word and when at the conclusion of the operation of opening a vein from which no blood flowed he shook his head all present understood the confirmation of their previous belief the superintendent asked to speak to mr carson in private it was just what i was going to request of you answered he so he led the way into the dining-room with the wine-glass still on the table the door was carefully shut and both sat down each apparently waiting for the other to begin at last mr carson spoke you probably have heard that i am a rich man the superintendent bowed in assent well sir half nay if necessary the whole of my fortune i will give to have the murderer brought to the gallows every exertion you may be sure sir shall be used on our part but probably offering a handsome reward might accelerate the discovery of the murderer but what i wanted particularly to tell you sir is that one of my men has already got some clue and that another who accompanied me here has within this quarter of an hour found a gun in the field which the murderer crossed and which he probably threw away when pursued as encumbering his flight i have not the smallest doubt of discovering the murderer what do you call a handsome reward said mr carson well sir three or five hundred pounds is a munificent reward more than will probably be required as a temptation to any accomplice make it a thousand said mr carson decisively it's the doing of those damn turnouts i imagine not said the superintendent some days ago the man i was naming to you before reported to the inspector when he came on his beat that he had to separate your son from a young man who by his dress he believed to be employed in a foundry that the man had thrown mr carson down and seemed inclined to proceed to more violence when the policeman came up and interfered indeed my man wished to give him in charge for an assault but mr carson would not allow that to be done just like him noble fellow murmured the father but after your son had left the man made use of some pretty strong threats and it's rather a curious coincidence that this scuffle took place in the very same spot where the murder was committed in turner street there was some one knocking at the door of the room it was sophy who beckoned her father out and then asked him in an awestruck whisper to come upstairs and speak to her mother she will not leave harry and talk so strangely indeed indeed papa i think she has lost her senses and the poor girl sobbed bitterly where is she asked mr carson in his room they went upstairs rapidly and silently it was a large comfortable bedroom too large to be well lighted by the flaring flickering kitchen candle which had been hastily snatched up and now stood on the dressing-table on the bed surrounded by its heavy pall-like green curtains lay the dead son they had carried him up and had laid him down as tenderly as though they feared to waken him and indeed it looked more like sleep than death so very calm and full of repose was the face you saw too the chiselled beauty of the features much more perfectly than when the brilliant colouring of life had distracted your attention there was a piece about him which told that death had come too instantaneously to give any previous pain in a chair at the head of the bed sat the mother smiling she held one of the hands rapidly stiffening even in her warm grasp and gently stroked the back of it with the endearing caress she had used to all her children when young i am glad you are come said she looking up at her husband and still smiling harry is so full of fun he always has something new to amuse us with and now he pretends he is asleep and that we can't waken him look he is smiling now he hears i have found him out look and in truth the lips in the rest of death did look as though they wore a smile and the waving light of the unsnuffed candle almost made them seem to move 
"'Look, Amy,' said she to her youngest child, who knelt at her feet, trying to soothe her by kissing her garments. "'Oh, he was always such a rogue. You remember, don't you, love, how full of play he was as a baby, hiding his face under my arm, when you wanted to play with him. Always a rogue, Harry.' "'We must get her away, sir,' said Nurse. "'You know there is much to be done before—' "'I understand, Nurse,' said the father, hastily interrupting her in dread of the distinct words which would tell of the changes of mortality. "'Come, love,' said he to his wife. "'I want you to come with me. I want to speak to you downstairs.' "'I'm coming,' said she, rising. "'Perhaps, after all, Nurse, he's really tired and would be glad to sleep. Don't let him get cold, though. He feels rather chilly,' continued she, after she had bent down and kissed the pale lips. Her husband put his arm around her waist, and they left the room. Then the three sisters burst into unrestrained wailings. They were startled into the reality of life and death. And yet, in the midst of shrieks and moans, of shivering and chattering of teeth, Sophie's eye caught the calm beauty of the dead, so calm amidst such violence, and she hushed her emotion. Come, said she to her sisters, nurse wants us to go, and besides we ought to be with mamma. Papa told the man he was talking to, when I went for him to wait, and she must not be left. Meanwhile, the superintendent had taken a candle, and was examining the engravings that hung around the dining-room. It was so common to him to be acquainted with crime, that he was far from feeling all his interest absorbed in the present case of violence, although he could not help having much anxiety to detect the murderer. He was busy looking at the only oil-painting in the room, a youth of eighteen or so in a fancy dress, and conjecturing its identity with the young man so mysteriously dead, when the door opened and Mr. Carson returned. Stern as he had looked before leaving the room, he looked far sterner now. His face was hardened into deep-purposed wrath. "'I beg your pardon, sir, for leaving you,' the superintendent bowed. They sat down and spoke long together. One by one the policemen were called in and questioned. All through the night there was a bustle and commotion in the house. Nobody thought of going to bed. It seemed strange to Sophie to hear Nurse summoned from her mother's side to supper in the middle of the night, and still stranger that she could go— the necessity of eating and drinking seemed out of place in the house of death. When night was passing into morning, the dining-room door opened, and two persons' step were heard along the hall. The superintendent was leaving at last. Mr. Carson stood on the front doorstep, feeling the refreshment of the cooler morning air, and seeing the starlight fade away into dawn. "'You will not forget,' said he. "'I trust you, you.' The policeman bowed. "'Spare no money.' The only purpose for which I now value wealth is to have the murderer arrested and brought to justice. My hope in life now is to see him sentenced to death. Offer any rewards. Name a thousand pounds in the placards. Come to me at any hour, night or day, if that be required. All I ask of you is, to get the murderer hanged. Next week, if possible. Today is Friday. Surely, with the clues you already possess, you can muster up evidence sufficient to have him tried next week. "'He may easily request an adjournment of his trial, on the ground of the shortness of the notice,' said the superintendent. "'Oppose it, if possible. I will see that the first lawyers are employed. I shall know no rest while he lives.' "'Everything shall be done, sir. You will arrange with the coroner. Ten o'clock, if convenient.' The superintendent took leave. Mr. Carson stood on the step, dreading to shut out the light and air, and return into the haunted, gloomy house. "'My son! My son!' he said at last. "'But you shall be avenged, my poor murdered boy.' Ay, to avenge his wrongs the murderer had singled out his victim, and with one fell action had taken away the life that God had given. To avenge his child's death the old man lived on, with the single purpose in his heart of vengeance on the murderer. True, his vengeance was sanctioned by law, but was it the less revenge? "'Are ye worshippers of Christ, or of Electo?' Oh, Orestes, you would have made a very tolerable Christian of the nineteenth century. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19. Jem Wilson arrested on suspicion. Deeds to be hid, which were not hid, which all confused, I could not know, whether I suffered or did, for all seemed guilt, remorse, or woe. Coleridge. I left Mary, on that same Thursday night which left its burden of woe at Mr. Carson's threshold, haunted with depressing thoughts. All through the night she tossed restlessly about, trying to get quit of the ideas that harassed her, and longing for the light when she could rise and find some employment. But just as dawn began to appear, she became more quiet, and fell into a sound, heavy sleep, 
which lasted till she was sure it was late in the morning, by the full light that shone in. She dressed hastily, and heard the neighbouring church clock strike eight. It was far too late to do as she had planned, after inquiring how Alice was, to return and tell Margaret, and she accordingly went in to inform the latter of her change of purpose, and the cause of it, but on entering the house she found Job sitting alone, looking sad enough. She told him what she came for. "'Margaret, wench, why, she's been gone to Wilson's these two hours. Ay, sure, you did say last night you would go, but she couldn't rest in her bed, and so was off betimes this morning.' Mary could do nothing but feel guilty of her long morning nap, and hasten to follow Margaret's steps, for late as it was, she felt she could not settle well to her work, unless she learnt how kind, good Alice Wilson was going on. So, eating her crust of bread breakfast, she passed rapidly along the street. She remembered afterwards the little groups of people she had seen, eagerly hearing and imparting news, but at the same time her only care was to hasten on her way, in dread of a reprimand from Miss Simmons. She went into the house at Jane Wilson's, her heart at the instant giving a strange knock, and sending the rosy flush into her face, at the thought that Jem might possibly be inside the door. But I do assure you, she had not thought of it before. Impatient and loving as she was, her solicitude about Alice on that hurried morning had not been mingled with any thought of him. Her heart need not have leaped, her colour need not have rushed so painfully to her cheeks, for he was not there. There was the round table, with a cup and saucer, which had evidently been used, and there was Jane Wilson sitting on the other side, crying quietly, while she ate her breakfast with a sort of unconscious appetite. And there was Mrs. Davenport washing away at a nightcap, or so, which, by their simple, old-world make, Mary knew at a glance were Alice's. But nothing. No one else. Alice was much the same, or rather, better of the two, they told her. At any rate she could speak, though it was sad, rambling talk. Would Mary like to see her? Of course she would. Many are interested by seeing their friends under the new aspect of illness, and among the poor there is no wholesome fear of injury or excitement to restrain this wish. So Mary went upstairs, accompanied by Mrs. Davenport, wringing the suds off her hands, and speaking in a loud whisper far more audible than her usual voice, "'I mun be hastening home, but I'll come again to-night, time enough to iron her cap. T'would be a sin and a shame if we let her go dirty now she's ill, when she's been so rare and clean her whole life long. But she's sadly forsaken, poor thing. She'll not know you, Mary. She knows none of us. The room upstairs held two beds, one superior in the grandeur of four posts and checked curtains to the other, which had been occupied by the twins in their brief lifetime. The smaller had been Alice's bed since she had lived there, but with the natural reverence to one stricken of God and afflicted, she had been installed, since her paralytic stroke the evening before, in the larger and grander bed, while Jane Wilson had taken her short, broken rest on the little pallet. Margaret came forward to meet her friend, whom she half expected, and whose step she knew. Mrs. Davenport returned to her washing. The two girls did not speak. The presence of Alice awed them into silence. There she lay with a rosy colour, absent from her face since the days of childhood, flushed once more into it by her sickness nigh unto death. She lay on the affected side, and with her other arm she was constantly sawing the air, not exactly in a restless manner, but in a monotonous, incessant way, very trying to a watcher. She was talking away, too, almost as constantly, in a low, indistinct tone. But her face, her profiled countenance, looked calm and smiling, even interested by the ideas that were passing through her clouded mind. "'Listen,' said Margaret, as she stooped her head down to catch the muttered words more distinctly. "'What will mother say? The bees are turning homeward for the last time, and we've got a terrible long bit to go yet. See, here's a linnet's nest in this goose-bush. Then bird is on it. Look at her bright eyes. She won't stir. Ay, we mun hurry home. Won't mother be pleased with the bonny lot of heather we've got? Make haste, Sally. Maybe we shall have cockles for supper.' I saw the cockleman's donkey turn up our way for Arnside. Margaret touched Mary's hand, and the pressure in return told her that they understood each other, that they knew how, in this illness, to the old, world-weary woman, God had sent her a veiled blessing. She was once more in the scenes of her childhood, unchanged and bright, as in those long departed days, once more with the sister of her youth, the playmate of fifty years ago, 
who had, for nearly as many years, slept in a grassy grave in the little churchyard beyond Burton. Alice's face changed. She looked sorrowful, almost penitent. "'Oh, Sally, I wish we'd told her. She thinks we were in church all the morning, and we've gone on deceiving her. If we told her at first how it was, how sweet the hawthorn smelt through the open church door, and how we were on the last bench in the aisle, and how it were the first butterfly we'd sing this spring, and how it flew into the very church itself, oh, mother is so gentle, I wish we'd told her. I'll go to her next time she comes inside and say, Mother, we were naughty last Sabbath. She stopped, and a few tears came stealing down the withered cheek, at the thought of the temptation and deceit of her childhood. Surely many sins could not have darkened that innocent, childlike spirit since. Mary found a red-spotted pocket-handkerchief, and put it into the hand which sought about for something to wipe away the trickling tears. She took it with a gentle murmur. "'Thank you, mother.' Mary pulled Margaret away from the bed. "'Don't you think she's happy, Margaret?' "'Aye, that I do, bless her.' She feels no pain, and knows not of her present state. Oh, that I could see, Mary! I try and be patient with her afore me, but I'd give aught I have to see her, and see what she wants. I'm so useless! I mean to stay here as long as Jane Wilson is alone, and I would fain be here to-night, but— I'll come, said Mary decidedly. Mrs. Davenport said she'd come again, but she's hard-worked all day. I'll come, repeated Mary. Do, said Margaret, and I'll be here till you come. Maybe Jem and you could take the night between you, and Jane Wilson might get a bit of sound sleep in his bed, for she were up and down the better part of last night, and just when she were in a sound sleep this morning, between two and three, Jem came home, and the sound of his voice roused her in a minute. "'Where had he been till that time o' night?' asked Mary. "'Nay, it were none of my business, and indeed I never saw him till he came in here to see Alice. He were in again this morning, and seemed sadly downcast.' "'But you'll, maybe, manage to comfort him to-night, Mary,' said Margaret, smiling, while a ray of hope glimmered in Mary's heart, and she felt almost glad, for an instant, of the occasion which would at last bring them together. Oh, happy night! When would it come? Many hours had yet to pass. Then she saw Alice, and repented, with a bitter self-reproach. But she could not help having gladness in the depths of her heart, blame herself as she would. She tried not to think as she hurried along to Miss Simmons, with a dancing step of lightness. She was late. That she knew she should be. Miss Simmons was vexed and cross. That also she had anticipated, and had intended to smooth her raven down by extraordinary diligence and intention. But there was something about the girls she did not understand, had not anticipated. They stopped talking when she came in, or, rather I should say, stopped listening, for Sally Ledbetter was the talker to whom they were hearkening with deepest attention. At first they eyed Mary, as if she had acquired some new interest to them since the day before. Then they began to whisper, and absorbed as Mary had been in her own thoughts, she could not help becoming aware that it was of her they spoke. At last Sally Lidbitter asked Mary if she had heard the news. "'No, what news?' answered she. The girls looked at each other with a gloomy mystery. Sally went on. "'Have you not heard that young Mr. Carson was murdered last night?' Mary's lips could not utter a negative— but no one who looked at her pale and terror-stricken face could have doubted that she had not heard before of the fearful occurrence. Oh, it is terrible, that sudden information, that one you have known has met with a bloody death. You seem to shrink from the world where such deeds can be committed, and to grow sick with the idea of the violent and wicked men of earth. Much as Mary had learned to dread him lately, now he was dead, and dead in such a manner, her feeling was that of oppressive sorrow for him. The room went round and round, and she felt as though she should faint, but Miss Simmons came in, bringing a waft of fresher air as she opened the door, to refresh the body and the certainty of a scolding for inattention to brace the sinking mind. She, too, was full of the morning's news. "'Have you heard any more of this horrid affair, Miss Barton?' asked she, as she settled to her work. Mary tried to speak. At first she could not, and when she succeeded in uttering a sentence, it seemed as though it were not her own voice that spoke. "'No, ma'am. I never heard of it till this minute. Dear, that's strange, for every one is up about it. I hope the murderer will be found out, that I do. Such a handsome young man to be killed as he was. I hope that wretch that did it may be hanged as high as Haman. One of the girls reminded them that the assizes came on next week. Aye, replied Miss Simmons, and the milkman told me they will catch the wretch, and have him tried and hung in less than a week. Serve him right, whoever he is. 
such a handsome young man as he was. Then each began to communicate to Miss Simmons the various reports they had heard. Suddenly she burst out, "'Miss Barton, as I live, dropping tears on that new silk gown of Mrs. Hawkes's. Don't you know they will stain and make it shabby for ever? Crying like a baby, because a handsome young man meets with an untimely end. For shame of yourself, miss. Mind your character and your work, if you please. Or if you must cry—' seeing her scolding rather increase the flow of Mary's tears than otherwise, take this print to cry over. That won't be marked like this beautiful silk, rubbing it as if she loved it with a clean pocket handkerchief, in order to soften the edges of the hard round drops. Mary took the print, and naturally enough, having had leave given to her to cry over it, rather checked the inclination to weep. Everybody was full of the one subject. The girl sent out to match silk, came back with the account gathered at the shop, of the coroner's inquest then sitting. The ladies who called to speak about gowns first began about the murder, and mingled details of that with directions for their dresses. Mary felt as though the haunting horror were a nightmare, a fearful dream, from which awakening would relieve her. The picture of the murdered body, far more ghastly than the reality, seemed to swim in the air before her eyes. Sally Ledbitter looked and spoke of her, almost accusingly, and made no secret now of Mary's conduct, more blamable to her fellow working women for its later changeableness than for its former giddy flirting. "'Poor young gentleman,' said one, as Sally recounted Mary's last interview with Mr. Carson. "'What a shame!' exclaimed another, looking indignantly at Mary. "'That's what I call regular jilting,' said a third, "'and he lying cold and bloody in his coffin now.' Mary was more thankful than she could express when Miss Simmons returned to put a stop to Sally's communications and to check the remarks of the girls. She longed for the peace of Alice's sick-room, no more thinking with infinite delight of her anticipated meeting with Jem. She felt too much shocked for that now, but longing for peace and kindness, for the images of rest and beauty, and sinless times long ago, which the poor old woman's rambling presented. She wished to be as near death as Alice, and to have struggled through this world, whose sufferings she had early learnt, and whose crimes now seemed pressing close upon her. Old texts from the Bible, that her mother used to read, or rather spell out, aloud in the days of childhood, came up to her memory. When the wicked cease from troubling, and the weary are at rest, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, etc. And it was to that world Alice was hastening. Oh, that she were Alice! I must return to the Wilson's house, which was far from being the abode of peace that Mary was picturing it to herself. You remember the reward Mr. Carson offered for the apprehension of the murderer of his son? It was in itself a temptation, and to aid to its efficacy came the natural sympathy for the aged parents mourning for their child, for the young man cut off in the flower of his days, and besides this there is always a pleasure in unravelling a mystery, in catching at the gossamer clue which will guide to certainty. This feeling, I am sure, gives much impetus to the police. Their senses are ever and always on the qui vive and they enjoy the collecting and collating evidence, and the life of adventure they experience, a continual unwinding of Jack Shepherd romances, always interesting to the vulgar and uneducated mind, to which the outward signs and tokens of crime are ever exciting. There was no lack of clue or evidence at the coroner's inquest that morning. The shot, the finding of the body, the subsequent discovery of the gun, were rapidly deposed to, and then the policeman who had interrupted the quarrel between Jem Wilson and the murdered young man was brought forward, and gave his evidence, clear, simple, and straightforward. The coroner had no hesitation, the jury had none, but the verdict was cautiously worded, willful murder against some person unknown. This very cautiousness, when he deemed the thing so sure as to require no caution, irritated Mr. Carson. It did not soothe him that the superintendent called the verdict a mere form, exhibited a warrant empowering him to seize the body of Jem Wilson committed on suspicion, declared his intention of employing a well-known officer in the detective service to ascertain the ownership of the gun, and to collect other evidence, especially as regarded the young woman, about whom the policeman deposed that the quarrel had taken place. Mr. Carson was still excited and irritable, restless in body and mind. He made every preparation for the accusation of Jem the following morning before the magistrates, he engaged attorneys skilled in criminal practice to watch the case and prepare briefs. He wrote to celebrated barristers coming the northern circuit, to bespeak their services. A speedy conviction, a speedy execution, 
seemed to be the only things that would satisfy his craving thirst for blood. He would have fain been policeman, magistrate, accusing speaker all, but most of all, the judge, rising with full sentence of death on his lips. That afternoon, as Jane Wilson had begun to feel the effect of a night's disturbed rest, evinced in frequent dropping off to sleep, while she sat by her sister-in-law's bedside, lulled by the incessant crooning of the invalid's feeble voice, she was startled by a man speaking in the house-place below, who, wearied of knocking at the door, without obtaining any answer, had entered and was calling lustily for, "'Mrs. Mrs.' When Mrs. Wilson caught a glimpse of the intruder through the stair-rails, she at once saw he was a stranger, a working man. It might be a fellow labourer with her son, for his dress was grimy enough for the supposition. He held a gun in his hand. "'May I make bold to ask if this gun belongs to your son?' She first looked at the man, and then weary and half asleep, not seeing any reason for refusing to answer the inquiry, she moved forward to examine it, talking while she looked for certain old-fashioned ornaments on the stock. It looks like his. Aye, it is his, sure enough. I could speak to it anywhere by these marks. You see, it were his grandfather's as were gamekeeper to some one up in the north. They don't make guns so smart nowadays. But how comes you by it? He sets great store on it. Is he bound for the shooting gallery? He is not, for sure, now his aunt is so ill, and left me all alone. And the immediate cause of her anxiety being thus recalled to her mind, she entered on a long story of Alice's illness, interspersed with recollections of her husband's and her children's death. The disguised policeman listened for a minute or two, to glean any further information he could, and then, saying he was in a hurry, he turned to go away. She followed him to the door, still telling him her troubles, and was never struck, until it was too late to ask the reason, with the unaccountableness of his conduct, in carrying the gun away with him. Then, as she heavily climbed the stairs, she put away the wonder and the thought about his conduct, by determining to believe he was some workman with whom her son had made some arrangement about shooting at the galley, or mending the old weapon, or something or other. She had enough to fret her, without moidering herself about old guns. Jem had given it to him to bring it to her, so it was safe enough, or if it was not, why, she should be glad never to set eyes on it again, for she could not abide firearms. They were so apt to shoot people. So comforting herself, for the want of thought in not making further inquiry, she fell off into another doze, feverish, dream-haunted, and unrefreshing. Meanwhile the policeman walked off with his prize, with an odd mixture of feelings, a little contempt, a little disappointment, and a good deal of pity. The contempt and the disappointment were caused by the widow's easy admission of the gun being her son's property, and her manner of identifying it by the ornaments. He liked an attempt to baffle him. He was accustomed to it. It gave him some exercise to his wits and his shrewdness. There would be no fun in fox-hunting if Reynard yielded himself up without any effort to escape. Then again his mother's milk was yet in him, policeman, officer of the detective service though he was, and he felt sorry for the old woman whose softness had given such material assistance in identifying her son as the murderer. However, he conveyed the gun, and the intelligence he had gained, to the superintendent, and the result was that, in a short time afterwards, three policemen went to the works at which Jem was foreman, and announced their errand to the astonished overseer, who directed them to the part of the foundry where Jem was then superintending a casting. Dark, black were the walls, the ground, the faces around them, as they crossed the yard. But in the furnace-house a deep and lurid red glared over all. The furnace roared with mighty flame. The men, like demons, in their fire and soot colouring, stood swart about, awaiting the moment when the tons of solid iron should have melted down into a fiery liquid, fit to be poured, with still, heavy sound, into the delicate moulding of fine black sand, prepared to receive it. The heat was intense, and the red glare grew every instant more fierce. The policemen stood awed with the novel sight. Then black figures, holding strange-shaped bucket shovels, came athwart the deep red furnace light, and clear and brilliant flowed forth the iron into the appropriate mould. The buzz of voices rose again, there was time to speak, and gasp, and wipe the brows, and then one by one the men dispersed to some other branch of their employment. Number B-72 pointed out Jem as the man he had seen engaged in a scuffle with Mr. Carson, and then the other two stepped forward and arrested him stating of what he was accused, and the grounds of the accusation. He offered no resistance, though he seemed surprised, but calling a fellow workman to him, he briefly requested him to tell his mother he had got into trouble, and could not return home at present. 
he did not wish her to hear more at first. So Mrs. Wilson's sleep was next interrupted in almost an exactly similar way to the last, like a recurring nightmare. "'Mrs., Mrs.,' someone called out from below. Again it was a workman, but this time a blacker-looking one than before. "'What do you want?' she said, peevishly. "'Only nothing but,' stammered the man, a kind-hearted matter-of-fact person, with no invention but a great deal of sympathy. "'Well, speak out, can't she, and had done with it? "'Jem's in trouble,' said he, repeating Jem's very words, as he could think of no others. "'Trouble,' said the mother, in a high-pitched voice of distress. "'Trouble! God help me! Trouble will never end, I think. What do you mean by trouble? Speak out, man, can't you? Is he ill? My boy, tell me, is he ill?' in a hurried voice of terror. "'Na, nah, na, nah, that's not it. He's well enough. All he bade me say was, "'Tell mother I'm in trouble, and I can't come home to-night.' "'Not come home to-night? And what am I to do with Alice? I can't go on wearing my life out with watching. He might come home and help me.' "'I tell you he can't,' said the man. "'Can't? And he is well, you say? Stuff! It's just that he's getting like other young men, and wants to go a-larking. But I'll give it to him when he gets back.' The man turned to go. He durst not trust himself to speak in Jem's justification. But she would not let him off. She stood between him and the door, as she said, "'You shall not go till you've told me what he's after. I can see plain enough you know, and I'll know, too, before I've done.' "'You'll know soon enough, missus. I'll know now, I tell you. What's up that he can't come home and help me nurse? Me has never got a wink of sleep last night with watching.' "'Well, if you will have it out,' said the poor badgered man, "'the police have got a hold on him.' "'On my gem,' said the enraged mother, "'you're a downright liar, and that's what you are. "'My gem has never did harm to any one in his life. "'You're a liar, that's what you are.' "'He's done harm enough now,' said the man, angry in his turn, "'for there's good evidence he murdered young Carson as was shot last night.' She staggered forward to strike the man for telling the terrible truth, but the weakness of old age, of motherly agony, overcame her, and she sank down on a chair and covered her face. He could not leave her. When next she spoke, it was in an imploring, feeble, childlike voice. "'Oh, master, say you're only joking. I ax your pardon if I have vexed you, but please say you're only joking. You don't know what Jem is to me.' She looked humbly, anxiously up to him. "'I wish I were only joking, missus, but it's as true as I say. They've taken him up on the charge of murder. It were his gun as found near the place, and one of the police heard him quarrelling with Mr. Carson a few days back about a girl.' "'About a girl,' broke in the mother, once more indignant, though too feeble to show it as before. "'My gem was as steady as—' She hesitated for a comparison wherewith to finish, and then repeated, "'As steady as Lucifer, and he were an angel, you know. My gem was not one to quarrel about a girl.' "'Aye, but it was that, though. They'd got her name quite pat. The man had heard all they said. Mary Barton was her name, whoever she may be. "'Mary Barton, the dirty hussy!' to bring my gem into trouble of this kind. I'll give it her well when I see her, that I will. Oh, my poor gem! rocking herself to and fro. And what about the gun? What did you say about that? His gun were found on the spot where the murder were done. That's a lie for one, then. A man has got the gun now, safe and sound. I saw it not an hour ago. The man shook his head. Yes, he has indeed. A friend of Jem's, as he'd lent it to. Do you know the chap? asked the man, who was really anxious for Jem's exculpation, and caught a gleam of hope from her last speech. "'No, I can't say as I did. But he were put on as a workman. It's maybe only one of them policemen disguised. Nay, they'd never go for to do that, and trick me into telling on my own son. It would be like seething a kid in its mother's milk, and that the Bible forbids.' "'I don't know,' replied the man. Soon afterwards he went away, feeling unable to comfort, yet distressed at the sight of sorrow, she would fain have detained him, but go he would, and she was alone. She never for an instant believed Jem guilty. She would have doubted if the sun were fire first, but sorrow, desolation, and at times anger took possession of her mind. She told the unconscious Alice, hoping to rouse her to sympathy, and then was disappointed, because, still smiling and calm, she murmured of her mother, and the happy days of infancy. End of chapter 19《ハッピーバーデー》ハッピーバーデー《ハッピーバーデー》I saw where stark and cold he lay beneath the gallows tree and every one did point and say twas there he died for thee O weeping heart O bleeding heart 
what boots thy pity now? Bid from his eyes that shade depart, that death damp from his brow. The Birdal Tragedy So there was no more peace in the house of sickness except to Alice, the dying Alice. But Mary knew nothing of the afternoon's occurrences, and gladly did she breathe in the fresh air as she left Miss Simmons' house to hasten to the Wilsons. The very change from the indoor to the outdoor atmosphere seemed to alter the current of her thoughts. She thought less of the dreadful subject which had so haunted her all day. She cared less for the upbraiding speeches of her fellow workwomen. The old association of comfort and sympathy received from Alice gave her the idea that, even now, her bodily presence would soothe and compose those who were in trouble, changed, unconscious, and absent though her spirit might be. Then again she reproached herself a little for the feeling of pleasure she experienced, and thinking that he whom she dreaded could never more beset her path, in the security with which she could pass each street corner, each shop where he used to lie in ambush. O oh, beating heart! Was there no other little thought of joy lurking within to gladden the very air without? Was she not going to meet, to see, to hear Jim, and could they fail at last to understand each other's loving hearts? She softly lifted the latch with the privilege of friendship. He was not there, but his mother was standing by the fire, stirring some little mess or other. Never mind, he would come soon, and with an unmixed desire to do her graceful duty to all belonging to him, she stepped lightly forwards, unheard by the old lady, who was partly occupied by the simmering, bubbling sound of her bit of cookery, but more with her own sad thoughts and wailing, half-uttered murmurings. Mary took off bonnet and shawl with speed, and advancing, made Mrs. Wilson conscious of her presence by saying, "'Let me do that for you. I'm sure you mun be tired.' Mrs. Wilson slowly turned round, and her eyes gleamed like those of a pent-up wild beast as she recognized her visitor. "'And is it thee that dares set foot in this house after what has come to pass? Is it not enough to have robbed me of my boy with thy arts and thy profligacy, but thou must come here to crow over me, me, his mother. Dost thou know where he is, thou bad hussy, with thy great blue eyes and yellow hair, to lead men on to ruin? Out upon thee with thy angel's face, thou whited sepulchre! Dost thou know where Jim is, all through thee? No, quivered out poor Mary, scarcely conscious that she spoke, so daunted, so terrified was she by the indignant mother's greeting. "'He's lying in the new bailey,' slowly and distinctly spoke the mother, watching the effect of her words, as if believing in their infinite power to pain. "'There he lies, waiting to take his trial for murdering young Mr. Carson.' There was no answer. But such a blanched face, such wild distended eyes, such trembling limbs, instinctively seeking support. "'Did you know Mr. Carson as now lies dead?' continued the merciless woman." Folks say you did, and knew him but too well, and that for the sake of such as you my precious child shot yon chap. But he did not. I know he did not. They may hang him, but his mother will speak to his innocence with her last dying breath. She stopped more from exhaustion than want of words. Mary spoke, but in so changed and choked a voice that the old woman almost started. It seemed as if some third person must be in the room. The voice was so hoarse and strange. Please say it again. I don't quite understand you. What has Jim done? Please to tell me. I never said he had done it. I said, and I'll swear, that he never did do it. I don't care who heard him quarrel, or if it is his gun as were found near the body. It's not my own Jim as would go for to kill any man, choose how a girl had jilted him. My own good Jim as was a blessing sent upon the house where he was born." Tears came into the mother's burning eyes as her heart recurred to the days when she had rocked the cradle of her firstborn, and then rapidly passing over events till the full consciousness of his present situation came upon her, and perhaps annoyed at having shown any softness of character in the presence of the Delilah who had lured him to his danger. She spoke again, and in a sharp tone. I told him, and told him to leave off thinking on me, but he wouldn't be led by me, the wench, thou wert not good enough to wipe the dust off his feet. A vile flirting queen as thou art. 
It's well thy mother does not know, poor body, what a good for nothing thou art. Mother, oh, mother, said Mary, as if appealing to the merciful dead. But I was not good enough for him. I know I was not, added she, in a voice of touching humility. For through her heart went tolling the ominous, prophetic words he had used when he had last spoken to her. Mary, you'll maybe hear of me as a drunkard, and maybe as a thief, and maybe as a murderer. Remember, when all are speaking ill of me, you will have no right to blame me, for it's your cruelty that will have made me what I feel I shall become. And she did not blame him, though she doubted not his guilt. She felt how madly she might act if once jealous of him, and how much cause had she not given him for jealousy, miserable, guilty wretch that she was. Speak on, desolate mother. Abuse her as you will. Her broken spirit feels to have merited all. But her last humble, self-abased words had touched Mrs. Wilson's heart, sore as it was, and she looked at the snow-pale girl with those piteous eyes, so hopeless of comfort, and she relented in spite of herself. Thou seest what comes of light conduct, Mary. It's thy doing that suspicion has lighted on him, who is as innocent as the babe unborn. Thou'lt have much to answer for if he's hung. Thou'lt have my death, too, at thy door. Harsh as these words seem, she spoke them in a milder tone of voice than she had yet used. But the idea of Jim on the gallows, Jim dead, took possession of Mary, and she covered her eyes with her wan hands, as if indeed to shut out the fearful sight. She murmured some words, which, though spoken low, as if choked up from the depths of agony, Jane Wilson caught. "'My heart is breaking,' said she feebly. "'My heart is breaking.' "'Nonsense,' said Mrs. Wilson. "'Don't talk in that silly way. "'My heart has a better right to break than yours, "'and yet I hold up, you see. "'But, oh, dear, oh, dear!' "'With a sudden revulsion of feeling "'as the reality of the danger "'in which her son was placed pressed upon her. "'What am I saying? "'How could I hold up if thou wert gone, Jim? "'Though I'm as sure as I stand here of thy innocence, "'if they hang thee, my lad, "'I will lie down and die.' She wept aloud with bitter consciousness of the fearful chance awaiting her child. She cried more passionately still. Mary roused herself up. "'Oh, let me stay with you at any rate till we know the end. Dearest Mrs. Wilson, mayn't I stay?' The more obstinately and upbraidingly Mrs. Wilson refused, the more Mary pleaded with ever the same soft and treating cry, "'Let me stay with you.' Her son's soul seemed to bound its wishes, for the hour at least, to remaining with one who loved and sorrowed for the same human being that she did. But no, Mrs. Wilson was inflexible. I've maybe been a bit hard on you, Mary, I'll own that, but I cannot abide you yet with me. I cannot but remember it's your giddiness as has wrought this woe. I'll stay with Alice, and perhaps Mrs. Davenport may come help a bit. I cannot put up with you about me. Good night. Tomorrow I may look on you different, maybe. Good night. And Mary turned out of the house, which had been his home, where he was loved and mourned for, into the busy, desolate, crowded street, where they were crying half-penny broadsides, giving an account of the bloody murder, the coroner's inquest, and a raw head and bloody bones picture of the suspected murderer, James Wilson. But Mary heard not, she heeded not. She staggered on like one in a dream. With hung head and tottering steps, she instinctively chose the shortest cut to that home which was to her, in her present state of mind, only the hiding place of four walls, where she might vent her agony, unseen and unnoticed by the keen, unkind world without, but where no welcome, no love, no sympathizing tears awaited her. As she neared that home, within two minutes' walk of it, her impetuous course was arrested by a light touch on her arm and turning hastily she saw a little Italian boy with his humble show-box, a white mouse or some such thing. The setting sun cast its red glow on his face, otherwise the olive complexion would have been very pale, and the glittering teardrops hung on the long curled eyelashes. With his soft voice and pleading looks, he uttered, in his pretty broken English, the words, Hungry, so hungry and as if to aid by gesture the effect of the solitary word, he pointed to his mouth with its white quivering lips. 
Mary answered him impatiently, Oh, lad, hunger is nothing, nothing. And she rapidly passed on. But her heart upbraided her the next minute with her unrelenting speech, and she hastily entered her door and seized the scanty remnant of food which the cupboard contained, and she retraced her steps to the place where the little hopeless stranger had sunk down by his mute companion in loneliness and starvation, and was raining down tears as he spoke in some foreign tongue, with low cries for the far-distant Mamma Mia. With the elasticity of heart belonging to childhood, he sprang up as he saw the food the girl brought, she whose face, lovely in its woe, had tempted him first to address her, and with the graceful courtesy of his country, he looked up and smiled while he kissed her hand, and then poured forth his thanks and shared her bounty with his little pet companion. She stood an instant, diverted from the thought of her own grief by the sight of his infantine gladness, and then bending down and kissing his smooth forehead, she left him, and sought to be alone with her agony once more. She re-entered the house, locked the door, and tore off her bonnet, as if greedy of every moment which took her from the full indulgence of painful, despairing thought. Then she threw herself on the ground, yes, on the hard flags she threw her soft limbs down, and the comb fell out of her hair, and those bright tresses swept the dusty floor while she pillowed and hid her face on her arms, and burst forth into loud, suffocating sobs. O oh, earth! thou didst seem but a dreary dwelling-place for thy poor child that night, none to comfort, none to pity, and self-reproach gnawing at her heart. Oh, why did she ever listen to the tempter? Why did she ever give ear to her own suggestions and cravings after wealth and grandeur? Why had she thought it a fine thing to have a rich lover? She, she had deserved it all. But he was the victim, he the beloved. She could not conjecture, she could not even pause to think who had revealed, or how he had discovered her acquaintance with Harry Carson. It was but too clear, some way or another, he had learnt all. And what would he think of her? No hope of his love. Oh, that she would give up and be content. It was his life, his precious life, that was threatened. Then she tried to recall the particulars, which, when Mrs. Wilson had given them, had fallen but upon a deafened ear, something about a gun, a quarrel, which she could not remember clearly. Oh, how terrible to think of his crime, his blood-guiltiness, he who had hitherto been so good, so noble, and now an assassin. And then she shrank from him in thought, and then with bitter remorse, clung more closely to his image with passionate self-upbraiding. Was it not she who had led him to that pit into which he had fallen? Was she to blame him? She to judge him? Who could tell how maddened he might have been by jealousy, how one moment's uncontrollable passion might have led him to become a murderer? And she had blamed him in her heart after his last deprecating, imploring, prophetic speech. Then she burst out crying afresh, and when weary of crying, fell to thinking again. The gallows! The gallows! Black it stood against the burning light which dazzled her shut eyes, press on them as she would. Oh, she was going mad, and for a while she lay outwardly still, but with the pulses careering through her head with wild vehemence. And then came a strange forgetfulness of the present, in thought of the long past times, of those days when she hid her face on her mother's pitying, loving bosom, and heard tender words of comfort, be her grief or her error what it might, of those days when she had felt as if her mother's love was too mighty not to last for ever of those days when hunger had been to her, as to the little stranger she had that evening relieved, something to be thought about and mourned over, when Jim and she had played together, he with the condescension of an older child, and she, with unconscious earnestness, believing that he was as much gratified with important trifles as she was, when her father was a cheery-hearted man, rich in the love of his wife, and the companionship of his friend, when, for it still worked round to that, when mother was alive, and he was not a murderer. And then heaven blessed her unaware, and she sank from remembering, to wandering unconnected thought, and thence to sleep. Yes, it was sleep, though in that strange posture, on that hard, cold bed, and she dreamt of the happy times of long ago, and her mother came to her, and kissed her as she lay, and once more the dead were alive again in that happy world of dreams. All was restored to the gladness of childhood, even to the little kitten which had been her playmate and bosom friend then, and which had been long forgotten in her waking hours. All the loved ones were there. 
She suddenly awakened, clear and wide awake. Some noise had startled her from sleep. She sat up and put her hair, still wet with tears, back from her flushed cheeks and listened. At first she could only hear her beating heart. All was still without, for it was after midnight such hours of agony had passed away, but the moon shone clearly in at the unshuttered window, making the room almost as light as day in its cold, ghastly radiance. There was a low knock at the door. A strange feeling crept over Mary's heart as if something spiritual were near, as if the dead so lately present in her dreams were yet gliding and hovering round her with their dim dread forms. And yet why dread? Had they not loved her? And who loved her now? Was she not lonely enough to welcome the spirits of the dead who had loved her while here? If her mother had conscious being, her love for her child endured, so she quieted her fears and listened, listened still. Mary, Mary, open the door, as a little movement on her part seemed to tell the being outside of her wakeful, watchful state. They were the accents of her mother's voice, the very South Country pronunciation that Mary so well remembered, and which she had sometimes tried to imitate when alone with the fond mimicry of affection. So, without fear, without hesitation, she rose and unbarred the door. There, against the moonlight, stood a form, so closely resembling her dead mother, that Mary never doubted the identity, but exclaiming, as if she were a terrified child, secure of safety when near the protecting care of its parent, "'Oh, mother, mother, you are come at last!' She threw herself, or rather fell, into the trembling arms of her long-lost, unrecognized Aunt Esther. End of chapter 20 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter 21 Esther's Motive in Seeking Mary My rest is gone, my heart is sore, Peace find I never and never more. Margaret's Song in Faust I must go back a little to explain the motives which caused Esther to seek an interview with her niece. The murder had been committed early on Thursday night, and between then and the dawn of the following day, there was ample time for the news to spread far and wide among all those whose duty, or whose want, or whose errors, caused them to be abroad in the streets of Manchester. Among those who listened to the tale of violence was Esther. A craving desire to know more took possession of her mind. Far away as she was from Turner Street, she immediately set off to the scene of the murder, which was faintly lighted by the grey dawn as she reached the spot. It was so quiet and still that she could hardly believe it to be the place. The only vestige of any scuffle or violence was a trail in the dust, as if somebody had been lying there, and then been raised by extraneous force. The little birds were beginning to hop and twitter in the leafless hedge, making the only sound that was near and distinct. She crossed into the field where she guessed the murderer to have stood. It was easy of access, for the worn, stunted hawthorn edge had many gaps in it. The night smell of the bruised grass came up from under her feet, as she went towards the sawpit and carpenter's shed which, as I have said before, were in a corner of the field near the road, and where one of her informants had told her it was supposed by the police that the murderer had lurked while waiting for his victim. There was no sign, however, that any one had been about the place. If the grass had been bruised or bent where he had trod, it had had enough of the elasticity of life to raise itself under the dewy influences of night. She hushed her breath in involuntary awe, but nothing else told of the violent deed by which a fellow creature had passed away. She stood still for a minute, imagining to herself the position of the parties, guided by the only circumstance which afforded any evidence, the trailing mark on the dust in the road. Suddenly, it was before the sun had risen above the horizon, she became aware of something white in the hedge. All other colors wore the same murky hue, though the forms of objects were perfectly distinct. What was it? It could not be a flower. That the time of year made clear. A frozen lump of snow lingering late in one of the gnarled tufts of the hedge? She stepped forward to examine. It proved to be a little piece of stiff writing paper compressed into a round shape. She understood it instantly. It was the paper that had served as a wadding for the murderer's gun. 
then she had been standing just where the murderer must have been but a few hours before probably as the rumour had spread through the town reaching her ears one of the poor maddened turnouts who hung about everywhere with black fierce looks as if contemplating some deed of violence her sympathy was all with them for she had known what they suffered and besides this there was her own individual dislike of mr carson and dread of him for mary's sake yet poor mary death was a terrible though sure remedy for the evil esther had dreaded for her and how would she stand the shock loving as her aunt believed her to do poor mary who would comfort her esther's thoughts began to picture her sorrow her despair when the news of her lover's death should reach her and she longed to tell her there might have been a keener grief yet had he lived bright beautiful came the slanting rays of the morning sun it was time for such as she to hide themselves with the other obscene things of night from the glorious light of day which was only for the happy so she turned her steps towards town still holding the paper but in getting over the hedge it encumbered her to hold it in her clasped hand and she threw it down she passed on a few steps her thoughts still of mary till the idea crossed her mind could it blank as it appeared to be give any clue to the murderer as i said before her sympathies were all on that side so she turned back and picked it up and then feeling as if in some measure an accessory she hid it unexamined in her hand and hastily passed out of the street at the opposite end to that by which she had entered it and what do you think she felt when having walked some distance from the spot she dared to open the crushed paper and saw written on it mary barton's name and not only that but the street in which she lived true a letter or two was torn off but nevertheless there was the name clear to be recognized and oh what a terrible thought flashed into her mind or was it only fancy but it looked very like the writing which she had once known well the writing of jem wilson who when she lived at her brother-in-law's and he was a near neighbour had often been employed by her to write her letters to people to whom she was ashamed of sending her own misspelled scrawl she remembered the wonderful flourishes she had so much admired in those days while she sat by dictating and jem in all the pride of newly acquired penmanship used to dazzle her eyes by extraordinary graces and twirls if it were his oh perhaps it was merely that her head was running so on mary that she was associating every trifle with her as if only one person wrote in that flourishing meandering style it was enough to fill her mind to think from what she might have saved mary by securing the paper she would look at it just once more and see if some very dense and stupid policeman could have mistaken the name or if mary would certainly have been dragged into notice in the affair no no one could have mistaken the re barton and it was jem's handwriting oh if it was so she understood it all and she had been the cause with her violent and unregulated nature rendered morbid by the course of life she led and her consciousness of her degradation she cursed herself for the interference which she believed had led to this for the information and the warning she had given to jem which had roused him to this murderous action how could she the abandoned and polluted outcast ever have dared to hope for a blessing even on her efforts to do good the black curse of heaven rested on all her doings were they for good or for evil poor diseased mind and there were none to minister to thee so she wandered about too restless to take her usual heavy morning sleep up and down the streets greedily listening to every word of the passers-by and loitering near each group of talkers anxious to scrape together every morsel of information or conjecture or suspicion though without possessing any definite purpose in all this and ever and always she clenched the scrap of paper which might betray so much until her nails had deeply indented the palm of her hand so fearful was she in her nervous dread lest unawares she should let it drop towards the middle of the day she could no longer evade the body's craving want of rest and refreshment but the rest was taken in a spirit vault and the refreshment was a glass of gin then she started up from the stupor she had taken for repose and suddenly driven before the gusty impulses of her mind she pushed her way to the place where at that very time the police were bringing the information they had gathered with regard to the all-engrossing murder 
she listened with painful acuteness of comprehension to dropped words and unconnected sentences the meaning of which became clearer and yet more clear to her jem was suspected jem was ascertained to be the murderer she saw him although he absorbed in deep sad thought saw her not she saw him brought handcuffed and guarded out of the coach she saw him enter the station she gasped for breath till he came out still handcuffed and still guarded to be conveyed to the new bailey he was the only one who had spoken to her with hope that she might win her way back to virtue his words had lingered in her heart with a sort of call to heaven like distant sabbath bells although in her despair she had turned away from his voice he was the only one who had spoken to her kindly the murder shocking though it was was an absent abstract thing on which her thoughts could not and would not dwell all that was present in her mind was jem's danger and his kindness then mary came to remembrance esther wondered till she was sick of wondering in what way she was taking the affair in some manner it would be a terrible blow for the poor motherless girl with her dreadful father too who was to esther a sort of accusing angel she set off towards the court where mary lived to pick up what she could there of information but she was ashamed to enter in where once she had been innocent and hung about the neighboring streets not daring to question so she learned but little nothing in fact but the knowledge of john barton's absence from home she went up a dark entry to rest her weary limbs on a doorstep and think her elbows on her knees her face hidden in her hands she tried to gather together and arrange her thoughts but still every now and then she opened her hand to see if the paper were yet there she got up at last she had formed a plan and had a course of action to look forward to that would satisfy one craving desire at least the time was long gone by when there was much wisdom or consistency in her projects it was getting late and that was so much the better she went to a pawn shop and took off her finery in a back room she was known by the people and had a character for honesty so she had no very great difficulty in inducing them to let her have a suit of outer clothes befitting the wife of a working man a black silk bonnet a printed gown a plaid shawl dirty and rather worn to be sure but which had a sort of sanctity to the eyes of the street-walker as being the appropriate garb of that happy class to which she could never never more belong she looked at herself in the little glass which hung against the wall and sadly shaking her head thought how easy were the duties of that eden of innocence from which she was shut out how she would work and toil and starve and die if necessary for a husband a home for children but that thought she could not bear a little form rose up stern in its innocence from the witch's cauldron of her imagination and she rushed into action again you know now how she came to stand by the threshold of mary's door waiting trembling until the latch was lifted and her niece with words that spoke of such desolation among the living fell into her arms she had felt as if some holy spell would prevent her even as the unholy lady geraldine was prevented in the abode of christabel from crossing the threshold of that home of her early innocence and she had meant to wait for an invitation but mary's helpless action did away with all reluctant feeling and she bore her dragged her to her seat and looked on her bewildered eyes as puzzled with the likeness which was not identity she gazed on her aunt's features in pursuance of her plan esther meant to assume the manners and character as she had done the dress of a mechanic's wife but then to account for her long absence and her long silence towards all that ought to have been dear to her it was necessary that she should put on an indifference far distant from her heart which was loving and yearning in spite of all its faults and perhaps she overacted her part for certainly mary felt a kind of repugnance to the changed and altered aunt who so suddenly reappeared on the scene and it would have cut esther to the very core could she have known how her little darling of former days was feeling towards her you don't remember me i see mary she began it's a long while since i left you all to be sure and i many a time thought of coming to see you and and your father but i live so far off and am always so busy i cannot do just what i wish you recollect aunt esther don't you mary 
are you aunt hetty asked mary faintly still looking at the face which was so different from the old recollections of her aunt's fresh dazzling beauty yes i am aunt hetty oh it's so long since i heard that name sighing forth the thoughts it suggested then recovering herself and striving after the hard character she wished to assume she continued and to-day i heard a friend of yours and of mine too long ago was in trouble and i guessed you would be in sorrow so i thought i would just step this far and see you mary's tears flowed afresh but she had no desire to open her heart to her strangely found aunt who had by her own confession kept aloof from and neglecting them for so many years yet she tried to feel grateful for kindness however late from any one and wished to be civil moreover she had a strong disinclination to speak on the terrible subject uppermost in her mind so after a pause she said thank you i dare say you mean very kind have you had a long walk i'm so sorry she said rising with a sudden thought which was as suddenly checked by recollection but i've nothing to eat in the house and i'm sure you must be hungry after your walk for mary concluded that certainly her aunt's residence must be far away on the other side of the town out of sight or hearing but after all she did not think much about her her heart was so aching full of other things that all besides seemed like a dream. She received feelings and impressions from her conversation with her aunt, but did not, could not, put them together, or think or argue about them. And Esther! How scanty had been her food for days and weeks, her thinly covered bones and pale lips might tell, but her words should never reveal. So, with a little unreal laugh, she replied, "'Oh, Mary, my dear, don't talk about eating.' We've the best of everything, and plenty of it, for my husband is in good work. I'd such a supper before I came out. I couldn't touch a morsel if you had it. Her words shot a strange pang through Mary's heart. She had always remembered her aunt's loving and unselfish disposition. How was it changed if, living in plenty, she had never thought it worth while to ask after her relations, who were all but starving? She shut up her heart instinctively against her aunt and all the time poor Esther was swallowing her sobs and overacting her part and controlling herself more than she had done for many a long day, in order that her niece might not be shocked and revolted by the knowledge of what her aunt had become, a prostitute, an outcast. She had longed to open her wretched, wretched heart, so hopeless, so abandoned by all living things, to one who had loved her once, and yet she refrained from dread of the averted eye, the altered voice, the internal loathing, which she feared such disclosure might create. She would go straight to the subject of the day. She could not tarry long, for she felt unable to support the character she had assumed for any length of time. They sat by the little round table facing each other. The candle was placed right between them, and Esther moved it in order to have a clearer view of Mary's face, so that she might read her emotions and ascertain her interests. Then she began. "'It's a bad business, I'm afraid, this of Mr. Carson's murder?' Mary winced a little. "'I hear Jem Wilson is taken up for it.' Mary covered her eyes with her hands, as if to shade them from the light, and Esther herself, less accustomed to self-command, was getting too much agitated for calm observation of another. "'I was taking a walk near Turner Street, and I went to see the spot,' continued Esther. "'And, as luck would have it, I spied this bit of paper in the hedge, producing the precious piece still folded in her hand. It has been used as wadding for the gun, I reckon. Indeed, that's clear enough, from the shape it's crammed into. I was sorry for the murderer, whoever he might be. I didn't then know of Jem's being suspected, and I thought I would never leave a thing about as might help ever so little to convict him. The police are so cute about straws. So I carried it a little way, and then I opened it, and saw your name, Mary. Mary took her hands away from her eyes, and looked with surprise at her aunt's face as she uttered these words. She was kind, after all, for was she not saving her from being summoned, and from being questioned and examined, a thing to be dreaded above all others, as she felt sure that her unwilling answers, frame them how she might, would add to the suspicions against Jem. Her aunt was indeed kind to think of what would spare her this. Esther went on without noticing Mary's look. The very action of speaking was so painful to her and so much interrupted by the hard, raking little cough, 
which had been her constant annoyance for months, that she was too much engrossed by the physical difficulty of utterance to be a very close observer. There could be no mistake if they had found it. Look at your name, together with the very name of this court, and in Jem's handwriting too, or I'm much mistaken. Look, Mary! And now she did watch her. Mary took the paper and flattened it, then suddenly stood stiff up, with irrepressible movement, as if petrified by some horror abruptly disclosed, her face strung and rigid, her lips compressed tight to keep down some rising exclamation. She dropped on her seat, as suddenly as if the braced muscles had in an instant given way. But she spoke no word. "'It is his handwriting, isn't it?' asked Esther, though Mary's manner was almost confirmation enough. "'You will not tell. You never will tell,' demanded Mary, in a tone so sternly earnest as almost to be threatening. "'Nay, Mary,' said Esther, rather reproachfully, "'I am not so bad as that. Oh, Mary, you cannot think I would do that, whatever I may be.' The tears sprang to her eyes at the idea that she was suspected of being one who would help to inform against an old friend. Mary caught her sad and upbraiding look. "'No, I know you would not tell, Aunt. "'I don't know what I say. I am so shocked. "'But say you will not tell, do?' "'No, indeed, I willn't tell, come what may.' "'Mary sat still, looking at the writing, "'and turning the paper round with careful examination, "'trying to hope, but her very fears belying her hopes. "'I thought you cared for the young man that's murdered,' "'observed Esther, half aloud, but feeling that she could not mistake "'the strange interest in the suspected murderer "'implied by Mary's eagerness to screen him from anything "'which might strengthen suspicion against him. "'She had come desirous to know the extent of Mary's grief for Mr. Carson, "'and glad of the excuse afforded her by the important scrap of paper. "'Her remark about its being Jem's handwriting "'she had, with this view of ascertaining Mary's state of feeling, felt to be most imprudent the instant after she had uttered it, but Mary's anxiety that she should not tell was too great and too decided to leave a doubt as to her interest for Jem. She grew more and more bewildered, and her dizzy head refused to reason. Mary never spoke. She held the bit of paper firmly, determined to retain possession of it, come what might, and anxious and impatient for her aunt to go. As she sat, her face bore a likeness to Esther's dead child. "'You are so like my little girl, Mary,' said Esther, aware of the one subject on which she could get no satisfaction, and recurring with full heart to the thought of the dead. Mary looked up. Her aunt had children, then. That was all the idea she received. No faint imagination of the love and the woe of that poor creature crossed her mind or she would have taken her, all guilty and erring, to her bosom, and tried to bind up the broken heart. No, it was not to be. Her aunt had children then, and she was on the point of putting some question about them, but before it could be spoken another thought turned it aside, and she went back to her task of unraveling the mystery of the paper and the handwriting. Oh, how she wished her aunt would go! As if, according to the believers in mesmerism, the intenseness of her wish gave her power over another. Although the wish was unexpressed, Esther felt herself unwelcome, and that her absence was desired. She felt this some time before she could summon up resolution to go. She was so much disappointed in this longed-for, dreaded interview with Mary. She had wished to impose upon her with her tale of married respectability, and yet she had yearned and craved for sympathy in her real lot. And she had imposed upon her well— she should perhaps be glad of it afterwards, but her desolation of hope seemed for the time redoubled, and she must leave the old dwelling place, whose very walls and flags, dingy and sordid as they were, had a charm for her. Must leave the abode of poverty, for the more terrible abodes of vice. She must, she would go. Well, good night, Mary. That bit of paper is safe enough with you, I see. "'But you made me promise I would not tell about it, "'and you must promise me to destroy it before you sleep. "'I promise,' said Mary hoarsely but firmly. "'Then you are going?' "'Yes, not if you wish me to stay, "'not if I could be of any comfort to you, Mary,' "'catching at some glimmering hope. "'Oh, no,' said Mary, anxious to be alone. "'Your husband will be wondering where you are. "'Some day you must tell me all about yourself. "'I forget what your name is.' 
Ferguson, said Esther sadly. Mrs. Ferguson, repeated Mary, half unconsciously. And where did you say you lived? I never did say, muttered Esther, then aloud, in Angel's Meadow, 145 Nicholas Street. 145 Nicholas Street, Angel Meadow. I shall remember. As Esther drew her shawl around her and prepared to depart, a thought crossed Mary's mind that she had been cold and hard in her manner towards one, who had certainly meant to act kindly in bringing her the paper, that dread terrible piece of paper, and thus saving her from, she could not rightly think how much or how little she was spared. So desirous of making up for her previous indifferent manner, she advanced to kiss her aunt before departure. But, to her surprise, her aunt pushed her off with a frantic kind of gesture, and saying the words, "'Not me. You must never kiss me, you!' She rushed into the outer darkness of the street, and there wept long and bitterly. End of chapter 21 Recording by Stephanie Dupal de Martin Chapter 22 Mary's Efforts to Prove an Alibi There was a listening fear in her regard, as if calamity had but begun, as if the vanward clouds of evil days had spent their malice, and the sullen roar was, with its stored thunder, labouring up. Keats Hyperion No sooner was Mary alone than she fastened the door, and put the shutters up against the window, which had all this time remained shaded only by the curtains hastily drawn together on Esther's entrance and the lighting of the candle. She did all this with the same compressed lips and the same stony look that her face had assumed on the first examination of the paper. Then she sat down for an instant to think, and rising directly, went with a step rendered firm by inward resolution of purpose up the stairs, past her own door, two steps into her father's room. What did she want there? I must tell you, I must put into words the dreadful secret which she believed that bit of paper had revealed to her. Her father was the murderer. That corner of stiff, shining, thick writing paper she recognised as part of a sheet on which she had copied Samuel Burnford's beautiful lines so many months ago. Copied, as you perhaps remember, on the blank part of a valentine sent to her by Jim Wilson, in those days when she did not treasure and hoard up everything he had touched, as she would do now. That copy had been given to her father, for whom it was made, and she had occasionally seen him reading it over. Not a fortnight ago, she was sure, but she resolved to ascertain if the other part still remained in his possession. He might, it was just possible he might, have given it away to some friend and if so, that person was the guilty one, for she could swear to the paper anywhere. First of all, she pulled out every article from the little old chest of drawers. Amongst them were some things which had belonged to her mother, but she had no time now to examine and try and remember them. All the reverence she could pay them was to carry them and lay them on the bed carefully, while the other things were tossed impatiently out upon the floor. The copy of Bamford's lines was not there. Oh, perhaps he might have given it away. But then, must it not have been to Jem? It was his gun. And she set to with redoubled vigour to examine the deal box, which served as chair, and which had once contained her father's Sunday clothes, in the days when he could afford to have Sunday clothes. He had redeemed his better coat from the pawn shop before he left, that she had noticed. Here was his old one. What rustled under her hand in the pocket? The paper. Oh, father! Yes, it fitted. Jagged end to jagged end, letter to letter, and even the part which Esther had considered blank had its tallying mark with the larger piece, its tails of Y's and G's. And then, as if that were not damning evidence enough, she felt again, and found some little bullets or shot, I don't know which you would call them, in that same pocket, along with a small paper parcel of gunpowder. As she was going to replace the jacket, having abstracted the paper and bullets, etc., she saw a woollen gun case, made of that sort of striped horse cloth you must have seen a thousand times appropriated to such a purpose. The sight of it made her examine still further, 
but there was nothing else that could afford any evidence, so she locked the box and sat down on the floor to contemplate the articles. Now with a sickening despair, now with a kind of wandering curiosity how her father had managed to evade observation. After all, it was easy enough. He had evidently got possession of some gun. Was it really Jim's? Was he an accomplice? No, she did not believe it. He never, never would deliberately plan a murder with another, however he might be wrought up to it by passionate feeling at the time. Least of all would he accuse her to her father without previously warning her. It was out of his nature. Then, having obtained possession of the gun, her father had loaded it at home, and might have carried it away with him some time when the neighbours were not noticing, and she was out or asleep. Then he might have hidden it somewhere to be in readiness when he should want it. She was sure he had no such thing with him when he went away the last time. She felt it was of no use to conjecture his motives. His actions had become so wild and irregular of late that she could not reason upon them. Besides, was it not enough to know that he was guilty of this terrible offence? Her love for her father seemed to return with painful force, mixed up as it was with horror at his crime. That dear father, who was once so kind, so warm-hearted, so ready to help either man or beast in distress, to murder? But in the desert of misery with which these thoughts surrounded her, the arid depths of whose gloom she dared not venture to contemplate, a little spring of comfort was gushing up at her feet, unnoticed at first, but soon to give her strength and hope. And that was the necessity for exertion on her part, which this discovery enforced. Oh, I do think that the necessity for exertion, for some kind of action, bodily or mental, in time of distress, is a most infinite blessing. Although the first efforts at such seasons are painful, something to be done implies that there is yet hope of some good thing to be accomplished, or some additional evil that may be avoided, and by degrees the hope absorbs much of the sorrow. It is the woes that cannot, in any earthly way, be escaped that admit least earthly comforting. Of all trite, worn-out, hollow mockeries of comfort that were ever uttered by people who will not take the trouble of sympathising with others, the one I dislike the most is the exhortation not to grieve over an event, for it cannot be helped. Do you think if I could help it, I would sit still with folded hands, content to mourn? Do you not believe that as long as hope remained I would be up and doing? I mourn because what has occurred cannot be helped. The reason you give me for not grieving is the very and sole reason of my grief. Give me nobler and higher reasons for enduring meekly what my father sees fit to send, and I will try earnestly and faithfully to be patient, but mock me not or in any other mourner, with the speech, Do not grieve, for it cannot be helped, it is past remedy. But some remedy to Mary's sorrow came with thinking. If her father was guilty, Jem was innocent. If innocent, there was a possibility of saving him. He must be saved. And she must do it. For was not she the sole depository of the terrible secret? Her father was not suspected, and never should be, if by any foresight or any exertions of her own she could prevent it. She did not know how Jem was to be saved while her father was also to be considered innocent. It would require much thought and much prudence, but with the call upon her exertions and her various qualities of judgment and discretion came the answering consciousness of innate power to meet the emergency. Every step now, nay, the employment of every minute, was of consequence. For you must remember, she had learnt at Miss Simmons the probability that the murderer would be brought to trial the next week. And you must remember, too, that never was so young a girl so friendless or so penniless as Mary was at this time. But the lion accompanied Una through the wilderness and the danger, and so will a high, resolved purpose of right doing ever guard and accompany the helpless. It struck too deep murk night. It was of no use bewildering herself with plans this weary, endless night. Nothing could be done before morning, and, at first in her impatience, she began to long for day. 
but then she felt in how unfit a state her body was for any plan of exertion and she resolutely made up her mind to husband her physical strength first of all she must burn the tell-tale paper the powder bullets and gun case she tied into a bundle and hid in the sacking of the bed for the present although there was no likelihood of their affording any evidence against any one then she carried the paper downstairs and burned it on the hearth powdering the very ashes with her fingers and dispersing the fragments of fluttering black films among the cinders of the grate then she breathed again her head ached with dizzying violence she must get quit of the pain or it would incapacitate her for thinking and planning she looked for food but there was nothing but a little raw oatmeal in the house still although it almost choked her she ate some of this knowing from experience how often headaches were caused by long fasting then she sought for some water to bathe her throbbing temples and quench her feverish thirst but there was none in the house so she took the jug and went out to the pump at the other end of the court whose echoes resounded her light footsteps in the quiet stillness of the night the hard square outlines of the houses cut sharply against the cold bright sky from which myriads of stars were shining down in eternal repose there was little sympathy in the outward scene with the internal trouble all was so still so motionless so hard very different to this lovely night in the country in which i am now writing where the distant horizon is soft and undulating in the moonlight and the nearer trees sway gently to and fro in the night wind with something of almost human motion and the rustling air makes music among their branches as if speaking soothingly to the weary ones who lie awake in heaviness of heart the sights and sounds of such a night lull pain and grief to rest but mary re-entered her home after she had filled her pitcher with a still stronger sense of anxiety and a still clearer conviction of how much rested upon her unassisted and friendless self alone with her terrible knowledge in the hard cold populous world she bathed her forehead and quenched her thirst and then with wise deliberation of purpose went upstairs and undressed herself as if for a long night's slumber although so few hours intervened before day dawn she believed she never could sleep but she lay down and shut her eyes and before many minutes she was in a deep and sound a slumber as if there was no sin or sorrow in the world she woke up as it was natural much refreshed in body but with a consciousness of some great impending calamity she sat up in bed to recollect and when she did remember she sank down again with all the helplessness of despair but it was only the weakness of an instant for were not the very minutes precious for deliberation if not for action before she had finished the necessary morning business of dressing and setting her house in some kind of order she had disentangled her ravelled ideas and arranged some kind of plan for action if jem was innocent and now of the guilt even the slightest participation in or knowledge of the murder she acquitted him with all her heart and soul he must have been somewhere else when the crime was committed probably with some others who might bear witness to the fact if she only knew where to find them everything rested on her she had heard of an alibi and believed it might mean the deliverance she wished to accomplish but she was not quite sure and determined to apply to job as one of the few among her acquaintance gifted with the knowledge of hard words for to her all terms of law or natural history were alike many syllable mysteries no time was to be lost she went straight to job lee's house and found the old man and his granddaughter sitting at breakfast as she opened the door she heard their voices speaking in a grave hushed subdued tone as if something grieved their hearts they stopped talking on her entrance and then she knew they had been conversing about the murder about jem's probable guilt and it flashed upon her for the first time on the new light they would have obtained regarding herself for until now they had never heard of her giddy flirting with mr carson not in all her confidential talk with margaret had she ever spoken of him 
and now margaret would hear her conduct talked of by all as that of a bold bad girl and even if she did not believe everything that was said she could hardly help feeling wounded and disappointed in mary so it was in a timid voice that mary wished her usual good morrow and her heart sunk within her a little and job with a form of civility bade her welcome in that dwelling where until now she had been too well assured to require to be asked to sit down she took a chair margaret continued silent i am come to speak to you about this about jem wilson it's a bad business i'm afeard replied job sadly ay it's bad enough anyhow but jem's innocent indeed he is i am as sure as sure can be how can you know wench facts bear strong against him poor fellow though he'd a deal to put him up and aggravate him they say ay poor lad he's done for himself i'm afeard job said mary rising from her chair in her eagerness you must not say he did it he didn't i am sure and certain he didn't oh why do you shake your head who is to believe me who is to think him innocent if you who knowed him so well stick to it he's guilty i'm loath enough to do it lass replied job but i think he's been ill-used and jilted that's plain truth mary bare as it may seem and his blood has been up many a man has done the like afore from these like causes oh job then you won't help me job to prove him innocent oh job job believe me jem never did harm to no one not afore and mind wench i don't over blame him for this job relapsed into silence mary thought a moment well job you'll not refuse me this i know i won't mind what you think if you'll help me as if he was innocent now suppose i know i knew he was innocent it's only supposing job what must i do to prove it tell me job isn't it called an alibi the getting folk to swear to where he really was at the time best way if you knowed him innocent would be to find out the real murderer some one did it that's clear enough if it wasn't jim who was it how can i tell answered mary in agony of terror lest job's question was prompted by any suspicion of the truth but he was far enough from any such thought indeed he had no doubt in his own mind that jim had in some passionate moment urged on by slighted love and jealousy been the murderer and he was strongly inclined to believe that mary was aware of this only that too late repentant of her light conduct which had led to such fatal consequences she was now most anxious to save her old playfellow her early friend from the doom awaiting the shedder of blood if jem's not done it i don't see as any in us can tell who did it we might find out something if we'd time but they say he's to be tried on tuesday it's no use hiding it mary things look strong against him i know they do i know they do but oh job isn't it an alibi proving where he really was at the time of the murder and how must i set about an alibi an alibi is that sure enough he thought a little your man asked his mother his doings and his whereabouts that night the knowledge of that will guide you a bit for he was anxious that on another should fall the task of enlightening mary on the hopelessness of the case and he felt that her own sense would be more convinced by inquiry and examination than any mere assertion of his margaret had sat silent and grave all this time to tell the truth she was surprised and disappointed by the disclosure of mary's conduct with regard to mr henry carson gentle reserved and prudent herself never exposed to the trial of being admired for her personal appearance and unsusceptible enough to be in doubt even yet whether the fluttering tender infinitely joyous feeling she was for the first time experiencing at sight or sound or thought of will wilson was love or not margaret had no sympathy with the temptations to which loveliness vanity ambition or the desire of being admired exposes so many no sympathy with flirting girls in short then she had no idea of the strength of the conflict between will and principle in some 
who were differently constituted from herself. With her, to be convinced that an action was wrong was tantamount to a determination not to do so again, and she had little or no difficulty in carrying out her determination. So she could not understand how it was that Mary had acted wrongly, and had felt too much ashamed, in spite of internal sophistry, to speak of her actions. Margaret considered herself deceived, felt aggrieved, and at the time of which I am now telling you, was strongly inclined to give Mary up altogether as a girl devoid of the modest proprieties of her sex, and capable of gross duplicity in speaking of one lover as she had done of Jem, while she was encouraging another in attentions, at best of a very doubtful character. But now Margaret was drawn into the conversation. Suddenly it flashed across Mary's mind that the night of the murder was the very night, or rather, the same early morning, that Margaret had been with Alice. She turned sharp round with, "'Oh, Margaret, you can tell me. You were there when he came back that night. Were you not? No, you were not. But you were there not many hours after. Did not you hear where he'd been? He was away the night before, too, when Alice was first taken, when you were there for your tea. Oh, where was he, Margaret? I don't know, she answered. Stay, I do remember something about his keeping Will company in his walk to Liverpool. I can't justly say what it was. So much happened that night. I'll go to his mother's, said Mary resolutely. They neither of them spoke, either to advise or dissuade. Mary felt she had no sympathy from them, and braced up her soul to act without such loving aid of friendship. She knew that their advice would be willingly given at her demand, and that was all she really required for Jem's sake. Still her courage failed a little as she walked to Jane Wilson's, alone in the world with her secret. Jane Wilson's eyes were swelled with crying, and it was sad to see the ravages which intense anxiety and sorrow had made on her appearance in four and twenty hours. All night long she and Mrs. Davenport had crooned over their sorrows, always recurring like the burden of an old song to the dreadest sorrow of all, which was now impending over Mrs. Wilson. She had grown, I hardly know what word to use, but something like proud of her martyrdom. She had grown to hug her grief, to feel an excitement in her agony of anxiety about her boy. So, Mary, you're here. Oh, Mary, lass! He's to be tried on Tuesday. She fell to sobbing in the convulsive, breath-catching manner which tells so of much previous weeping. Oh, Mrs. Wilson, don't take on so. We'll get him off, you'll see. Don't fret. They can't prove him guilty. But I tell thee they will, interrupted Mrs. Wilson, half irritated at the light way, as she considered it, in which Mary spoke and a little displeased that another could hope when she had almost brought herself to find pleasure in despair. "'It may suit thee well,' continued she, "'to make light of the misery thou hast caused. "'But I shall lay his death at thy door as long as I live, "'and die I know he will, and all for what he never did. "'No, he never did, my own blessed boy!' She was too weak to be angry long. Her wrath sank away to feeble sobbing and worn-out moans. Mary was anxious to soothe her from any violence of either grief or anger. She did so want her to be clear in her recollection, and besides, her tenderness was great towards Jem's mother. So she spoke in a low, gentle tone the loving sentences, which sound so broken and powerless in repetition, and which yet have so much power when accompanied with caressing looks and actions, fresh from the heart. The old woman insensibly gave herself up to the influences of those sweet, loving blue eyes, whose tears of sympathy, those words of love and hope, and was lulled into a less morbid state of mind. And now, dear Mrs. Wilson, can you remember where he said he was going on Thursday night? He was out when Alice was taken hill, and he did not come home till early in the morning, or to speak true in the night, did he? Aye, he went out near upon five, he went out with Will, he said he were going to set him a part of the way, for Will were hot upon walking to Liverpool, and wouldn't hearken to Jem's offer to lending him five shillings for his fare. So the two lads set off together. I mind it all now, 
but thou seest alice's illness and this business of poor jem's drove it out of my head and went off together to walk to liverpool that's to say jem were to go part of the way but who knows falling back into the old desponding stone if he really went he might be let off the road a merry wench they'll hang him for what he's never done no they won't they shan't i see my way a bit now we mun get will to help there'll be time he can swear that jem were with him where is jem folk said he were taken to kirkdale in the prison van this morning without my seeing him poor chap oh wench they've hurried on the business at a cruel rate ay they've not let grass grow under their feet in hunting out the men that did it said mary sorrowfully and bitterly but keep up your heart they got on the wrong scent when they took to suspecting jem don't be afeard you'll see it will end right for jem i should mind it less if i could do aught said jane wilson but i'm such a poor weak old body and my head's so gone and i'm so dazed like what with alice and all that i think and think she can do naught to help my child i might have gone and seen him last night they tell me now and then i missed it oh mary i missed it and i may never see the lad again she looked so piteously in mary's face with her miserable eyes that mary felt her heart giving way and dreading the weakness of her powers which the burst of crying she longed for would occasion hastily changed the subject to alice and jane in her heart feeling that there was no sorrow like a mother's sorrow replied she keeps on much the same thank you she's happy for she knows nothing of what's going on but the doctor says she grows weaker and weaker that may be like to see her mary went upstairs partly because it was the etiquette in humble life to offer to friends at last opportunity of seeing the dying or the dead while the same etiquette forbids a refusal of the invitation and partly because she longed to breathe for an instant the atmosphere of holy calm which seemed ever to surround the pious good old woman alice lay as before without pain or at least any outward expression of it but totally unconscious of all present circumstances and absorbed in recollections of the days of her girlhood which were vivid enough to take the place of reality to her still she talked of green fields and still she spoke to the long dead mother and sister low lying in their graves this many a year as if they were with her and about her in the pleasant places where her youth had passed but the voice was fainter the motions were more languid she was evidently passing away but how happily mary stood for some time in silence watching and listening then she bent down and reverently kissed alice's cheek and drew jane wilson away from the bed as if the spirit of her who lay there were yet consonant of present realities she whispered a few words of hope to the poor mother and kissing her over and over again in a warm loving manner she bade her good-bye went a few steps and then once more came back to bid her keep up her heart and when she had fairly left the house jane wilson felt as if a sunbeam had ceased shining into the room yet oh how sorely mary's heart ached for more and more the fell certainty came upon her that her father was the murderer she struggled hard not to dwell on this conviction to think alone on the means of proving jem's innocence that was her first duty and that should be done End of chapter 22「twenty three the subpoena and must it then depend on this poor eye and this unsteady hand whether the bark that bears all my treasured hope and love shall find a passage through these frowning rocks to some fair port where peace and safety smile or whether it shall blindly dash against them and miserably sink heaven be my help and clear my eye and nerve my trembling hand the constant woman her heart beating, her head full of ideas which required time and solitude to be reduced into order, Mary hurried home. She was like one who finds a jewel, 
of which he cannot all at once ascertain the value, but who hides his treasure, until some quiet hour when he may ponder over the capabilities its possession unfolds. She was like one who discovers the silken clue, which guides to some bower of bliss, and secure of the power within his grasp, has to wait for a time before he may thread the labyrinth. But no jewel, no bower of bliss, was ever so precious to miser or lover, as was the belief which now pervaded Mary's mind that Jem's innocence might be proved without involving any suspicion of that other, that dear one, so dear, although so criminal, on whose part in this cruel business she dared not dwell even in thought. For if she did, there arose the awful question, if all went against Jem the innocent, if judge and jury gave the verdict forth which had the looming gallows in the rear, what ought she to do, possessed of her terrible knowledge? Surely not to inculpate her father, and yet, and yet, she almost prayed for the blessed unconsciousness of death or madness, rather than that awful question should have to be answered by her. But now a way seemed opening, opening yet more clear. She was thankful she had thought of the alibi, and yet more thankful to have so easily obtained the clue to Jem's whereabouts that miserable night. The bright light that her new hope threw over all seemed also to make her thankful for the early time appointed for the trial. It would be easy to catch Will Wilson on his return from the Isle of Man, which he had planned should be on the Monday, and on the Tuesday all would be made clear. All that she dared to wish to be made clear. She had still to collect her thoughts, and freshen her memory enough, to arrange how to meet with Will. For to the chances of a letter she would not trust, to find out his lodgings when in Liverpool, to try and remember the name of the ship in which he was to sail, and the more she considered these points, the more difficulty she found there would be in ascertaining these minor but important facts. For you were aware that Alice, whose memory was clear and strong on all points in which her heart was interested, was lying in a manner senseless, that Jane Wilson was, to use her own words so expressive to a Lancashire ear, dazed, that is to say bewildered, lost in the confusion of terrifying and distressing thoughts, incapable of concentrating her mind, and at the best of times Will's proceedings were a matter of little importance to her, or so she pretended. She was so jealous of aught which distracted attention from her pearl of price, her only son Jem. So Mary felt hopeless of obtaining any intelligence of the sailor's arrangements from her. Then should she apply to Jem himself? No, she knew him too well. She felt how thoroughly he must ere now have had it in his power to exculpate himself at another's expense. And his tacit refusal, so to do, had assured her of what she had never doubted, that the murderer was safe from any impeachment of his. But then neither would he consent, she feared, to any steps which might tend to prove himself innocent. At any rate, she could not consult him. He was removed to Kirkdale, and time pressed. Already it was Saturday at noon. And even if she could have gone to him, I believe she would not. She longed to do all herself, to be his liberator, his deliverer, to win him life, though she might never regain his lost love by her own exertions. No! How could she see him to discuss a subject in which both knew who was the blood-stained man, and yet whose name might not be breathed by either, so dearly with all his faults, his sins, was he loved by both? All at once, when she had ceased to try and remember, the name of Will's ship flashed across her mind, the John Cropper. He had named it, she had been sure all along. He had named it in his conversation with her that last, that fatal Thursday evening. She repeated it over and over again, through a nervous dread of again forgetting it. The John Cropper. And then, as if she were rousing herself out of some strange stupor, she bethought herself of Margaret. Who so likely is Margaret to treasure every little particular, respecting Will, now Alice was dead to all the stirring purposes of life. She had gone thus far in her process of thought, when a neighbour stepped in, she with whom they had usually deposited the house-key, 
when both Mary and her father were absent from home, and who consequently took upon herself to answer all inquiries, and receive all messages which any friends might make or leave, on finding the house shut up. "'Here's something for you, Mary. A policeman left it. A bit of parchment.' Many people have a dread of those mysterious pieces of parchment. I am one. Mary was another. Her heart misgave her as she took it, and looked at the unusual appearance of the writing, which, though legible enough, conveyed no idea to her, or rather her mind shut itself up against receiving any idea, which, after all, was rather a proof that she had some suspicion of the meaning that awaited her. What is it? asked she, in a voice from which all the pith and marrow seemed extracted. "'Nay, how should I know? Policeman said he'd call again towards evening, and see if you'd gettin' it. He were loath to leave it, though I telled him who I was, and all about my keeping the key, and taking messages.' "'What is it about?' asked Mary again, in the same hoarse, feeble voice, and turning it over in her fingers, as if she dreaded to inform herself of its meaning." "'Well, you can read every word of writing, and I cannot, so it's queer I should have to tell you. But my master says it's a summons for you to bear witness against Jim Wilson at the trial at Liverpool Assize.' "'God pity me,' said Mary faintly, as white as a sheet. "'Nay, wench, never take on so. What you can say will go little way either to help or to hinder, for folks say he's certain to be hung, and sure enough—' It was t'other one as was your sweetheart. Mary was beyond any pang this speech would have given at another time. Her thoughts were all busy picturing to herself the terrible occasion of their next meeting. Not as lovers meet should they meet. Well, said the neighbor, seeing no use in remaining with one who noticed her words or her presence so little, thou tell policeman thou'st getten his precious bit of paper. He seemed to think I should be keeping it for my cell. He's the first as has ever misdoubted me about giving messages or notes. Good day. She left the house, but Mary did not know it. She sat still with the parchment in her hand. All at once she started up. She would take it to Job Lee, and ask him to tell her the true meaning, for it could not be that. So she went and choked out her words of inquiry. "'It's a subpoena,' he replied, turning the parchment over with the air of a connoisseur, for Job loved hard words and lorry-like forms, and even esteemed himself slightly qualified for a lawyer. From the smattering of knowledge he had picked up from an odd volume of Blackstone that he had once purchased at a bookstall. "'A subpoena! What is that?' gasped Mary, still in suspense. Job was struck with her voice her changed, miserable voice, and peered at her countenance from over his spectacles. "'Ah! Oh, a subpoena is neither more nor less than this, my dear. It's a summonsing you to attend and answer such questions as may be asked of you regarding the trial of James Wilson for the murder of Henry Carson. That's the long and short of it, only more elegantly put for the benefit of them who knows how to value the gift of language.' I have been a witness before time myself. There is nothing much to be afeard on. If they are impudent, why, just you be impudent, and give em tit for tat. Nothing much to be afeard on, echoed Mary, but in such a different tone. Ay, poor wench, I see how it is. It'll go hard with thee a bit, I dare say, but keep up thy heart. You cannot have much to tell em that can go either one way or the other. Nay, maybe thou may do him a bit of good. For when they set eyes on thee, they'll see fast enough how he came to be so led away by jealousy. For thou art a pretty creature, Mary, and one look at thy face will let him into the secret of a young man's madness, and make him more ready to pass it over. Oh, Job, and won't you ever believe me when I tell you he's innocent? And indeed, and indeed I can prove it. He's with Will all that night. He was indeed, Job. My wench! "'Whose word hast thou for that?' said Job pityingly. "'Why, his mother told me, and I'll get Will to bear witness to it. "'But, oh, Job!' bursting into tears, "'it is hard if you won't believe me. "'How shall I clear him to strangers when those who know him and ought to love him 
are so set against his being innocent. "'God knows I'm not against his being innocent,' said Job solemnly. "'I'd give half my remaining days on earth. I'd give them all, Mary. And but for the love I bear to my poor blind girl, they'd be no great gift, if I could save him. You've thought me hard, Mary, but I'm not hard at bottom, and I'll help you if I can. That I will, right or wrong,' he added, but in a low voice, and coughed the uncertain words away with the moment afterwards. "'Oh, Job, if you will help me!' exclaimed Mary, brightening up. "'Though it was but a wintry gleam after all, "'tell me what to say when they question me. "'I shall be so gloppened. "'I shan't know what to answer.' "'Gloppened, terrified. "'Thou canst do nought better than tell the truth. "'Truth's best at all times,' they say. And for sure it is, when folk have to do with lawyers, for they are cute and cunning enough to get it out sooner or later, and it makes folk look like Tom Noddy's when truth follows falsehood against their will. But I don't know the truth. I mean, I can't say rightly what I mean, but I'm sure if I were pent up and stared at by hundreds of folk and asked ever so simple a question, I should be for answering it wrong. And if they asked me if I had seen you on a Saturday, or a Tuesday, or any day, I should have clean forgotten all about it, and say the very thing I should not. Well, well, don't go for to get such notions into your head. They're what they call nervous, and talking on em does no good. Here's Margaret, bless the wench. Look, Mary, how well she guides herself. Job felt watching his granddaughter, as with balancing, measured steps, timed almost as if to music she made her way across the street. Mary shrank as if from a cold blast, shrank from Margaret. The blind girl, with her reserve, her silence, seemed to be a severe judge. She, listening, would be such a check to the trusting earnestness of confidence, which was beginning to unclock the sympathy of Job. Mary knew herself to blame, felt her errors in every fibre of her heart but yet she would rather have had them spoken about, even in terms of severest censure, than have been treated in the icy manner in which Margaret had received her that morning. "'Here's Mary,' said Job, almost as if he wished to propitiate his granddaughter. "'Come to take a bit of dinner with us, and I'll warrant she's never thought of cooking any for herself to-day, and she looks as wan and pale as a ghost.' It was calling out the feeling of hospitality so strong and warm in most of those who have little to offer, but whose heart goes eagerly and kindly with that little. Margaret came towards Mary with a welcoming gesture, and a kinder manner by far than she had used in the morning. "'Nay, Mary, thou knowst thou's getten not at home,' urged Job. And Mary, faint and weary, and with a heart too aching full of other matters to be pertinacious in this, withdrew her refusal. They ate their dinner quietly, for to all it was an effort to speak, and after one or two attempts they had subsided into silence. When the meal was ended, Job began again on the subject they all had at heart. "'Yon poor lad at Kirkdale will want a lawyer to see they don't pull on him, but do him justice. Hast thought on that?' Mary had not, and felt sure his mother had not. Margaret confirmed this last supposition. "'I've but just been there, and poor Jane is like one dateless. So many griefs come on her at once. One time she seems to make sure he'll be hung, and if I took her in that way she flew out, poor body, and said that in spite of what folks said, there were them as could and would prove him guiltless. So I never knew where to have her. The only thing she was constant in was declaring him innocent. "'Mother-like,' said Job. She meant Will when she spoke on them that could prove him innocent. He was with Will on Thursday night, walking a part of the way with him to Liverpool. Now the thing is to lay hold on Will and get him to prove this. So spoke Mary, calm, from the earnestness of her purpose. "'Don't build too much on it, my dear,' said Job." "'I do build on it,' replied Mary, "'because I know it's the truth, "'and I mean to try and prove it come what may. "'Nothing you can say will daunt me, Job, "'so don't you go and try. "'You may help, but you cannot hinder me "'doing what I'm resolved on.' "'They respected her firmness of determination, 
and Job almost gave in to her belief when he saw how steadfastly she was acting upon it. O oh, surest way of conversion to our faith, whatever it may be, regarding either small things or great, when it is beheld as the actuating principle from which we never swerve, when it has seen that instead of overmuch profession it is worked into the life and moves every action. Mary gained courage, as she instinctively felt that she had made way with one at least of her companions. Now I'm clear about this much, she continued. He was with Will when the shot was fired. She could not bring herself to say, when the murder was committed, when she remembered who it was, that she had every reason to believe, was the taker a way of life. Will can prove this, I must find Will. He wasn't to sail till Tuesday. There's time enough. He was to come back from his uncle's in the Isle of Man on Monday. I must meet him in Liverpool on that day, and tell him what has happened, and how a poor Jem is in trouble, and that he must prove an alibi come Tuesday. All this I can and will do, though perhaps I don't clearly know how, just at present. But surely God will help me. When I know I'm doing right, I will have no fear, but put my trust in Him, for I am acting for the innocent and good, and not for my own self, who have done so wrong. I have no fear when I think of Jem, who is so good. She stopped, oppressed with the fullness of her heart. Margaret began to love her again, to see in her the same sweet, faulty, impulsive, lovable creature she had known in the former Mary Barton, but with more of dignity, self-reliance, and purpose. Mary spoke again. Now I know the name of Will's vessel, the John Cropper, and I know that she is bound to America. That is something to know, but I forgot, if I ever heard, where he lodges in Liverpool. He spoke of his landlady as a good, trustworthy woman, but if he named her name it has slipped my memory. Can you help me, Margaret? She appealed to her friend, calmly and openly, as if perfectly aware of and recognizing the unspoken tie which bound her and Will together. She asked her, in the same manner, in which she would have asked a wife where her husband dwelt. And Margaret replied in the light calm tone, two spots of crimson on her cheeks alone, bearing witness to any internal agitation. "'He lodges at a Mrs. Jones Milkhouse yard, out of Nicholas Street. He has lodged there ever since he began to go to sea. She is a very decent kind of woman, I believe.' "'Well, Mary, I'll give you my prayers,' said Job. "'It's not often that I pray regular, although I often speak a word to God, when I'm either very happy or very sorry.' I've catched myself thanking him at odd hours when I've found a rare insect, or had a fine day for an out. But I cannot help it, no more than I can talking to a friend. But this time I'll pray regular for Jem and for you. And so will Margaret, I'll be bound. Still, wench, what think you on a lawyer? I know one, Mr. Cheshire, who's rather given to the insect line, and a good kind of chap. He and I have swapped specimens many's the time, when either of us had a duplicate. He'll do me a kind turn, I'm sure. I'll just take my hat and pay him a visit. No sooner said than done. Marion and Margaret were left alone. And this seemed to bring back the feeling of awkwardness, not to say estrangement. But Mary, excited to an unusual pitch of courage, was the first to break silence. Oh, Margaret, said she, I see. I feel how wrong you think I have acted. You cannot think me worse than I think myself. Now my eyes are opened. Here her sobs came choking up her voice. Nay, Margaret began, I have no right to. Yes, Margaret, you have a right to judge. You cannot help it. Only in your judgment remember mercy, as the Bible says. You, who have always been good, cannot tell how easy it is at first to go a little wrong, and then how hard it is to go back. Oh, I little thought, when I was first pleased with Mr. Carson's speeches, how it would all end. Perhaps in the death of him I love better than life. She burst into a passion of tears. The feelings pent up through the day would have vent. But checking herself with a strong effort, 
and looking up at Margaret as piteously as if those calm, stony eyes could see her imploring face, she added, "'I must not cry. I must not give way. There will be time enough for that hereafter if—' "'I only wanted you to speak kindly to me, Margaret, for I am very, very wretched. More wretched than any one can ever know. More wretched, I sometimes fancy, than I have deserved. But that's wrong, isn't it, Margaret?' "'Oh, I have done wrong, and I am punished. You cannot tell how much.' Who could resist her voice, her tones of misery, of humility? Who would refuse the kindness with which she begged so penitently? Not Margaret. The old friendly manner came back. With it, maybe, more of tenderness. Oh, Margaret, do you think he can be saved? Do you think they can find him guilty if Will comes forward as a witness? Won't that be a good alibi? Margaret did not answer for a moment. Oh, speak, Margaret, said Mary, with anxious impatience. I know nought about law or alibis, answered Margaret meekly. But, Mary, as Grandfather says, aren't you building too much on what Jane Wilson has told you about his going with Will? Poor soul, she's gone dateless, I think, with care and watching, and over much trouble, and who can wonder? Or Jem may have told her he was going by way of a blind. "'You don't know Jem,' said Mary, starting from her seat in a hurried manner, "'or you would not say so. "'I hope I may be wrong. "'But think, Mary, how much there is against him. "'The shot was fired with his gun. "'He it was, as threatened Mr. Carson, not many days before. "'He was absent from home at that very time, as we know. "'And as I'm much afeard, some one will be called on to prove, "'and there's no one else to share suspicion with him.' Mary heaved a deep sigh. "'But, Margaret, he did not do it,' Mary again asserted. Margaret looked unconvinced. "'I can do no good, I see, and by saying so, for none on you believe me. And I won't say so again until I can prove it. Monday morning I'll go to Liverpool. I shall be at hand for the trial. Oh, dear, dear, and I will find Will, and then, Margaret, I think you'll be sorry for being so stubborn about Jem.' "'Don't fly off, dear Mary. I'd give a deal to be wrong. And now I'm going to be plain-spoken. You'll want money. Them lawyers is no better than a sponge for sucking up money. Let alone your hunting out will, and your keep in Liverpool and what not. You must take some of the mint I've got laid by in the old teapot. You have no right to refuse, for I offer it to Jem, not to you. It's for his purposes you're to use it.' "'I know. I see. Thank you, Margaret.' You are a kind one at any rate. I'll take it for Jem, and I'll do my very best with it for him. Not all, though. Don't think I'll take all. They'll pay me for my keep. I'll take this. Accepting a sovereign from the hoard which Margaret produced, out of its accustomed place in the cupboard. Your grandfather will pay the lawyer. I'll have nought to do with him, shuddering as she remembered Job's words about lawyer's skill in always discovering the truth sooner or later and knowing what was the secret she had to hide. "'Bless you, don't make such an ado about it,' said Margaret, cutting short Mary's thanks. "'I sometimes think there's two sides to the commandment, and that we may say, "'Let others do unto you as she would do unto them, "'for pride often prevents our giving others a great deal of pleasure "'in not letting them be kind, when their hearts are longing to help, "'and when we ourselves should wish to do just the same if we were in their place.' Oh, how often I've been hurt, for being coldly told by persons not to trouble myself about their care or sorrow, when I saw them in great grief and wanted to be of comfort. Our Lord Jesus was not above letting folk minister to Him, for He knew how happy it makes one to do out for another. It's the happiest work on earth. Mary had been too much engrossed by watching what was passing in the street to attend very closely to that which Margaret was saying. From her seat she could see out of the window very plainly, and she caught sight of a gentleman walking alongside of Job, evidently in earnest conversation with him, and looking keen and penetrating enough to be a lawyer. Job was laying down something to be attended to, she could see, by his uplifted forefinger and his whole gesture. Then he pointed and nodded across the street to his own house, as if inducing his companion to come in. 
Mary dreaded lest he should, and she should be subjected to closer cross-examination than she had hitherto undergone, as to why she was so certain that Jem was innocent. She feared he was coming. He stepped a little toward the spot. No, it was only to make way for a child tottering along, whom Mary had overlooked. Now Job took him by the button, so earnestly familiar had he grown. The gentleman looked fidging fain to be gone, but submitted in a manner that made Mary like him, in spite of his profession. Then came a volley of last words, answered by briefest nods and monosyllables, and then the stranger went off with a redoubled quickness of pace, and Job crossed the street with a little satisfied air of importance on his kindly face. "'Well, Mary,' said he on entering, "'I've seen the lawyer, not Mr. Cheshire, though. Trials for murder, it seems, are not his line of business. "'But he give me a note to another attorney, a fine fellow enough, only too much of a talker, I could hardly get a word in, he cut me so short. However, I've just been going over the principal points again to him. Maybe you saw us. I wanted him just to come over and speak to you himself. Mary, but he was pressed for time, and he said your evidence would not mean much either here nor there. He's going to the sizes first train on Monday morning, and we'll see Jem, and hear the ins and outs from him, and he's given me his address. Mary and you and Will are to call on him. Will, special, on Monday at two o'clock. Thou'rt taking it in, Mary? Thou'rt to call on him in Liverpool at two, Monday afternoon. Job had reason to doubt if she fully understood him. For all this minuteness of detail, these satisfactory arrangements, as he considered them, only seemed to bring the circumstances in which she was placed more vividly home to Mary. They convinced her that it was real, and not all a dream, as she had sunk into fancying it for a few minutes, while sitting in the old accustomed place, her body enjoying the rest, and her frame sustained by food, and listening to Margaret's calm voice. The gentleman she had just beheld would see and question Jem in a few hours, and what would be the result? Monday. That was the day after to-morrow. And on Tuesday. Life and death would be tremendous realities to her lover, or else death would be an awful certainty to her father. No wonder Job went over his main points again. Monday at two o'clock, mind, and here's his card. Mr. Bridgenorth, 41 Renshaw Street, Liverpool. He'll be lodging there. Job ceased talking, and the silence roused Mary up to thank him. You're very kind, Job, very. You and Margaret won't desert me, come what will. Pooh, pooh, wench! Don't lose heart, just as I'm beginning to get it. He seems to think a deal on Will's evidence. You're sure, girls. You're under no mistake about Will. I'm sure, said Mary. He went straight from here, purposing to go see his uncle at the Isle of Man, and be back Sunday night, ready for the ship sailing on Tuesday. So am I, said Margaret, and the ship's name was the John Cropper, and he lodged where I told Mary before. Have you got it down, Mary? Mary wrote it on the back of Mr. Bridgenorth's card. He was not overwilling to go, said she as she wrote, for he knew little about his uncle, and said he didn't care if he never knowed more, but he said kinsfolk was kinsfolk, and promises was promises, so he'd go for a day or so, and then it would be over. Margaret had to go, and practice some singing in town. So, though loath to depart and be alone, Mary bade her friends good-bye. End of chapter 23 of Mary Barton Chapter 24 With the Dying O oh, sad and solemn is the trembling watch Of those who sit and count the heavy hours Beside the fevered sleep of one they love O oh, awful is it in the hushed midnight, While gazing on the pallid moveless form, To start and ask, Is it now sleep or death? Anonymous. Mary could not be patient in her loneliness. So much painful thought weighed on her mind. The very house was haunted with memories and foreshadowings. Having performed all duties to Jem, 
as far as her weak powers yet loving heart could act and a black veil being drawn over her father's past present and future life beyond which she could not penetrate to judge of any filial service she ought to render her mind unconsciously sought after some course of action in which she might engage anything anything rather than leisure for reflection and then came up the old feeling which first bound ruth to naomi the love they both held towards one object and mary felt that her cares would be most lightened by being of use or of comfort to his mother so she once more locked up the house and set off towards ancoats rushing along with downcast head and for fear lest any one should recognize her and arrest her progress jane wilson sat quietly in her chair as mary entered so quietly as to strike one by the contrast it presented to her usual bustling and nervous manner she looked very pale and wan but the quietness was the thing that struck mary most she did not rise as mary came in but sat still and said something in so gentle so feeble a voice that mary did not catch it mrs davenport who was there plucked mary by the gown and whispered never heed her she's worn out and best let alone i'll tell you all about it upstairs but mary touched by the anxious look with which mrs wilson gazed at her as if waiting the answer to some question went forward to listen to the speech she was again repeating what is it will you tell me then mary looked and saw another ominous slip of parchment in the mother's hand which she was rolling up and down in a tremulous manner between her fingers mary's heart sickened within her and she could not speak what is it she repeated will you tell me she still looked at mary with the same childlike gaze of wonder and patient entreaty what could she answer i tell you not to heed her said mrs davenport a little angrily she knows well enough what it is too well belike i was not in when they sarved it but mrs hemming her as lives next door was as she spelled out the meaning and made it all clear to mrs wilson it's a summons to be a witness on jem's trial mrs hemming thinks to swear to the gun for you see there's no but her as can testify to its being his and she let on so easily to the policeman that it was his that there's no getting off her word now poor body she takes it very hard i dare say mrs wilson had waited patiently while this whispered speech was being uttered imagining perhaps that it would end in some explanation addressed to her but when both were silent though their eyes without speech or language told their hearts pity she spoke again in the same unaltered gentle voice so different from the irritable impatience she had been ever apt to show to every one except her husband he who had wedded her broken down and injured in a voice so different i say from the old hasty manner she spoke now the same anxious words what is this will you tell me you'd better give it to me at once mrs wilson and let me put it out of your sight speak to her mary wench and ask for a sight on it i've tried and better tried to get it from her and she takes no heed of words and i'm loth to pull it by force out of her hands mary drew the little cricket out from under the dresser and sat down at mrs wilson's knee and coaxing one of her tremulous ever-moving hands into hers began to rub it soothingly there was a little resistance a very little but that was all and presently in the nervous movement of the imprisoned hand the parchment fell to the ground mary calmly and openly picked it up without any attempt at concealment and quietly placing it in sight of the anxious eyes that followed it with a kind of spellbound dread went on with her soothing caresses she has had no sleep for many nights said the girl to mrs davenport and all this woe and sorrow it's no wonder no indeed mrs davenport answered we must get her fairly to bed we must get her undressed and all and trust to god in his mercy to send her to sleep or else for you see they spoke before her as if she were not there her heart was so far away accordingly they almost lifted her from the chair in which she sat motionless and taking her up as gently as a mother carries her sleeping baby they undressed her poor worn form and laid her in the little bed upstairs they had once thought of placing her in jem's bed to be out of sight or sound of any disturbance of alice's but then again they remembered the shock she might receive in awakening in so unusual a place and also that mary who intended to keep vigil that night in the house of mourning would find it difficult to divide her attention in the possible cases that might ensue so they laid her as i said before on that little pallet bed and as they were slowly withdrawing from the bedside hoping and praying that she might sleep and forget for a time her heavy burden she looked wistfully after mary and whispered you haven't told me what it is what is it 
and gazing in her face for the expected answer, her eyelids slowly closed, and she fell into a deep, heavy sleep, almost as profound a rest as death. Mrs. Davenport went her way, and Mary was alone, for I cannot call those who sleep allies against the agony of thought which solitude sometimes brings up. She dreaded the night before her. Alice might die, the doctor had that day declared her case hopeless, and not far from death, and at times the terror so natural to the young, not of death, but of the remains of the dead, came over Mary, and she bent and listened anxiously for the long-drawn, pausing breath of the sleeping Alice. Or Mrs. Wilson might awake in a state which Mary dreaded to anticipate, and anticipated while she dreaded, in a state of complete delirium. Already her senses had been severely stunned by the full explanation of what was required of her, of what she had to prove against her son, her gem, her only child, which Mary could not doubt the officious Mrs. Hemming had given, and what if in dreams that land into which no sympathy or love can penetrate with another, either to share its bliss or its agony, that land whose scenes are unspeakable terrors, are hidden mysteries, are priceless treasures to one alone, that land where alone I may see, while yet I tarry here, the sweet looks of my dear child. What if, in the horrors of her dreams, her brain should go still more astray, and she should waken crazy with her visions and the terrible reality that begot them? How much worse is anticipation sometimes than reality? How Mary dreaded that night, and how calmly it passed by! Even more so than if Mary had not had such claims upon her care. Anxiety about them deadened her own particular anxieties, she thought of the sleepers whom she was watching, till, overpowered herself by the want of rest, she fell off into short slumbers in which the night wore imperceptibly away. To be sure, Alice spoke, and sang during her waking moments, like the child she deemed herself, but so happily with the dearly loved ones around her, with the scent of the heather and the song of the wild bird hovering about her in imagination with old scraps of ballads or old snatches of primitive versions of the psalms, such as are sung in country churches half draperied over with ivy, and where the running brook or the murmuring wind among the trees makes fit accompaniment to the chorus of human voices uttering praise and thanksgiving to their God, that the speech and the song gave comfort and good cheer to the listener's heart, and the grey dawn began to dim the light of the rush candle, before Mary thought it possible that day was already trembling in the horizon. Then she got up from the chair where she had been dozing and went half asleep to the window to assure herself that morning was at hand. The streets were unusually quiet with the Sabbath stillness. No factory bells that morning, no early workmen going to their labors, no slipshod girls cleaning the windows of the little shops which broke the monotony of the street. Instead you might see here and there some operative sallying forth for a breath of country air, or some father leading out his wheat hodling bairns for the unwanted pleasure of a walk with Daddy in the clear frosty morning. Men with more leisure on weekdays would perhaps have walked quicker than they did through the fresh, sharp air of this Sunday morning, but to them there was a pleasure, an absolute refreshment in the dawdling gait they, one and all of them, had. There were, indeed, one or two passengers on that morning whose objects were less innocent and less praiseworthy than those of the people I have already mentioned, and whose animal state of mind and body clashed jarringly on the peacefulness of the day, but upon them I will not dwell, as you and I, and almost every one, I think, may send up our individual cry of self-reproach that we have not done all that we could for the stray and wandering ones of our brethren. When Mary turned from the window, she went to the bed of each sleeper to look and listen. Alice looked perfectly quiet and happy in her slumber, and her face seemed to have become much more youthful during the painless approach to death. Mrs. Wilson's countenance was stamped with the anxiety of the last few days, although she, too, appeared sleeping soundly. But as Mary gazed on her, trying to trace a likeness to her son in her face, she awoke and looked up into Mary's eyes, while the expression of consciousness came back into her own. Both were silent for a minute or two. Mary's eyes had fallen beneath that penetrating gaze, in which the agony of memory seemed every minute to find fuller vent. "'Is it a dream?' the mother asked at last in a low voice. "'No,' replied Mary in the same tone. Mrs. Wilson hid her face in the pillow. She was fully conscious of everything this morning. It was evident that the stunning effect of the subpoena, which had affected her so much last night in her weak, worn-out state, had passed away. Mary offered no opposition when she indicated by languid gesture and action that she wished to rise. 
a sleepless bed is a haunted place. When she was dressed, with Mary's aid, she stood by Alice for a minute or two looking at the slumberer. "'How happy she is,' she said quietly and sadly. All the time that Mary was getting breakfast ready, and performing every other little domestic office she could think of, to add to the comfort of Jem's mother, Mrs. Wilson sat still in the armchair, watching her silently. Her old irritation of temper and manner seemed to have suddenly disappeared, or perhaps she was too depressed in body and mind to show it. Mary told her all that had been done with regard to Mr. Bridgenorth, all her own plans for seeking out Will, all her hopes, and concealed as well as she could all the doubts and fears that would arise unbidden. To this Mrs. Wilson listened without much remark, but with deep interest and perfect comprehension. When Mary ceased, she sighed and said, "'Oh, wench, I am his mother, and yet I do so little, I can do so little. That's what frets me. I seem like a child that sees its mammy ill, and moans and cries its little heart out. It does not to help. I think my sense has left me all at once, and I can't even find strength to cry like the little child.' Hereupon she broke into a feeble wail of self-reproach, that her outward show of misery was not greater as if any cries or tears or loud-spoken words could have told of such pangs at the heart as that look and that thin, piping, altered voice. But think of Mary and what she was enduring. Picture to yourself, for I cannot tell you, the armies of thoughts that met and clashed in her brain, and then imagine the effort it cost her to be calm and quiet, and even in a faint way cheerful and smiling at times. After a while she began to stir about in her own mind for some means of sparing the poor mother of the trial of appearing as a witness in the matter of the gun. She had made no allusion to her summons this morning, and Mary almost thought she must have forgotten it, and surely some means might be found to prevent that additional sorrow. She must see Job about it, nay, if necessary, she must see Mr. Bridgenorth, with all his truth-compelling powers, for indeed she had so struggled and triumphed, though a sadly bleeding victor at heart over herself these two last days, had so concealed agony and hidden her inward woe and bewilderment, that she began to take confidence and to have faith in her own powers of meeting any one with a passably fair show, whatever might be rending her life beneath the cloak of her deception. Accordingly, as soon as Mrs. Davenport came in after morning church, to ask after the two lone women, and she had heard the report Mary had to give, so much better as regarded Mrs. Wilson than what they had feared the night before it would have been. As soon as this kind-hearted, grateful woman came in, Mary, telling her purpose, went off to fetch the doctor who attended Alice. He was shaking himself after his morning's round, and happy in the anticipation of his Sunday's dinner, but he was a good-tempered man who found it difficult to keep down his jovial easiness even by the bed of sickness or death. He had mischosen his profession, for it was his delight to see every one around him in full enjoyment of life. However, he subdued his face to the proper expression of sympathy befitting a doctor listening to a patient or a patient's friend, and Mary's sad, pale, anxious face might be taken for either the one or the other. "'Well, my girl, and what brings you here?' said he, as he entered his surgery. "'Not on your own account, I hope?' "'I wanted you to come and see Alice Wilson, and then I thought you would—' maybe take a look at Mrs. Wilson. He bustled on his hat and coat, and followed Mary instantly. After shaking his head over Alice, as if it was a mournful thing for one so pure and good, so true, although so humble a Christian, to be nearing her desired haven, and muttering the accustomed words intended to destroy hope, and prepare anticipation, he went, in compliance with Mary's look, to ask the usual questions of Mrs. Wilson, who sat passively in her armchair. She answered his questions and submitted to his examination. "'How do you think her?' asked Mary eagerly. "'Why, ah,' uh, began he, perceiving that he was desired to take one side in his answer, and unable to find out whether his listener was anxious for a favorable verdict or otherwise, but thinking it most probable that she would desire the former, he continued, "'She is weak, certainly. The natural result of such a shock as the arrest of her son would be.' For I understand this James Wilson, who murdered Mr. Carson, was her son. Sad thing to have such a reprobate in the family. "'You say, who murdered, sir,' said Mary indignantly. "'He is only taken up on suspicion, and many have no doubt of his innocence. Those who know him, sir.' "'Ah, well, well, doctors have seldom time to read newspapers, and I dare say I am not very correct in my story. 
Dare say he's innocent. I'm sure I had no right to say otherwise. Only words slip out. Nope, indeed, young woman, I see no cause for apprehension about this poor creature in the next room. Weak, certainly, but a day or two's good nursing will set her up. And I'm sure you're a good nurse, my dear, from your pretty kind-hearted face. I'll send a couple of pills in a draught, but don't alarm yourself. There's no occasion, I assure you. But you don't think her fit to go to Liverpool? asked Mary, still in the anxious tone of one who wishes earnestly for some particular decision. "'To Liverpool, yes,' replied he. "'A short journey like that couldn't fatigue, and might distract her thoughts. "'Let her go by all means. It would be the very thing for her.' "'Oh, sir,' burst out Mary, almost sobbing, "'I did so hope you would say she was too ill to go.' "'Whew!' said he, with a prolonged whistle, trying to understand the case, "'but being, as he said, no reader of newspapers, "'utterly unaware of the peculiar reasons there might be "'for so apparently unfeeling a wish. "'Why did you not tell me so sooner?' It might certainly do her arm in her weak state. There is always some risk attending journeys, drafts, and what not. To her they might prove very injurious, very. I disapprove of journeys or excitement in all cases where the patient is in the low, fluttered state in which Mrs. Wilson is. If you take my advice, you will certainly put a stop to all thoughts of going to Liverpool. He really had completely changed his opinion, though quite unconsciously. So desirous was he to comply with the wishes of others. "'Oh, sir, thank you. And will you give me a certificate of her being unable to go if the lawyer says he must have one? The lawyer, you know,' continued she, seeing him look puzzled, who was to defend Jem, it was as a witness against him. "'My dear girl,' said he almost angrily, "'why did you not state the case fully at first? One minute would have done it, and my dinner waiting all this time. To be sure she can't go, it would be madness to think of it. If her evidence could have done good, it would have been a different thing.' "'Come to me for the certificate any time, that is to say, if the lawyer advises you. "'I second the lawyer. Take counsel with both learned professions. Ha, ha, ha!' "'And laughing at his own joke, he departed, leaving Mary accusing herself of stupidity "'and having imagined that every one was as well acquainted with the facts concerning the trial as she was herself. "'For indeed she had never doubted that the doctor would have been aware of the purpose "'of poor Mrs. Wilson's journey to Liverpool. "'Presently she went to Job.' the ever-ready Mrs. Davenport keeping watch over the two old women, and told him her fears, her plans, and her proceedings. To her surprise, he shook his head doubtfully. "'It may have an awkward look if he keep her back. Lawyers is up to tricks.' "'But it is no trick,' said Mary. "'She is so poorly, she was last night so, at least, and to-day she is so faded and weak. "'Poor soul, I dare say, I only mean for Jem's sake.' and so much is known it won't do now to hang back. But I'll ask Mr. Bridgenorth. I'll even take your doctor's advice. You tarry at home, and I'll come to you in an hour's time. Go thy ways, wench. End of chapter 24「「but there would be time enough, she felt, for giving way hereafter. She sat quiet and still by an effort, sitting near the window and looking at it, but seeing nothing, when all at once she caught sight of something which roused her up and made her draw back. But it was too late. She had been seen. Sally Ledbetter flaunted into the little dingy room, making it gaudy with the Sunday excess of coloring in her dress. She was really curious to see Mary. Her connection with the murder seemed to have made her into a sort of lusa natura, and was almost, by some, expected to have made a change in her personal appearance, so earnestly did they stare at her. But Mary had been too much absorbed the last day or two to notice this. Now Sally had a grand view, and looked her over and over, a very different thing from looking her through and through, and almost learned her off by heart. Her everyday gown, Hoyle's print, you know, that lilac thing with the high body, 
she was so fond of a little black silk handkerchief just knotted round her neck like a boy her hair all taken back from her face as if she wanted to keep her head cool she would always keep that hair of hers so long and her hands twitching continually about such particulars would make Sally into a gazette extraordinary the next morning at the workroom, and were worth coming for, even if little else could be extracted from Mary. "'Why, Mary,' she began, "'where have you hidden yourself? You never showed your face all day at Miss Simmons. You don't fancy we think any worse of you for what's come and gone. Some on us, indeed, were a bit sorry for the poor young man, as lies stiff and cold for your sake.' mary but we shall ne'er cast it against you miss simmons too will be mighty put out if you don't come for there's a deal of mourning agate i can't mary said in a low voice i don't mean to ever come again why mary said sally in unfeigned surprise to be sure you'll have to be in liverpool tuesday and maybe wednesday but after that you'll surely come and tell us all about it miss simmons knows you'll have to be off those two days but between you and me she's a bit of a gossip and will like hearing all how and about the trial well enough to let you off very easy for your being absent a day or two besides betsy morgan was saying yesterday she shouldn't wonder but you'd provide quite an attraction to customers many a one would come and have their gowns made by miss simmons just to catch a glimpse at you after the trial's over really mary you'll turn out quite a heroine the little fingers twitched worse than ever. The large soft eyes looked up pleadingly into Sally's face, but she went on in the same strain, not from any unkind or cruel feelings toward Mary, but solely because she was incapable of comprehending her suffering. She had been shocked, of course, at Mr. Carson's death, though at the same time the excitement was rather pleasant than otherwise, and dearly now would she have enjoyed the conspicuous notice which Mary was sure to receive how shall you like being cross-examined mary not at all answered mary when she found she must answer la what impudent fellows those lawyers are and their clerks too not a bit better i shouldn't wonder in a comforting tone and really believing she was giving comfort if you picked up a new sweetheart in liverpool what gown are you going in mary i don't know and i don't care exclaimed mary sick and weary of her visitor well then take my advice and go in that blue merino it's old to be sure and a bit worn at elbows but folks won't notice that and the colour suits you now mind mary and i'll lend you my black watered scarf added she really good-naturedly according to her sense of things and withal a little bit pleased at the idea of her pet article of dress figuring away on the person of a witness at trial for murder i'll bring it to-morrow before you start no don't said mary thank you but i don't want it why what can you wear i know all your clothes as well as i do my own what's in there you can wear not your old plaid shawl i do hope you would not fancy this i have on more nor the scarf would you said she brightening at the thought and welling to lend it or anything else oh sally don't go on talking of fattens how can i think on a dress at such a time when it's a matter of life and death to jem bless the girl it's jem is it well now i thought there was some sweetheart in the background when you flew off so with mr carson then what in the name of goodness made him shoot mr harry after you'd given up going with him i mean was he afraid you'd be on again how dare you say he shot mr harry asked mary firing up from the state of languid indifference into which she had sunk while sally had been settling about her dress but it's no matter what you think as did not know him what grieves me is that people should go on thinking him guilty as did know him she said sinking back into her former depressed tone and manner and don't you think he did it asked sally mary paused she was going on too fast with one so curious and so unscrupulous besides she remembered how even she herself had at first believed him guilty and she felt it was not for her to cast stones at those who on similar evidence inclined to the same belief none had given him much benefit of a doubt none had faith in his innocence none but his mother 
and the heart loved more than the head reasoned, and her yearning affection had never for an instant entertained the idea that her Jem was a murderer. But Mary disliked the whole conversation. The subject, the manner in which it was treated, were all painful, and she had a repugnance to the person with whom she spoke. She was thankful, therefore, when Job Lee's voice was heard at the door, as he stood with the latch in his hand, talking to a neighbor, and when Sally jumped up in vexation and said, "'There's that old fogey coming in here, as I'm alive. Did your father set him to look after you while he was away, or what brings the old chap here? However, I'm off. I never could abide either him or his prim granddaughter. Good-bye, Mary.' So far in a whisper, then louder, "'If you think better of my offer about the scarf, Mary, just step in tomorrow before nine, and you're quite welcome to it.' She and Joe passed each other at the door, with mutual looks of dislike, which neither took any pains to conceal. "'Yon's a bold, bad girl,' said Job to Mary. "'She's very good-natured,' replied Mary, too honorable to abuse a visitor, who had only that instant crossed her threshold, and gladly dwelling on the good quality most apparent in Sally's character. Ay, ay, good-natured, generous, jolly, full of fun. There are a number of other names for the good qualities the devil leaves his children, as baits to catch gudgeons with. Do you think folk could be led astray by one who was every way bad? However, that's not what I came to talk about. I've seen Mr. Bridgenorth, and he's in a manner the same mind as we. He thinks it would have an awkward look, and might tell against the poor lad on his trial. Still, if she's ill, she's ill, and it can't be helped. I don't know if she's so bad as all that, said Mary, who began to dread her part in doing anything which might tell against her poor lover. Will you come and see her, Job? The doctor seemed to say, as I liked, not as he thought. "'That's because he had no great thought on the subject, either one way or t'other,' replied Job, whose contempt for medical men pretty nearly equaled his respect for lawyers. "'But I'll go and welcome. I had not seen the old ladies since their sorrows, and it's but manners to go and ask after them. Come along.' The room at Mrs. Wilson's had that still, changeless look you must have often observed in the house of sickness or mourning. No particular employment going on, people watching and waiting rather than acting, unless in the more sudden and violent attacks, what little movement is going on, so noiseless and hushed, the furniture all arranged and stationary, with a view to the comfort of the afflicted, the window blinds drawn down to keep out the disturbing variety of a sunbeam, the same sad and serious look on the faces of the indwellers, you fall back into the same train of thought with all their, these associations, and forget the street, the outer world, in the contemplation of the one stationary, absorbing interest within. Mrs. Wilson sat quietly in her chair, with just the same look Mary had left on her face. Mrs. Davenport went about with creaking shoes, which made all the more noise from her careful and lengthened tread, annoying the ears of those who were well in this instance, far more than the dull sense of the sick and the sorrowful. Alice's voice still was going on cheerfully in the upper room, with incessant talking and little laughs to herself, or perhaps in sympathy with her unseen companions. Unseen, I say, in preference to fancied, for who knows whether God does not permit the forms of those who were dearest when living to hover round the bed of the dying. Job spoke, and Mrs. Wilson answered. So quietly that it was unnatural under the circumstances, it made a deeper impression on the old man than any token of mere bodily illness could have done. If she had raved in delirium, or moaned in fever, he would have spoken after his want, and given his opinion, his advice, and his consolation. Now he was awed into silence. At length he pulled Mary aside into a corner of the house-place, where Mrs. Wilson was sitting, and began to talk to her. "'You're right, Mary. She's no ways fit to go to Liverpool, poor soul. Now I've seen her, I only wonder the doctor could have been unsettled in his mind at the first. Choose how it goes with poor Jem, she cannot go. One way or another, it will soon be over. The best to leave her in the state she is till then.' 
I was sure you would think so, said Mary. But they were reckoning without their host. They esteemed her senses gone, while, in fact, they were only inert, and could not convey impressions rapidly to the overburdened, troubled brain. They had not noticed that her eyes had followed them, mechanically, it seemed at first, as they had moved away to the corner of the room that her face, hitherto so changeless, had began to work with one or two of the symptoms of impatience. But when they were silent she stood up and startled them almost as if a dead person had spoken, by saying clearly and decidedly, I go to Liverpool. I hear you and your plans, and I tell you I shall go to Liverpool. If my words are to kill my son, they have already gone forth out of my mouth, and naught can bring them back but I will have faith. Alice, up above, has often told me, I want faith, and now I will have it. They cannot. They will not kill my child, my only child. I will not be afraid. Yet, oh, I am sick with terror. But if he is to die, think ye not that I will see him again. I see him at his trial? When all are hating him, he shall have his poor mother near him, to give him all the comfort eyes and looks and tears and a heart that is dead to all but him can give his poor mother who knows how free he is from sin in the sight of man at least they'll let me go to him maybe the very minute it's over and i know many scripture texts though you would not think it that may keep up his heart i miss seeing him ere he went to you prison but naught shall keep me away again one minute when i can see his face for maybe the minutes are numbered, and the count but small. I know I can be a comfort to him, poor lad. You would not think it now, but he'd always speak as kind and soft to me as if he were courting me, like. He loved me above a bit, and I am to leave him now, to dree all the cruel slander they'll put upon him. I can pray for him at each hard word they say against him, if I can do naught else, and he'll know what his mother is doing for him, poor lad by the look on my face. Still, they made some look or gesture of opposition to her wishes. She turned sharp round on Mary, the old object of her pettish attacks, and said, Now, wench, once for all, I tell you this, he could never guide me, and he'd sense enough not to try. What he could not do, don't try to. I shall go to Liverpool to-morrow, and find my lad, and stay with him through thick and thin. And if he headies, why, perhaps, God of his mercy will take me too. The grave is a sure cure for an aching heart. She sank back in her chair, quite exhausted by the sudden effort she had made. But if they even offered to speak, she cut them short, whatever the subject might be, with the repetition of the same words, I shall go to Liverpool. No more could be said. The doctor's opinion had been so undecided, Mr. Bridgenorth had given his legal voice in favor of her going, and Mary was obliged to relinquish the idea of persuading her to remain at home, if, indeed, under all circumstances, it could be thought desirable. "'Best way will be,' said Job, "'for me to hunt out Will early to-morrow morning. Mary, come it after with Jane Wilson. I know a decent woman where you two can have a bed, and where we may meet together when I found Will.' afore going to Mr. Bridgenorth's at two o'clock, for, I can tell him, not trust none of his clerks for hunting up well, if Jem's life's to depend on it. Now Mary disliked this plan inexpressibly. Her dislike was partly grounded on reason, and partly on feeling. She could not bear the idea of deputing to any one the active measures necessary to be taken in order to save Jem. She felt as if they were her duty, her right. She durst not trust to any one the completion of her plan. They might not have energy or perseverance or desperation enough to follow out the slightest chance. Her love would endow her with all these qualities independent of the terrible alternative which awaited her in case all failed and Jem was condemned. No one could have her motives, and consequently no one could have her sharpened brain her despairing determination. Besides, only that was purely selfish. She could not endure the suspense of remaining quiet and only knowing the result when it was all accomplished. So, with vehemence and impatience, she rebutted every reason Job adduced for this plan, 
and of course thus opposed by what appeared to him wilfulness he became more resolute Every words were exchanged and a feeling of estrangement rose up between them for a time as they walked homewards but then came in margaret with her gentleness like an angel of peace so calm and reasonable that both felt ashamed of their irritation and tacitly left the decision to her only by the way i think mary could never have submitted it if it had gone against her penitent and tearful as was her manner now to job the good old man who was helping her to work for jem although they differed as to the manner mary had better go said margaret to her grandfather in a low tone i know what she's feeling and it would be a comfort to her soon maybe to think that she did all she could herself she would perhaps fancy it might have been different do grandfather let her mary had still you see little or no belief in jem's innocence and besides she thought if mary saw will and heard herself from him that jem had not been with him that thursday night it would in a measure break the force of the blow which was impending let me lock up house grandfather for a couple of days and go and stay with alice it's but little one like me can do i know she added softly but by the blessing of god good and welcome and here comes one kindly use of money i can hire them as will do for her what i cannot mrs davenport is a willing body and one who knows sorrow and sickness and i can pay her for her time and keep her there pretty near altogether so let that be settled and you take mrs wilson dear grandad and let mary go find will and you can all meet together at after and i'm sure i wish you luck job consented with only a few dissenting grunts but on the whole with a very good grace for an old man who had been so positive only a few minutes before mary was thankful for margaret's interference she did not speak but threw her arms round his neck and put up her rosy red mouth to be kissed and even job was attracted by the pretty childlike gesture and when she drew near him afterwards like a little creature sidling up to some person whom it feels to have offended he bent down and blessed her as if she had been a child of his own to mary the old man's blessing came like words of power End of chapter 25 Reading by Belinda Brown of Indianapolis, Indiana